today. Good Friday morning, everybody. John and Lance along with Dell for the next three hours here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. And despite the fact that there was literally nothing on yesterday. That's not true. We had good news, bad news. Well, we had Nick Casario, which we're going to go through. Yeah, and we had some good news, bad news. Look, the bad news is Jose Abreu didn't get it, get a hit. But the good news is he didn't have an error. So in terms he, of his hit he didn't to make error, an out either. Yeah, and in terms of his hit to error um, performance index or whatever we were calling it, uh, hit efficiency, uh, play efficiency, whatever our new term that we created yesterday, it was kind of good news, bad news. You know, um, Jose Abreu did not have an error. It would have been sad if he went to the one to one ratio of hits for the season to errors. I don't know if that's ever happened in Major League history. Once you've had more than three hits, I don't know if anyone's had. I hope he gets a hit before his next error. I kind of hope he one to way. one. I kind of want to <laughs> oh, see the one to one. Oh, oh. Historically, a, a true historical unicorn. You know, that was a tough ball that he missed. It, it, it took a uh, like a, a weird hop and it came straight at him. He's a major league first baseman though, and there's a reason that it was an error and not because of the weird hop. I mean, I saw people on Twitter like Ian was being stupid with everybody. How how difficult it was. Hey. It was it was a tough ball. There's no question about it. He's a major league first baseman. He's getting older now. His reflexes. I, I think it's just that his bat his bat speed is slower. He yeah. just isn't the same guy. No, he's it, just not. That's what happened to Yuli out of nowhere. Yeah. Bat speed just yeah. got too slow after winning a batting title. Win a batting title and now can't make a team anywhere. Yeah, I mean it's yeah it, it happens quick when you get older. It happens out of nowhere. And so that's always the concern. And I think Abreu hit a time frame where i think we're just getting the absolute worst of jose abreu and that's why you know it's like there's not gonna be all anything you're gonna be able to do yeah uh so the oh, so good news justin verlander on the mound tonight which is awesome bad news is you know you think that it's letting up a little bit the nationals are just coming off a west coast trip where they went five and four yeah they played oakland but they beat the dodgers two out of three mm-hmm. and their pitching is really really good right now yeah. and they're facing a guy mackenzie gore tonight who shut the astros down pretty much. they gave up two runs kyle tucker had a couple of hits off him but he pitched five and i want to say two-thirds against the astros last last year and and they, they they only got him for a couple of hits they're pitching really well right now. And the Astros don't need to see a team that's pitching really well right now. No. What they need or is a, a bunch of slappies. Or a team that's hitting really well. Right. Those two things. If What we need is a team who is not hitting or pitching particularly well. Right. I mean, we... That's frankly was, what the Astros could use right now with their six wins. The, it, the schedule was supposed to ease up with the Royals some. And they got slapped around, slapped around in Kansas City. I don't need to see more of that. Now, you do have your aces going in this one. You know, you start with Verlander, right? You got Verlander in game one. And you, then in game two, you got Ronel Blanco and then Christian Javier. Mm-hmm. It doesn't get any better than that for the Astros. No, I mean, it's it's as good as you could hope for. The question is, we haven't seen Justin Verlander have a good start this year in his two minor league uh, in his two minor league starts. We have not seen a productive. Working on stuff, Lance. I know. I'm working hoping he on was just stuff. working on a slider or whatever. He's just changing speeds. Doesn't care if he gets hit around the park. But, um, you know, it's still just you, you feel like he'll be able to bear down and get it done. Um, but it's going to be – it will be interesting to see how he does today, as you mentioned – He's got his he's got his hands full today, and uh, so do the Astros with a team. Even though they're eight and ten, they've got one of their best pitchers on the mound today, and Justin Verlander is supposed to be the Astros' best pitcher. You've got a lineup that can hit. It just you know they score in bunches or they don't score, and so uh, this is one of these series where nothing in 162 games has come down to three games or anything like that, but. This is a real litmus test for where this team potentially is, the direction they're headed. Because if they don't do well in this series, no, it's not only this series. So, so the really, they got the day off yesterday. They play the three in Washington. Mm-hmm. Then they got Monday off. They go to three in Chicago. The Cubs are are not good. Oh. Then they get a day off. Then they've got two in Colorado, and they're awful. Then they get another day off. 
This is this is the most advantageous schedule ever. Well, they got two of Colorado here over the, uh, the next weekend. Four and, and then, 15 Colorado, by the way. And then three against Cleveland here, where they're unstoppable at Minute Maid right now. <laughs> unstoppable. So this is a stretch that you really have to make hay. We knew it was going to be difficult those first 20 games. We knew that. 6-14 and 14 is pretty bad. That's 300 baseball. This is where you have to play 700 or more baseball. This is where you need, you need to really, really make some hay because after Cleveland, you got Seattle here, and then you go to the Yankees. So we need to make some hay over these next seven, eight, nine games. Yeah, you can't afford to play 500 baseball. No, no. I mean, you just can't. It's better than playing 300, but it's not going to – you, you just can't – you have to make up more ground. Yeah. You have to make up ground, period. We've got some programming news for you here. Kind of a big deal. Kind of important. Our our next golf tournament is coming up on May 7th, and it's at Highland Pines. It's different. You know, we, we usually go to and, – and we're going to continue to go to Wildcat. We will. But if you've never played Highland Pines, you need to come on out on May 7th. Get to our website, ESPN 9, 975. Uh, and get here for the occasional invitational because this is a treat. If you've never been up there to Porter and seen this golf course, it is really, really cool. You're going to be off that I'm week. Flying. You're off. Yeah, I'm flying that day. You're off that week. So uh, May 7th, we're we're going to be up there, Dell and I, in his favorite thing he's going to have. And where do you see the course, Dell? It's beautiful. It lays out for your game, too, so I think you're going to yeah, like it in terms of – in terms of the way that the pins are typically tucked, I think you're gonna. It's favorable to your bump and run type of Carbach, mentality. Uh, brewing company lunch and dinner from Valencia's Tex Mex Garage. Big ups to. Can I get them to Valencia's. give me food a day in advance? Uh, we got the 18 holes of golf award ceremony afterwards. Uh, we want you to register now at ESPN975.com. See, get I- there now. Get early bird. It's cheaper. Yeah, do, do it, it now. now. Go For play, a limited time, go play you've golf got an early birthday Before it gets to be 1,000 degrees. What about degrees. Dell's new show well, now? Well, see, that's what I thought. you When you said big programming news, I thought you were going to say, um, hey, I thought you were going to li- I thought you were going to say, don't miss out on the NFL draft with Dell because Dell and his good friend Paul and his other the, good friend Joe. The Dell show? The yeah. The Dell draft Del's show? Dell's now taking my stuff that right. I do right. as the preeminent draft expert. Using now your Del, information? Using... I, I would plagiarizing. assume plagiarizing, and and he is going to now be trying to bite my. He's trying to jack my style word for word, bar for bar, in his draft analysis. Yeah, that, that feels unlikely. I'm sure the only thing he'll have open is your draft guide. Yeah, only yeah. thing I'll be looking at is I don't have a draft guide. Yeah, he doesn't. Something like that. I'm but. I might go through his strengths and weaknesses until they bore me, and then I'll stop doing that um because much like this show he'll bore me so i'm not gonna do that you never know what i'll say uh, yes, I, you had to dump yes me. i do i've i've asked you well at least on your draft stuff i know what you have to say because i've been in there as you're writing it up and you never say anything interesting um <laughs> that's kind of true but just how it is but yes. no it's not my show paul gallant and joe george will have a draft show out at i believe cobos on friday because that's when the texans will be making picks and what are you doing then you just producing no i'm going to be out there because Joe asked me to. Yeah. But it wasn't oh, my see. idea. Oh, if Joe asked me. Mm. Well, he did. I'm Joe a, I'm a team player. Asked yeah. Yeah, whatever. He asked me, so I went out. I'm going out there. So He's gonna now, hijack now we can just forget about him He's doing anything hide. for this show. Yeah, we're done. Do we even have Casario or no? Do we have you any just sound? You know, you know, because you know, he did show. play the Alex Bregman sound in his show yesterday. What a well, little yeah. twerk. <laughs> yeah. What a he twerk. Did. Oh, we can't get it. Can't get it. It's not me? working. Can't I can't find it. it. I can't uh, find oh, it nowhere. I wish you'd have told me. And then first thing he plays Back in the baseball card. It's not the first thing I played. Uh but the point remains, if you would have called for it and, and said, hey, is it ready? I would have told you it was ready. Then we would have played it. Uh, we do have Casario stuff. All you have to do is look at the rundown. I know Lance never does. That's why someone always has to tell him yeah. where, when his lives well, are because he's a big I, baby. I even looked. I, yesterday I looked at the rundown, saw Alex well, Bregman on it, and we still don't play see it. How you, see how it happens? Yeah. You, now you ask me if it was ready, oh, and it's ready. Okay. Now see how it goes. You ask, and I'll tell you. No, how about uh, producers just have to. I'm not a, uh, According to listen, you guys, I'm not just a producer. I was listening to. Joel and Jeremy yesterday. You're barely a producer. They played 20 sound bites from Nick Casario yesterday. Not one delay. It was like they called, they went for it. Who's their producer? He's unbelievable. Who's their producer? He's really good. Brian. 
Yeah, Mac. Be Mac. Wow. He's a real producer. Unbelievable. Okay, by the way, location to be determined as far as my draft show. So we're still figuring that out. But you know what BMAC didn't do? He didn't follow the rules. Okay, what's the rules? What do you mean? The rules are because Joe George, my favorite, has set up a system where, hey, if you grab audio, email it it. to a certain spot so we all know where it is. You know what the greatest producer in the world didn't do? Email it to a certain spot. He was a me guy. Yeah, Yeah, me. Well, he was me, not we. Yes. But you know what happens? He shows on top. They were bam, 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 bite after bite, bam, 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 bam. And he said, you know what I don't give a rat's ass about? The other shows. You know you, you know, know what? I'm, I, 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 I like that kind that. of selfish mentality. That. How many bites in a row did they play? About 12 or 15. Maybe if they had. I mean, it was nonstop. And their host didn't have to do anything. I mean, maybe, if they, maybe, maybe yeah. if they had, like, actual thoughts on stuff. Maybe well, they, they just, did. Oh, okay. You, you're just Jeremy saying. was mad at Casario <laughs> uh, the whole time. <laughs> you made it sound like all they did was rapid fire. Bang, bang, bang. Well, okay. no. They had comments in between how okay. mad Jeremy was at, at Nick. Okay. Yeah. That, that, Are you mad at Nick for what he said yesterday? I'm, I don't care what Nick says. <laughs> I'll truth. find out. I'll find out. Did if you see I'm the mad. leak of the uh, helmets? helmets? Do you think it's an intentional leak? I don't know that, but there's no. They have a I big th- event on Tuesday. Well, I feel like it was just because. Oh, that's true. Because yeah, it's because seven, one, somebody three. was unpacking a helmet yeah. out of a Riddell uh, yeah. box, and they're showing the helmet off. I mean, whoever did that, you can tell they leaked it. They yeah. shouldn't they be fired or no? Well, yeah, unless you or maybe don't. they didn't know. But they so the Texans got out in front of it by having Cal. Did yeah. you see the Cal picture? I saw it with the he's dog. not even an owner anymore. At this point, he's just part of he's just part of the hip hop culture. Cal was out there with the dog. The dog has the only a thing missing was it wasn't a pit bull. Yeah, it was I guess his own black lab or whatever. Tex. It has Tex has a big chain. With the H, the new logo H that they're I don't using. I like the new logo H. I like and the he, other one. Well, that we'll they talk had. about that. And then Tal's squatting down. Yeah. And he's throwing up his H. I mean, I would In never. In front of see, his mansion. Could you imagine Jim Mersey doing that? No, I mean it's something you see off a rap album. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a it's a cover. <laughs> It's cover art with his hat. You, you yeah. got the flex in the background. You got your dog here. He's got his, You're squatting down. His giant barbecue. That's his brand too. Now <laughs> he's flipping burgers. Oh, out that's there. his and brand. He's flipping burgers and River Oaks in his front yard. <clears throat> that's how. That's how Cal is branded. That's himself. how gangster he is. Yeah. He's flipping in the front yard, which is against HOA re- regular. Right. I mean, I'm assuming their HOA is extremely strict. Name an owner. Who's the one owner? Is there? Is it Jerry? Like, is there anyone else? Josh Harris from Washington. Is there any? Because I just don't know him. He's is there the, any other owner that could get away with that cover art? He's got his shades on. His yeah. his his branded shades and his stash and his H hat. His mm. new H hat. Someone on. needs to get a hold of him. I don't see. He's got the old helmet now, on see, the grill. Mac is out of control with with him doing wrestlers. Yeah. And, but Cal keeps leaning further and further into it. To where I'm reading comments and like, that's my Cadillac owner. Your owner ain't. My owner is the. Like, people, people love. Are, they're sheep. People are such sheep. They really are. People love Cal McNair for this. It doesn't take much. Just like they love Mattress Mac whenever he, you know, like they, they love Mattress Mac because he was yelling and cussing at somebody in, in Philadelphia. That's my, that's my furniture guy or whatever. Cal McNair, now that he just throws up the H, it's unbelievable. And they've won. The things, the ugly things that were said by you two and many people in public what, about Cal. What did we say? Uh, earlier. And then now what the way people think of Cal is what about what, what about what you have said? I don't recall anything. Do you have yeah. anything on tape? Yes, if you want to play that game. Sure, show it to me. <laughs> show it to you. Yeah, you don't you, have any of me saying anything negative about Cal. Because he's the it best. Wasn't, it wasn't memorable enough. You do have Actually, yeah. the problem is when, particularly last year, I wasn't really around when, mm. you, when it was going really poorly. That's true. RJ and others were here, so they probably didn't grab it. But last year, everything was great. So what, what was there to say? Cal got the brakes beaten off of him along with everybody in the organization for, for two, three years. And not now, by me. I, I can't. Find, I don't know who it was, but not by me. I can't find a negative <laughs> thing about the Houston about Cal McNair Nothing. anywhere. I, I never Every, said. and he doesn't do anything other than throw up the H and just make public appearances and be flip a nice a guy, burgers. which he is. Yeah, he's just a, a generic. Yeah. He's a generic nice guy. He's there with his wife. They're the first family of 
Yeah. Uh, and like Jim Crane can't go to restaurants without having, having been screamed at about Bagwell Lytics. <laughs> no, that's not true. Which is something John trademarked. That's no. You guys, I, first of all, I never said a negative thing about Cal ever and that I remember, <laughs> that I recall. You called and him Hodor. Se- and second, you him I Caldor. never, he no, never that, called him that came, I didn't like that. That, I know that I came never from Twitter. Uh, that you can't Twitter. put that on John. That I mean, I, I thought but that was what, ugly. What you yet, can't I put on John. Don't put people. that on me. What you can't put on John is, do, 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 do. you can't well, put I that never, on John. I never said anything negative about him. No, That's not. Sell the team. Show me where I said You know what? And if you say sell the team, that's not negative. Yeah, just. I want you to make money. Sell the team. Yeah. You, you need some cash. You did ask now? At, at one point for our Carrie McNair to take over. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was in charge of that. I was leading that bandwagon. <laughs> yeah. But now Cal, he's going to come out with Bun at the rodeo next year. I'm pretty yeah. sure Cal's actually yeah. performing. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this. I've never said a negative word about free rain coffee. I know that. I would never say a negative word about free rain coffee because free rain coffee gets you started. It gets your day started. Dream free rain Work, repeat. Dream free rank coffee. Work, repeat. Let's go. Love it. You'll love it if you haven't tried it. I've got a recurring uh, order that keeps on coming, and you can do that online too, by the way. Instead of having to go back and order it again, this is my order. No, it will just keep on sending it out to you every however often that you want it, every couple of months, every couple of weeks, whatever it is. But whatever your order is, let's go. Free rain coffee is here for you. I just got the notice that my my free rain coffee order is in the mail now. It comes to you. It's so good. It's so good. And and you are just going to love free rain coffee. If you've never had it before, I'm telling you, you're going to love it. It's Texas. It's America. You're, it, is, it, it just sparks your day. It's so full flavored. Get, get on board. 975coffee.com. Put in promo, promo code ESPN20 for 20% off site-wide. 975coffee.com. ESPN20. Hey, guys, uh, GMC is professional grade, <clears throat> and they're also available out there in Angleton, Gulf Coast Chevy Buick GMC. When you're buying a GMC truck, you're getting professional grade. That's what they're known for, and a GMC Sierra 1500 is built to work for you. A lot of people want to have it because it looks great, but you know, it's workspace, too. It's the, the carry load that you're going to have, and you're going to have an opportunity to utilize. It's also a great-looking truck. I don't want to... Deny that. It really is. Right now, you can get a 2024 GMC Sierra 1500 model with a Turbo Max or a 5.3 liter V8 engine at 1.9% financing for 72 months. They're giving it to you for 70, 
two months. What's that going to mean for you? Going to mean those payments are going to be much lower, and that's for well-qualified buyers. If you want a new truck, visit my dealership down there in Angleton. Craig DeSurf and Rick Drenner and the entire crew, Jeff, are all fantastic at making sure that you're happy and you're never hassled, you're never hustled, you never feel pressured, and you get the vehicles that you're looking for. It's Gulf Coast Chevy Buick GMC in Angleton. They know trucks. GMC, we are professional grade. You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. All right, 720 ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. 713-780-3776. A lot of stuff to do despite no games last night, uh, despite the fact that uh, no, there was no NBA. It gets back tonight. Uh, the play-in games and unfortunately no Jimmy Butler, right? He's done. Uh, Zion, out. Those odds have changed drastically. <clears throat> well, the Heat were a one-and-a-half-point favorite before the news was confirmed. They're still a one-and-a-half-point favorite. So, They're we'll done. see if it, as the game Their gets heart's closer. Their gone. The heart is gone. Yeah. They're Did, done. I, I thought it had moved. That line would have moved. Are you sure there's still one and a half? Bet however Tim much Reynolds. you want to win on against the Heat. However much you want to win, just bet that amount. Their heart's gone. Jimmy's gone. <laughs> he is. Well, but you know what a lot of teams do when the star goes down? They actually step and up. And, in fact, the Heat have a better winning percentage when he's not on the floor than when he is. Ah, so, so What about the uh, other – the New Orleans has got to be. Nor well, the Kings are beat up, too. They, they, they didn't matter. It didn't matter against the Warriors, but they're missing a couple of their wings. Uh, but Zion won't play. They need more from Brandon Ingram. He was benched in the fourth quarter because of how bad he was. So – that's a game New Orleans should probably still win, but McCollum and Ingram have to play better. They yeah. stunk in the game against the They Lakers. don't usually, so. No. No. And so. it's another home game for them. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so we got that tonight. We got Verlander going against Gore tonight. So that is good news for our Houston Astros. We got that. We got a lot of Nick Casario, okay? So let's start with uh, some sound from Nick Casario. Um, the first one, Dell, is... Talk, he talks about – I mean, we heard Will Anderson Jr. talking about, hey, man, you got to be a different dog to play here now. Well, okay. I mean, we, we need to slow down. He said it's right. not for everybody. It's not for everybody. All right. Nick Casario, I guess he agrees with that. When you go into the draft as best you can, you want to put the team in a position where if you had to go out there and play a game today, like we'd be able to put a team on a field. So when we feel as we sit here today, if we had to go out there and play a game – We'd be able to put a team out there, um, not necessarily have to rely on the draft to, let's say, add a player. Like, I think whoever we draft, I mean, hopefully they'll come in here and create a, a role and, and a niche for themselves. It's probably going to be hard to make this team or make a significant impact. And, I mean, hopefully that's a good thing. That is a good thing, not having to depend on rookies, right? Um, now, last year they had to depend. I mean, their whole season depended on rookies. This year you're going into this draft. If if the 43rd, I don't know that where they're going to pick because you never know with Nick Casario where he's going to move to. If the 43rd and 59 picks don't start, that's okay. You don't have to this year. No. This is an enviable place. I, when I look at team needs and I look at, look at teams, there are certain teams that are hard to figure out where they could go. Houston's one of the hardest to figure out because they have so few – must have priority needs. I mean, of course, we know they, they still need a cornerback. They could use another safety. They could yeah, use. I mean, look, I, I don't really you know, know what that means. I think, you know, when you put the team together, you look at the We're hearing that. Oh, yeah. His mic must be on. Yeah, I don't know. We're your hearing, mic is on. We're hearing that. I thought yeah. Nick, I think he was firing off a funny soundbite by Nick. No. Trying to counter what no, he no. said. But, no, the Texans are one of the few teams I look at and I go, man, they're kind of hard to figure out now because of what they've done in free agency and where they're picking. It's kind of it's a little bit difficult. There's some other teams like that, and then you got teams like Buffalo, desperate for a wide receiver. Texans aren't in that position. And when Nick says we could play without even having a draft, I believe him. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I mean, believe him. I mean, as many cornerbacks, you know, he signed a bunch of guys at corner at the other corner. But you could go to you could go to battle with them. You got safeties, not great, but you got safeties. You got your defensive line set. Well, I, think the I safeties guess safeties could be okay if they're healthy. Yeah. I mean, Jimmy Ward, if he's healthy, when's the last time we saw Jimmy Ward healthy? 
You know what? I, I was when uh, is that? I talked to my buddy, our buddy John Harris, the other day, and we were talking about the safety. So I was like, "What do you What do you think about safety? I like that for him." We were talking about Tyler Newman because Johnny knows all these players. He's got his own draft guide. You ought to reach out to him if you want it. But he was, um, he, he is like, well, you know, uh, Aaron Murray missed. He said Eric Murray missed however many games it was, and Jimmy Ward missed seven games, and. Who's the other? There's another safety. I'm trying to remember the other safety. Missed like nine games. I couldn't believe how many injuries the tech, like how long and expanded and extended well, that's why. the injuries were. DeAndre Houston Carson, if I remember correctly, didn't start off the he didn't start off the season even on the Texans roster. And he ended up being a starter. No, for the he last was a starter for games. a while. He played a lot. Yeah. So I just think that when you look at when you look at the safety position based on the injuries that the Texans had, um, it's you have to think worst case scenario roster death. Yeah, I mean, and future starter worst case scenario. Although I think you can get a a guy to compete or maybe be the third. No, honestly, where safety. is it? Where would a place where the forty third pick would come in and start? You know, well, um, I mean, would he start over Jimmy Ward? No, probably not. He's going to stick with. The would veterans. he start over that cor- any other corner over there? Maybe, maybe. Not a rookie second round. Well, maybe, maybe. Maybe a rookie second rounder, forty two. Yeah, maybe. How about a big? It'd be one where they might tech. be able to beat him out. How about a big defensive tackle? Maybe. Do you know? Do you know that the Chiefs told Tavondre Sweat they would draft him and the, they would still draft him in the first. They would. They're in, he's in consideration for the first round. The Chiefs. Andy. Andy Reid, Mormon. Yeah. Okay. He is world famous for taking on. He you got some trouble. Let me know. Yeah. Tyreek. Let's go. Um, Dame, who was the who was the other one from Florida who had credit card theft and Damien and Blue Trees all the time had multiple tests. Damien uh <clears throat> no. Robinson, the the wide receiver from Florida. What was his first name? Is it Demetrius? Demetrius Robinson. Maybe that's who it was. Yeah, something like that. Um you can name a variety Kareem Hunt. Let's go. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. To Andre Sweat, DWI, and then you got, you know, weight issues. Come on, we'll look at you in the first. Well, Andy now, he's also can really good. With that. But Andy's one of those Demarcus, guys. Demarcus. Demarcus Robinson. Robinson. That's it. Yeah. But Andy's also one of those guys who could say, "Well, we got a good room. What do we? Yeah. We're fine. We're trying to win championships." And I put that man next to Chris Jones, and now what are y'all going to do? Yeah. And it's kind of scary to think the Chiefs could get to Andre Sweat. Maybe in a second. One. In one, oh, they could for sure could get him in a second. No one else is drafting Tavon. A lot of teams have him in a fourth now. Yeah. A lot of teams. All right, um, breaking it. We got more Casario. So if anybody wants to get in, we got uh, open line, 713-780-3776. Catching up on breaks. You got to talk right now about John Daspit. I do have to talk about John Daspit, and I actually get to talk about John Daspit. Right now, <clears throat> he went out of town. It's going to be out of town for a few weeks but he's it's working it's a work trip that's what he's doing he's working the entire time because he can't take days off it's just not in his nature and frankly when you get hired by John Daspot as a lawyer you understand this is not going to be one of those things where you you punch in you punch out your billable hours and you're done it's not one of those jobs he worked over at Fulbright Jaworski some of the lawyers who were there with him at the very top uh, of his food chain worked at Fulbright so you know they're used to being at a big time firm and yet John started his own place because he wanted to work he wanted to do things his way for people in Houston and then eventually throughout the state of Texas and now it extends into other states but it's incredible because they as personal injury lawyers are giving you so much attention there's so much attention paid to your to your uh, injury and to your hospital bills and to your physical well-being your mental well-being the entire nine yards that you're going to find out that this is just a great opportunity for you to have somebody fighting for you that is going to get you the proper um the proper payout for your injuries with pain and suffering and all of your medicals he'll fight against the insurance company that frankly is trying to screw you 713 call now that's his phone number 713 call now or go to daspitlaw.com
Hey, um, I don't know what kind of problem you have with your locks, but if you do, especially if you've got home locks right now that you need uh, a new lock, and maybe you need a better lock for your homes, Medeco is uh, incredible. You need to talk to Derek DeSola over at uh, Houston Safe and Lock, and he's going to take care of you. A lot of times he's at West Timer in the Beltway, but you could also reach him or one of their experts in the locks up at I-10 and Wirt with King Safe and Lock. So you you need a lock. You need a better way to your for your business. You need smart devices. You need pin codes. You need fobs. You need key cards. Whatever it is, whatever direction you want to go. But these guys know how to do it. They know how to solve it. They do everything. So you don't have to worry about a thing. And locks are kind of a big deal. And especially if you're having a problem at your home, if you need to change those locks or whatever it is, whatever you need lock wise, they've got the experts in installing, uh, rekeying, master key systems, access control systems, smart lock, all of it. You need anything to do with a lock, 975safe.com, 975safe.com, or call 713 5555. You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. All right, welcome back here on the show. John and Lance, along with you, it's 713-780-3776 is the number if you would like to get in here. Continuing on with Nick Casario, all right? So this is one I was listening, this really got Jeremy and uh and joel too and and rightfully so nick is a little saucy he is he is i mean some of the things that he says he doesn't i agree he doesn't know he last time he didn't know what a window was i don't what's a window i i, I don't understand and jeremy cited many instances where he used the word window oh he did yeah oh jeremy went deep in the yeah deep dive. He did. yeah and and so and and like so, I mean, I I don't know. He got pissed off about the diva on on Stefan Diggs. I get that. You're asking a, a a general manager who just signed a guy and who has to I, deal with a guy. I would prefer that they would have delved deeper into because they did the they did ask him about the contract with Stefan Diggs and why he did it. And Casario really didn't answer it. But but what? But the question wasn't asked. Why though? Why did you give up the last three years? And give him three and a half million dollars more to than you had to. Answer the truth, which is that he would have been a pain in the ass if you didn't. Well, that, he, that his agent he, said we want you don't, to don't do put want, words in Nick's mouth because he'll but, be pissed off agent, about exactly was, what you're saying. But this is what this is the truth. Do you want him to tell you the truth? Yeah. I, yeah. You yeah know, the, well, right. Stephon but he's not Dix going wants to. to go to free agency and get new money. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's the truth. That's the truth. And if he says that, he's not really protecting. I don't know what was his answer on that. He just said, "Well, you know, with the age, he didn't really answer. Well, we can get, we'll, we, we can, we can what get can that. What can you that say? I guess he, I don't know. We can actually, pull, we have that whenever you want it. You got that one? Yeah. Okay, but let's. Okay, uh, let's do this one first, though. Give me a saucy. Nick. The big names. Okay, adding big names this this off season. He wasn't sure he understood that question either. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't really know what that means. I think, you know, when you put the team together, you look at the opportunities that are presented in front of you. You have X number of dollars that you have available to you, and it's all about resource allocation. So, I mean, what, Devin Singletary, was that not like a big enough name last year, I guess? No. So, again, no. we're looking for good football players with the right mindset that come in here, espouse our philosophy, and then ultimately have to go out there and perform and, and play football. You know, there are bits of that where when he was talking about money allocation and what makes sense, that's cool. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. But he had a little add, he had to add a little spice De for no reason. Devin Singletary didn't even wasn't even a starter at the beginning of last season. Ten win Nick is a little different. Yeah, I mean, ten, no, ten win this Nick has is, is got a little flex on you. Well, yeah, he's had some of that already. He already had that, but he's he's not he's not new with Houston no, media he, anymore. And I think Nick is basically come on, Nick. You well, know that I don't even know what that means. It, he's got a he's got a little Belichick in him from working those years with Belichick. He it's, does. it's actually it's actually true. Yeah. That's what Nick. It's it's different, but at the same time, I think he's looking to be a little defensive about. Stuff. Yeah, I mean, and smartest guy in the room, and all of that. I don't care. You know what? I don't care. I don't. It really doesn't bother me. But it yes, no. Are you really Daniel Hunter and and Stefan Diggs? 
I, aren't bigger names than Devin Singletary? Really? Really, Nick? Well, they are. I mean, I don't even know what that means. Yeah, how, he's really not as smart as he thinks because he says that a lot. He says, I don't even know what that means. He didn't know what windows were. He doesn't know what big names mean. He does. He doesn't, I think he doesn't he know knows. a lot of words. I think the, the, he the response is, you seem to not know what a lot of things mean. Yes, he doesn't know the meaning of words. They're simple words, Are, too. Like window. diva. He says he doesn't know what diva means. I, he doesn't know what stuff means. I thought he was smarter than this. What if somebody speaks to him in Spanish? They tell him in Spanish. Oh, yeah. To see if he knows okay, pero what diva. diva La what diva. Is, no sabes? What is diva, diva, diva. in Spanish? <laughs> diva is a diva. No, but in Spanish, is there a word for it? Uh, diva. That's it? Yeah. So, hey, a... so the next question is, is English your second language? <laughs> is it Ventana? Is, is this... Window Ventana? Are, are big names? You don't know what the big name are means? You are, are you our ESL? Big means large. Name is the is something that you put on something. To, that's what you call it. Nombre is, grande. Is Nick Casario the first... NFL GM ESL, he might be As English a second English, language. English a second language guy. Uh, Como es ventana? <laughs> si, sí, es lo mismo. Let me see. La ventana. Oh, la, la ventana. ventana. Es lo mismo para I know what that means. Un campeones. Mm. Uh, si tu tu sabes es <laughs> ventana es lo mismo. He might be Italian. Muchos... He's Casario. He might be Italian. Well, that's your well. It's romance language. You should be able to figure it you out. Should figure One it thing out. I learned from watching Ripley yeah. with so much Italian is that hey, I think I could probably get along in Italy nah, with my sure Spanish. You can. You yeah, can. I'm pretty sure you can. All right, you got the other one that you said you got the what oh the nut oh the dig stuff the dig stuff. structure yeah yeah about the stru- uh, how we about they asked him okay so why did you take uh, what's the deal with the contract why'd you do that. Yeah, every situation is different. I think we evaluate it case by case. You have discussions with the representation and the player, and ultimately you make a decision that you feel was in the best interest of the team and the organization, everybody involved, and that's why we ended up where we are. See, uh, okay, so why was that better for you? Why is it better for you to have just a one-year deal with Steph? Steph well, but he didn't explain that. So apparently it might be better. It may be better for the organization that you only have Stephon Diggs for one year because I'm going to tell you this. He's going into a contract year. Dude is going to play his ass off. Well, let's just do the math on this. <clears throat> he can only be one year. I'm already resigned to the fact that he's. this is a one-year rental, and that's it. Um, and we'll see how everyone feels about it when it's when it's when when the period's over. I think he's going to be productive. But you have two wide receivers coming up next year. Both of them are going to make 25-plus, more than likely. You can't afford to pay your wide receiver position $50 million with contracts that are going to run. Now, you could... You could for Diggs if it's a three-year deal because of the structure of. Can you trust him for three years? But I don't, I don't know. Well, once again, I don't. I mean, you've got Daniel Hunter on. I mean, I think he. I don't okay, know. I that know you he doesn't can. know what diva means because he says that. Uh-huh. I don't know what diva means, but he certainly knows how to treat a diva. I'm going to have you here for one year. I'm going to give you more money than you thought you were going to make. And you're going to be in a contract year, so you're going to play your ass off. I think it's smart, I know though, John. exactly what. Yeah, I think it's it is better for the team. It actually is better yeah. for the team. Although he didn't, he didn't say it, and he can't say it. <clears throat> no, but I think he. I respect the fact he can't say it. Like, look, yeah, you could, you could, you could say whatever you want about him getting a little saucy, as you said, but he can't say like he can't tell you the truth on that one because he risks alienating a player you you simply can't do it steven nelson already made fun of his his vest and he had to sign steven nelson to a year contract after steven nelson made fun of his vest yeah yeah i mean how how humbling does that have to be that this guy just was cracking jokes on my vest and i still got to give him money now you saw once he got good he's like now you can't get paid steven nelson beat it yeah and he got rid of him this year because he remembered the vest thing yeah, well, you think that's why I got rid of him? Or I think it played into I just it. don't want to pay him that money, that man, his money. No, but I mean, I mean, you don't want Stephon Diggs. Stephon Diggs wants to get to the market and get more money. He wants to be one of the highest paid players. I don't think he will based on the attitude issues he's had at a couple spots. This really just keeps him, should be, on his best behavior. They get a contract year player, which isn't always great because then he could also be demanding the football more have you thought about that john that he's contract year but could be saying i need my touches yeah yeah that could be disruptive too so it's something to keep an eye on but i think there's enough footballs for the yes. three the three players yes there will be enough and stefan diggs is good enough where you go 
get that man the ball. You know what? He's right. Yeah, I mean, he's right. But but I could see a scenario where you got a game and you think, you know, and then I think Nico is my first target. Then Tank is the guy I want to go to next. And there's going to be days where he probably needs to be the third target yeah. in matchups because he's not getting down the field like Nico. Nico can hit some big shots for you. And the and game so isn't tank. one with 14 play drives anymore. And so can Tank. I, I, I see, it's an, I see. honestly, I live in a, we, we're living in a world where Tank could have more touchdowns than Stephon Diggs this year. Uh, Yeah, Stephon's pretty good in the red zone, though. He, man. Yeah, but so Tank. Tank is, too. But what if Tank's just in there to block? What? What? Why are they going to? They're going to use him at guard again. Okay, we got to stop that. No, he's third tight end. He's t- okay. Seven forty three. ESPN ninety seven. Can we call Stephon Diggs a move tight end <laughs> going forward? Well, in this offense, back type. In this offense, maybe around the goal line. But Stephon Diggs, remember, Josh Allen found him a lot for touchdowns because he got open a lot in the red zone. Yeah. So. You basically have the long ball touchdown guy and Nico, and you got two guys that are wizards around the in the red zone in Tank. I mean, Tank had seven touchdowns <laughs> in limited time. Yeah. Tank is a problem. Yep. And you got him in, him in, like I said, I'd be shocked if this isn't a Super Bowl season and even Super Bowl <sighs> win for the Texans right now. You're gonna shocked. back that you're gonna follow what Shit. after what John said about shocked. about the best team in Astros history. You want to do this now too? This is going to be not, the I'm best team. I'm not backing off. I know you're not. This I know is you're going not. to be the best team in Texans history. How about that? How about that? I said it. I meant it, and I will eat that for a while. Tell. What's what's the? We don't have a 35 year old first baseman. <laughs> yeah, not not okay? on the Texans. Not for the Texans. Yeah, you just have Jeff Acuda and C.J. Henderson. Yeah, but yeah. they're young. They're like they're are like they, little Dubons running around they, waiting to explode. Are they good? Well, Dubon wasn't really that great before he got here. Hmm. You know who was J.P. France? Just some guy. Just some guy with the with the constitution on his forearm. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, who was Renel Blanco? Renel Blanco is just some you, guy you know in the minor league. You're naming a lot of guys on a team that's terrible right now, right? Renel Blanco's good. No, but you're naming guys on a team that have showed up and the team still stinks. That, 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 that is kind of true. He's got a point. No, he's got a point. I've got a point here about the best barbecue grills at the best price. That's when you join the club at Texas Star Grill Shop. We were there the other day, and I got I, I bought my my grill. I got a beautiful grill, a uh, DPS grill in my backyard that I love from Texas Star Grill Shop. It's the, a premier grill. It, it if you if you want the pellet grills, if you want gas grill, if you want uh, propane, whatever it is. But not only grills, there's so much more to it. All of the accessories that you need for your grilling, but they can also build you an outdoor grill station grill uh, with everything that you could possibly i mean build it literally build it for you you can make it in brick or you can make it what the the countertop everything about it it's perfect it's perfect if you're going to do outdoor grill listen summer's coming up and you need to join the club join the club at 975grills.com you get special pricing that nobody else get you're going to be in the club so if you're thinking about or you need anything grill-wise, there's one place to go, 975grills.com.
You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. All right, 748 ESPN, 97.5 and 92.5. Someone, 378037. Is that Gilbert on the line there? Who is, is that? I can't see it. Um, if it is, we got to get him in here, see what he thinks about what's going on with this Astros team. I'm sure he's not. He's got to be upset about it, I would imagine. He's going to be damn pissed about it. Yeah, I would think so. Anyway, um, so we got a big day today. I got a surprise for you two coming up at 9 o'clock. Mm-hmm. The best surprise you have ever. You never do anything like this, but I do. You bring in Eric Layden, okay? Mm-hmm. I'm, bringing in, I'm, I'm bringing food in, okay? That's like, better than a person. Great food. Great food. Yeah, food is better than a person. Yes. I'm nothing against Eric Layden. No, but it, let's just be honest. Food is better food than is a person. Food is better than a person. How about Eric Layden stepped up and goes, I'm going to be taking my post-draft trip with the wife. Uh, we do this every year. And I said, almost jokingly, you ought to come and do the show. He's, He's going like, to come in. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do three of those days. He's going to fly into Houston and do the, and come show. To the show. But he's like dying to talk Astros baseball. He watches every game. He won't let his kids. He told us he doesn't let his kids watch other baseball games during the week. They can watch other other teams the weekend, but they can only watch Astros weekday. And at this point, that's a CPS that's, thing. Um, so uh, he's watching gonna be Hunter here. Brown on a Thursday. Could get you a call to CPS. Oh, God. May 8th, 9th, and 10th, he's going to be with us. May 7th, we're going to be at Highland Pines Golf Course, and we want you to be in for the occasional invitational. Go to ESPN975.com and sign up. It's an early bird right now to sign up. And if you haven't played Highland Pines before, I'm t- I'm going to tell you this. You feel like you're in Georgia. You don't feel like you're in Houston. It's the it, it the it, there's 40 foot drops. There are lakes and pine trees. It's just beautiful. It, the zoysia grass, we've told you about this before, the zoysia gla- grass, Lance, it's different. It is. It makes it all different. Isn't it made the from The grains are lightning, like are that? always lightning. It's great. It's, That's not great. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I no, want no. slow greens. Yeah, no. You slow want, greens are forgiving. No, you don't want slow greens. Why not? No, you want nice, fast greens. No, I'll, I don't want fast I'll greens. I feel like I'm in fast Georgia. Fast greens go flying off yeah. the... You'll That's feel like you, you're in Georgia. You I'm going to drive that. you around the course, Bill, I, I and don't you're going to go, I don't wanna, wow. This do I want to feel like I'm in Georgia? Yeah. What part of Georgia? You... Like not Georgia, Russia, Georgia. No, like, I know. Like I, I know the Georgia state. This the isn't Atlanta the 1950s. With Augusta in it. This isn't the fifties. Is, is it Atlanta, Georgia, or Macon, Georgia? What are <laughs> we talking about? No, it's like Augusta, Georgia. We're like Macon. It's like Augusta, Georgia. Have you ever had boiled peanuts? You know that boiled peanuts are the 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 Georgia thing, it's right? A big thing. Yeah. Have you ever had? Well, them? We're gonna, I'm going to wear a peach shirt because okay. that's Georgia. Have you ever had boiled peanuts? Uh, I have. I don't it's know. It's terrible. Are they? I don't get it's it. Absolutely but it's a southern terrible. thing. They love them. I don't get it. It's anymore. absolutely terrible. <clears throat> oh. Um, what about Gilbert? He's wonderful. Let's get Gilbert in here. Hey, Gilbert. Hey, how you doing, gentlemen? Good. What's up, Gilbert? How you doing today? Um, Pretty good, anyway. I think you're going to go win tonight. You do? I hope so. Yeah, I know, because Justin Verlander's back. How about that? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look for that new uh, logo thing anyway, you know. What'd you think of that? What do you that? think, Gilbert? The new Houston Texans logo and helmet. What did you think about the helmet, the logo, the whole nine yards? Pretty good look anyway, you know. Yeah. I don't like it. I don't like the H. I like the other H that they had first. There's been a lot of, there are a lot of people who hate that helmet that came yeah. out. A I, lot of people hate the helmet. I was surprised. I thought... The res- I thought it was mostly going to be positive responses, and there was a lot more negative than I thought. I I like the horns. I really like the horns helmet. Are you going to draft next week, uh, Lance? What'd you say? Yeah, about- well, I'm not going to the draft. I'm going to Los Angeles. Yeah, what are you gonna? What do you need, Gilbert? Because he's going to Los Angeles. What do you want him to pick? They you up? don't have anything there. Yeah, they- we had a lot of cuts. Yeah, uh, Colleen Wolf or uh, picture. What's that? That Colleen uh, picture. Colleen Wolf or Rapp. So she said she does not have an eight by ten. She wanted to know if she could print something and sign it for you off the yeah. computer, like a color picture. Can she do that? What are you saying? Could she print a picture of herself on a printer and then sign it? Yeah, eight by ten. 
or wrap it for me. Okay, yeah. but I that counts, right? He ain't looking for the logistics of it. Just get yeah, it done. Just get, honey. Okay, but okay. when I, when when it's on a piece of I wood, I want a picture of that woman. But when it's on I, a, Gilbert, no, I but I gotta <laughs> say this: you you guys act like it's not a big deal. But I want him to know it's going to be on a piece of printer paper, regular printer paper. paper. No, it's not going to be on glossy. That's like that's not what he's looking for. It's not going to. He well, don't That's care. why I have to say this. I think so. I don't think he cares. If you want to know the truth, he just needs a picture of her for some reason. Okay, <laughs> but I think he's going to say that's not a picture. What an awful thought. <laughs> I see a picture for me, you know. He wants a, a I know, and a I real said something deal. to her. <laughs> Can she wear a shirt that says, hey, Gilbert, on it? Is that what he wants? Yeah, <laughs> that would be cool. Not a bad idea. Yeah, 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 that's the picture I want. That's, that's the picture, picture he, he wants. wants. Well, I can't get that. <laughs> hey, <Gilbert laughs> yes, you can. She says no one has a picture that says, hey, Gilbert, on it. Make a shirt. Maybe write it on there. Hey, Gilbert. Yeah. Or is the, whatever. What if she does anyway. this to make a G? Anyway. A G? What if she you want her that? throwing up G's? Oh, you want her throw up the G's? G's? Throw up the G's. Yeah. No. Yeah. Something yeah. that signifies this shirt, this picture specifically for Gilbert. G. Lance, print out a shirt that says, hey, Gilbert. Uh, no, we're not talking. I'll talk to you later. Not yet. How do you think the Astros are going to end up, Gilbert? They're 6 and 14 now. Is this, should we be concerned? I feel like we should do a. Like a uh, one of those, like an ESPN talk show, or you know the morning TV show they have. Gilbert Astros Astros start. Are you? Do you want to <coughs> splash it or trash it? Let's get back it, to this picture. Fact or fiction? Isn't that Astros are going to ba- Astros are going to bounce back this year the and bees make the playoffs? That? Fact or fiction? Aren't you stealing that from the Killer Bees? I don't care. Fact or fiction? Astros well, making the playoffs. So. I don't think. Oh, so no. you're saying it's fiction. I don't think so. Fact or fiction, Gilbert? So say fiction, then. Gilbert. Well, well, go, 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 get, my, get my picture for the Okay, hold on, hold on, yeah, talk to you later, okay? hey, hold on. Hold on. I know. Get you, he's focused. I know, but let me ask you a question. <laughs> he, you're the, trying to nah, he already hung up. No, I want to see his mission. Up. He hung up. You hung up on him. No, I didn't. He, he hung did. up on me? I didn't t- he hung up on you. Well, he hung up on you. You know what I heard? You Get my picture. Click. That's what he did. That's, what That's he like, said. I want my money. Remember Give when me, Maury got yeah, choked by, yeah, uh, by yes, Robert? I remember. Tenero? I want my money. Give me my Give money. Me my Give picture. me it. Give me it. Give me. I don't mind. You're trying to distract him from his you sole two purpose. A-holes. You were both asses. <laughs> what do we do? And at the same point, you're both holes. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why. Because you, you make things worse for me. You make things worse. Way worse. Get him his picture. That's Get all you have that to do. Man. He's got to. You know, he he did, uh, to I his credit, this. to his credit, he backed off for a little bit. He didn't say anything about the picture for a couple weeks. And he's like, no, no. I gave Let's you time. <laughs> I gave you some time. I gave you a little leash, and now look what you did. Look what you I'm did. I'm printing a picture from my office, black and white. I'm signing it. And this he is doesn't what he's want getting. a black and white photo. He don't What's want he going to do with that? That's what he's going to get. Oh, come on. Well, not, that's, that's what he's going to get. That's all. All right. And it's just going to say, Colleen Wolf. And I'm going to do like one of those VeriSign where it just is the computer decides this is how Colleen Wolf is. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, we got a break. 713-780-3776. Get that man his picture. All right. Do you think Chad You're GPT could? Take, it's like BMAC. BMAC was focused on his show, didn't care about anything else. Okay. You think anybody distracted BMAC yesterday from put, putting on a great show producer-wise for the for the killer bees? He no. He certainly ignored a directive that was given out this week. <laughs> he don't care about that. And Gilbert, Just like Gilbert. He ain't caring about is, the Astros no, right now. There's okay, no I'm, directives. I'm, that man's on his mission. Okay? Have you guys watched Ra- Baby Reindeer yet? I don't want to watch that. No, I'm yeah, not going to watch it. you need to watch Too it. Too uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable, but you need to watch it. Mm. It's about a stalker who will not be stopped. Well. I mean, he's, you know, <laughs> has he had he's, he's, a protective order against him before? Yeah. He's he that. will be the first one to tell you. Yes, he has. And Janet Shamlian is yes. the one who went and took it out. Now, he's harmless, yeah. but she still didn't know that at the time. So she went and, you know, had to do what she had to do. Gilbert is relentless. Yep. In some ways, he is like a picture stalker. He wants this Colleen Wolf picture, and he's not going to stop. He won't stop and until he gets God, it. thank God he doesn't have her phone number. Right. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I got I don't have a phone number, but I do have a website for you, ChastangFord.com. ChastangFord.com is where you get your car on. It's where I've gotten my last two vehicles on, and I'm going to get my future vehicles on. I love Chastang Ford. I love everything that they represent. I love, you know, when you, 
it it's the kind of business where it's from the, at the top on down and there's a reason for their success. There's a reason that they are where they are as a family, as a business. It's because of the way that it starts from the top on down and everybody in that organization knows what they have to do. They're not pressuring you. They're not adding on. They're not marking up. It just doesn't happen. They've got the vehicles on the lot or you can customize the vehicle exactly how you want it at your price, at what you want in that Ford car or truck or pre-owned vehicle as well. And they're going to get you, they're going to work that deal as hard as they possibly can to get you at your payments or below your payments with the best financing that they can get. I'm telling you, there is no better car buying experience in the city of Houston than Chastain Ford. Businesses will tell you that as well because they're the number one Ford commercial dealer in the city. If you're looking for that vehicle, ChastainFord.com on 610 at Homestead, not Hempstead. Five minutes from downtown Chastain Ford. Welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. couple of notes. Okay, so yesterday the Chevron began. Lauren Coughlin shot six under. Nelly Corda at four under. We got a, a nice tournament, and uh, they're playing. Uh, Nelly's playing this morning. Nelly is so good. She's just so much better. She's won uh, her last four starts. She's just been incredible. So this is going to be fun. Hopefully she can pick up her second major right here. There was a story this morning. Um, so Scotty Scheffler is really, really good right now, right? Scotty Scheffler is just dominating the field. Yep. Scotty Scheffler set the record last year, making $21 million. Do you know what, if Tiger Woods- Making how much? $21 million. That's the record? The record, yeah. Huh. Most prize bet money earned in a season, $21 million last year. Tiger Woods- if he had had his 2000 season last year, his 2000 season was incredible. He had, Tiger Slam. He had nine wins, three majors, 17 top tens. Mm -hmm. You know how much money he would have earned last year? Thirty million. More. Forty. More. Fifty. More. Wow. 
60? More. No way. He would have made $92 million last year. Wow. You want to talk about putting something in perspective. <laughs> and Scotty set the record at 21. If he finished at all of those tournaments that he played in, I've got them all listed mm-hmm. right here, how much he would have won. $92 million last year. So that'll tell you just how good Tiger was at his peak versus Scotty Scheffler at his peak. Scotty said he was a little tired. Did you see he was like he was at the Masters and he was doing his interviews. He's like, man, I just want to get home. I just so much want to just get home. And so, I mean, I really thank you, everybody, and this is great, but all I'm thinking about is really getting home. Do you know what he did when he got home? What? He went to a bar for five hours. Tiger? No, Scheffler. Oh, Scotty Scheffler. Oh, I saw the, you saw I saw the, the picture. Video, yes. He's hanging out at a dive bar <laughs> with everybody. I think they're wearing his master. That's my guy. Yeah. His wife's at home pregnant. Yeah, I saw he that. He couldn't wait to get home. He was going to leave the master. I saw the pictures. It was like, it was like people that you find at a... Little Woodrow's or something, you know, just some random bar. It was or Nick's place. Yes, it actually was more is much, much more like, more like Nick's, Nick's place. place. Yes, it was actually much more like Nick's place. And dude was just there, and he was apparently somebody tweeted out he was there for five hours. Now I can't wait to get home just so I can get to this bar. I can't wait to get home to just leave everybody and go drink with my buddies, my buddies in my neighborhood. That's awesome. That's my hero. See, that's a heroic effort. Wife's at home pregnant. He's at a bar for five hours. That's It doesn't get more heroic than that, okay? So, just so you know. Oh, that's our golf talk today. How great Scotty Scheffler is. And how great Tiger Woods is. Um, So, apparently, Nick also said, which we didn't hear. Nick Casario said, this tremendous offseason that they're having is just a bunch of garbage. Did you hear this quote from him? Yeah, which that was the one that was most shocking to me. It's just, here's, it's, la- it's kind of laughable, he says. We d- haven't done anything. What happened last year has no bearing on this year. Why it's just a bunch so, of garbage. Why was he so cranky yesterday? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I mean see, you want to talk about pissing all over a parade? <laughs> what? Mean, what? 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 What's the big I mean, signing that we got, had? What? Oh, Devin Singletary wasn't a big signing last year. Blake Cashman wasn't big. He's, what does it mean? I don't even know what a big signing is. I don't even know what is. a diva. I don't know what a window. Man, he's he's uh, got a lot of Belichick and, and, and O'Brien in him. <laughs> what do you even mean big signing? What does that even mean? I don't even know what that. Jack, do you know what big What's a window? Do you even know what a window? What is a window? Uh, uh wow it, he is it's just a bunch of garbage you're all a bunch of garbage for saying we're good we had a good off season wow i mean have a just have I some guarantee fun when he's talking to cal he goes hey, where's Cal's, my vest do you think he it's does garbage. this <laughs> it's on you sir <laughs> do no you think, he didn't wear a vest do you think cal, yeah that's true yesterday he did do you think cal um maybe that's why he's do you think cal said that's a sneeze do you think cal you. if he had said that's a really good off season that we had here, Nick. You think Nick said, "What is? I don't even know what that means. A good off season. What is? That's garbage, Cal. No, he'd say we think so too. Yeah, garbage. we're really happy with what happened. Yeah, that's what he'd say in real life. Yeah, but now he's got. He also likes to tamp down those expectations. It's too late. Well, I've already got you in Super Bowl. John's got you in Super well, Bowl. Well, right. Well, remember when we were we were lauding Charlie Casserly and some of his moves? He was like, "Hey, now, see, you got, oh. hey." See, oh, no, everybody's no. going to expect us to win and now, he, see? Hey. He actually told he the media, told yeah. hey, listen, it's not such a great thing. Expectations aren't such a great thing, okay? It's a, it, takes, it takes time, right? You'd much, ra- you'd much rather them want a six-win season, okay? Because you can, you can do that. Well, that's but what if they uh, expect hey. 10, and you give them eight, hey, you're the worst in the world. That's ex- He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Look at where the, the Texans are right now after the unexpected wins last year. I mean, everybody loves them again. Lou Holtz. We're playing, we're taking on Georgia Tech. This is a heck of a football team. Boy, you guys aren't talking nearly enough about how good Georgia Tech is. University of Georgia Tech. University of Navy. It's a very, very, very difficult team to beat. I don't know how we're going to do it. They're sitting there on Wednesday. They can't wait to beat Notre Dame. And we're sitting here overrated, bunch of players who aren't playing to their capabilities. And the media is just telling us we're a a 23-and-a-half point favorite. Outlandish. (laughs) Georgia Tech. That's a great team. Well, Coach. Okay. okay. Are you going to cover or not? Yeah, that's all. That's Just, all we do you, are you going to cover? 
Yeah. Because they're not they anywhere the near as good. Breaks yes. off them 56 to yes, 7. But stop telling us how bad you are. Uh, but that's what they want to do. Yeah. Listen, and Nick is probably getting to that point. Oh, listen, y'all are putting us in the Super Bowl. Slow down. I know exactly what. Okay. I don't feel bad about Astros. Espada wants to keep expectations lower now. <laughs> the best way to do that is start off 6 and 14. Yeah. Because now, and it's just the first, listen, that's the first 20 games. There's still much more baseball to go. We still have, you know, we still have eight times that much baseball to go. So what does that mean? He starts off, you lower the expectations with the 6 and 14, and now he's like, all right, let's start playing for real now. Did you see uh, Jose Altuve passed Chuck Klein and Scott Rowland, two Hall of Famers, and now he's he's, – He's uh, zeroing in on Harmon Killebrew and Gary Carter from for hits. He's got uh, oh two thousand. He's only catching up with Gary Carter. You know, Gary Carter had catcher. a Hall of Fame career, bro. I know, but he's still a catcher. But but he was Altuve's a good hitting catcher. But Altuve's had multiple two hundred hit seasons. It's kind of wild that Jose Altuve. Jose Altuve's got to play a lot more baseball. I'm sorry. Well, but he, he needs to play at least five more years. And this thing, this this uh, this little story says, well, he averaged 146 hits over his last three seasons. He missed. He only played 90 games last you know year. Altuve, he missed 70 games. You know Altuve can't hit. Five years isn't going to get Altuve 3,000 hits, right? Yeah, it he's is. Not a 200, no, he's not a 200-hit season guy anymore. He's, he's just over 2,000. He's over. Yeah, he's got. He'll have twenty one hundred, right? He'll yeah. He'll get. He'll he'll have five more years, and he'll get it by two thousand twenty nine. He'll absolutely. Well, how much has he averaged last three years? Why do you think Jose Altuve? Because gonna get, because he missed seventy games. But why is he going to get healthier? Well, he's not going to miss seventy games. What hurt him was the the pandemic year. Yeah, that too, that too. But no, no, he's on pace to get it at, at, in two thousand twenty nine. Well, he's on pace based on previous seasons. He's based on his how many hits he gets when he's healthy now. Injuries aside. And they're also going to bench him. They're also going to keep him healthy by, like, the most games he'll play is 140, more than likely. I don't know. They don't bench him that much. Well, 22, they don't bench him 22 it's not games. crazy to have 22 games off for Jose Altuve over a 62-game season. It is kind of crazy. I don't I don't believe he'll take 22 games off. Mm. I don't believe Every that. getaway game. Um, no, they don't, play, they don't rest him every getaway game. Um, anyway, he's got, he ranks uh, 251st all time. But he is moving. He's he, yep, he's moving up the ladder quickly now. There are a lot of guys that he is going to be passing the, this season. The last time Jose Altuve played 150 games was 2017. 137, 124, 48, 146. So that was that was pretty good. That's 16 games off. 141. And, of course, last year was 90. And this year is 20. I don't know, John. I mean, it's from 2018 on, even if we eliminate – 20 and you even eliminate this year the numbers tell you he's going to miss some time with an injury the numbers tell you they're going to like the most hits he's had in a season since uh 2018 was 167 in 2021 which is good but if you do the math on 167 it still leaves him a little bit short yeah five years but again he only played what 90 games last year well but 167 he played 146 games so if you if you multiply five times that you're getting. I, I guess you'll be right there, close to three thousand. Yeah. It, but it, that he has to play the most games he's played in several years, uh, and uh, I just don't think that's likely when you've been playing. I think he needs six years to get to three thousand, and that's if he stays relatively, relatively serious injury free. He did have the hand issue. I mean, he's had different stuff pop up, but that's not unusual for older players. Yeah. He can never play for another team. That's. That's no. a lock. You can't play for another team. Well, he won't ever play for another he team. He won't ever play for another he, team. This might not be his last So you contract. believe he gets to 3,000 hits? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Will Drayton come back and create a celebrity duck or a 3,000 hit towel or a mini bat for his. No, Jim Crane will do that. He'll do mini bats? Well, he'll do. Celebrity ducks? Yes. He'll do. He'll pull out all the Drayton stuff? Everything. No, how many, well, he, how deserves, many, he deserves how, everything. How many ring giveaways did Jim Crane have? Jose Altuve. D- a lot of ring giveaways. <laughs> Jose, if you don't have a ring in this city, You're, you don't like the Astros. Because no. it's not hard to get a ring. But, and they're good quality. They're real good quality. Question for you. How, I believe that 100%, and I know this is going to hurt some feelings in the Astros organization if this happens, Jose Altuve should 100% have a statue outside of He absolutely Park. will. 
Minute Maid Park. He absolutely will. Now it's a golden age championships. Are Bagwan Biggio going to get upset? They're Hall of Famers. I'll bet you they would make like well, I'll tell those you be three a Hall guys. Of Famer. They'd make those three guys standing. Well, I know, but they're not going to have Jose Altuve only gets a statue. They already got statues of Big Bag Biggio. Oh, that's right. What are you talking about? That's right. Well, I, well that's right. But I didn't know they had. They have a Biggio statue. Yeah. Oh, I know about the Bagwell statue. That's right. Yeah. I totally forgot about Bags statue. Yeah. Well, then Jose Altuve gets his. And, yeah. Well, does Reggie Jackson have a statue? <laughs> <laughs> he's a Hall of Famer. He is a Hall of Famer. He should have a statue. He's part of with, the fellowship. With the moves he's made. He's part this of the fellowship. This iteration of the of the front office. Reggie Jackson, maybe just sitting behind a computer. Reggie Jackson, you know, it'd be cool. He's not behind Have a you ever computer. Seen those big presidents' heads that are, um, I don't know where they are. They're at some. They're heads of presidents. They're huge, and Mount Rushmore. No, well, oh. here in Houston, somebody makes them. Yeah, I've seen that. And somebody will tell us on on Twitter, they shouldn't make something like that for Olajuwon. Once again, you get people upset, but what a Simone Biles. You, okay, you put him on Mount Rushmore up on a building? Okay, it's time. I didn't think it would happen, but we're under a Mount Rushmore talk of Houston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're doing See, this already three months early. I, well, it's not even it's June, to have a it's not even June yet. What are you Houston? doing? I'm looking at the Jeff Bagwell statue. It's him stretching at first base. Why not the batting stance? That well, that was kind of the well, idea. Well, because Biggio's throwing to him. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, oh, so, I didn't so they even, put him up at the same time? That. Pardon me? They put him up at the same time? Yeah. Oh, okay. Bags and Biz, they got the Biggio's throwing it to him. He's turning the double play. But Altuve's <laughs> statue needs to be bigger. Uh, well, it, do, it needs to be yeah. up. Did yeah. you see the baby Allen Iverson statue they put up? No. Oh, you got to see it. It's it's yeah. They wee. put tiny. It's yeah. wee. It's, oh no. Did you see that though? Yeah, it's at the practice facility. It's it's not great. <laughs> it's not great. He was actually when he unveiled it. He went, no, he is so little. Well, he would have we. He, he would have known it's we by the way. The, I know by, by how big it was. By how the but, drape was. It well, wasn't a very big like black. Is there drape. like a hinge here where it folds up and locks in in place? No, this no, is how big bad. it is. We gotta talk. We gotta break it here. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six is the number you want to get in here. It's basically a holiday show. We ain't got nothing. To, nothing to do here. We got an hour and forty five minutes left of just whatever. Well, we're gonna have a guest today, aren't we? We are gonna have. We're not. We're gonna have. We're gonna have a surprise. Oh, sorry. No, that's on Monday. We'll have a guest. Yeah. Yes. 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 On Monday we'll have a guest. Um, we're gonna have a surprise today, though, Dell. You're gonna be very happy. Food? About it. Hmm. What, what? Is it food? Hmm? That's uh, the only thing that would make hmm? me happy about this show. Hmm? 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 I know Lance feels the same way. Yeah. No. 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 Do you, we got? It's coming, baby. It's coming. Uh, time to talk about HRP. I'm gonna go out there today and eat. As a matter of fact, HRP. Uh, having a little party, and I'm going to go out there. And well, the first time I went out there, it was amazing, amazing their technology. I mean, honestly, they got a second floor that is full of computer. The computer room is like you walk in there and you feel like, man, I, are you sure I'm not getting some kind of a too much electricity around me here? Because it is, it is impressive. They have an impressive, impressive. Uh, facility where and and here's the deal is what they do is they do everything perfectly i mean we get our payroll here and it's perfect every single time and it doesn't matter how difficult it is i've talked about this before that you could have uh whatever it is you've got salaries you've got bonuses you've got hourly you've got commission it doesn't matter how your people get paid it's not a problem Okay, and it, if it's a problem for you, your business is growing, and now all of a sudden your payroll department says we can't keep up with it, or we got to hire more people. Man, you're just wasting money, because HRP is going to do it more economically than you can do it yourself. They just are. It's what they do every single day. They know what they're doing. They'll save you money there. They'll save you money on your taxes. They'll save you money on your affordable. They'll make sure that your Affordable Care Act is perfect. They'll save you money on your other uh, all of your different. Um, uh, benefits packages because they're not in the benefits package business. They're going to find the best one for you. They, you want to save money in your business? There's one place to go, hrp.net, 281-880-6525 or hrp.net.
You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. At the age of 34, <clears throat> in uh, his 14th year, Jose Altuve currently leads the league in doubles, hits, batting average, and total bases. He's pretty good. Oh, he's real good. Jose Altuve is pretty good at baseball. Like I told you, his last 162 games have been amazing. He's been amazing. He is. Uh, he just doesn't get enough love. He's going to catch it there. Everybody's going to boo him. Everybody's going to. I mean, it's just ridiculous. The thought and this. This said whether or not this article that was written writing about you know him passing those Hall of Famers was talking about. Well, we'll see how the media responds to the cheating scandal. They don't care because he's the face of it, and it's just so ridiculous. He's the face of it. It's this so ridiculous that he's the face. You of know, it's interesting when you when you look at Jose Altuve's career, um, and this happens to players sometimes when they, well, they get bigger, they get stronger, but they also change their approach. Jose Altuve has really changed his approach at the plate quite a bit. When you take a look at the slugging percentages and, and the OPS. I mean, right now his on base percentage is four sixty two. It's like I mean, his 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 OPS is eleven thirty seven. But in his first three years, and he got two hundred thirty four plate appearances, you know, in two thousand eleven. OPS six fifty four, seven forty, six seventy eight, eight thirty, eight twelve. I mean, you know, he was not a home run. He was not a home run hitter, but he did hit fifteen, which is which is pretty good. Which is a sign of things to come. Actually, in two thousand fifteen. The 15 year where they made the playoffs. Now Tuve is only 25 years old. Wow, but um, eight, twelve, and then after that in 16, a year that they didn't that they uh, didn't make. No, no, no. Yeah, they didn't make the playoffs in 16. He was third in MVP, 928 OPS. And then the next year in 17, where they won it, 957 OPS. 2018, where they lost in the playoffs uh, to the uh, Boston Red Sox. 837 OPS. It's fine. Not as high as it had been. But after that, 903. Then you had 629 the COVID year. doesn't count. 839. But the last two years, 921, 915. Hmm. You know, you argue that you look at the last two years, and, of course, that gets into the 162 games because he's only played 20 this year, 90 last year, and then 141 the year before. But you look at this going on three-year run, 2022, 2023, 2024. It's some of the most productive baseball he's ever played. Yeah. I mean, it's truly astounding. When you start thinking about Akeem Olajuwon, some of his best basketball was after the age of 30. He was at his – he wasn't as explosive a player, but he was a more efficient and he was a more dominant player when he was in his, you know, early to mid-30s. Yeah. And Jose Altuve seems to be on track to do the same thing. How many times has Jose Altuve finished in the top uh, 10 of MVP voting in his career? Five times? Four. Four. He's finished inside the top five three times. Pretty good. No, real good. Did you see Jeff Bag? Now, this is what Bag should do. And First of all, Bags on the television broadcast is awesome. He's, ph- he's, he's phenomenal. 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 Great sense of humor. Yeah. Very quick. Witted, uh, Te- great te- intel ex- into, explain- into, into baseball. Well. I just don't want him doing personnel. So, That's so. It. He and Abreu spent about an hour yesterday, uh, yesterday, about an hour on together on Monday afternoon. Excuse me, at Minute Maid Park, talking about hitting in the dugout before Bagwell watched Abreu take early batting practice on the field. They talked behind the cage several times with Bag giving him advice along the way. Most of the stuff I do is we just talk. Bagwell said we talk about approach, talk about what's going on in their thought process, what's comfortable, what's uncomfortable, and maybe what I thought about when I was struggling and how. That could relate to anything that those guys do. It's no different than anything I do with the minor league kids. It, it didn't appear to help too much. I mean, it's because Jose Abreu still had the week he had. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe somehow, some way, they can unlock something. If not, is there? I mean, and we everybody just cut him. Just I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people just say, "Just cut him. Just let him go. Just let him go." You're letting go of forty million dollars, and I don't know that that's going to happen. At worst, you put him on the bench, and you have him pinch hit. I guess I do. I I don't know who he could pinch hit for, 
What what situ what possible situation would you want Jose Abreu at the plate for right now? <laughs> other than any other hitter on the team, I like that Bagwell is doing that though. I think I think it tells you one of two things. A, it may tell you that Bagwell knows he's inextricably linked to Jose Abreu, and he's it's on his bill. Yeah, it's on his tab. The other thing could be just be that you know, and it could be actually both of them. That Jeff just wants to try to help this guy. And remember, he was a batting coach for about half a year one time for the Astros many years ago. Yeah. And I don't think he liked the coaching lifestyle. But um, I think that's great that he's out there sharing his knowledge with Abreu. Abreu physically may not be able to do well, it. Well, that's, so the that's the issue is, is it mental? Is it that Abreu is not seeing the ball well? Is it is it that Abreu is guessing wrong? Is he... Uh, or is it physical that his bat speed is so slow that he can't get around anymore? Yeah, when it's that, you're you're done. You're done. And it eventually will get there for him. And if it's that, he's he's cooked. But that can also play into your mental. It, it, it can end up bat. playing into both. How about a lighter bat? Why don't you try something? <laughs> I mean, I mean I'm how about some that? classes? Somebody suggested, I don't think he's seeing the ball. Because he the swings that he takes oh, on God. some pitches. Can you imagine if he gets up with glasses on? And a lighter bat that's choked up on, yeah. And he's just like trying to trying well, to just slap it. Well, how about if he starts driving the ball that way? Well, I'd like that. Uh huh. I mean, anything. What? Do something. Put some glasses on him, even if they're just clear glasses, just to show everybody. Hey, we're trying something different. Yeah. The gl have it, glasses is the most basic thing you can do. To, you want to talk about a panic move? Vash was like, oh, how about Jose, if you wore glasses and got a hit, even if there are no lenses. That's it, what I'm saying. Just no glass. lenses in it. Like, everyone would be like, this is it. That's <laughs> what it, it was. It was the glasses. <laughs> he couldn't no see. Len or he's got lenses, but it's a no, you know, it's a it's a no prescription lens. Or what if he just wore sunglasses? Just anything. Just make it more interesting. If you're going to get out. You know what? I'll just be, I'll ju I'll be honest. If a Braves getting out anyway, do fun stuff at the plate. Do you think maybe buttoning your shirt might help? To the top? Uh, to the top, all the way. Collar done? Like, everything's all buttoned? Everything. Buttoned up. I'm buttoning it up now, okay? This is the new. Kyle Tucker went gloves, no gloves. Uh, hand, put the hands on the dirt, no hands on the dirt. Wiping your face with your sleeve. All those things. And he changed it up, and guess what? Well, look where he was last year. Let's go, Abreu. Button it all the way up. Untie your beard. Uh, untie wear your a pair beard. Of, yeah, he's got that little thing, that little knot he's on his beard. He's not going to untie his beard. Though. He got. He wears some glasses. I mean, untying the beard is going to. It's going to be all over the place. It's going to look nasty. The way you, know, you guys are thinking of up, thinking up all these things. The only thing he needs is one thing to change: a time machine. Go that, back five years. Five years and be a break. That'll yeah, break see, unfortunately, we can't do time machine. Well, we don't have that. Uh, then I think buttoning up, unbutton, gloves, no gloves, choking up, forget about it. Uh, well, uh, The word you should think be thinking about is cooked. <laughs> cooked? That's terrible. I don't want to think about That's cooked. Abreu is cooked. Yeah, no, you're a bad person. I'm not, We're I'm trying not a bad to help person. a man out, and you're telling him, you just need a time machine. Well, that's a simple he solution. He might need a time machine. He though. might, though. He might. And if he needs a time machine, then we need to beat him. We need to historically beat him to that time machine and go back and not sign him to a contract. If we can get a time machine, let's just do that. Let's just, and we could win. That's a win. That's a big win. Uh, time for me to talk about Doc Linville right now. And if you're, listen, you don't have a time machine to go back when you had hair. You don't. What you need now is Doc with Neil Grafting. That's the way you get your hair back. But listen, you, you don't have to. It's, you don't have to be, it's not as bad as Jose Abreu, okay? You can't get your hair back, okay? You, you don't need a time machine. You got Doc Linville, Neo Grafting, moving the side of your hair, the hair on the side of your head to the top of your head. It's wonderful. You will love it. You will love the results. He's getting fantastic results. Those hairs from the side don't ever fall out. That's all you, do you ever notice somebody, have you ever seen somebody with no side hair? No. You know why? Because the side hair always, always, Tim always. Tim Legler. Grows. There, boom. Got no, you. he shaves it every day. He, he, okay? But he has to shave it every day because that hair ain't going away. You don't lose the hair on the side of your head. Here's the deal. You put it on the top of your head, and you don't lose it there either. So if you're looking for a great way to get hair again or just stimulate, stimulate the growth of your own hair, 
975hair.com. It's the best process. It's easy. Doc is going to take care of you. Stop already with the bald head. 975hair.com. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. <laughs> You're a bad person. Um, we didn't even mention John T. Porter yesterday. Mm. D- done. NBA said you can't play anymore. Banned from the league forever. But they didn't. But did they ever say, I saw the, they said he's banned from the league, but did they say for life? Yeah, for life. Was it was it in a release? I think it is. Because I, I didn't see it. I didn't see it in a no, release. Every, I thought when every I read it. story said. Well, we all for know life. he's banned for life because you have to make that statement against a guy who doesn't really do anything. Well, like, I'll bet he's you the perfect ban, example for everybody. Though I bet you wouldn't ban LeBron for life. Uh, okay. Well, would, if you ban him for a year, it's probably for would life. Would Jeff or Green two get years. banned for life? I say yes. Yes. Would Jock Londale get banned for yes. life? Yes. Would Jalen Green? Yes. He absolutely would. Would Alpi? Yes. You can't to. ban a Turkish guy for life. Well, that's that's not going back to the you Turkey seen thing. You've seen his fans are going to be pissed. Oh, no, I don't, well, guess what? Then don't bet on your, don't I bet think against sir, yourself. I think he'd be banned for a year. For those you know, Jante Porter bet against himself on DraftKings certain 
certain different like number of points Fandle, he was going to score, rebounds yeah. he was going to score, and it took himself out of a game. He, <laughs> so he, well, he he parlayed. He bet a parlay. Parlay. A six leg. It wasn't even a yeah. It wasn't even daily fantasy. It was a six team parlay, six proposition bet parlay, and he hit them all. Yeah, because he took himself out of the game and he won six figures. Yeah, because he basically. I, I, I assume he faked an eye injury and another injury so he wouldn't play much, so he would go under on all of his. He bet himself under. He literally threw, he shaved points against himself. That is the very definition of impact in a game and shaving yeah. points. He must be banned for life in that instance because you cannot. There's been so many things with gambling popping up now. Yeah. You cannot allow. That statement needs to ring loud and clear across football, baseball, college basketball, college football. I think what they're basically doing, and now college athletics is talking about doing away, making illegal gambling on college sports. Have you seen that? No. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're taking. They're talking about. Good luck. With I don't that. know if they'll be able to do it, but they're talking about getting rid of it on the major platforms, and that's a. Most people now, they say that there's a belief that there's about sixty five percent of the people now to seventy percent gamble on legalized platforms, um, because that's easy to find, and. If they take away college athletics, that would not going to be great for my DraftKings stock. I can promise you that. Mm. Ever since that came out, my stock has gone down. Yeah. Several points. Oh, yeah. Well, the NBA cares about their integrity. Apparently, the NFL does not. Okay. We ban people for years. The NFL is reinstating five players who were suspended indefinitely last year for violating the gambling policy. Uh, Lions wide receiver Quintez Cephas. C.J. Moore, Demetrius Taylor, Shaka Tony, and Rashad Berry. They're all... All reinstated. All Detroit. But you know what? None of them bet football, and they all bet from the facility, and they've actually changed it now. This is a little weird to me. Okay, you can bet on sports. From the facility. But now. just not from the facility. Well, right. Like, the, but the league is trying to get it so that you can bet from the facility, too. The players are. The players are like, hey, why we got to wait to go home? Guys, they wanna... Can't y'all just follow the rules on this <laughs> I know. one? I know, and you're 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 kind of dumb. They can tell where you are gambling from. <clears throat> well, that's a tough thing. Is when you say you can't you can't use weed, but weed's legal in this state. How you how do you argue with that? You can't you can't gamble, but gambling's legal in this state. Obviously, not on your own sport, but you now have you now have state law versus NFL rules. That's Yep. You know, if the NFL gets too strong on that, there could be a clash, legal clash on that. Well, and they'll probably lose that. Yeah, they'll probably lose it. But betting on your now, sport, sport, I don't think. You can't, you they, can't, they wouldn't you know. lose that. But I'd also argue, to be honest with you, you don't think there are football players who are friends with basketball players? Come on. Yep. Basketball players, friends with football players? Of course there are. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And you're getting inside information. Absolutely. Um, Zay Flowers has been um, exonerated. And the NFL says he can play football. He had a domestic violence charge, which there the league says they concluded there was no support uh, for the finding. So Zay Flowers has been is going to be uh, playing. Your Houston Texans, your general manager met the media uh, yesterday and had a lot, a lot of things to say. He was not too. He was kind of. He was a little pissy. Okay, we'll put just put it that way. He doesn't like certain questions. He doesn't know the meaning of a lot of words. He a lot of times he says, "I don't know what that means." So that's that is a problem that our general manager has such a limited vocabulary. Or English is is his second language. Is his second? It could be his second language. I can't fault a man for being so fluent in English but not getting every word right. He's right. trying. He's trying. You can tell he's trying. I would think as smart as he is, he's had a bigger vocabulary. But he doesn't know what big names mean. He doesn't or, know what diva window. means. He doesn't know what window means. He knows what it means, guys. He doesn't know what it means. He, I'm not going to call him a liar like you are. He told us he yeah, didn't know he what said, it means. I don't know what that means. He said that several times now. And then we had a leak of the of the uh, logo of the uniforms. As somebody in a in a warehouse b- broke open the Texans' uh the Riddell packages and took out a helmet and showed everybody what the helmet looked like, which I don't know that that's the best thing for the organization. Do you believe that it's Joan, the uh, the teacher? Do you believe that? Joan, who is the show's official teacher. Yeah. 
Um, and mom, I think that's fair to say. Yep. She's show mom. She believes it's all set up, a PR set up. Like, this is a whole, they leaked that. Then Cal does the thing. She think. I mean, they did have the barbecue pit there already set up. It's you almost don't know like that they already had. Doesn't have that set up all the time. You don't know that. No, no, no. But I mean, they had the chains ordered, and it could have been a picture they've already taken a stock photo. Because you are right. Well, unless it they've was got a big unless event they leak on it, Tuesday. but maybe they leak some stuff just to pump up the event on Tuesday. But I've already seen it. Why do I have to? You go saw on everything. Tuesday? No. Okay, that's the point. Yeah, I know. We here's in- what we have a listener. Our guy, our guy Tony, also known as Concept Mayhem. You know he is a professional graphic artist, right? Yes. He does all those really billboards good. you see around town with John Daspit. That's his work. He's done he's some really, really good. yeah. He's really really good. Here's what he said about the. Um, he said, as a design professional, that new Texans helmet, and he did a poo emoji, and then he had Randy Jackson saying, "Yeah, that's going to be a no from me, dog." And then another guy says, another guy comes in here. Daniel says, after seeing the helmet and the alleged jersey set. It looks like they just took every suggestion from fans who don't understand aesthetics and just mashed it together. Ended up with a Broncos kick uh, knockoff set. The uniform's equivalent of Will Ferrell making the candy pancakes on Elf. Tony then goes on to see, he answers that guy and says, perfect analogy. Designed by committee is a recipe for meh. Underwhelming, bland, unmemorable, but at least the dumbs feel included. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and so... He also says, no, I'm not going to tell you what he said about Nick Casario. I actually can't say that. One. I got I got real NFL Europe vibes from that helmet. I don't know how the rest of the uniform will come together. I think the Lions have but, a fire ass uniform. Uh, I, I think the Lions did. The Lions went. Did you see the Lions blue? Well, they had. Well, that's that's their. Uh, they had a whole uniform duo uh, makeover. But yes, they have a specific one that stands out. When I look at the Texans, I feel like you could be playing the rain fire on Saturday. Or the Barcelona Dragons, whatever those names See, are. This isn't the. We're on a roll, and now all of a sudden, that does. And I thought the unis were going to be. They had some m- mock-ups that looked awesome, awesome, awesome of Texans uniforms. I love the horns. I love the red, the re- the blue horns on the red helmet and the red uniforms are awesome. And then we're going to get this. Yeah, look uh, at these Lions helmets. That's tough. And that'll go. The Lions had a, a that release. Blue, that is blue cool. helmets, all black uniform. Why are the Lions cool and we're not? Well, because look at this. Look how tough I don't that know. uniform is. That is cool. But their overall basic, oh. the blue and the white that that we'll see most of the time, it's more like the Barry Sanders uniforms. Um, as far as the uniform itself, I think they have a blue face mask now. Um, but yeah, I'm looking. The Texans look like they're playing the London Monarchs. Although I will say, this is also kind of Carolina Panther vibes. It does look like the Panthers. For Detroit Lions. It does look like the Panthers. Yeah. We're not so playing, so they suck now. World League of America. That wasn't even NFL it, Europe. They start off as World I League know, of, but, of American but Football. The more recent incarnation. Rain Fire, Frankfurt Galaxy. Yeah, Frankfurt Galaxy. London Monarchs. You're Scottish, mentioning all the. Scottish Claymores. What Claymore. Are they called? Claymore. <laughs> that's, what, that's what that helmet looks like. Uh, My dad went and coached that, in that league. That's not what we're looking for. Cal's got the H up, and he's cool with the dog and Sorry. the chain. And we're going to say the London Monarchs? Come yeah, on, John. come on, Dell. Get Look, on board. Go pull up the NFL Europe helmets and tell me I'm wrong. Look how sad Dell is because his uniforms are the same garbage-ass, same you uniforms. You always come he's and attack had. me. Dan yeah. Marino wore your uniform. It's probably t- the same exact jersey. They just took the name off. Yeah. yeah. You've had the same Garbage. Uniform. Why are you always forever. attacking me when I have a because when I have I know ideas? your stuff is personal against the city of Houston <laughs> no since you're bi coastal. No, it isn't. You're totally bi. And mm. because mm. of that, bi. you're like you want it to be either West Coast or East Coast. And so you've got it has to look like about, the Lakers about Gulf or it has Coast. to look like the Dolphins. The I don't third coast. I don't root for the Lakers. You're, yeah. third. you're conflating me with RJ because you think oh, all black right. producers yeah. are the same. Well that's right. that was yeah. RJ. Uh <laughs> Time to talk about GiveMeTheMin.com, John Clay Wolf. Okay, so there's a little war going on on Twitter with John, John Clay Wolf. Like somebody, uh, I forget who it is. I don't, I don't really care. He said, oh, I got, I got more from Carmack. No, no, you didn't because you never sent back the offer from Carmax. He got, well, I got $1,000 more from Carmax. Well, you never sent back the offer. John Clay Wolf will beat any offer out there. He will beat it, and if he doesn't beat it, he'll send you $1,000. But you got to give him a chance to match it. You didn't. Boom. You lose. 
So here's the deal. Make John, John Clay Wolf. You know what? John Clay Wolf's going to jack up that price for you. It's what he does on all of the vehicles. He is going to jack it up so that you win, friends. You are going to win because John Clay Wolf is going to jack up the price of your car and give you more for it. It's what he does every single day. And he's even on here, you know, arguing about this with this this guy. And this guy's like, you got to give him a chance to match the offer. Okay, stop already. If John Clay Wolf says he's going to beat the price, he's going to beat the price. And he does it all the time. John Clay Wolf gives you more for your vehicle, period. Period, period. You're going to hear him tomorrow on the show. And it's it's a funny show. It's a really good show. It's the longest running show on ESPN 97.5. And you're going to hear him buying cars. Boom, 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 boom. And if you know what, you can handle back and forth. That's what that's what it's about. You know what? Go get an offer from somebody else and send it to him. And if, you, if he can't beat it, he's going to send you $100. But you got to give him a chance to match it all at GiveMeTheVin.com. That's GiveMeTheVin.com. You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. All right. 848 ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. 713-780-3776. The number to hang out with us here on the show. 713-780-3776. Mike Lombardi ripped the... Mike Lombardi ripped the Falcons organization over that story yesterday. Well, uh, he, you know, now he's a big Belichick guy. He and Belichick yeah, are friends. He he worked for Belichick, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So more than once. You have, I mean, he just ripped into the Falcons organization about Arthur Blank and he his was ownership with Bill and, and everything. Cleveland else. With the Browns too, yeah. and and uh, Patriots. He, but listen, he's not what the he's not what the Falcons needed. I, I mean, you it's a short term. Let's let's face it. Belichick is just going for this record, right? I mean, I, he he does have something to prove because without Tom Brady, um, he has not been the same guy. He hasn't been all that good. He still has something to prove. What what he has to prove is that he can win without Tom Brady, and he wants to get the all time record, right? Yeah. But to to the uh, do the Falcons have to be the team? He's better. I'm I'm telling you. I think after this year. When the Cowboys don't win it, it's going to be Belichick. Belichick's going to come in there. Belichick is going to 
he can't. First of all, he can't mess up the roster because it's pretty well set. It's not like they got a bunch of money and 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 oh by the way, it, it, they tell him right now. Stephen Jones handles the draft. Bill, you're not handling the draft. We are. There's no, re- but Bill might say no. Well then, no. Then you're not coming in. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think you want to win because you win games with the Cowboys. I definitely think there's a chance that Bill Belichick never coaches again because you have to be a team that is okay with basically hiring an interim coach. And I just don't know how an interim coach who is used to having literally all the power since he's been in pro football, every head, whether it was Cleveland, whether it is the Patriots, he always has control. And I don't think he's going to be okay with having Stephen Jones and Stephen Jones would not, they would work in collaboration with Belichick. I think the reality is Belichick would get all the guys he wants. Um, and he'd make make those guys feel like they had a say so, but the reality is it would be Bill Belichick's players. Um I don't know. I just if you're an owner, John, are you okay with somebody just being just coaching two to three years? No. No. I'm not either. That's why I'm not sure any owner is gonna hire him. I don't know. Somebody who's close like the Cowboys are. Somebody who's close. Do you think they've done it before you over with hump? Barry he did it before. Um, well, but Sanders, I mean, Switzer was not supposed to be a short-term deal. Well, yeah, because he was goofy. He was a short-term deal. Yeah. yeah. And no one is high. I don't remember anyone hiring a coach, well, other than the Texans, Lovey Smith. Yeah. The Texans what do you mean model, they did it twice in a row? I know, but we were terrible. We're not close. With Cully and Lovey. Yeah, we weren't close, though. Any, I just, I don't know. This is not really a oh, thing I don't that we know. ever see. Uh, Dick Vermeil was uh, the, that was the, they, they wanted to go over the top, so they hired Dick Vermeil to come in and do that and and get it and do it. Uh, are you, this it's not unprecedented but, to get a, a hire an older coach. Marv Levy got it's, it's, rehired. It's pretty, it's pretty unprecedented now. Well, yeah, you're talking way. Marv Levy's a long time ago. Dick Vermeil's over 25 years ago when he was hired by the Rams. It's it's pretty rare now. Everyone goes, as a matter of fact, if you're 50, you're ancient with any NFL coaching searches now. Pete have you, Carroll, did you see the, did you see the Pete coaching? Pete Carroll, how old was he when they hired him? They finally got rid of him. Yeah. Well, but, but they won a Super Bowl with him. But they, they, they all did this before 2010. I mean, it's not this way anymore. Uh, if you look at the head coaches, did you ever look at the coaching, you know, the owners meetings where all the coaches get together? The team picture, it's like, man, everyone's in shape and young. Yeah. It's wild to look at. Just think about this. Matt Eberflus, I don't know. Flus is probably near 50. Uh, Detroit Dan Campbell, he's probably around there, too, in great shape. But, yeah, he's probably around there. Green Bay, we know, is um, – Well, Rivera, Andy Reid. I mean, we, we got some old coaches. Pete Carroll just was was, was released. I mean, we, had, we got old coaches in the league. Rivera's gone. I know, but – he was there for how many years? And they hired a young guy. But but but, but my point is, hey, my not, point is, there's old coaches still in the they're league. They're not hiring seventy year olds. Well, seventy year olds aren't getting that's hired a, but, anymore. But there's no Belichick that's ever been out there before. It, it's he, not, that's never happened. Before. But he couldn't even get a sniff this year. Yeah, there was multiple jobs open, and he couldn't get a sniff. I mean, the jobs that he could take over conceivably would be. But what was the what best job available? Um, Again, if you if you're a good team looking to get over the top, uh, Seattle, there was none of that. There was okay, none of that. Here are teams that would fit that mold: Buffalo Bills. Right now, there's one. They would fit a mold. Um, another one would be Dallas. Dallas, Ca- Cowboys. Dallas Cowboys would fit that mold. Another one would be Cleveland Browns. If Stefanski gets in trouble this year, I mean he was coach of the They're year. Pretty good. Pretty good. Lo- they got a pretty good roster. Got a pretty good roster. I don't know if Cleveland would get rid of Stefanski. Steelers with Tomlin, nah. they end up winning ten no, games. No, they get they're going to get a guy that's going to be there for forty Indianapolis, years. Indianapolis, Tennessee, not for three. Kansas City, Las Vegas, Denver. They wouldn't get rid of Peyton. Chargers, brand new coach. Cowboys, they wouldn't get rid. of Eagles, well, Eagles, they weren't happy. No, they weren't happy with Sirianni. They weren't happy. Um, Giants, that uh, yep. Mara, I mean, if you're going to, more than likely, it's going to be old owner would have to be. Old, would have to be old school owner, and Mara might fit that mark more than anybody. And Bill, he, Bill Belichick won there, won big there. Uh huh. I mean, Mara. To be honest with you, the New York Giants are yeah. probably the best fit because they have an owner who probably cares a lot less about age than some of the other. I mean, you care about age because you want a guy that can be your next Mike Tomlin and be there forever. That's 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 what it's the Tomlin effect. It's the Harbaugh effect. It's you know, the John Harbaugh effect. It's wanting a guy that you can grow old with who is going to be consistent. And 
And this is just a rare instance. Obviously, the Astros had to do what they had to do with Dusty Baker, which is it wasn't to get over the top. It was a highly unusual set of circumstances. Now, you know who did that? Chicago Cubs with Joe Madden. Yep. The Cubs went older in Joe Madden. Maybe he just looks and older. And won. I don't know how old he was there. And won. But the NFL has really gone young. I mean, really, yeah, really but there, young. Again, again, there's never been a Belichick. And they're off the – You know, the, off the last the, time there was a, was Vince Lombardi, and he went to the Washington he's not an Redskins. offensive coach either. No. They've gone young, an offensive coach, and somebody who's good with quarterbacks. Bill Belichick is going to make sure that he has a great offensive coordinator. Always does. Except Matt. Except that, where he put a defensive coordinator I mean, that's in the charge. the thing is, I don't know if you trust him as an offensive coach. I know, right? I know. Well, not offense coach, a do head you, coach in charge of making sure his offense is good. Do you believe, do you believe now, do you believe that uh, Joe Shine, there's stuff out there all the time that's not true? I don't think anybody is ready to move right now. I know people are listening. We'll all do that. I think those exploratory talks will happen here shortly. They've already happened. Um, do you think he says, I still, I still am confident in Daniel. So here's what he Daniel said. Daniel Jones, the way he, he's wired, what he showed in 2022. He laid out his whole, he laid out his whole quarterback roster and they could go to war with the same guys and you can't give up, you can't give up leverage. So if you want to trade, you have to be willing to say, no, we're fine with these guys because he's going to call Elliot Wolf and he's probably already talked to Elliot Wolf and Elliot Wolf has to say, Hey, we're open for business to make sure that Joe Shine knows anybody who calls. We may, but we may sit here and draft. But you cannot give up what you may do. Nick Casario said we may move up. You know how we do with our picks. You got to keep everyone guessing at what you're doing. And Joe Shine has to say we're okay with our quarterback because if he doesn't, then no. all the fans are going to lose their mind yeah. when when Elliot tries to just sexually assault him with his offer. Like, all right, we want to flip, but we want next year's first and a third this year. You think that was he have to be sexually assaulted? What tries to brutalize him? Maybe that's a yeah. That's probably yeah. Bad. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're right. That was a bad. My bad. I shouldn't have said that. That's two this week. Brutalize. I mean, I don't have to dump that one, but I had to dump another one. But what are we doing in there? No, okay, him. brutalize. Yeah, for him. That's no, what I'm it's saying. him. He, what what do brutalize he the things that he says. Brutalize below do the you waist. Think- well, why does it have to be below the waist? <laughs> yeah, why? Oh. Just making it specific. Maybe a Dan Campbell thing, kneecap, take out his kneecap. Yeah. yeah, but that's what Dan Campbell said doesn't compare to what he no, just said. No, he's but if Joe bad. Shine, if Joe Shine thinks, I look, mean, Monty Austinfort got a good deal with the Houston Texans last year because he knew they had to come up. They didn't have what, any leverage. And what did he do to the Texans? What, yeah, did, He did good things for himself. Did he assault them in a bad place? What he, is wrong with you? He leveraged them. <laughs> what is, he leveraged them. <laughs> What is wrong with Leveraged, you? you can be leveraged and still do a deal. What what Elliot Wolf could do is try to brutalize Joe Shane if he thinks only Joe Shane is 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 coming up. If if Joe Shane, if he thinks he's desperate. So Elliot needs to make sure that Joe Shane knows and mm. and Minnesota knows that they are open for business for everyone. Nah, yeah, now they to, may still pick the pick. You're trying to clean it up, but you owe us all an apology. And I want it. You kind of do. No, you kind of do. Look. I said what I said. I heard what you said. And we know what you said. I mean, and I'd like to this, apologize in this and say in this economy, egregious. you're going to be saying something I'd like, like to say brutalized. Yeah, say brutalized. From brutalized. Now on. brutalized, and not yeah. bu- not below in yeah, any area. You know, you Just say brutalized. In there. Brutalized from between the knees and the armpits, you, where the strike zone is. Okay. <laughs> brutalize his strike zone mm-hmm. as an organization and. So I just feel Sign like Angel Hernandez. I just feel like, yeah, except for Angel, I just feel like uh, Joe has to say that. You know, I still think the most interesting thing would be if the Patriots traded for Daniel Jones. If they swap picks oh. and the Patriots Ugh. got Who Daniel, do oh, well, hold on, <laughs> wow. hold on. I mean, you take on wow. Daniel Jones, but obviously you also get uh, their first round pick next year. Um, or or you get their first next year and they get your third this year, something like that. Daniel Jones. But it gives you a quarterback now. Who wants that quarterback? Well, you think the Patriots after suffering through Mac Jones want another Jones? Daniel, that's true. From Mac Daniel, to Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones got hurt last Bailey year. Zappi, Daniel, Jones had a, Jones. Daniel Jones had a good year the year before. Yeah. And Gerard Mayo is known as a great offensive. No, he's Coach. not. Oh, yeah, no, that's he's not. Right. He's so you want, the, you want them to go from Bailey Zappi and Mac Jones to Daniel, Daniel Jones? Jones? I'm I don't fine know. with that. I hate that. I think too many. Wow. Way too many Joneses. Yeah. I think it'd be fun. Okay, I'm not keeping up with the Joneses. It gives you a chance to it's, 
to, to it gives you a chance to have your quarterback this year while you look for it next year. Well, basically, it, they, they, they won't a have a quarterback right. this year. I'm going to give you a chance right now to get John. out of that dip, that grossness where you're dipping right now. You're putting in that. I don't know, skull or whatever it is that you dip, and you put it, and there's stuff falling, falling all over your shirt, and you dip, and you spit in a cup, and that or gross, and you're gross, and everybody thinks you're gross. I want one woman to tell you how much she really appreciates that dip you got in. One, ever. One woman who's ever said that, ever. Never happened. Never happened, unless she's dipping herself and spitting on the floor. Okay? It's gross. Nobody likes it. Nobody. Your friends only. Nobody likes it. Your wife, your your girlfriend, nobody. Nobody likes it. So get out of it. Stop it already. It's dangerous. You're, you're hurting yourself. Tobacco, nicotine, not good for your jaw. Not good for you between your cheek and gum. It's just not. How about this? Hemp in a pouch made of hemp with the same flavor that you like, the citrus or the wintergreen or the tobacco flavor even. They make that. Whatever it is flavor that you like, Whatever it is, I mean, that dip, you could put one or two in there, you know, to make it just that much more intense to stop you from dipping. Hemp in a pouch made of hemp with CBD oil. CBD American Shaman is carrying them because they, they love what, what it's doing. You're not going to spit anymore. You're going to swallow because you got that dip in there that's not tobacco. It is it, hemp in a pouch made of hemp with CBD oil. It is Canstead and Dew Blend 975 dip. Dot com. That's 975dip.com. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. All right, welcome back here on ESPN 97.5. This doesn't usually happen, but it happened to Araldus Chapman. Did you see this? Araldus Chapman has been suspended for a couple of games. He didn't like the strike zone, and he was telling Edwin Moscoso that, and he got kicked out of the game. And then he was suspended by the league. Do you think it's that or the way he fondles his mom? mom? (laughs) Couldn't have helped. Which is worse, arguing with an umpire? (laughs) I think the way he behaves with his mom in pictures is worse for me. But he must have really said something bad to the umpire. For those of you who don't know, there are 
through pictures and videos. Not that hard to find. Of Araldus Chapman groping his mother's breast. Mm-hmm. He's a grown man. As a grown person. As, yes, now. He put it summer, out there on purpose. This off season, He needs to stop doing that, I think. I don't know. Maybe that's why he, he's suspended. I think it's because he probably said something maybe about you're cheating or are they paying you. They're not going to put up with that stuff anymore. It's I've noticed that's gotten pretty serious from sports leagues. Don't want to hear about, you know, claiming that somebody is being paid, a referee or an official is being paid. Who was it? That did the money sign and got suspended in basketball or, or got fined? It was a fine. It was Rudy Gobert took on a big oh, fine. Oh, yeah, because, because yeah. It, was to, it was toward the referees that he was uh, he was saying that they were taking money. That's that's ugly. That You can't you can't do that stuff. You can't do that towards the referees. Um, why are you sending us a Michael Douglas when you say brutalize the strike zone? Okay, stop it. Don't 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 do that. Michael Douglas <laughs> has his issues. Um someone three seven eight oh three seven seven six. Look at this. MS thirteen underneath the Texans. Who did Helm that? H Who did the that? Texans. There's no MS thirteen on there. What are you doing? Because it's old English. Yeah. No. I, oh, I guess. I guess that's MSL MS thirteen. No, it's not. It's the Texans. I'm telling you, this is not being well received the Texans new helmets. The the roughnecks is greater than the Texans new helmet. I don't know. I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that. Uh seven one three seven eight oh three seven seven six is the number if you'd like to get in here. I guess she might be by the front by the front desk Dell. Um she she may be in, uh, over there. Um Paige Spiranek? Justin Brown surprise Paige Spiranek? It's not Paige Spiranek. Okay. No. It's someone you know. You've, she's been in here before, okay. and she's bringing us food. Okay. Yeah. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six is our. What do you phone expect? Of, what do you expect of uh, of Verlander tonight? Um, I'm expecting him to go honestly. Five innings, probably five hits, two runs. Eighty walk and maybe eighty three pitches. Five strikeouts. Yeah, eighty five pitches, maybe eighty eight pitches. Hmm. Yes. So I think so. Yeah. And so it'll be it'll be awfully nice if he. Oh, Kate's here. Kate McLean has come up from Tony's. All right. And brought Dell wow. s- chicken sandwiches. Okay. Nice. Dell is. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. This is for him. We'll be there in a minute. Kate McLean from Tony's. Tony's. Nice. She. They got a new chicken sandwich. Their burger is. I always off love when chefs come. The charts. Wagyu. I always love when chefs come. It's it's incredible. Wagyu burger. Yeah. She like does it. unbelievable work. Like it. And now she's got a new chicken sandwich that she brought in for us here. And we will be uh, talking to her. She's a big, big sports fan. As a she's got her song. Stroud jersey on right now. She's wearing she Stroud. Got her, yeah, her C.J. Stroud. Yeah. She's, she's C.J. C.J. Stroud in it. Um, I, I expect Verlin. I, I think I along the same way. If yeah. he, I don't. I, I don't think know. he'll be solid. I don't, I, I don't think he's going to get rocked by, by the command, not the commanders, the um, guardians. I think he'll be or solid. The, or the Nationals. I mean, the Nationals. Yeah. Guardians, Cleveland right. Guardians. Right. Um, I think he'll be – all the Washington teams have had to change their names. Cleveland's having to change their names. So, right. Well, Nationals is not. But your Guardians, you know, you can't do – did you see the Native Americans are suing Washington for getting rid of the Redskins' name? What? Yeah. I love that. Because they want they – want to. They argue that that was something that was that they had pride in, and I haven't seen the whole, haven't read through the whole lawsuit. But anyway, getting back to Verlander, um, I think he's going to be solid. I don't think he's going to be spectacular. Nothing would tell you he's going to be spectacular, and he really hasn't, really hasn't gotten in pitching shape yet. No, well, we'll find out whether or not he's. We now, really let's, can't. Let's not forget he's got to get innings in if he wants his contract to vest. So he may even be pushing and this. Think thing. about one forty. He needs 140. Yeah. So he may be pushing this thing to say, hey, I need to get out there. Let's go. Um, but fact of the matter is they need him. They need to push everybody back. Right now, if Verlander is here, who are you taking out of the rotation if you want to stay with a five-man? Mm, Hunter Brown. Yeah, I agree. I don't think there's any question. He's no question gonna, about he's it. He's got to go. Got to go. They're going to stay with the six-man rotation for now, it looks what's like. The, what's the reason for that? Um, be, well, they got a lot of days off. Yeah, here's they're I don't, going I don't Verlander, know why Blanco, Javier. Then it's Brown, 
France and Verlander again. So no, that's only four. Wait, who are we missing? Who are we? Who? Oh no, that's right, because Eric had to come into the yeah, Eric because was, Fromber's gone. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he took Fromber's place. Right. Well, so Eric out. So that's a five man rotation. <laughs> that's still a five man rotation, and they got a lot of days off. They got um, they took yesterday off. They've got Monday off. They've got next Friday off. They've got the following Monday off. So they've got a lot where they only need a five man rotation. It would be great if Hunter Brown didn't have to take a go to a four man. If you want to know the truth, that wouldn't be so bad if you mm-hmm. yeah, to to get him into the uh, into the bullpen and ease that up. Here's the problem with Verlander starting tonight is that he's probably not going to pitch a lot of innings, and you're going to have to go back to your bullpen. The nice thing is that you have a lot of days off, so you can use your pen well. You've only got three games before you've got another day off. You got Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then you got another day off. So your bullpen should be able to go. Unfortunately. There's been nothing good about your bullpen. There's really been nothing good that you want your bullpen out there. Nope. So hopefully Justin Verlander turns this thing around starting tonight with the Washington Nationals. All right, we're going to break it here. Uh, 713-780-3776 if you want to get in here and hang out with us. You, my friend, need to talk about Texas Grill Star. Texas Grill Star, Star Texas Star Grill, yeah, is um, a company that I've spoken for for years. It's a lifestyle. It's not even a company. I mean, Texas Grill Shop has um, exploded over the last decade, decade and a half, and it's been incredible to see. I got my first Traeger grill um, from Rick Martin and and the guys over at Texas Star Grill Shop when they were just first starting out. It changed everything for me. I didn't even know how to grill, and it made it so simple, and I I learned along the way a lot of things from Rick and Michael over at Pete's Fine Meats, and and I've got to tell you something. Their expansion – has been incredible. All the different shows they've opened up, the showrooms they've opened up, but they now have what's called the club, and it's been very important for him to have the best prices. They have what's called the club, and in this club, you get all kinds of discounts. You get all kinds of heads up on special pricing. You get your allowed special pricing. You can go to their website and sign up for it. Their website is 975grills.com, 975grills.com. Sign up to be in the club. But also, you know, if you don't sign up, this is a little secret. If you go in there and just say, hey, I'd like club pricing, the pricing for the club, they'll know what you're talking about, and you'll get special discounts on a lot of the grills they have in stock. And these are going to be the best prices. No one is going to beat them on the retail location for prices. Nobody, because they're the biggest, they're the best. They've got all kinds of seasonings, marinades, barbecue accessories, pizza ovens, uh, that are incredible, that are tabletop. You cannot and you should not miss out on the great offers they have. Join the club at 975grills.com and get your barbecuing to the next level with Texas Star Grill Shop. Go to 975grills.com.
taxes suck, especially your real estate taxes, okay? Your property taxes, they're coming to you, and this is the season where you have to fight. Do you want to fight? Your pro- if you don't fight your property taxes, guess what? You, the value of your, your appraised value goes up this year, and then it's going to go up again next year. And they can only do a certain percentage, but you know what? The government always pushes that. They always push that. Uh, uh, they, they are going to try to get as much out of you as they possibly can. They're going to tell you that your home is worth more than it is. You need somebody to fight for you because you don't know how to do it. You're not going to. These are professionals that you're up against and uh, the, the government, and they're going to they're gonna fight you. It's a process. It takes you three minutes now to fight them. You know why? Because you get own well. You put property tax back in your pocket, no stress, big-time investment, no investment. 86% of Ownwell's customers save on their property taxes, about 1100 over 1100 each. It's a great process. It takes you three minutes to sign up. But you have got to fight this because if you don't, you are going to lose in the long run. Save money on your property taxes with Ownwell. Sign up in less than three minutes and start your protest today at Ownwell.com. That's O-W-N-W-E-L-L.com. You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Chef is here. Chef Kate McLean, who has been on before. She's wonderful. She's got a, she's a huge fan. What's wrong with your Astros? Huge fan. You know what? I so I I brought my Texans jersey, but mm-hmm. I also brought Whoa. my Astros jersey <laughs> Chef is, because wow. they need us right <laughs> they now. They need help. They need help. You know what? They need our support. Yeah. So they, we need to not. We need to love them instead of hate we on them. We need to love them. Okay. Yes. Now, they do need some extra tender care, actually, because they are. It's awful. It's awful. You know what's like crazy about sports is like, you know, people will just. You won't do well for a little bit, and people just get down on them. <laughs> Turn on you. Well, they do. But we need to love them and, and see them through this. Oh, it's see, it's nurtured, the- Lance, not the way you go about it's it. Nurture. You know, I love that a chef is saying this, knowing full well what Yelp comments look like for restaurants. Yeah, that's true. I don't even look at them. You should. <laughs> you, <know. laughs> you should. And the Astros should. shouldn't listen to or read anything Well, either. but her Yelp's going to be always great. Yeah, well, you always find the ones that don't. Mm. You could have a thousand good things said about you, but that one that no. isn't good will always sting. Yeah, am I wrong? No, you're right. That does. Yeah. That does. No, those hit the worst. Stings. Those hit the. Oh, I immediately on Twitter, uh, mute. Okay, I'm, <laughs> done. I'm done with you. Um, so Kate McLean from Tony's is here. You've been here before. All your boys heard, heard uh, you on the show before. And yes. They they loved you have, having you on the show. We love having you in here. Thank because you. Because you brought... Uh, Lance, I'm going to tell you this. I had the best meal of my life at Tony's. Kate made the best meal. I'm telling you, it was the best meal of my life mm-hmm. that I ever... So when I'm on uh, Murderer's Row and I'm on my... And when I'm right before my last meal... Because it's coming. For my death sentence. What right? are you going in for? I don't... Uh, murder, probably. Del- more than likely. Ro- yeah. But there's more than more. Who do we think he's killing? Is that I, what we're asking? I'm not sure who it is, but I'm sure that'll. That <laughs> You're not going be. to death row for like tax evasion. No, you can't. No, they yeah. won't. They probably won't do that. It's going to have to be a pretty yeah. bad murder. But it's going to be Jeremy Branham? <laughs> I'm not murdering Jeremy Branham. Okay. Okay. So, will you disagree with the sports stuff? I, I do, but know I, how I bad don't it think was I'll kill get. him for it. But I want you to make my meal, okay? Okay. Will you promise? Done. Okay. Because Do you want to be I'm associated t- with I'm not there the, before you. Does she want to be associated with the yes, unknown murderer? Yes, she wants to be associated. Yes. Okay. Official yes. chef of yes. death row? Yes. Death row chef signed by Suge Knight? Yeah, that's right. That's right. You're we all Sean be- Penn and I am Susan Sarandon. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. And I'll wear the little habit. Did she wear a habit? I don't, I don't remember. I don't know. But yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, it was the best meal I've ever had. Ever had. And now, and by the way, the Thank burger you. at your at your place, you don't have to, that doesn't have to be fancy. You can go sit in the bar. We sit in the bar. We watch the television. I get a burger. My wife gets a piece of tuna or what, or a fish or whatever. And we just, let, we, we can watch the, uh, tell Riel, oh, they're so fancy they can't have a TV at Riel, right? Right. 
At Tony's, we got TVs. Okay, that's a little different. That yeah. is a little different. That's yeah, uh, yeah. And it's fa- it doesn't get any fancier than Tony. Doesn't get any better than fa- Tony's. We watched the Masters together. Yes, yes. How about really? that? Really? Yeah. 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 How about that? A lot of beards out there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So you said beers? beards, lot, beards, beards. A lot of golfers wearing beards. Oh these yeah. Days. Oh, Wendy and I were remarking on that. Yeah, like not opposed to the other beards. <laughs> John is. John started I'm wearing not his. Sure, beard. what you meant by that? Actually, um, <laughs> <laughs> I went. That's why I thought you said beers. Like, yo, yeah. you're watching golf with John. A lot of beers out there. Yeah, yeah beers well, there's that for too. sure. Total. There's that too. totally. But you cut. You brought us a new chicken sandwich, Dell. Yes. You tried it. You tried it yet? I have not. You got to try. You got to. Okay. I'm telling you, it's fantastic. Dell is the one. You know, we. we this is. This was for Dell. So they're. See they're, now, they're, when you call me a bad person, realize what happened because of me. Just realize you're getting a chicken sandwich because of me, John. That's right. That's well, right. John suggested it. Yeah, yes. I don't know about you yes. because but, of you. But this is <laughs> because of this me, This is Lance. relatively new on your menu, right? Yes. Yeah. And what did, what did, the buttermilk and tell us about it. So, yeah, it's a chicken thigh deboned. Um, so we get a whole chicken. We take the thigh off. We debone it. And then it's buttermilk soaked in different spices. And then we just double batter. So, wait a minute. You don't get a bag full of frozen chicken patties, right? No. <laughs> No, we get whole chickens get from whole Bell and Evans. Ch- okay. And Frozen <laughs> chicken patties. They're air chilled. Okay. Yeah. So not in solution. Organic, it sounds like if it's air chilled. Okay, so not this vegan. Is, so this will tell you that this is fresh, okay, everybody. And then it's lettuce and tomato and French onion, right? So fresh French onion dip. That you guys make. Yes. You make everything, don't you? I mean it's A amazing, it. Lance, what they the stuff you make, you. I mean, there's nothing that you just like. Even your ketchup, you you guys are are, are most good restaurants are making their own stuff. They have their own recipes and adherence to it. Yeah. I'm eating mine yeah. now. I don't care. Yeah. Nope, nope. Yeah, we can tell. Yeah, we we. You can didn't tell have to alert us to that people. fact. You might wait. Yeah, or but something. we prep a lot of that stuff, and we have a really good team, front and back of house, and that's yeah. that's everything. I mean, so. it's uh, the the kitchen. It's a lot like I'm telling you. It's so much like the bear. It's awesome <laughs> where everybody is back there. Watch it chef. behind you, chef. Okay. It's, less you're yelling. Going, do you all call each other chef, right? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Right? Less screaming, less yelling. No, that's accurate. Let's, there's a lot of accurate stuff, and their consultants they had are really good with that. Um, what's the worst? Do you remember? Have you been in kind of an abusive um, kitchen before where you had, where it was really intense back there? Like, you're a sports fan. You know sports gets pretty. Yeah. There's some coaches that are, that are, that are rough, and there's a lot of great chefs who have worked for staged or work, which is just basically you're, it's like an intern. You're just working for free. Um, with some, I, my friend Seth Siegel Gardner worked under um, Gordon Ramsay for a little bit. Oh, Marco man, that's Pierre be White. An abusive a- oh. atmosphere. Oh, yeah. He said, you yeah. know, it's, it gets intense. Yeah. 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 Your, 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 your kitchen gets intense, right? Do you yell at everybody? No, I'm I'm pretty nice. You are. But 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 you have to be firm in in a lot of moments because what we're doing is very serious and what we're doing is very fast. Yeah. And um it is a lot like sports. I mean, we have two games a day, right? Lunch and dinner service. You're with your team. You're either on the line. Oh my god, that's the best. Um but I don't get to be on the line anymore. I have to be, you know, pull. Why do you like to be on the line? What is what is that? What? You're, you're the offense coordinator. Cuz yeah. you're just like you're you're flexing together and it's like 2 minutes. Okay, 2 minutes, but I see in two minutes. It's a minute and a half. And um you ready? Are you ready? Okay, and then we put it all up at the same time. You know, and we're just talking, talking, talking. And um it is my favorite place to be. And then the front of you're house goosebumps. The front of house is killing it. You know, they're clearing your silverware, they're putting it down, they're pouring the wine pairing. And it's That's this where it's beautiful calm. chaos. It's calm out there, and then yes. back right. there. Yes. Yeah. Boom, yes. boom, boom, boom. Right. The timing of the whole thing is is that's what's awesome is you have to time different, you know, depending on what your little stations are. They got to time different stations, and different stations have different timings, and yeah, it's really, you know, like restaurants where you have to put all your can you put everything in all at once so that we'll and we'll pace out and course out everything for you. Then you have other restaurants where. I was at Street to Kitchen yesterday. And you can just order whenever you want. And so, order fire. Yeah. yeah. We call it order fire. Yeah. Yeah. Or hold, you know? Mm hmm. So, but 
I don't get the. It's fine dining, but it's where you're eating. Okay, that, I'm I'm eating yeah. at Tony's, right? I'm, that's what <laughs> yes. I'm saying. But it's not. It's fancy, but it's not like that. It's not. You know, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, it's a really great atmosphere. If you haven't if you haven't been to Tony's in a while, you need to go because it Thanks. is really. And and again, I mean, you get burgers there. You get uh, chips. You got you got chips on the menu. You got fries on the menu. You got a chicken sandwich on the menu. That's delicious. Come for lunch. Yeah, just we, go. Don't, we yeah, do a, a, yeah. a three course for $25 Greenway Express deal. We've had that price for 10 years and I never changed it. Really? Yeah, and you can get the chicken sandwich Man, on that and deal. This is a really good chicken sandwich. Thank you. And the chips, I almost always universally hate homemade chips. Those really? are really good. Yeah, I don't know why. I think they're oftentimes burned. Like I, yeah. I don't think they're done well. They don't change out oil, whatever the case may be. Those are really like legit those are really good. Thanks. I don't know we're bragging about chips. Boy, your chips. <laughs> Shout no, out to Violetta. Homemade she chips, but I, that's homemade one of those. Is great. <clears throat> those are ones that I, that's one that a lot of people get wrong, I think, or they're too oily or they're just not done well. This is done really well. Yeah, Thanks. lunch. People think of Tony's all the time for over the years, and things change. Or You and I were talking about this. It's not, it doesn't have to necessarily be the stuffy coat and tie and, you're talking about going in for lunch, John. You're talking about a television where you can watch go in the game. and watch. Yeah, Boom. so it's it's uh it's maybe not exactly the way people either remember it or think they know it. Yeah, yeah, and and it's been nice since I've been back for two years, and so they've got they've given me a lot of control to change things and and you know do fun stuff like bring in a singer in the middle of the dining room. Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah, you know? we were there for New Year's, and the piano player was excellent. It was fun. It was oh, a great, cool. a great time. And Miss Donna will come and greet you right at Always, your table. Yeah. Always, she's amazing, amazing. Open table doesn't have anything on Donna alone. She yeah. is the original open table. She's like, oh, she's related she, and to she her. Knows and they need to yes. sit there. Yes. Yeah. And she knows everybody. It's yeah. great. It's a great atmosphere. If you haven't been to Tony's, and again, twenty five bucks for a three course uh, lunch. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, you wore your CJ Stroud jersey in. You got to be more excited than ever about this team, guys. This is such a fun time. I know we're Except- getting good. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's it's been a while. We're well, collecting the pieces. Uh, well. Yeah, except the Astros are ruining it a little bit. That's okay. Yeah. We've they had a good run love. with the Astros. Stop well, looking the gift horse in the mouth. Love. <laughs> I've, pro- I've tried. I forgot. we got to love them. Two World Series them. wins Art. with the Astros, and you're upset that they're not giving you an eighth straight season? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I am upset. Man, Let's go. greedy. <laughs> that's right. Maybe I am a little bit greedy, but okay. I want my team. I want my team back. Not this one. I want my team they're back. They're coming back. <laughs> All right. Justin's back today. We'll be fine. Uh... That's uh, that's our friend, a star. She's a star. Kate McLean Thank you. over at uh, Tony's. Get there. It's on Richmond. Uh, Edlow? Is it Edlow or is it? Um, um, Timmins. 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 Yes. Timmins and, uh, and Richmond. Get on over there and uh, and see her for lunch. Go, go over there for lunch or dinner or whatever. Yeah. Make a reservation. Get there if, if you can this weekend. Thank you so much, Kate. You're, you're Thank the Thank you, John. She's wonderful. And I love the 97.5 ESPN app. You guys all need to download it. She, she, I gave you all my metrics. You can look at all. You, I gave you. I said yes to all of it. It's track, you track me. You just wake up and you <clears throat> track and you, me. And you hit the app and it starts playing for you. Yeah, in the morning I I put it on and I hear you guys and it's like an espresso shot and then I get a few giggles in before I like leave and it's it's great. So thank you. You have to bear down and and get after it. Get yeah. It. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Then and it's the giggles time to go. are done. Let's yeah. go. That's <laughs> what John and I do. We grind on a daily basis. Well, man, Hard work. Hard, hard work here. Some of the hardest workers you'd see. Well, we work so hard that we can actually eat a chicken sandwich <laughs> live on the air while we're eating. While yeah. we're while, while we're doing, we're doing our, show. our show. Yes, that's what we do. Do you ever? Do you ever? Like, have you ever just said, "You know what? I'm hungry during this shift. I think I'm going to have my own food." Did you tell somebody to fire something, but it was just for you, and did you trick them? Yes, you actually, you have. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. A veal I thought cutlet. that would have just been me, but you did it too. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm like, hey, can you drop? Fire two veal cutlets. And they're like, where's it going? I'm like, that little plate in Bianco because yeah. I'm getting hungry. Yeah. yeah. Good you know? for you. Good. You see, Absolutely. she can eat while she's grinding too. Absolutely. That's it. You should be able to. Well, everybody should. If you have should. a good job, you should be able That's to right. eat while you're, you're working. Your job sucks if you can't eat while you're doing it. I just wrote an essay on what chefs eat. It's on our website. Um, oh, what check chefs that out. eat? What yeah. do you eat? So it's a, it's a it's little as, snapshot. A lot of, of times it's not as fancy as people think. It's, it's the snapshot of what happens when you're a chef and your diet throughout the week. Okay. So on the website, there's a little thing in the bottom corner. It says essays by Kate. 
and um, it'll be loaded up later today. All right, but, we'll check. Oh, but it's not there yet? You might enjoy that. Yeah, um, I want to check that I out. I fired it off at 8 a.m. this morning. So what we'll is uh, Tony's, what's the website? Tony's Houston.com. Tony's Houston.com. Go to the website and see what chefs eat. That's Kate yeah. McLean, superstar, right here. Thank you. Shout out show. to Joey Gomez, our um, sous chef. I had to. Okay. He's, Good. Been, he's no, been prepping me. And, he, and, and my brother, David McLean. It did, it did he help you prep these? Um, he Your didn't. Show? He didn't. But oh, well then, he, lazy. He taste tested them. No, out he, he not anything but. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sous chefs are the stars. Yeah, that's they, right. They, they are. are. They are. They're the backbone. No question. While she's out in the front schmoozing with people. Hi, Hi chef. Hey. Yeah. He's out Taking there running, compliments. The, running the line. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kate, thanks so much. We appreciate Thank it. You. I got to talk right now about my peeps, uh, Robin. Okay, over at Houston Powder Coaters. She's the best, too. Love what they do over at Houston Powder Coaters. Listen, do you have tables? Do you have furniture? Do you have patio furniture? Do you have whatever it is that you have, car parts rusted out, boat parts rusted out, whatever, you got Houston Powder Coaters here for you. If it's unique, you just love it, whatever the case may be, you don't want to replace it, you don't want you want to keep that patio furniture. Maybe it has some kind of uh, a value to you, emotional value, and maybe it was your grandmother, whatever the case may be, or you just don't want to spend that money on new furniture, you got it at Houston Powder Coaters. HoustonPowderCoaters.com, 281-676-3888, 281-676-3888, or HoustonPowderCoaters.com. They will pick up and deliver absolutely free. They've got, they're the best. Robin's going to tell you exactly what they're going to do. And she'll, you could send her a picture and tell her, and, and she'll tell you whether or not to buy new stuff or she can help you all at HoustonPowderCoaters.com. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. Fabulous. Fabulous, fabulous. Thank you, Kate. She's wonderful. And uh, I'm surprised Lance left his... Did you just walk her out? I'm surprised you left your chicken sandwich for that long. I really am. Um, no one's going to take it here. People here are honest. Except when you steal interns' hamburgers. It didn't happen. It did happen. Kate is like a sports fan. Kate is, no, she's. That's all for real. Yeah, it is for real. She loves that. She loves her teams. Yeah. And um, she's awesome. She is a star. That's awesome. Thank you, Kate. Um, all right, we're finishing up the week here. 
Is there anything we didn't really talk enough? Of, did did we talk enough about the Chevron? I don't think so. I think but. we did. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk for a second about. <clears throat> so I'm a few days from flying out to to LA. I'm going to be in LA all next week doing. I'll be on TV. If you want to watch me on Path to the Draft, I'll be on Path to the Draft Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then you can see my draft analysis pick by pick um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I'll be doing all the picks on NFL Plus or YouTube. You can also see it on YouTube, at least for the first day. I'm not sure about day two and day three, but all the picks, I'll, I'll have analysis for all of them. So I don't even know if I get a break at all. I think, I'm, I, think I have to do every, every selection. Um, Friday is going to be a brutal show for me. Because after I stay up and do the first round on TV that night, I have to do a second and third round mock, which takes forever. Because I actually try to put thought into it. It's the dumbest thing in the world. Every year, I'm just going to go plug these guys in. So now I'm working on a cheat sheet. I want to be as ready. But what happens with all the trades? Yeah. But the guys aren't going to move that much. No, 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 no. But teams with different team needs. needs. So I'm going to be locked in on everyone's team needs. And I'm just going to be bam, bam, bam. Yeah, right. This is the year that I'm going to I'm going to do better. The less, the least amount of sleep I ever got when I was when I did a 6 a.m. show on 790. Uh, the year they drafted Deshaun Watson, the last year I was there, I got an hour and a half of sleep. Then last year was like two, two and a half hours. It's pretty, and then I got to come back and do TV all over again that next night on Friday. So Friday morning after the draft. And that's why there's talk there's been some talk about me not doing a show on Friday. Who, no, there's no because been no the talk Texans, about that at all. Some of the no discussions, one has ever mentioned that. There's been some discussions about <laughs> me not working. Because the Texans don't have a first round pick and a lot of people, many Our people per, preeminent draft. He doesn't want to be around to the take draft. The first round many, of the draft off. Many, many people in Houston have talked about the fact that since they don't have a first round pick, they really don't care as much. No, no. people want you around to see if maybe someone fell out of the first round that maybe the Texans might want. Yeah. And you're previewing the second round anyway. What are you talking about? Many people. Don't, don't eat and then He's talk. Many, many people. Talking. He's eating and talking again. Many, many people have talked about not wanting to hear me on Friday. Well, some people. <laughs> no. I don't know if many people have said this, but some people have suggested your lack of professionalism is affecting you. Yeah. No one has said that. No people. That's not true. It I've really got a tweet. is kind of. No people, but many people have said, why even have them on on Friday? All right. So and I'm a man of the people. So give the people what they want. So you're you not tried a man your chicken of the sandwich yet, though. You got a show to do. Are you going to save it for after? Sure. And you are? I got to. No, yeah, I got to take my dad to the airport today. So oh, I, so I'm not going to be able to get. How did you get stuck on Uber Patrol? Well, it's because you're. I'm a son of an immigrant. That's how I got stuck. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair. So, I wouldn't stick my mom in an Uber or my dad no, in an no, Uber. I'd can't. take him too. We have to do it. You have to do it. Uh, you didn't even tell us he was here. I did, though. I told Lance because I told was... me. He didn't want to tell you because it's best not to tell you that kind of because stuff. Because you would suggest, is he really your dad? Where was your mom? And was she in Chicago at some point? <laughs> yeah. You've done that before. I don't think I've you'll ever question said his, that. You've you'll done that question before. That, I don't believe I've ever said that. You'll question if he's actually my... Del Snow. Yeah. You think I've... <laughs> he wouldn't be a snow. He couldn't last in Winterfell. <laughs> he's not you a... would be the snow. No, you wouldn't be a Stark. You would no, be the you. If no, you. You would be snow. wouldn't be a Stark. You don't have to be a yeah. Stark to be a Snow. Oh, oh no, no, no. Stark, remember? No, 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 no. Oh, no, wait. A Snow is just a, a bastard. You're not a, no, a Snow is a northern bastard, yes. But you wouldn't be a no. northerner. You couldn't I wouldn't laugh. be a northerner. No, I wouldn't. was a northerner. You're, but you don't like living up there. I hated it. You'd I be, moved to, I I moved down to, where is it? You you moved to the south. Like, you'd be where King's Landing is. That's yeah, the south. I, I yeah. moved to King's Landing, yeah, from the, from, from the, from the wall. Yeah, I had to get away from the Someone wall. Should, well, you should, you should be sent to the wall for that. Is is he really your dad? I, I never said that to you. You, said, you said, exactly those words. Yeah, but you, you said as your mom. When was your mom in Chicago? That's exactly. all. And then I that's said, all John, I wanted to know. I said, I John, you asking. never met my mom. He goes, you, you don't, don't know. know. This was six years ago. He was doing this. You don't know. You don't know. He you intimated know. that he had relations with your mom. It may be my father. <laughs> And then he may be your father. That's I didn't literally... intimate that. You took it the wrong way. Oh, sure. I took it the wrong way. Okay. Yeah. No, you intimated it. You in... No, you just, you're just taking stuff the wrong not way. To be confused Very with, sensitive Not to be confused with being intimate That's with my mother. That's your snowflake generation. That's why. It's okay. not snowflake to yeah. push back on the notion that you may have had relations with my mother. <laughs> That's not snowflake. <laughs> That's stuff that gets you punched in the face. <laughs> 
Oh, I'm seeing here on a run. You snowflakes can't even take when I say that I had sex with your mother. <laughs> soft. It is a little soft. Your generation is soft. a little soft. Um, on the rundown here, it says Caitlin Clark blocked Antonio Brown. She did. What happened there? Well, he made some less than, well, let's say some overly crass comments about her, and she had had enough. And did you see what he said? He said she takes really, some of her shot selection is really problematic. It was not. I don't think that, that was, was it. That was not what he said. <laughs> he made comments about grooming, and she was like, nope, enough of you. Good for her. You can't have that man on your timeline. It's no. just best that you don't see or hear. And then he, he doubled and then down. Because, because everyone who gets blocked by a famous person has to screenshot it and then and say, look who blocked me. And then he, <laughs> what did he, well, he first called her, can I say it or do you have to say C word of the day? Not not the not the, not the the Scottish European C word, like white person C word of the day. He goes, oh, cracker? Yeah. Oh, oh. C, C word of the day. And then he called her cousin it. The cousin that hurts more than cracker. Yeah. Um, oh, did did anyone know what you just said? No, no one. I didn't. He doesn't. I know. said the cousin it is going to hurt more than cracker. Yeah. The cousin it is. Um, cousin it's going to sting a little bit more because the first reference had. A, a, was, I said about grooming. Yes. Yeah, it was about her grooming. Yeah. I mean, that's just he's bad. Antonio is a really bad person. I don't think the world would really miss Antonio Brown if he were not to have social media ever again, and no one ever heard from him ever again. He, f let's go through the timeline, shall a, we? He's going to be a problem. He was accused of farting in a girl's face. Yeah. Uh, he didn't pay for a trainer, I think it was. He didn't pay for art that he basically stole. Um, he the has there were movers that he was screamed at all the movers yeah. and threatened them with violence. Yeah. Like he's done. He claimed that he he claimed that he broke up the marriage of of Tom Brady. Um. He has been took his clothes off on, on the field. I mean, he legitimately needs. No, he's got, he needs help. Obviously, I, it, 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 it will come out that at some point he has CTE. He has mm -hmm. that hit that he took from Perfect was, I'm, I, 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 anyone would have it. Would have mental problems after. Is it after one hit can do it? Because if so, that's the hit. Yeah. Um, apparently, CJ's catching it over his baseball throwing style. He, he I was much, worried about it. He went viral. Um, people are... No, I mean, that's too much. We talked about it, too. We we're surprised. But the fact is, he threw it down the middle. Perfect strike. Yeah. That, what else can you... Like, okay, hey, he didn't... Where did it go? Right to the guy for a strike? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, what are you going to keep saying? He fired a perfect strike, but... He still he was a two sports car. It says apparently he was not a two sport. He was a two sports car, but it was basketball, not baseball. If you don't throw a baseball, it's hard to throw a baseball. Okay, just so you know, it's lighter. It's just different. But he threw it a lot like he throws a football. So uh, that he's catching it. And okay, if that's what he catches it for, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with. It. But honestly, what surprised me is the way you throw a football is the same as like a slider. I'm surprised, or a cutter. I'm surprised he didn't have a little cut action on that fastball. Well, move. actually, your your hand your actually hand turns out on a football. What a football! Well, yeah, but the rotation. Yeah, but the rotation. You're then why didn't it? Then why wasn't it a screwball? I don't know why it wasn't a screwball. All I know is that Antonio Brown was ugly, and so are people about our CJ. And stop now. We're gonna stop that. Um, I like how Dell said, you know how people do with famous people, and then they screenshot when they get blocked. He's talking about Antonio Brown got blocked by a famous person, Caitlin Clark. <laughs> yeah. She's more famous than Antonio she Brown. She is now. more famous. She is. More people know Caitlin Clark. Absolutely. All little girls. I mean, even like I asked Yanni, he's got two little girls. He said, Yeah, they wanted to. We sat down and watched the whole game. They never watched a, a girls' basketball game ever. Mm -hmm. Yes, we watched the whole game. And because of her. I mean, she is a phenom. Boy, people are getting salty too that, you know, the other women in the. Why didn't she get this? Why hasn't this player in the WNBA had this acclaim who won a WNBA championship or rookie of the year? It's really simple. Marketing has way frequently it is tied to how good a player is, but how marketable you are also has to do, just do with how marketable you are. It's not necessarily tied to all, all your play stuff. Like, 
you know, Allen Iverson was super marketable because he was different than anything that you had seen. He wasn't going to be for everybody, but I promise you, if you look at the impact that he had on the culture of basketball, Allen Iverson's Allen Iverson's reach from a marketing standpoint can be felt to this day. Substantial marketing. Hakeem Olajuwon, the best he ever got was Etonic shoes. Big deal. They were like 70 pounds. And who was better? He's a big man. But Dream was better, but yeah. it doesn't matter. A, big man... Posts don't get as much acclaim. But also, you know, if you do something that's unique, if you're a unicorn, you're going to be special in marketing. Tiger Woods, Allen Iverson, Caitlin Clark, they're just different than everyone yep, else. Yep. Uh, you don't. You can't describe it. They have it, okay? And that's what people want. Again, with your saying cousin it about Caitlin Clark? No. Why did you say no, she has she has it. it. She had not. I she see what is you're doing. It. That's a cheap shot. She is it. It. She has it. That's a cheap shot. Hey, you know who has it? He just called K Caitlin Clark. He said she has it, I and I knew what he was he said, doing there. But that's I not what he said. I did not. Caitlin Clark is not cousin it. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to take anything from you at your word because you're too busy picking chicken out of your teeth. I love that. I love that chicken. Either Thank you. you I'm, I was mostly talking about Lance, but you're doing it too. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I want to talk. You know who has it? Kent Jones. He has it. He has Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, LTV, DTI, PIT, FICO, HELOC, LMNOQ. Did you say DTF? He's got it all. Wow. DTI. No, DTI. <laughs> He's got it all. He's got all of those different mortgages that you can choose from. What you Are you shopping your mortgage? If you're not shopping your mortgage, then you're doing it wrong. Because this is the biggest expense you'll have in your life most of us this is the biggest expense we've ever had and why would you not shop it why would you not shop for something that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars if not more he is safe transparent dependable pairs you with the best wholesalers in the nation he's a small business he has got less overhead than anyone than all of these big offices that put their names on bowl games more experience. He's been doing it for 29 years. He's going to give you. He's going to give you the best deal he can find. That's what he's going to do every single time. So if you're looking for that guy that's going to stand behind you and work his tail off for your mortgage, he's the ultimate mortgage hookup. Find out. You can even if you just want to find out, get a scenario quote. You can do that as well. Seven one three five two zero fifty six twenty six. Seven one three five two zero fifty six twenty six. Seven one three five two zero loan. Or 975loans.com. Tell Kent you heard it right here.
Hey, I've talked about buying the luxury watches from Zadok Jewelers. Did you know that you can also sell and even trade with Zadok Jewelers? They're taking timepieces. If you're someone who's a connoisseur of nice watches, maybe you have a collection and you want to upgrade into something new, they will buy your watch or they'll even take it and trade, and you guys can start to negotiate there and have money to get the Breitlinger, the Cartier, the Tag Hauer, IWC. There's so many different types of watches that they have. But don't forget, if you have a timepiece that needs to be fixed, they have seven on-site master watchmakers who are, who are suited to offer a complete evaluation of any timepiece that you may wish to trade in, and they can fix your timepiece as well. So just want to make sure that those of you who have watches understand that the best place in the entire state of Texas may be right there at 1801 Post Oak Boulevard for buying the best watches with exclusive uh, offerings to selling your watch or even trading it in. You're going to get the best service, the best selection, outstanding prices, and an experience you will not forget at Zadok Jewelers. Make sure that you go to the website to check them out at ZADOKZADOK.com or stop in at 1801 Post Oak Boulevard. Well, I'm not sure about this one. Courtney Tillia, OnlyFans star. She says she does porn because it's God's message. She said she was meant to, she was put on this earth to help people. Do you think she's doing God's work? Hmm. <laughs> I think it depends on who you ask. Well, there is, there are instances of uh, my prostitution daughter, in the Bible. If you ask my daughter, she's doing the devil's work. Yeah. But if you ask... Just generic guy named Greg. Yeah. Maybe he would say, yeah, I agree with her. Yeah. Just some generic guy who know. says, yeah, I think he's. I'm not sure, Courtney, God had this plan for you, but what else? Yeah, here she is. Oh, yeah, there she is. That's free will also. Dude. A woman says her husband leaves bed in the early early hours to go sleep next to his mom. Okay. Do you... We <laughs> are to his mom or her own mom? His mom. Hmm. In the morning, he goes up to his parents to sleep, and I don't feel good about it. He wants to sleep next to his mom. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, no, no, no. So the husband leaves the wife and the sleeps husband next leaves to his own mom. Next to his mom. Oh, okay. I thought you were telling me the wife leaves the husband no. and goes to sleep with the husband's husband mom. husband leaves the bed in the early hours to sleep next to his mom. I, I can see this. It, it's. I I'm not really... saying it makes sense, but I could totally see this happening with some mo hardcore mama's boy. Uh, is his name Araldus Chapman? It's not a Raldis Chapman. Okay. Ooh, I don't want to know. And he, he's sleeping but with his mom, too. could you see that? I see him no, doing too lay, much stuff. I, no, I'm hoping just he's laying in the same bed. He obviously has some level of little kid in him still. Dell, this is for you. Hugging someone, even a robot, eases pain and depression. Dell is depressed yeah. because he doesn't have anybody to hug. That's true. He, so am I hugging? This is why people should give you back hubs. No, so... Hugs the act of hugging someone relieves your serotonin. depression. Serotonin. Yes, yeah, your depression. So I right. have to hug someone. You get. You, you have a release someone. of serotonin, a release of pheromones, yeah. a release of what's the other stuff that you get? Um, uh, well, for you, it would, if you get a back hug, it would also no, be adrenaline. No, but what you're saying is I'm supposed to be hugging other people. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, just hug and back. And you should, yeah, hug and hug back. That's right. That's right. That's right. Mark Next time you guys see Dell, hug him and just say, it's going to be okay, buddy. Marjorie Taylor Greene is demanding space lasers to combat migrants. There's she no way she like said that. She feels like we should be taking out migrants. She didn't say. No. There's yep. no way. Actually, there is a way. Yes. But come on. She did not say, after all the heat she's taken for Jewish space lasers. She's called for the deployment of space laser technology on the U.S.-Mexico border. Okay. You, Israel has some of the best unmanned defense systems in the world. There it is. She went with Jewish space lasers again. <laughs> I've previously voted to fund space lasers for Israel's defense. America needs to take our national security seriously and deserves the same type of defense for our border that Israel is has like and probably uses. science fiction where it goes, pew, 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 <laughs> like that? Yeah. And it can just whomp, the saw you in half? Yes. Wouldn't that be cool? So she wants to, it would be she wants to kill yes. migrants with space, space lasers? Space laser technology. Yes. Yes. A Louisiana lawmakers have voted to remove lunch breaks for child workers and cut their unemployment benefits. 
<laughs> Child workers. Well, hold on a second. Yeah. You're getting ball sacked here. No, I'm not. It's actually on... No, it's on NOLA, NOLA NOLA.com. No, that's New Orleans' actual newspaper. Yes. Hold on. What do you mean child workers? A Louisiana House committee voted to repeal a law requiring employers to give child workers lunch breaks and to cut employee benefits. Okay, is this workers for children, not child workers? Child workers, yes. But there's child labor laws. What do you mean? Okay, the House of Labor advanced the child labor uh, legislation, which would slash the amount of time for people to collect unemployment. No, this is for child this workers. This cannot be for child workers. It, you're, you're misreading that. I am not misreading. Who, what? Name and a child it, who's Louisiana. ever filed for unemployment. Hey, it's a Louisiana. A child who filed for unemployment. Yes. No, who does you don't that? get to start your unemployment benefits. at. You don't get unemployment benefits at that age. You're on a, your employment clock you're doesn't start. You're not allowed start. to work. What do they consider child? They, 16-year-old? It has to be 16. Um, yeah. Well, that's a child, I guess. Ah, they're not children. Yeah, okay. Um... Yeah. Okay. So yes, Louisiana. You're talking about Louisiana. Here. I know. There's a chance. Okay. There's a chance it could be accurate. Um, we are done. What's we got? Astros this weekend in Washington. Your homework we got is the RBC, which is big. We got the Chevron Championship going on. What's the RBC? Oh, the Heritage. You don't know anything. <laughs> John's telling you which golf tournaments yes, to watch. Yes. Yes, that's what I'm going to be watching. You have the live that you want to promote. You no, want to promote no, the no, blood money? Live. No. Of the Saudis. Well, oh, you got a frisbee tournament you want to promote? No, okay. just watch. Just go out and play. No, no, I'm not. Don't watch do it. Go, either. go throw them. Uh, I won't do that. I'm going to go out there on Saturday and I'm going to crack chains or whatever we say, break chains. Breaker you, of chains, you, Lance Erline. I'm going to be chain breaking. You yeah, are breaking sure. chains this weekend. Sure, I'll probably go out to TC Jester and break some chains. It's a good three mile walk. Nice to play the tournament to play the course. So yeah, I think I'll break some chains. That's a nice walk. All right, we're done. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you about all that golf and stuff. On Monday, nope. everybody. Baseball. Time for me to talk about my peeps over at uh, TPC Industrial. TPC. Oh, that's oh TPC. That's golf too. That's right. But this isn't that. This is flanges and all, all the stuff that you could possibly need for your work site. Okay, valves, fittings, flanges, forged steel, couplings, hoses, and more. They've got thousands of pieces in stock. Any part that you need, stocked or not. They can get it. If you're looking for a particular item, give TPC Industrial a call today. Rapid delivery. All right, they're right up. They're in Mount Bellevue. They're going to get it to you right away. Houston and Archie are awesome. You'll love doing business with them. They are, are, are suppliers in this industry, and if you're not getting what you need from your supplier, make them your supplier, or at least let them embellish whatever uh, you need, okay? They can add to it. So if you're looking for any PVF needs, all your PVF needs, your current PVF supplier can't find you what you need, call TPC Industrial today, 346-226-3866, 346-226-3866, or tpcindl.com.
Welcome into the show. I'm Dell, who's normally here, but we've got a we got a lineup change. No, not one of those. I know. I, I know the station does a lot of those, but I'm just talking about specifically to this show. We have a lineup change for now. Uh, Sean has taken the, a day off. So it's not permanent, but he's not here today. It's a Friday. I understand getting that three-day weekend in. So Austin will be the producer for today. Austin's produced other shows on the station before. He's he's filled in for people capably. He just has never done this show. So we're going to certainly do a Get to Know Austin segment. He, he's just finding out about that right now. I did not tell him, but we will do that. I do know a couple things about him. I know he is a Browns fan, so there was a certain point last year in the month of what was it December early January where he didn't have a great week considering what happened to his team when they came down here for a playoff game he's got a diamondback hat on so I will get into that but we're going to get to know Austin we know a lot about Sean and his his unwillingness to read subtitles we'll see if Austin feels the same way so we'll get to that in a little bit um, on the show but there was other things was beyond the personal stuff regarding Austin. We had Casario speaking to Casario that the Texas GM said a lot and also said nothing, depending on the question. We had the leak of the Texans helmet and then subsequent leaks of people who say they know what the mock-up of the uniform will look like. There's a couple of prominent ones out there that people are focused on. And I got to believe uh, maybe because anything that Nick Casario talked about, it was him really just reviewing things that have already, already been done that the prominent news story of the day yesterday, despite the fact that the GM of the football team spoke quite a bit, was the fact that we know what one helmet looks like, and then we know what 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 a uniform looks like, maybe, if we believe the league. So I am interested to see what people actually care about regarding that. Did you care what Nick Casario said, or were you far more interested in what the uniforms look like? You can call in if you have a, a thought on that, 713-780-3776. I'm actually interested because I know – what the timeline looked like for me um, once that helmet hit hit the hit the the timeline. It was all about do we like this? Do we not like it? I contend that they look like helmets that are better placed in NFL Europe. You can't tell me if the Scottish Claymores are lining up on the other side. You would you would you would you would think the Texans alternate helmet is out of place. People out here longing for the 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 bullhorn or whatever that thing is called um, that they currently have their their traditional logo on the helmet people say hey you know what not so bad that generic brand or bland uniform and logo not so bad when you look at what the idea that actually made it through the, the through the uh, the design process came out to be and it's only just the one helmet who knows how long they'll wear it or how often they'll wear it I'm sure it'll be teamed up with their H-Town blue sp- specific uniform but that's out there we'll get into that um, we have some unfavorable numbers for the Astros based off a, uh, well, it's a, it's a article by Chandler Rome of the athletic. We have some numbers about the Astros in the clutch and their best players and how bad they are. Look, you're six and 14. You're going to have some ugly numbers, but these are particularly terrible when you consider what we've believed about this team in the past, how they come up big, you know, outside of being at home against the Rangers last year, but they come up big in clutch situations. We have clutch players, that rise to the moment, they have not. That has not been the case this year, and it's been their best players who've had that issue. So uh, that is unfortunate. So we will. I'll give you those, and and um, it just speaks to what has been a very disappointing year. But the good news is, Justin Verlander's back. He'll be pitching today against the Nationals team, who maybe before the year you thought, even if you, even in your wildest nightmare, you thought the Astros would be struggling. You you probably assume once they got to that National Series. They, they got beyond the tough 20 games to start. They, they got the Nationals, and that would be a bit of a reprieve. Unfortunately, it isn't a bit of a reprieve. The Nationals clearly better than the Astros. So that needs to change, and hopefully it changes with the return of your ace. An ace who has had a couple minor league starts. They're, they've not been good. Um, I always think it's funny when the excuses get broken out for one of your players. Um, and depending on depending on how big of a fan you are you it might be easy for you to break out those those excuses but Verlander in rehab starts you're not going to take a lot out of it other than he's healthy but a lot of people have said oh he's working on a slider he, he's working on things I would just like him to get outs I don't care how he's or what he's working on just go out there and get outs whether it be bad defense or otherwise um but just go get me some outs and that's what we're gonna need from him today. 
and going forward. Although working on stuff is out of the way, just go get yourself them out. Um, so we'll see uh, what that what the first start for Verlander going forward is. Austin, I don't. Sorry, I was trying to tell him we don't we don't have. I don't think we have interns right now. There's an intern working um for, from the previous show, so I think you may be responsible for answering the phones uh right now. Unfortunately, uh, just this show generally doesn't have one. I think Lexi, our prefer the previous show, is working on putting up the podcast. If you're wondering where the podcast is for the John and Lance show, it'll be up soon. Lexi was uh getting some training involving. Board the board, so it'll be later than normal, but it'll be up there quickly. Uh, if you missed out on any of the John Land show from earlier today, but Verlander gets the start. The and and it's funny I have, I say the the Nationals are cl- clearly better than the Astros. They've played better recently. Uh, hard not to when the Astros got swept, but they're only eight and ten, so there is a shot to get uh to get some wins on the board, and you have to hope it begins with with uh with JV in Washington, and he'll see Mackenzie Gore who's had a really good start to the year. So that's not great. 23 Ks, only five walks, uh, 2-0, and an ERA under three for Mackenzie Gore. And I appreciate this man. He wears the number one as a pitcher. I always think that single digits, that's generally a football thing I think is cool. But Mackenzie Gore is rocking the number one um, for, the, for the Nationals left-hander. So we'll see w- what, he, what he looks like against the Nationals lineup uh, that has struggled and – they have their peaks and valleys. The valleys have been far too, far too frequent. Uh, you just have to hope uh, the peaks start to become a thing. And also, maybe, maybe just level out. Get me six runs. I mean, I know that I know when they when they have a good night, it's generally ten. Um, and then they have their awful nights, and it's uh, they're getting shut out or only scoring one run and putting a lot of stress on their rotation, the bullpen. Score five or six. I think that might be enough today, uh, particularly if Verlander has his stuff. I can't really see the the name, uh, but I know they want to talk about Shogun. Uh, so we, so that's Austin. Just so you know, Shogun is the show of this show. Uh, that sh- that TV show gets brought up a lot, and a lot of people want to talk about it. And I think we've pushed that narrative here on the show, and people have either watched it because we talked about it, or just watched it because it's a great show. And now they want to bring uh, their thoughts to the table. So we'll talk about that when we come back. We're just getting started here. Uh, we will play Casario Sound. When we come back, he he said some things. He got a little snippy. Maybe it's maybe because he's ten win Nick, and now he feels he's feeling himself a little bit. But he didn't particularly like questions regarding Stefan Diggs and being a diva. So we'll hear from him on that, and we'll also hear from you once again. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven six is the number. First segment in. We'll be back.
You're listening to the Dell Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Vertex Community Bank Studios, here's Dell Olalea. Welcome back to the show. We've got an interesting thing going on on the board right now. Austin answered the phone, and he couldn't tell who, or he couldn't tell what this person was saying. So he guessed, he just guessed, or he just made a guess, excuse me, about who this who this person is. I have it as Sue up on the board, but it's he. it wasn't a, a female voice. So we'll see. I'm just going to go by Sue until you correct me. Sue, you wanted to talk about Shogun? Katsu, gentlemen. Oh, you went with a Japanese name. Okay. What, what is yeah, your... Yeah, Sapatu, gentlemen. Dude, Crimson Sky, the last episode, was fire. Also, what's the over and under on Shannon Elizabeth being on OnlyFans? Ryan, want to know. Ryan, stop it. <laughs> you're not You're not Nakatsu. You're Ryan. Uh, and he switched it up. Unless Shannon Elizabeth is a, is a natural blonde, he actually went with the brunette this time. Um, yeah, Shogun is great. The last episode was great. We talked about it a little bit yesterday with Julian, uh, who is our resident sh- Shogun correspondent. Watch that show. It's entertaining. I get the subtitle thing might get in your way. You don't want to read a TV show, but you'll adapt. It'll be it'll it'll be fine. And the acting being done, even in a separate language uh, or different language, excuse me, is awesome. And we got one more episode. Uh, episode nine was. Really good, particularly if you like the conversations and small room aspect of the game Game of Thrones. We know the big battle scenes were, were, were got people's attention later, but all the conversations that led to major things uh, was kind of the backbone of that show. Now Shogun is following in that mode, and they, at least the creators, don't particularly like just being compared to Game of Thrones, but I'm just trying to give people a reference point um, as far as the political in- intrigue and how small things, whether you say them or don't say them, can lead to bigger bigger results. Shogun is that show. Uh, check it out, whether you are watching it on FX or you're watching it on Hulu like I am. I never watch anything at this point when it airs. I usually just catch it on a streaming service. So, yeah, Shogun. F- Shannon Elizabeth, I don't know. I'm going to say unlikely, although her career it hasn't been as great as the other women you've brought to the table, so you're probably more in the realm. But at this point, you're also... Ask, yesterday you brought up Amy Smart, who was for, who's 48 years old. I think Shannon Elizabeth may be in that age range, too. So so Ryan is just living out his teenage fantasies. Women he found attractive and may still he might still find attractive uh, when he was younger. Uh, Shannon Elizabeth is 50 years old. I don't know what she looks like today. But, Ryan, I don't know if you're hard up, but <laughs> if it hasn't happened for her by now, it probably isn't going to happen. I mean, OnlyFans can make you a lot of money quickly. She's got a big name, big enough to uh, capitalize, but doesn't seem like doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Her her IMDb less stellar than the other women you've mentioned, uh, but once again, I'm not sure you bringing women that you used to fantasize over helps you in any way, particularly when it's these specific women. Uh, good luck next time. I'm going to put this one. I'm going to put a number on it. I'm the numbers guy when it comes to this. Under 2%. Uh, you're, you still haven't cracked the 5% mark yet. Good luck to you on that. Um, as we move forward from Ryan or Nakatsu or whoever the hell he wanted to be today, uh, call. We'll get into the Texans. Nick Casario spoke. In fact, it felt like it was GM day yesterday. A lot of GM spoke because while the guys aren't in uniforms, a lot of players in shorts and T-shirts throwing the, throwing the football around, getting workouts in. So now whether – Despite the fact that the players aren't available for the media, you've gotten GM speaking. I'm looking at Joe Shane right now, the Giants GM on ESPN, and Nick Casario was was available yesterday. Answered a lot of questions. Didn't particularly like all of the questions. And uh, once once um, Austin uh, gets that phone call up, we'll, he'll be able, he'll be available to play some sound. And he spoke on. Stefan Diggs acquiring him, whether he's a diva or not, why Diggs isn't available to the media. A, l- a lot of people were focused on the big acquisition this year, this offseason. I mean, maybe Daniil Hunter might have a bigger impact because of Nico Collins and Tank Dell. T- Stefan Diggs may become your third wide receiver. Who knows? That's still that's still up for determining, depending on how the offense breaks and 
and who who is best fit who's the best fit for the offense. But as far as the diva tag that has been placed on Diggs, Nick Casario didn't appreciate it, and he responded when when he was asked about it. I mean, look, he's an experienced player. He's been productive. He's instinctive. He has good hands. So, um, you know, our system is maybe a little bit different than the system that uh, he was in in Buffalo, but he was as productive as any you know, player in the league. So um, there might be some things that we're doing maybe that are similar. That is uh, Nick Casario on, on how Diggs might fit into the offense and what they're getting. He did actually talk about Stefan Diggs, and uh, Austin let me know when, when we have that queued up. He, he wasn't a fan of the label, mostly because he says it's unfair. You can't put that on a guy, and we won't put it on a guy. And by we, I mean he meant the Texans. He won't put that on a guy he doesn't know well enough. Uh, in fact, uh, it became a topic of conversation on the show this morning that that's, Nick Serio doesn't know what a lot of words mean. In fact, I believe he said, I don't even know what that means. Um, he has used that that line to get out of questions he doesn't appreciate, and this is and this is the latest. What does the diva mean? I think he knows, uh, but he just simply didn't like uh, putting that label on his newest player. Number one, I don't even know what that definition means. Someone can define that for me. Again, like we're not worried about, you know, again, we're worried about what a player does when he walks in our building. So we do our research. We talk to our players. We talk to other players all the time. We talk to our players, you know, as an example, like a lot of the guys are in the draft. And we talk to those players, hey, what are your thoughts about uh, so-and-so? What is your experience with him? So and we do our research, and then ultimately D'Amico and I sit and talk, and if we feel comfortable with the decision, then we go ahead and make the decision. Um, I, candidly, I think it's unfair to label anybody until they have a, actually have an opportunity to walk in the building. Again, our environment's different than another environment, so we really don't know what's going on in, in 31 other buildings. We know what's going on in our building, so decided to have stuff here. You know, a lot of that is fine, um, but you do know what a diva means. I appreciate him not wanting to put a tag on his newest acquisition. Um, they they are starting a, a work, working relationship, and and why would you even play into what the media might want to put on Stefan Diggs? Partly because he's probably a bit of a diva. You don't you don't want you don't want the first time you're heard talking about him to acknowledge that being a thing. Hey, we like Diggs. We like him as a player. He's in our building. What may be classified as the diva one place may be something we appreciate here. And, you know, he's a he is a winning player. That that shouldn't get lost. Stefan Diggs has played in a lot of big games. He's been productive. And the Texans don't have a lot of those guys on the roster. A lot of it has to do with being bad for years. And a lot of it has to do with them rebuilding and reworking the roster. They don't have a lot of players who have experience in meaningful games. He is one of those players. Whether his leadership quality should be put into question, that's up for debate. I'm sure if you talk to some people in Buffalo, they would have loved Stefan Diggs as a leader. Others might feel differently, just how it is. Uh, not Everyone can't be liked by everyone everywhere. So he is here. Uh, the Texans will work with him, and they've already done that when it comes to restructuring of his deal. They gave him more money up front. It's a one-year deal. Stefan Diggs, we all assume, wants to get back in the free agency because of his age. He wants he wants a he wants a shot quicker to make a lot of money. Now, a lot of that's going to be based on how he plays here. Is he a guy who's going to be thrilled with potentially being a second or third? He's never had to be that. Well, at least not for a long time. He was the first in Minnesota, and he certainly was the first in Buffalo. The first time we saw a reduction in his targets was the back half of the 2023 season, and then he got traded. <laughs> so do those correlate? I don't know, but as soon as as soon as he became less influential, he had to get gone, and that's why he was available for the Texans. And in fact, Casario talked about how the trade came about. He said it wasn't something they were they were looking for. It, it's just it just came came to them. We know they're at, at, after a big time wide receiver. The Keenan Allen stuff was maybe a week or so before the Stephon Diggs came trade came, and we heard. Keenan Allen discussed how the Texans were a team on his list. He eventually wound up with the Bears. So they were on the market for a big name wide receiver. It just so happened that the Diggs thing kind of maybe not fell into their lap, but it wasn't something they were pursuing. It just so happens the Bills were done with him, and it didn't cost them a lot. If we go by the, the, the trade value, considering the picks they got back, they only had to give up maybe a late second or third for 
a generally a perennial all pro, excuse me, or at least a, a perennial pro bowler and a productive receiver on a good team. If we're talking about the trade value, they win that one on its face. Whether they actually win it will be determined by what he is as a player and how he fits. <sighs> More than a year of digs. Do they get there? They set they set themselves up for it not for if they want out they can get out really quickly and the hope is he's great and he wants to be here. You do a lot of winning in year one and he sees it as a place where he wants to be. This that ties into what has kind of been the narrative this year about the Texans that people want to play here. The off season has been filled with whether it be jersey edits or rumors about C.J. CJ Stroud wanting this player here and this player wanting to be here. We heard Will Anderson talk about how when he was at the Pro Bowl, players talked about wanting to be Texans, and he followed that up with, it's, it's not for everybody. The Texans culture isn't for everyone. Slow down. It's one, one good year. But maybe, maybe they set a standard where, some players wouldn't fit in, and I'm sure that's the case, but I don't know how he would know that if he's amongst pro bowlers. Pro bowlers kind of fit in almost everywhere, as long as, as, long as uh, this the pro bowl year wasn't a one-time thing. Generally, when you're a great player, you find a way to fit in because your habits kind kind of mesh with other another team's winning culture. How do you become a perennial pro bowler? You probably have good habits, so I'm going to say slow down, Oh, and not everyone would fit. The guys you were around probably would fit in. I mean, if you just happen to be at a camp um, and you were just around average players, maybe they wouldn't fit in. But pro bowlers, bring them on. If they're available, bring them on. And the Texans have said, that's our philosophy. They brought in Joe Mixon, who you might assume wouldn't fit into the culture. They brought in, they brought in Stephon Diggs, who you might assume wouldn't fit into the culture. So maybe the Texans culture is for more people than Will Anderson thinks. We will see how Joe Mixon and Stephon Diggs blend in with what the Texans are building here under D'Amico Ryans and Nick Casario. We'll have more from Casario uh, throughout the show because, as I said, he spoke quite a bit. But I did want to bring you the numbers for the Astros as they get ready for their national series. The, the numbers aren't great for their clutch players, at least the guys we think are clutch. They have not been good in big situations. Part of the reason why they're 6-14. and 14. We'll talk about that when we come back.
This is the Dell Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Dell Olalea. I don't normally quote baseball reference, but just to give some context, Layton Close in baseball is a plate appearance in the seventh inning or later with the batter seam tied, ahead by a run, or having the tying run at least on deck. So what we would call a clutch situation, what we've always called clutch, they have a specific definition for it. Seventh inning on, close game, pretty much what it is. The Astros have had plenty of opportunities, despite the fact that the rotation has been a mass unit. There have been rough starts, but we know when you watch the games, there are times where the Astros are, if it feels like one hit away from changing the complexion of a game. And if you feel like they're not coming through, you would be right. The Astros OPS is over 170 points worse in late and clutch situations or late and close situations than the league average. They are, they are bad when it matters the most. They have 21 hits, 19 are singles. They only have two extra base hits, and those two belong to Jose Altuve. And they're both doubles, so not even a home run in a big time situation. Their four best players, or at least their four best hitters, Altuve, Alvarez, and Bregman, they had, they've had, this is, by the way, this is all num- all numbers from a Chandler Rome article, article from The Athletic. They've all had at least 12 plate appearances in those situations. Jordan is one for 11, Bregman is two for 11, and Tucker is two for eight. So your best players, when it matters most, aren't showing up. So when we start to talk about how this team is bad, it's legit. The team is bad. You can go down the lineup into the rotation, into the bullpen, and find places where the players you expect to come through have not come through. Why Ryan Presley can't be good in anything but a close, close, closing situation? I don't know, but that's something that needs to be figured out. They're, the Astros, because partly their inability to come up clutch, have, haven't given Josh Hader many closing opportunities. That's a problem, considering what he's here for. Whether the slander for Joe Musgrove is right or not, the fact that it was indirect. He didn't mention Hader by name, but he did talk about how it's nice to now have a closer that can pitch beyond the ninth inning in save situation. So plenty of things have led to this bad start, but their hitters and their inability to be what they have been in, in, a, in game situations where they're needed is a is a big contributor to being six and fourteen, and they play the Nationals in a series where you would hope to take two out of three. The, the Nationals aren't great, but they have played better recently, and it's not hard to play better than the Astros. But they have done that too. Uh, so nothing's nothing's a gimme anymore. It used to be well, we got the Nationals, uh, we'll take two, maybe we'll take three. But that is the old Astros. The new Astros don't hit. the The new Astros don't come up clutch, whether they're pitching or they're hitting, and can't take anything for granted, and you hope that the return of Justin Verlander changes some of the momentum because at last check, when we heard from Alex Bregman, one of the guys who struggled, didn't seem like there are many answers other than execute and play better, which is what you could say at any point when your team stinks. Play better. And I, and yesterday I talked about it. I don't know how when it was suggested to him by a media member that they should have a players-only meeting. What's that, what's that going to do? Hey, guys, we need to hit better? I think I think they know that, so we'll ho- hopefully that that begins to turn around, um, and that begins today. Now, Justin Verlander's back. As I mentioned, uh, anyone who's been following his time down in the minors has noticed the results haven't been good, but hopefully the process means more, and that process leads to results starting today. Here's John Morosa. He was on MLB Network discussing what you might be able to expect from Verlander going forward. The Houston Astros need some good news. And so here's the future Hall of Famer back on the mound for the Astros tonight. Long anticipated season debut for JV. It'll be his third game start of the regular season. He made two minor league rehab outings, gave up a number of runs in his last one. So he's not necessarily based on the numbers, 
in peak mid-season form, but he is good to go. He knows his body exceptionally well. He's able to get back on the mound now and give the Astros some quality. The expectation is probably in the range of five innings based on where he was the last couple times out. There you see the rotation that he is now joining. Of course, Brown and France have struggled a bit to begin this season. The Astros, some good news here, Lauren. They do believe Framber Valdez is not far behind okay. Verlander in terms of rejoining the rotation. But so that's John Morosi on MLB Network. And that last bit is good news, too. Sean and I have joked about Framber playing catch and what that might mean for his, his return. But if Morosi is to be believed, Framber is not too far behind, which means you'll have your top two guys. And Javier's pitched well, well, well enough, at least particularly when you compare it to some of the other outings, to suggest that if you have your top three back and they are close to what we would expect of them, uh, then the rotation uh, begins to be solidified. The Ronel Blanco thing, Blanco thing, and how, how good he's been has certainly been a, been a, been a bright spot. And who, who, who could say that he shouldn't be your fourth or fifth guy? I mean, wh where he's put in rotation means less to me than the fact that he remains in the rotation. And Hunter Brown and... And JP France can go fight it out for that. I guess that that fifth spot, if you if we want to label them, the number five starter and Blanco the number four. I gave you some numbers for the Astros disappointing hitters. The one guy who has used an offseason to find himself again is Jeremy Pena. We know about the power numbers decreasing last year and all the jokes that were made about every time every time we saw him in in a workout situation and, and a social media pick came out everyone's like is that going to help him hit more home runs is is that going to change the way he hits for power well so far so good for Jeremy Pena he is one guy who's put in who has put in the work has been well documented and uh he's he's been good he is someone you could say took whatever last season gave him and flipped it uh so not not all bad just not enough good and Joe Spada uh, talked about Pena in this article uh, from the Chronicle, gave some quotes, and you know he's pleased with he's pleased with the strides he's making and the fact that he's driving the ball to all fields. Um, but as you might imagine, Payne is frustrated, not necessarily because of his play overall, but the fact that the team isn't good. The individual stuff is cool, but the fact that the team hasn't performed up to their uh, their standard is wearing on everyone. Um, I don't think anyone there thought six to fourteen was on the table. I don't think anyone thought their best players would struggle the way they have. But it's a long season, as as everyone will say. 20, only 20 games in. And I saw someone uh, tweet out the Astros went like 6-14 and 14 last off se last season. If, of course, it was in the middle of the year, so it wasn't as highlighted. I think it might have been in June, and then they ripped off. I think they went like 13-7 and seven over the course of the, the next 20. So if that's on the table, great. Of course, you still be a game under 500 because of how bad you've been. Uh, but if 13-7... Uh, and seven, Excuse me. You'd be two games in the five hundred because of how bad you've been. But if a but if a a thirteen and seven streak is coming, please bring it on. It'd be nice to talk about a team who's playing better uh, going forward, and less about the back of a baseball card. Which I hope I hope after a day off, they had a little meeting and decided we're going to retire that particular phrase because everyone's noticed it and everyone's annoyed by it. Coming up, we're gonna. I mentioned this as the show started. It's time for Austin to introduce himself. Uh, you, if you haven't heard him before, it's probably because he's he comes in every now and again on a show. Someone's out for a day or someone's sick. You might you might see Austin or hear of Austin's name mentioned by one of the hosts as he's filling in. Well, now I'm going to hear from the Cleveland Brown fan. That's really all I know about him as a sports guy. Uh, also, the Diamondback hat might suggest he's a Diamondback fan or he just or he just likes cool hats. I had a spray. I have a phase where I'll just wear hats that have nothing to do with the team I like, just because I like the hat. So we'll hear from Austin. Um, also, it's 11:30. Michael Carroll will be here to give us what we should and maybe shouldn't watch. He gave us the the banger to not watch Good Times, the animated series, and I've noticed on Netflix no one's watching it either. Because normally when Netflix has a a an IP and it's new, and it's something everyone recognizes, it'll be in the top ten. Good Times. Not so much. Uh, it's not recommended by anyone to watch. It appears, and uh, the step, the the executive producing Steph Curry thing, ain't helping the cause. Uh, so Michael Carroll dead on on that. We'll see what he has going forward. Uh, 
uh, maybe he has a great suggestion for something to watch, or maybe he's going to <laughs> he's going to tell you not to watch something that may be getting intention this this um, uh, this weekend. So we'll get to that at eleven thirty. But first, I want to tell you about this: the draft is. Less than a week away. I mean, the Texans won't have picked by this time next week, but they will be getting ready to pick to make their second-round selections. So you should be locked in with ESPN 97.5. We'll be your home for NFL draft coverage, and the only place in town to hear every single first-round selection on the radio is right here. So we're going to do, we're going to have the it, we're going to have the ESPN broadcast on Thursday, but on Friday, we're going to have a live and local show. Uh, it'll be me. Paul and Joe and others for our Texans draft show from 6 to 9 p.m. next Friday night. There's a question. I always question whether we can actually mention the Texans anything in these things because of the uh, that because of 610. But we're calling it a Texans draft show uh, from 6 to 9 p.m. here on the station. But once again, if you just like draft coverage, listen all week long. We know Lance will be out in L.A., but he will be doing the show despite his protests. John and Lance, our preeminent draft expert, will be here to answer your questions. But the station will have you covered. 6 p.m. on Thursday, the entire first round, and then the 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. show on Friday night as we get you through that second round and and maybe parts of the third round as the Texans make, start making their selection. So be aware of that uh, going forward. Just some, just some programming notes to be aware of as we get closer and closer to the draft. Speaking of the Texans, we'll get back to Casario. We'll, we'll get back to Cal. But, but first, we're going to hear from Austin. We'll talk to him when we come back.
The Del Olalea Show continues on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's your host, Del Olalea. Welcome back to the show. This segment is dedicated to getting to know Austin. Austin is a producer here. He, you probably have heard him, depending on, it surely has to do with logistics. If we have a producer out on remote or or out for the day, Austin will pop in when he's available to produce a show. You've probably heard, I don't know if, have you ever done the John Lance show? No, no, not, okay. not, I've only done uh, the B's. Uh, Gallant and George a few times and then your yeah. show once before. Oh, you've done this show before? Yeah, I think you were on remote and um, it was that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Last week we were on remote and I thought Michael Carroll was here and it turned out to be you. I do remember that. I guess not having the face in front of me had me forget pretty quickly. Um, I've gone, I want to warn you, I've gone through your Twitter account um, just to find out who you root for. He's a Browns, D-backs, Cavs, and Betrayed Yotes fan. That's in reference to the Coyotes moving to Utah. Um, he's been going through it, everybody. Uh, if I just go through his tweets, uh, the fact that the Phoenix Coyotes slash Arizona Coyotes, whatever you want to call them, uh, they've had a couple of names, are now going to Utah. Um, he he has been tweeting through it, which is it's cool. It's I mean, I would rough. do that probably rough. if I tweeted enough. Um, I would probably tweet through my misery. So you are a Sam Houston, Sam Houston grad. Uh, but explain, because... We had a guy call in who was a 49er Yankee, and I and uh, I don't know if he was a Warriors fan, but he 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 rooted for very popular. Uh, oh, he was a Bulls fan, so he rooted for all the teams you think you'd be a bandwagon fan for. This is not the case for you. So you've got you got multiple Arizona teams and two Cleveland teams. How did this come about? Well, I really like the city of Cleveland uh, after going there. Uh, I think in 2014 to, to watch the Browns Texans game and okay. I was already a Browns fan at that time, but uh, that just kind of solidified it for like the for like the Cavaliers and the Guardians, and um, yeah, Arizona a Coyotes fan. Still going to say the name to, until they come back because there is a chance they will come back. Okay. And then the D backs a lot of stuff with them, like a lot of cross promotion. So by I guess that way, I kind of adopted the Diamondbacks as like a second baseball team. So you, so the Diamondbacks and the Guardians. You went to go see a Texans Browns game, and you weren't even a Texans fan. But was someone you know a Texans fan? That's why you're there. Uh, oh yeah, my uh, dad took me up, up there. It was for my uh, high school senior trip. Oh okay. So we saw the schedule whenever it came out, and saw that it was my senior year. So decided to do that. So you, you had a resurgent Browns year. I mean, it came back in a came about in a very weird way uh, just because of the quarterbacks and how many you saw play and Diamondbacks make a World Series you've got one title and that was how old were you when they won like two, 2001 was it they won uh, against the Yankees oh yeah I, I was like four okay so you, if you remember it you barely remember <laughs> it uh, but th- but they're in the World Series last year and they lost to the Rangers which Astro fans certainly know unfortunately a lot about but this guy, the, the, but the Coyotes are gone. If we're gonna rank, as we get to the year, we're gonna rank your sports fandom. Which one? Which which title would mean more from which team? When they come back, the Coyotes. When? Excuse me, I, I might have said if. <laughs> um, let so the Coyotes title would mean the most. The hockey uh, title would mean the most. Yeah, yeah, they, they were my favorite team out of all of them. And would you adopt a Houston team? I. If we got one. I probably would if um, if like say the five-year window that the current uh, owner has to, like, build the arena and get an expansion team there. If that falls through but Tillman is able to get something, I would consider uh, jumping on board. Okay, so you're not against hope if it comes about where your Yotes don't come back. I didn't even know they shortened Coyotes to Yotes. Now I just saw it on your account, so now I know. Uh, If that happens, you would gladly adopt a Houston team. So you're a producer in this town at, at a sports station and don't root for any of the teams. So me and you are relatively kindred spirits. Mm-hmm. I will I will pick and root for – I root for the Astros. Baseball doesn't hold much of a place in my heart overall. Mm-hmm. So I will root for the Astros. That's easy for me. Um, I, I root for the Rockets when they're not playing my favorite team. That's easy. And the Texans – it's great if they're good. Um, I don't. I'm. I don't have a passion. Like if they lose, I'm not gonna be down. I'm not gonna put on a jersey, uh, which is something you've made pretty clear too. Because when the Browns were in town mm-hmm. a couple times, you put on Browns jerseys, uh, which 
I mean, no one here is going to fight you. Yeah. We don't. We don't. We don't care about it that much. But um, so you did you go to the playoff game? No, I was working that day. Oh, uh, you. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Sucks on both and both. Well, you didn't have to go watch a beat down. I guess I don't. It know started that, out good. <laughs> it it did until until the Texans kind of got control and then of course a couple pick sixes at the hands of uh. Joe Flacco kind of put that game away. So we know about your sports fandom. Like this show, if you produced it more often, you'd probably have to give TV opinions. What, what do you do? You watch anything that would fit the show? Because you heard me talk about Shogun. We're gonna have Michael Kerr on at eleven thirty to talk about if you want to call it nerd culture, or just pop culture television shows. Where are we at? Are you a Law and Order fan? Are you watching Lost? What do we? What where are you at with TV? I don't really follow like storyline series. I guess you can call them that. I'm more like a singular episode type of show guy just mindless like put it on just watch as background so yeah yeah pretty much so you don't have a favorite show is what you're saying um uh, i don't think so no wow well yeah you wouldn't fit it <laughs> uh so tv is not your thing what about so what are you entertaining yourself with if it's not sports then if it's not going to be tv uh i do listen to a lot of music okay. and um i'm trying to get into reading but i just can't find the time right now so so you would so you are if we're not talking about sports you're like hey what are we doing is that what is that what it is are you just um, as far as every day is, does it take the sports just take up most of your life uh it, it keeps me busy okay yeah you got yeah this yeah, there are other things everyone has a, a life outside mm -hmm. of uh, sports so so I would say I couldn't go to you on Shogun right I couldn't <laughs> go to you on uh, the new Godzilla movies that are that have been out or, or will come out. Not right now, but I could like find time if need. I be. wouldn't. No, I'm not gonna force you to watch yeah. a television show. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, I mean, Sean is doing it because uh, he's part of the show on a more consistent basis. But I, 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 I won't call it tragic. But the Browns thing and the Cavs thing, outside of LeBron stuff, it's, it's a rough go for you, man. And then you got your favorite hockey team leaving. Does even a? You're not from Arizona, so doesn't how does it affect you that much that it, you won't root for them when they're in Utah? Uh, no, I won't. But it affects me because they are the team that got me into the sport. So I think with that, it just kind of it's it's like seeing like if they, what if they kept what if they were the Salt Lake Coyotes and the colors remain the same? That would hurt worse. OK, OK. I'm trying to figure out because it's never happened to me where my one of my favorite teams. I know it's happened here. And of course, eventually the team, the team, they got another team. And a lot of people went with the Titans. Some people stayed and I, I get both sides of it. But yeah, I, I don't know what that's like, but. Um, maybe it's because ho hockey's probably third or fourth on the list, but I, I get it. Um, we, we, we won't be rooting for the Utah, whatever they are. Yeah. Uh, you will just hope and pray that the, that Phoenix, uh, slash Arizona gets another team. And for the time being, I will hope the players do well, but I also hope that they leave as fast as they can. So you want... I like, I like the core that they were building before all this happened. So you're a little vindictive. You hope the thing falls off the face of the earth. Yeah, yeah, but I hope the players, the players do that it. are long gone whenever that starts to happen. Gotcha. Yeah. If a if a new bunch of players suffer, who cares? Yeah. But but, yeah. but your current guys, your your boys, the ones you root for on a daily basis, um, are good. I understand, I understand. I understand uh, the empathy and also screw the rest of it. Um, mm -hmm. I I completely I completely get it. So that's that's just a little bit about Austin. I just want to get to know him a little bit because uh, who knows? Depending on if Sean has another day off. Um, I I will have I'll be working with them and I know what not to go to not TV and <laughs> yeah. not movies but if it's but if it's uh, Phoenix Arizona sports um, he's my guy um, so if a big story happens just be aware Austin you may be the guy I go to for information if something happens right. about with the Cavs okay speaking of that uh, you think the Cavs bounce back from last year's playoff failure and do, do you think they beat the Magic it's gonna be tough um, I think it goes. Seven, just because I don't know much about Orlando. I don't really follow outside of the Cavs, but you're not alone. No, not a lot of people know about the Orlando Magic. Yeah. They're just an anonymous team that, despite winning their division, not that that matters in basketball anymore, but mm. being a five seed, people are like, eh, well, Apollo and who yeah. and the, and the Wagner brothers. But other than that, I don't know how many how many people. Follow. I'll give them the respect, though. I think I think it will go seven. Just because. and you think the Cavs win this one, though? Yeah, I, I do believe so. Okay, yeah. so you were good with them tanking a game against Charlotte to not have to be the two seed. Yeah. I mean, it you, is what it is. Because you could, if you, if we saw Joel Embiid on, on what was it, Wednesday, he didn't look right. I mean, mm -hmm. the Sixers found a way to, to claw out a victory. But if we're talking about 
facing a team who doesn't have a, a healthy superstar. I might have, I know they're playing a game where they didn't want to see the Sixers or the Heat, but if it's that version of the Sixers, yeah, I, I, I think they might have made the wrong decision. You're going to see a healthy Magic team who probably senses a bit of disrespect considering how the Cavs handled that final game. Um, but, hey, you get, you get the Magic, they're inexperienced, and certainly you don't want to drop a second series in a row uh, when you have home court advantage oh, yeah. in the first round, which means pro- – well, it might happen anyway, but it probably means the end of Donovan Mitchell – in uh, in Cleveland, if I don't want to bring bad news to you, <laughs> but if they don't win this series, even more impetus for Donovan Mitchell to say quietly because he won't. I don't think he'll come out publicly and say it, but let it be known that he wants out and then a trade because if he's not going to resign, you can't let him go for nothing. I've prepped myself to expect him to. You're be used gone. to stars leaving that yeah. team, so you're you're kind of you're kind of aware. If that, he stays great, but it's like I've kind of already prepared myself for the inevitable. You're locked in. You're gonna. My guys are Garland and Mobley, yeah. and uh, and and Allen. Those are the guys that I'm gonna lean on going forward, and probably the right decision. Uh, but the playoffs begin Saturday tomorrow, and but we got two playing game, games tonight. You got the Heat versus the Sixers. The six, excuse me, not the Sixers. The Bulls. The Heat will be without Jimmy Butler. So that sound we played yesterday of Jimmy Butler's agent railing against reports that he wasn't gonna be available because no one knew. Well, it turns out the, the reports are right. They were right. Shams and Woj, mostly Shams was the guy he took issue with, reported that Jimmy Butler, before they even had an MRI, that he was going to be out several weeks. And turns out he's going to be out several weeks several weeks with an MCL injury, so he's not available tonight. He won't be available in the future. And one Miami reporter put, put the timeline like timeline like this, that he would have to beat the Celtics and then win the second round before they would see Jimmy Butler. So, yeah, uh, I know the reporter wants to control the narrative, but – Turns out the reports were right. And then you also have the Kings versus the Pelicans and no Zion in that one. So you've got major stars out as uh, the teams who are on the road have a real chance to get to the eighth seed. And then if the Bulls win, they see the Celtics. And if the Kings win, they see the Oklahoma City Thunder. So the playoffs begin tomorrow. The play-in elimination games are tonight. So a good, good three days for NBA basketball and hopefully – Hopefully they're great games, and and hopefully um, we get some great games. At least a winning weekend out of the Nationals. I'm not even asking you to sweep sweep the Nationals. Just take two out of three, please. Um, let's 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 end the misery that has been the first 20 games. One hour in the books, as I mentioned, Michael Carroll will join us at 11:30. We're gonna hear from Nick Casario on the other side about whether players want to come to Houston and what that might mean, or if he even thinks that's a thing when we come back.
Welcome back to the show, second hour of the program. And the big news beyond Nick Casario and him talking and answering some questions and dancing around others um, <laughs> was Cal McNair. Cal McNair, in response to the helmet leak, went to, and I call it big news because it's a Thursday afternoon with no local teams playing, so big news is relative. But Cal, through the... Houston Texans Twitter account tweeted out a picture of him in a hat, a new hat with the new secondary logo, his dog with a diamond chain with the secondary logo and his giant grill. Cause we know the cow brand includes flipping burgers and uh, kissing babies. And the problem for uh, the problem for one company is there is a website on, on the grill. And this company was one one crop away from getting free publicity. I'm sure. I'm sure the Texans had took probably got a different side, a different crop picture, and go. You know what? We can't. We're not giving anybody free promo. So I know what this, who this company is because we've heard them on this air before. Uh, but they were just this close. They're getting plenty of free promo. You can see it. You you, you pull up the picture uh, from the Houston Texans official account. You see Cal up in front of his big house, uh, kneeling down, throwing up the H. Hat tilted to the side. I uh, got, a, I guess, a black lab uh, with the diamond chain. And just to the left, left of, left of the picture, left in the picture, a company. One crop away from all that free pub. But the Texans said, nah. A little more work has to be done if you want to figure out who they are. So uh, that was what I took from it, other than, you know, a giant house for a rich, a rich man. And the Calvary Brown is crazy to me, man. The fact that this guy is... I won't call him a mascot. That would be disrespectful. He's, But he is the at the forefront of the, the new Texans. When he's not sitting down with Hannah, during, do, when they're doing their whole first family of Houston of football and Houston stuff, they're not doing the rounds. He is the guy they put out front. Sure, you've got C.J. Stroud. You've got Tank. You've got all, you've got all these guys to be excited about. But when, they, but when they want to push stuff, it's the sun – of the ex, well, he's not the ex owner. He passed away, but he's the he's the son who was everyone who made fun of him. He's the guy everyone made fun of. Now he's the guy everyone looks to when they want Texans content. Cal McNair is one of the greatest glow ups, and I say glow up. He hasn't done anything except put on a hat. The mustache remains. He throws up the H, puts up a hat. He flips some burgers, and the rebrand is complete. The marketing team didn't have to do much. They just told Cal to put on a hat, and everyone loves him. And we know what that's about. The team's good. At least they had a good year. And now and now, oh, now we can't get enough of Cal. Just wait. I'm not predicting a bad season, but I can't wait for some of you. If it doesn't go well early for you to turn on Cal. Enough of the H's. Just win games. That's where unfortunately, unfortunately, that's where we are with the Texans. I won't compare back of the baseball card to Cal throwing up the H. But if the Texans start poorly next year, all that H throwing and burger flipping, Cal's gonna catch it. No one likes a cool owner when things are bad, when things are going bad. That's why most owners don't make appearances and don't do anything. Cal's unique in that regard, as as long as well as um Hannah. They're out in the forefront because the good times are rolling. Just wait, we'll see. Le- we'll see less and less of them if uh, if this if the sophomore slump that I don't expect from CJ Stroud occurs. You got a good quarterback. You got to feel good, and it's a lot of good vibes for the Texans. They're uh, responding to leaks by putting Cal McNair, of all people, and his dog at the forefront. But, hey, it works. Everyone's saying, that's my owner. That's my owner. He was your owner two years ago, too, and we and we, and we know how you felt about that. Uh, but shout-out to Cal McNair for hiring the right coach. And uh, if some reports are to be, be believed, pushing to draft the quarterback, and that quarterback happened to be the right one as well. Well, the guy who is building the team beyond the quarterback position is Nick Casario. And we, we we go on with what he said yesterday. And he was asked about the thought that people want to come here. He talked about, it's been talked about all offseason, that people want to be here. And we'll get to that a little bit later because there are more questions about team building going forward um, that he answered. But he, but he asked about the trade. He was asked about the trade and how it came about the Stefan Diggs trade. And, you know... I mentioned that the the Texans weren't seeking out Stephon Diggs, 
but but it came to them and they made a move. So they f- they moved on from Keenan Allen and went to Stefan Diggs and this is Casario explaining the process. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't really know what that means. I think uh, looks like uh, we, we we got crossed up there. So when we uh, when we have that ready, Austin will let me know uh, because he, it wasn't something as I mentioned they searched out. It it kind of fell to them and they made an aggressive move, and that's all you can ask for. Uh, when you see an opportunity, you go make a play, and 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 that's what they did. And now they have they have a wide receiver core that compares to the best in the league, if not the best. We can talk about the top in, and maybe it's the Ayuk. Debo combo in San Francisco or the the Hill Waddle combo in Miami, you can name others. But when we talk about a, a, a trio, and then you throw in the tight end of Dalton Schultz, I don't know if you can find a better combo or at least a, a better foursome as far as a pass catchers. And then throwing Joe Mixon, he's a guy you can use out of the backfield too. Uh, but this is this is Casario talking about how they how this trade came about and what led to them acquiring Stephon Diggs. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't really know what that means. That sounds like the same clip. So we're having a little issue with our with our system. So we'll 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 get to that when we come back. We're we're due for a break anyway. So we'll hear from Casario on the other side about how the trade came about. And we'll we'll talk about some stuff beyond Houston because Antonio Brown's been blocked by the biggest star in women's sports because some of the things he said. And it's not surprising. If you know what he said, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say all of it, but I'll allude to it and you can figure it out. It's not surprising Caitlin Clark said enough of you, Antonio Brown. Why would she be any different from most of us who don't have much time for him? But he attacked her directly. Uh, we'll get into that. We'll also talk about a weird, a weird knock on a Texas wide receiver who'll be in the draft. We've talked about A.D. Mitchell quite a bit on the show, and there's a report about why he's someone you might not want on your team. It's weird. We'll talk about it. Other stuff to get to. We'll be back. That was something like.
Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's the Dell Olalea Show. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Dell Olalea. That was something like I don't think we were really anticipating, um, but, you know, I think we had some conversations at different points, um, and ultimately it was able to come to fruition, and we felt that, you know, it made sense, it made sense for us to pursue. So um, I'd say we talked to, talked to a lot of teams about a lot of different things at different points, um, and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, Steph can come in here, and Steph's been a productive player, so if we can come in here and help our team in some capacity. That was Nick Cotero discussing how the dig trade came about. Didn't pursue it. Didn't wasn't something that was on the front of mind, but it but it fell to them and they made a move and aggressively made the trade, found a, a distressed asset, if you you can say that. A Bills team desperate to get out of the Stefan Diggs business and it and it didn't cost them much. It's not gonna cost them very much in the future too if it doesn't work out this year. So um if we're talking about the we're in it now, we're in it to win it, and we're all in now, it's 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 a move um that you can you can Applaud if you all, if you think the Texans are close. If you don't think they're close and you'd rather have a second round pick, then <laughs> you can push back. But I don't think I don't think I've seen a lot of pushback in regarding the compensation, maybe the restructure of the trade that Casario danced around. Didn't really answer uh, that question when asked about it. But hey, you go get your, you go go get yourself a star receiver and hopefully it works out for you. I mentioned Ad Mitchell before we went to break. He is a player that it's probably a second round pick. There are some questions about his hands. Um, the report I, I continue to remember is someone said he catches hands. He he catches the football like he's got tennis rackets for hands. That's not a compliment for a wide receiver. It's it's rough. Our preeminent draft expert doesn't think that is a proper a proper evaluation of his hands. There are some questions about it. Sometimes he'll double, double catch a football. He's not always smooth uh, when he's bringing the ball in. But the tennis rackets for hands thing aggressive uh, and Lance Sterling doesn't particularly agree with that but a scout told Bob McGinn this about A.D. Mitchell and we've heard a lot of weird things about players some of them are too nice um, and that's why they don't want him on the team I've they don't have great football character that's something that maybe resonates more than he's too nice to be a pro player but this is what Bob McGinn says about A.D. Mitchell or excuse me Bob McGinn was told about A.D. Mitchell you're going to have to assign somebody to be next to him for his first few years because his issues are all about diabetes and his blood sugar. And uh, when his blood sugar's off, he's rude. He's abrasive. He doesn't pay attention in meetings. It's why you get really, really bleep character reports coming out of Georgia and Texas. Before you even get to the diabetic part, he's kind of going to do it to do it his way. He's a little bit of a wild horse. You're going to, you're, you've got to see if you can harness him in. Then once you do that, he doesn't address the diabetic stuff in a mature way. He's very much a boomer bust type of guy. So low blood sugar is what you have to worry about with A.D. Mitchell. Make sure he's had his. Make sure he takes his insulin. I don't. All the things that have to take place for you to be good when you have di, when you have diabetes. Wow, I don't think I've ever heard that one. Uh, his attitude issues are because he's diabetic and doesn't take his blood sugar. He uh, doesn't take his diabetes and his and, and his medication. Uh, he doesn't take his his diabetes diagnosis well uh, or seriously, and he doesn't do well when it comes to managing it. Okay. Uh, that's the weirdest thing I've heard this year about a prospect. <laughs> I think I think I prefer the the tennis rackets for hands if I was A.D. Mitchell. The man is diabetic, and that's not good for him, as far as his football career is concerned. Well, we'll see. I guess if we're gonna blame if we're gonna blame my crappy attitude on something, bl- blame it on a medical diagnosis as opposed to oh he's just a cr- he's just a he's just an a hole. He's an a hole because he's a diabetic. I don't know if I've ever heard that before. Uh, but uh, but these are the things you start to hear, maybe not to that extreme, but you start to hear that when uh, when the draft gets closer and closer. Guys have guys are asked questions. Sometimes they're a little free with their words, and the AD Mitchell slander is out there. So if you had any thoughts on maybe you're not a Texans fan, but Texans fan, but you like the University of Texas and you like that prospect, just know he doesn't hire he doesn't handle his diabetes very well, and that's why some scouts are down on him. Hopefully he can overcome that um, and, be, and become a, a productive wide receiver because he has skills. You watched him against Georgia, excuse me, for Georgia, and in the playoffs, even with Texas. He makes big catches in playoff games. He, he played at a program at Texas that wasn't going to feature wide receivers, but when they needed plays in big moments, he stepped up. And we know 
against the University of Alabama for Texas, he made big plays, and he did it against Washington. We saw his reaction when he finally got a chance. He was a little upset that he didn't get more chances. So there's some thoughts that he isn't a guy who cares or tries very hard when he knows the ball's not coming to him. I would appreciate that evaluation over the diabetic one. So there are concerns about him, but he is a supremely talented player who, if he can get over the tennis racket for hands and the diabetic, and the inability to handle his diabetes, he could be a great player, according to scouts. These are the t- That's the type of analysis you get, uh, depending on how a scout feels on a player. So just beware. Don't take everything s- seriously when you hear, when you hear evaluations because one man's opinion could be another man's trash, depending on the player and the men making those evaluations. So A.D. Mitchell. A guy to be on the lookout for probably on the second day. I don't think he'll be taken in the first round. Although a run a run on wide receivers may change that, but you could probably expect A.D. Mitchell to be a second day pick. The first overall pick in the WNBA draft has made a move. Kaylin Clark has blocked Antonio Brown. If you didn't see it, you're lucky. I saw it because a lot of stuff comes up on my for you page because I'm always looking for sports stuff. So Antonio Brown's going to come up. Um, he thinks he has a news network, uh, but this one had nothing to do with news. He made a comment about Caitlin Clark's grooming, and I'm not going to tell you what type of grooming. Just look it up if you if you so choose. He made a comment, and he's not been kind to her, so she decided, okay, enough, enough, Antonio Brown, and he, a lot of people like and feed off being blocked, and Antonio Brown certainly did too. Um, he's compared Clark to Mel Gibson, and he, I guess he's consistently consistently called her cousin it from the Adams family, but that ain't the most egregious thing. Like I said, I'm not going to talk about it, but you can find it. Um, so she's had enough. I think, I think the one that I won't mention is the one that put her over the top. And, of course, like I said, people like when they get blocked. So he called her – how do I – he called her – it's not really a slur, I guess, but it's a – I guess it's a, the C word for white people. He called her that. He called her the the Ritz of the day. You can figure out what that means. And then he said, blocked by Cousin It. After quote tweeting the picture of her blocking him. So for whatever reason, it's Antonio Brown has decided to go after Caitlin Clark. Maybe it's for clout. Maybe he generally doesn't like shooting guards taking 35-foot jumpers. I don't know what it's about, but he doesn't like her. Uh, and, and she has responded by saying, enough. I don't want to see what you have to say about me anymore. Nothing about it is positive and she's had an she had an interesting I don't know 72 hours dealing with men in sports first it was Greg Doyle at the Indy Star when he did the whole hey you know if you don't know Caitlin Clark when she when she wants to send a signal to her her family she'll do the little heart hands the Jeremy Pena uh, she'll do that to to her fans or excuse me her her family and Greg Doyle of Indy Star a guy who's been doing it a long time in in Indianapolis, did it to her when she looked to him for a question, and then she responded like, okay, I do that that to my my family when I want to send a little hello to them. And he goes, if you do it to me, uh, we'll we'll get along just fine. I can't even even describe how creepy it was hearing it. We don't see him when he does it. We just see her reaction to it, and it's it's the proper one. She's a little uncertain about what he's doing. Um, and then you top it off with um, with Antonio Brown and his stuff. I guess it comes with the territory of being really famous and people want to pay attention to you. There's going to be a lot of good that comes from Caitlin Clark and her fame. These last couple of, of things, not great. What is great is her deal with Nike. She is the third WNBA player to have a to have an, an exclusive shoe. It's her, Sabrina Anescu. And Brianna Stewart, those are the three. She is. Uh, they all got them before they actually ever played in a WNBA game. So Nike likes to j- jump on very early. And uh, the Sabrina, Sabrina ones are shoes that men in the NBA wear. Uh, they love that shoe. They said they say it reminds them of the Kobe. Uh, so we'll see what what the Caitlin Clark shoe is like. But she's got a signature shoe. She's got a big deal from Nike. So all those concerns about how much money she was making, don't have to worry about it. Nike's got her covered um, if the WNBA salary isn't up to snuff, which some of you took issue with this this week. And the WNBA deal is going to come up soon, so those those numbers are probably going to change pretty quickly when the new CBA for them comes about. 
But most importantly, she's blocked Antonio Brown. And honestly, what what possible thing could be productive by her being able to see what he says about her? I think she made a good decision. When we come back, Michael Carroll will join us. He will give you opinions and recommendations on the best things to watch going forward or things you shouldn't watch. Maybe it's the equivalent of an Antonio Brown tweet. We'll find out. we got a couple more segments to go on the show. We'll be back.
that some guy is here. Sean Mapes is not, but <laughs> Michael Carroll is here with us, and he'll give us his opinions on what we should or should not watch. He is the host of Comicast. You can listen to that every Friday from 9 to 10 here on ESPN 97.5. He does that with the former producer for The Blitz, Zhang Lee. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can hear that. It's a If you go to the... The podcast version of it, whether you're on Spotify or Apple, it's a two-parter this this week. They have two episodes that you can listen to. Uh, this week on ESPN 975, they're giving you an hour, which it's going to be great. But if you want more, they're going to have they're going to have their, the, a two-parter that you can listen to going forward. And it'll be pretty good, and it won't be the equivalent of an Antonio Brown tweet. I'm, sometimes I'm in a haze, so I don't <laughs> I don't remember who what I was comparing that tweet to. Um, but yeah, Antonio Brown. If he tweets about you, it's generally not going to go well. No, it's not good. I, I will say, I will say, I'm a Caitlin Clark, Clark fan, so yeah. I won't be tweeting about things like that. Yeah, uh, she's going to be likely very, very good on the WNBA level. Mm-hmm. There's going to be there's going to be plenty to tweet about. Not what <laughs> one Mr. Brown decided he wanted to attack her for, uh, and she has decided. I'm out on that, which is probably a, Understandable. Good, a good idea. Now, you were out on Good Times, the animated yes. show on Netflix, yeah. and it looks like the rest of the viewing world was out on it, too. Uh, it's It has IP, it has a name, and and it didn't make Netflix Netflix's top ten, which would suggest probably not a lot of interest. I wonder why. Yeah, it was aggressive. Steph Curry, uh, while you're do- dealing with Wash Clay Thompson, maybe put out a better <laughs> animated show he's the executive producer or at least one of them behind the show now i don't i'm generally a positive guy you right? are I, gen- definitely. I i like to promote the positivity around here with like the different recommendations and whatnot and that like it was a thing that i was like i really don't think people should watch it i don't want it to be a regular thing but I will say I do have something else you do, shouldn't Ooh. watch this weekend. Str- you feel as strongly about this one as you did about uh, Good Times? Mm, maybe not as strongly as Good Times, just because I think Good Times, was the, like at least the trailer was kind of offensive. Yeah. This one, I'm more just like, it's not a good Should we wait? Movie. Should we start with the positive first or go with the No, negative? I want to rip this band-aid oh, off. Okay. I want to rip this band-aid uh, off. Michael's got some smoke for something. Uh, <laughs> well, uh... I don't know if you watched a little movie last year called Rebel Moon. Oh, you're telling me Scar Giver is terrible? Uh, it's uh, about the same. Okay. It's, it's about the same of what, you, what you've gotten from Zack Snyder films as of late. A lot of slow-mo, a lot of good cinematography, but that's about it. You're about to get that this weekend as well if you watch it on Netflix. Did you know I saw somewhere that Scar Giver... It's like maybe two of a potential six. Yes, he, that they want that he wanted to do. He said something about yeah, I want to do six of these, and it's like I don't well, know like, what story you have in this brain of yours. But through, I, through the first two, at least according to Michael Carroll, not 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 a great story. Have you seen Rebel? I Man? saw the first one. It, like you eh. said, it's a very Zack Snyder. I mean, I didn't have a strong opinion one, one way or the other, which is probably a problem for a movie of that that uh, genre. You're probably supposed to. Considering all the work he put in for yeah. the shots, you're supposed to, and it's supposed to be a story that pulls you in, and it's supposed to be this grand epic, yeah, right? It's supposed you're supposed to be locked in. I'm like, eh, whatever. No, no, I just watched a lot of slow mo for like the two hours or yeah. whatever it was, and it's just like, also, it's Netflix. They let Scorsese do a three and a half hour Irishman movie. Why are you doing like, oh, I'm gonna do this movie, Rebel Moon, but then there's an extended version that I'll eventually release. Like, just release the movie. Like, it's not the same as, like, you're doing a studio so, version. So or there's an extended version of Rebel Moon? There's an extended version of Rebel Moon? Is that Moon? out? Not yet. Okay. There's an extended version of this film that just came out? Wait a minute. We just saw on, well, not just saw, but on Max, he was able to get the Snyder cut on there, yeah. and that was a long-ass movie. Why, yeah. why wouldn't Netflix, that, why couldn't he just do it? You're I, right. Why that, wouldn't he? It's it a streaming no service. Just do it. It's, it. That's their thing. They were like, hey, do what you want to do. Okay, I'm going to edit it down, and then I'm going to do another version where I don't edit just it down. Just put out the, the long-form just version of the it. Movie. Just the movie. That's all you got to do. Who, who, you don't have to. Play the theatrical release game. Just put out your movie. It's absurd. <laughs> it's, it makes no sense. I, I got so I, if if I was so inclined, I gotta sit through an extended version of this story that's going nowhere. Which like okay, like if you like, I get the appeal of director's cuts when they're done right. Yeah, but like if it takes you four hours to tell a good story, because like like the extended version of Batman vs Superman, it is better than the it, other version. It is yes. 
but it shouldn't take you three and a half. Like, it, it doesn't take and you. And to be fair, it's not taking him four hours. He he thinks this story should take, what, 12? Yeah, I guess, 13, yeah, because there's six hours. of them. Yeah. yeah, and could you imagine six extended cut versions of his oh story? God. A 24 hour. Oh he wants God. you to watch from midnight to, to midnight. He really wants to do his own, like, which I think he kind of does, a Snyder Con. Yeah. And just have all his movies playing all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so yeah. So you have watched Scargiver. Did you get a? F- no, are you just telling people no, 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 not no. to watch? it? I'm just telling people not to watch it. But I, I'm gonna probably watch it because I watched the first one. Yeah. But, so I can better tell you. But like from what I've seen, don't watch it. So Michael, Man. sight unseen, he's got no. a feeling. He's I, got a feeling. I got a feeling. Like as soon as like this is the same thing with Good Times. No, again, not the, not quite offensive, but it was like okay, I'm watching it on my phone. This is this is just unnecessary. This more, is unnecessary more than anything. This I, is unnecessary. The problem for me is I love unnecessary, <laughs> so I'm probably gonna watch because I love to see what's what was billowing in his mind to fi- to make to make him think I got six of these <laughs> in the tuck. And he's got Anthony Hopkins, who yeah, as a as a robot, as a robot, you never see his face. Yeah, and, and a voice is what we have of Anthony like, Hopkins. He's this big part in the beginning of the movie. Don't see him again. True. Until the very, the very end. end, yeah. Then there's two like action sequences. This is a Rebel Moon. I'm talking about the first one. There's two sequences that take about 20 minutes, that are literally just recruiting moments. That's all it was, and it was just an excuse to do something cool on screen. Yeah, adds zero to the rest of the story, which is the Zack Snyder way. Yeah, exactly. I don't have a real negative feeling about him. I I just watch his movies and think, why am I here? <laughs> You should listen to Jong. He <laughs> he has a real he has feel. A, okay. He has a feel. Okay. He has a feel. So listen to Comic Cast. Yeah, Comic Cast. Just saying. Nine, 9 to 10 tonight or the whole podcast version which is on Spotify or Apple any place you can find your 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 uh, podcast any place you listen Comic Cast will be there. So we've gone from we've gone we ended last week with good times. Not don't watch it. We started this week with the the scar giver. Don't yeah, watch it. Don't watch it. What do you think we should watch? So if you're going out to the theaters, I'd recommend Abigail. That is good and good reviews, surprisingly, considering the subject matter. I wouldn't yeah. imagine. I'm I'm into the the whole vampire stuff. Yeah. I like that. I, but considering this, how it sets up, and I would just imagine people would think it was bad. That's what I, I was expecting it to be bad. Like, that's what I was expecting. But all reports, everyone that's seen it so far is raving about the it's a horror comedy. For one, it's about a group of people that are, I guess, duped into kidnapping this child that is a ballerina and also happens to be a vampire. The big surprise is it's a murderous vampire. Yeah, murderous vampire. And to be be fair, I'm I'm sure some... It's less scary to deal with a vampire than a ballet kid. And it's it's also apparently more comedy. Like, it's a balance between horror and comedy. And and horror, like, gross, like, you know, gore and stuff like that. But it, it... and and I should say also, when we do this segment, I'm typically I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm not gonna recommend a lot of horror movies. Horror is not my bag. Gotcha. It's just not it's just not me. I get scared. I get scared easily. Okay. I'm sorry. But horror comedy or something something along those lines, I'm with it. So I, I'm I would recommend Abigail. I would also recommend because I'm a guy Ritchie fan and I, every trailer I've seen of this so far I've really enjoyed. The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, the new Henry Cavill film. Okay. All about it. It's sort of a kind of true story, so it's you know it's a lot of over exaggeration and whatnot. Yeah. But it the the look and feel of it, it's it just feels like a fun action romp for the okay. for it. It's a set in World War II, um, and a group of I don't know how to, like just a group of misfits, if you will. Yeah, it's a are, lot of it's a lot of faces you will recognize. Yes. Henry Cavill, uh, the the most prominent. Yes, b- but. Um, Alan Richardson's in it, who yeah. who plays Reacher. Yes. Um. So all, and so all these na- faces you'll, you'll recognize. You'll see if you're into that. Uh. What was that? That T. I don't know what it's called, but it was a, it was a book series that they turned into a a long like four or five movies. It's pretty much. Hey, are we going to get together? Are we? Gonna, oh, are we not? Yeah, I yeah. forgot what it was called. The, yeah. at, the after series. I think it was called something. Yeah. yeah. The the star of that the the male lead in that is in it. Henry Gold and mm-hmm. Carrie. Carrie, I always say, I always want to say Yules, but it's Elways, right? I believe so. Carrie yeah. Elways um, from The Princess Bride, mm-hmm. long ago, mm-hmm. another facial recognized. So, getting good reviews. So they're in line with what uh, Michael's thinking. So these are movies you you should go see. Yeah, if you if you want to go to the theater this weekend, I would recommend those two. I'm 
and I'm not going to necessarily recommend this movie. I'm not going to necessarily don't watch this movie, but Sasquatch Sun- Sunset. Is that out? It's out this weekend. <sighs> I, I, I have, I'm not going to tell you not to, but I'm also not going to tell you you should. It's a you at your own pace. At your we, own we've talked speed. about this before because yes. I saw the trailer yes. and mistook it for a monkey movie because I, I saw so many monkey trailers yeah. um, leading up to that point. Yeah. It's it's a it's a as you said a Sasquatch a fictional char- fictional character about a fictional family. Sasquatches will be having sex. They'll be living <laughs> their lives like a, like a normal family unit, I guess. Just watch the trailer. And there are no words right being spoken. It's just it's th- because Sasquatches don't. It's not like. Did Harry and the Henderson, did that Sasquatch speak? I don't think so. I don't think he did. So yeah. Sasquatches, from what we know, don't talk. Uh, so they yeah. won't be talking in this movie. You'll have you'll have um, Riley Keel, who is the granddaughter of Elvis Presley. Mm-hmm. You have Jesse Eisenberg. Um, so a lot, but you can't tell because they're going to be Sasquatches. They're going to be Sasquatches for this duration is of it, this movie. Is it Sasqu- Sasquatches? Or is Sasquatch I? Sasquatch I. I don't know the plural. I don't know. Generally, you're only supposed to see one yeah. if you see one at all. I don't, I, I don't know either. But now you get a family of them. So there's that if you want to watch it this weekend. The other thing that I would say, like, streaming-wise... Just catch up on Shogun because that is absolutely phenomenal. Fantastic, yes. And I finished Fallout earlier this okay. week. Man, that show's so good. It is. It it's has really no good. business being that good, but it's really considering good. Considering when you look at the tra- when you see the trailer, it's a little funky, it's a little weird. You, and yeah. of course, you see the ghoul, you see Walton Goggins without a nose. You might start to, huh, what is this? Yeah. And exactly. you hear video game adaption. There are a lot of things that lead to you thinking, and you see giant monsters. A lot of things that make you think, eh, what is this show? Is this not going to be any good? Yeah. It's really good. No, it's it's a even, really good really, show. Even the you know video game people can be very territorial, and even they very are like, true. It, we like this show. It's it is one of the better video game adaptations, but I would I would also argue kind of like The Last of Us, it's just a good t- a show. I it, think yes, it's just a good. show. It's yeah. just a good show. It's absurd, but also at the same time can balance between emotional arcs. It it left me wanting to like not like turn it off, and I, 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 I was, was impressed by that. I had lower expectations because it it can be hit or miss when it comes to video game adaptations. This one works on a lot of levels. I agree. I don't normally bring recommendations. This show is on Hulu, and it just began its run they, with a two-episode premiere, Under the Bridge. It's set in the oh, yes, in I the 90s. This. Uh, I mentioned Riley Keel. She is one mm-hmm. of the stars of the show. Also, Lily Gladstone mm-hmm. from, what's the movie called again? Oh, uh, Killers of the Killers Flower, of Flower Moon. Killers of Flower Moon, the, mm-hmm. the, the lead actress in that, star of that movie. She's in this, too. She plays a police officer. It's about a, and it's not a great feelings as far as the storyline is no. concerned. It's about a, a girl who goes missing. Um, and then eventually we find out, well, I'll let you watch the show before I tell you uh, <laughs> any more. But the premise is a, a young girl who's in a group of a friend group, uh, a friend group of girls. She goes mm-hmm. missing and they unravel how this occurred and what happened. Uh, and like I said, you won't have good feelings about it, but at least through two episodes, it's compelling. And speaking of that, something that I forgot to mention that and I didn't get a chance to watch the first episode. So I'm going to try and catch up on it this weekend. The Sympathizer on HBO okay. and HBO well, not HBO Max anymore, but Max with Robert Downey Jr. And, oh, man, I forget the rest of the cast. But the sympathizer set in Vietnam War, I believe. I think it's Vietnam era. Yeah, Vietnam so. era. Um, it's, yeah, I I forget the premise off the top of my head, but that's a show that I, I think is definitely, like, it's definitely one that's intriguing me okay. based off what I've seen so far so about it. we've given you plenty of positive. Yeah. I mean, the one negative is the Scar Giver. Of course, yeah. if you watch the first one, I get it. If you want to watch the second one, I'm, yeah. kind, I'm a kind of a completist, too. So when I see the first part, I have to see the second part. But if I hear, like, we're going three through six, so I, that's <laughs> going to be a tough run for me, man. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to sit through because of Zack Snyder, you're pro- if we're talking about former movies, they're probably at least 12 hours. Oh, 100%. Yeah, like, at I, least. Yeah, no, I... I Hard pass. Yeah. That's that's why I like like this movie, like he made some point about it being like the most watched movie or having more views or whatever than Barbie or whatever he said. And it was like, bro, I had that thing on my phone while I was cooking. Yeah. Like it I, was on. I don't remember it much on. from it. I can't tell you a character name. I, so sure I watched it, but I, I'm not sure you, I watched it in the way you would want yeah, me to watch it. Like I wouldn't I, I calm down, bro. Honestly, I can't tell you a I know who's in the movie by actor, but I can't tell you a character name from that movie. I honestly can't tell you outside of Charlie Hunnam's in that movie. Don't remember his character name. So Sophia Botella. Botella. Scar Giver. I don't know. It's what her usually name is. the other way around for the yeah. most part. We remember character names, not actor names. In this one, 
He got a lot of prominent faces. Mm-hmm. I just don't remember what they were called. No, no, I don't. I, a lot of them, I don't know that they all got names there, or it, it might have been just nicknames okay. or something like that too. Like it's, it's again, cinematography wise, pretty good. Like it's solid, but. If you want to just turn your brain off for something that kind of bites off of Star Wars and other stuff, like yeah. hey, watch it. If you're in a sci-fi and cinematics and all and slow mo, it <laughs> might it might be for you. It's so much slow mo. If you love a slow mo, if you love a rap video from what's like the er, the early two thousands, <laughs> early two thousands, yeah, it's for you. It's, it's for you. It's like throwing a bunch of genres and a bunch of like IP and mixing it all up and trying to say like it, or like a kid who's like. I'll have this character like having random action figures trying to tell a story. I would like say the comparison in sports is what some people are saying about the Texans uniforms. You just had a lot of people in a hodgepodge throw stuff together, and that's what the Zack Snyder uh, Rebel Moon movie is, and probably what the Scar Giver will be too. Oh, people like this font style, right? Let's throw that in there. Yeah, hey, hey, we're being modern and, and traditional, <laughs> and, and and you know, we'll throw some light blue because H Town Blue. That's kind of what Scar the Scar Giver is. And, yeah. In a movie form. Yeah, people like lightsabers, so let's have this one character walk around with it's, lightsabers. But isn't that from a other very famous movie no, series? No no, 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 no. It's brand new. It's a different type of it's lightsaber. Different. We it's won't different. even call it a lightsaber. Maybe it does, it does a whoosh thing that's different. Except for whatever yeah, the sounds yeah, are. Yeah, They're different the, sounds. Yeah, it doesn't have the same sound. Yeah, so don't worry. But very Michael, different. Michael Carroll, once again, coming in and bringing the heat and the smoke for Zack Snyder. He's not alone in that, but uh, I haven't heard it from him. I didn't know where he stood on Zack Snyder. Now I do. Mm, um, now you know. Yeah, that's kind of where I stand, too. Yeah. Unnecessary for the most part. Dawn of the Dead? That was good. I like that one. That was good. The other ones? The, eh. the most recent stuff? Eh. Eh. Take a break. Eh. Yeah, please do. Please. <laughs> Maybe because we're kind of forced to watch it because it's like IP. He, Zack Snyder just broke my phone. Uh, that's what you heard. <laughs> <laughs> we're kind of forced to watch it because of what he makes because it's kind of in the genre of stuff we watch. Yeah. But we're never yeah. happy with what he makes. No. It's, kind of, it's really our fault at this point. We are, what else is my fault is we're way due for a break. So Oops. we are done. Michael Carroll will join us next week as long as he has time. Uh, but once again, listen to Comic Cast tonight on 97.5 from 9 to 10. And also the podcast, Apple, Spotify. I always want to say Google, but Google Podcasts don't exist, no. exist anymore. But Apple, Spotify, they're there for you. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. We've got one more segment to go. Eric wants to talk about something. It's probably Eric Wong. We'll get to him when we come back.
Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's the Dell Olalea Show. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Dell Olalea. Welcome back to the show. One more segment to go. Eric, I see you. We'll get to you. But first, I want to talk about this. You guys want to take a day off from work? You should. And if golf is something you like to do, I got a, I got something for you. You you take that day off. You play around the golf with your favorite sports station at the 97.5 and 92.5 Occasional Invitational Benefiting Kids Meals. This year's tournament will take place on the 7th. That's a Tuesday at 1030 a.m. It'll be at Highland Pines Golf Club. Each golfer will receive beverages from Carbach Brewing Company, lunch, dinner from Valencia's Tex-Mex Garage, 18 holes of golf, and quick and a quick award ceremony immediately after the tournament. Register now at ESPN975.com under the promotions tab and use code EARLYBIRD for a 97... See, what we're going to do here is let you know that the price or the money is... Just what our what our tag is, $97.50 registration for a limited time. See what we did there. $97.50 registration for a limited time um, for the occasional invitational benefiting kids meals. That's Tuesday, May 7th at 1030 at Highland Pines Golf Club. Eric has a question. What's up, Eric? Hey, guys. How you doing, Bill? How you doing? Yeah, I was wondering, uh, have you heard anything good about that new show, Late Night with the Devil, or The Fall Guy? I'll hang up a little bit. I've heard The Fall Guy is good. I've seen people say that that's a good show, the Emily Blunt, Ryan Gosling joint. People like that. Uh, we, you seen If you've seen it, or at least seen some of the promo stuff for it, I mean, uh, they're playing into the fact that they both had big movies last summer, or last year at least, with uh, Barbie and Oppenheimer. Um, so they've, they've played into that, but they're in that one. I've seen good reviews. I haven't seen... I've seen the trailer, at least part of a trailer for the first one you talked about. I'm interested in that. Unlike Michael Carroll, I do like horror. Uh, so I, I um, will watch that one. But I haven't seen the reviews on Late Night with the Devil. But I'm in. Um, if, if when I get to watch it, I will, I will let you know. That one, that one people like too. So um, at least so far, the last 30 minutes or 25 minutes or so, people, uh, we've gotten recommendations for good stuff, uh, whether it be – Shogun, oh, uh, we'll remove the scar giver from the equation. But the rest, uh, Michael's suggestions and Eric's have uh, got people excited. So if you're in, into something to watch this weekend, the scar giver, excuse me, The Late Night with the Devil is on AMC Plus right now. So that's available. The other ones you'd have to go to a theater for. But Late Night with the Devil, you can see right now. I might check that out this weekend now, now that I know it's available. Give me horror all the time. I don't get scared very easily, but... um. But I do like a, a bit of anxiety and a jump scare if the movie is capable of it. So I'll take a look at that. Possession, I'm in on. Uh, we are almost done for the day. What to look forward to? Hopefully a Verlander win or at least a good start. I can't guarantee that the Astros hitting will come around. But with Verlander back tonight, you want to see him pitch well because I think it would certainly add a boost to the team. I mean, we know way back in 2017 the story is told that that team was floundering. They made the trade for Verlander, and, of course, they go on to win a World Series. I'm not predicting that, but I do think if Verlander is a number one for them, it changes some of the feeling in that in that, uh, in that that clubhouse. Get Verlander back. We heard that Fromber's maybe closer than you think to coming back, and um, and then you have your top two, and you hope the, the Javier season and Blanco season continue, and then you find you piecemeal number five, whether that be Hunter Brown or or uh, J.P. France at this point. This, those two pitch much better than they had earlier in the year in their last outing, so maybe that's still up for debate. Uh, but it starts with Verlander tonight. It starts with, hopefully, if it is a close game late, that your best players show up. I read the stats from Ch- the Chandler Rome article from earlier. Those guys have been bad, and it makes sense because the whole team has been bad. So if they're not good in those late and close situations, it would it would – Explain why you're six and fourteen, or at least partly explain. And you know, Austin, we went through a whole show without mentioning a, fir- a first baseman. Nor I don't know how uh, I don't know how many shows in the city have done that, not mentioning that particular player, uh, but we haven't. And I don't don't break the streak. We're uh, we're almost done for the day. 
I'm sure that streak will it'll end with this show and it'll change in the next show. And I'm sure he will get mentioned. It wasn't the plan, but we avoided mentioning a certain first baseman's name. And I think that's a plus. I was just going to say, I, I'm pretty sure this is the only show that's going to do that today. <laughs> yeah, I think I think maybe hopefully we set a trend. You can go you can go hours. You can go shows without mentioning his name. Because I would suggest there are other problems, maybe not bigger problems, but plenty of other things to talk about when it comes to the Astros and the problems they face. And this weekend may start to turn the tide, starting with the Nationals. It, one can hope. We, I, we are done for the day. Gallant and George are up next. They're going to be followed by the Killer Bees. Enjoy the weekend. If you're not an NBA fan, it's probably not a great weekend for you, but you got the play-in games tonight, em- elimination games, and you also have the start of the NBA playoffs. Austin's a Cavs fan. Hope it goes better for him than it did last year because that team is on the verge of a major, major major shakeup if they don't win and probably even if they do win because Donovan Mitchell doesn't appear to be a guy who wants to spend a lot of time in Cleveland. Austin enjoyed his time in Cleveland way back when as a kid when he saw the Browns play, play, excuse me, play the Texans. I don't think that feeling is what Donovan Mitchell feels every time he steps out of his house. He feels like a guy who's like, let's wrap this season up. I need to get out of here. But hopefully it doesn't wrap up early. I'm sure he wants to win. He just doesn't want to do it in Cleveland. But maybe he will. And the Magic, the Cavs, and others, uh, the NBA playoffs back. So we're going to hear a lot of Mike Breen yelling bang and and others things. Because Mike Breen is probably the voice you're going to hear um, a lot going forward. He is the he is the number one guy on the number one broadcast for the station and the network who hosts the finals. Gaunt and George up next. I'm assuming Cal will get talked about and the Texans will as well. I'll talk to you on Monday.
Happy Friday. Welcome into Glon George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Sean Mapes off for his birthday. Thinks he's too good for us. Doesn't want to celebrate with us. A real man works Disrespect. on his birthday. I agree. Like me. Real man. Yeah. The Sean, manliest of all the men. Sean Mapes, not a real man. Not about that life. Not about that life. We're going to celebrate next week when we're in La Burge, though. We're going to enjoy it. I don't know what's going to happen to Sean. I kind of want to make him eat that death burger that Brian McDonald ate. So that's his punishment. But I think death he, burger? Yeah, it was like super, super, super spicy. There was Carolina Reapers and everything in there. Oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah, it's not for me either. I don't know why anyone would order it. I told the chef that. I was like, I don't know why it's on your menu. I think Conan O'Brien could handle it. Did you see Conan O'Brien on the <laughs> I, Wing Show? I did. What a psychopath. I kind of want to do like our own version of the Wing Show. I just don't know yeah, what it I, is. I don't. I don't. No, no, maybe not like not hot wings, but like I don't know, maybe like a barbecue version of it or something like that, where we have conversations and just eat brisket. It's pool season, sir. I'm trying to look hot so I can find a wife. Well, you don't have to be on the show. Okay, good. Uh, you good. Can... <laughs> Do this on your own, okay? I need my abs back because I need to demonstrate my value <laughs> so I can enact the dentist system. To make sure that you're okay going forward, you know, to find that wife. Which yeah, exactly. Such a, such a priority for Paul Galan. If I have abs, it's the implication that, mm. uh, yeah. So the Astros obviously didn't play last night. Uh, Justin Verlander back on the mound for the first time this season versus the Washington Nationals. But it's 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 draft season, and it is is Texans meeting with the media season. And in the next segment, we got to talk about these leaks because people are not happy. It's pretty funny that for all of the leaks we didn't get before the Texans drafting with the second overall pick last year, the Houston Texans, when it comes to the uniform reveal that was supposed to happen at the NFL draft, they are literally down to just one item, which I believe also was leaked this morning. There's like little details that are not leaked yet. It's and just I, the red helmet. It's just the red helmet. The red helmet. Well, I'll just say it with a horn on the side of it. So I've heard. Yeah, there, there is. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll deep dive into the, the hate that it's getting. In the next segment, but the Casario, Will Anderson, D'Amico, CJ, they've all met with the media this week. And, and for the most part, in typical offseason fashion, it's a whole lot of nothing. Uh, like you, Paul, I do find it interesting that Joe Mixon met with the media. And I believe Daniil Hunter met with the media. But he Stephon did. Diggs has not met with the media here in Houston. I just find it intriguing that he's not made that public appearance yet for the Houston Texans. I don't feel entitled to a Stephon Diggs press conference because press conferences are generally boring, but Stephon Diggs is already the most interesting member of the Houston Texans. He is outspoken. He is somebody that is coming from a situation where it seems there was drama that led to him leaving the Bills uh -huh. and joining the Texans and... He's the newest Houston Texan. Yes. So it is a bit surprising. And the splashiest Houston Texan edition. Perhaps ever. Yeah. So it is surprising that we haven't heard from him. Maybe that's a request he made. Totally fair to do it. I'm sure mm -hmm. he's annoyed with all of the attention that he's kind of created for himself when it comes to the end of his time in Buffalo and now joining the Texans. Maybe the Texans felt that, okay, we're going to try to make him seem like he's just one of the guys on the team. But it is weird that with Daniel Hunter and Joe Mixon, they didn't do that. Yeah. And it doesn't, it probably is a lot about nothing. Pro to your point, it probably is just like, yeah, I don't want to deal with this right now. I don't want to be peppered by the media of questions about what went wrong with Josh Allen, about saying on Twitter that Josh Allen wasn't good before he got there. It's, it's just, it's it's curious. But Nick Casario, when he met with the media, there was a couple things that stood out to the both of us. Because both these, you know, these clips stood out for, for you, and then I, I listened to them as well. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. We'll start here with Nick Casario, who, he got a little snappy when asked about big names uh, in the Houston Texans. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't really know what that means. I think, you know, when you put the team together, you look at the opportunities that are presented in front of you. You have X number of dollars that you have available to you, and it's all about resource allocation. So, I mean, what you could, Devin Singletary, was that not like a big enough name last year, I guess? So, again, we're looking for good football players with the right mindset that come in here, espouse our philosophy, and then ultimately have to go out there and perform and, and play football. 
He's such a nerd. I love it though. He's a football nerd. I love I love resource allocation because it's always been it was something he would say a lot in the last two off seasons before this one when the Texans wouldn't do anything. He'd be like, and he would use that as a, a reason why the Texans would do nothing, and that it just, or it wasn't time, whatever excuse he wanted to make. But yeah, a little snippy there. I don't know why. I like it. I do too. But just it, it is though, in a way, him defending his team. What? Devin Singletary isn't a big name. Well, because he's not on the team anymore. Look, for us, we talk about sports on a daily basis. We look for the big names because generally people want to hear us talk about the biggest stars mm-hmm. in sports. But for someone like Nick Casario, it's his job to look at everybody on the roster and look at what they can do and what they can't do. So the idea of big names, it is beneath him. And I like that he responded in that way. I'm sure some people are rolling their eyes at him. But you know what? I feel like with Nick Casario, if we trust Nick Casario, like some of you people claim, except for, oh, no, he, he, got, rid of the, he got rid of the end of the Stephon Diggs contract. Oh, no, he sucks again. He drafted CJ Stroud and Will Anderson and Nico Collins, uh-huh. among others. But whatever. Forget all of that. I, I feel like if he's going to push back like this, Instead of saying, oh, who does he think he is? I'm going to say, cool, I like it. It's more interesting yes. than anything he says at his press conferences. A hundred percent. Which are so boring. And look, nothing against him. But how boring are they, Paul? Joe, I told you about how I do this with every Nick Casario press conference because it just makes me laugh. What I do is I copy and paste some of the answers into a Microsoft Word document because at the bottom of the Microsoft Word document, it'll show you how many words were said. Can you guess how many words Nick Casario's opening statement was? Just guess. <laughs> 450. 1,263. <laughs> That's amazing. This guy can filibuster with the best of them. Imagine your opening statement is 1,263 words. Mm-hmm. Double of, of nothing. Double spaced in Microsoft Word. Say we're doing an English paper again. Uh-huh. You got to do the double spaced. Double spaced. That's two and a half pages. If you go a little crazier and do the cheat trick that everybody used to do. Oh, where, the double space after the period? Uh, yes, exactly. Where you, you make the you make the period a slightly bigger font. Yep. Oh, my God. We're at three full pages with yep. the opening statement. What Nick Casario says is generally nothing. So I like that he's kind of being a dick yeah. at the beginning of these press conferences uh, or at the uh, when he's answering these questions. Because, yeah. We think about big names, but he doesn't think about big names. Yeah, here here is uh, Nick Casario again uh, with the media the other day. Uh, he was uh, hot and bothered by being asked about bringing divas to the Houston Texans. Number one, I don't even know what that definition means. <laughs> doesn't know what it me. means. Again, like, we're not worried about, you know, again, we're worried about what a player does when he walks in our building. So we do our research. We talk to our players. We talk to other players all the time. We talk to our players, you know, as an example, like a lot of the guys are in the draft. And we talk to those players, hey, what are your thoughts about uh, so-and-so? What is your experience with him? So, and we do our research, and then ultimately, D'Amico and I sit and talk. And if we feel comfortable with the decision, then we go ahead and make the decision. Um, I I think it's unfair to label anybody until they actually have an opportunity to walk in the building. Again, our environment's different than another environment. So we really don't know what's going on in, in 31 other buildings. We know what's going on in our building, so decided to have stuff here. I love that he's like, I don't know what that means. I love it, What too. do you mean you don't know what that means? I love it, too. He does know what it means. I mean, he was with the Patriots, and while the Patriots didn't deal with many divas, they did have Chad Ochocinco for a limited period of time. The 2011 team, he barely played for that team, but he yeah. was there. They had Randy Moss. There were some other players as well that pushed boundaries. Definitely less than in most other organizations, uh-huh. but he knows what a diva is. Is. He knows what we're talking about when we say that. But this is, once again, Nick Casario standing up for his players. And how about this? I'm putting my fist up right now. It's unfair to label anybody. Damn. That Damn. sounds like something Jesus would say. You know? So, I like that Nick Casario is sticking up for his guys. Yes, some of what he said there, kind of BS. Uh-huh. Doesn't know what a diva is. Okay. Nick, you're a wrestling fan. Honestly, actually, like using the Randy Moss example in that moment would have been a great one. Like, as like it would have been a checkmate on the whoever asked the question. It's be like, well, they called Randy Moss a diva when I was in New England, but then he got to New England and he set an NFL record in touchdown catches in a single season with a quarterback. Like that would have been such a good checkmate in that moment. But I just I love the response to both of those questions. Being like, I don't even know what that means. 
What does it mean? It's more than he gives us ever, and I will take it. Some people are like, oh, how dare you say that? Now, look, he's done a pretty good job the last couple of years cleaning up a mess that Bill O'Brien and Jack Easterby left. And he's, if he's going to answer the saying, I don't know what that is, fine, I like it. I like it. It's different. And sh he's, he's shown a little, uh, as opposed to Bill Belichick sneering at a question and giving uh -huh. more grunts and and fart noises and like ums. he's Trent Balky than oh. uh than than words Nick Casario chooses to give us a uh, five page English theses but he starts them off by saying at the very beginning I don't even know what you're talking about yeah, I, I like it I did too so I, there you go and Fred Fred here on the Twitch says I can't believe Paulie likes the response from Casario you know what I, what I've learned is Paul is team Nick Casario yeah like, you are through and through Team Nick Casario. He's done a good job. Everyone was blaming him for stuff. And, and again, it's like this, this anti-Patriots bias. God forbid somebody tries to be the Patriots. Oh, the well, team that went to nine Super Bowls and won six. Why are okay. the Texans trying to be them? Okay. You idiots. But to be fair. Th that's what everybody should aspire to be. But to be fair, what? every single organization in the NFL, from the Jets to the Titans to the Browns to the Texans, that has tried to become the New England Patriots... Uh, we'll also include the Broncos and the Raiders with Josh McDaniels, has failed no, miserably. No, they brought in people that were never capable of actually doing that. But guess what? Every team should try to go to nine Super Bowls and win six. Agreed. Over a 20-year period. Agreed. That's what literally everyone should be going for. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that people are like, why are they trying to copy the Patriots? Because the Patriots win all the time, you dumbass. <laughs> God, well, what are you going to say next? Oh, I can't believe people are copying the Chiefs, you know? And I know your Chicago Bears tried to copy the Chiefs. Was it so dumb of them to hire Matt Nagy? In retrospect, sure, he was with the Chiefs. Hey, they made the playoffs once. Yeah. He, he won Coach of the Year. He did. And now they're drafting Caleb Williams. Now the Chiefs are more Chiefsy now than when Matt Nagy was there. But hey, you get what I'm trying now, to say here. He's also back with the Chiefs, so maybe they'll have to try it again down the road. Now, now in typical uh, Paul Gallant show fashion, this is not the only Nick Casario we will hear from in this segment. I believe we also have right a robot. Correct. Uh, so um, listen, I'm a man of science. I went to Syracuse University, the most prestigious university in the United States of America. You know, it's not a party school. As though many will say that it is because it was like number one in rankings. But while I was there, I developed a complex system that allows me to find the inner thoughts of people like Nick Casario, who I believe may be a replicant or a Terminator. You take a look at that man. He hasn't aged in 20 years. Look at the shape he is in. Look at the way that he speaks with lots of analytical thought. He doesn't know what a diva is. He doesn't know what a big name is. He is a man of 10101111 going through his head, all binary code. And because of my genius, I have figured out what Nick Casario was actually saying when he was asked about diva. Uh, guys, thanks to the Nick Casario robo translator, here is what Nick Casario was actually saying there. I do not know what the word diva means. I do know about the vast amount of devastation that the great robot revolution of 2027 mm. will bring to humanity. It was I who drafted C.J. Stroud. It was I who drafted Will Anderson. It was I who excommunicated Jack Easterby. And you dare ask me about divas? Like what he did there. You hear that? He says, like, he just said the world's going to end in 2027. That's, said, my, that's my biggest takeaway that the robots are going to take over in 2027. He, he, and he also said, Devast, <laughs> devastation. Yes. But 2027. He's cute. We got three years left. Well, hey, it's that's better. We got. It was 2026 last time we heard from him. Oh, so it's moving back. I think he's realizing, well, I might have a dynasty on my hands here. So, so. every single year the Texans are good, the farther back he pushes Correct. the robot revolution. Yeah. So we got we got to get a couple of Lombardi. I'm glad that you're here. also tracking the robot revolution that Robo Casario is about to incite on us. You know, mm -hmm. like, I'm glad you know that it was 2026 and now it's 2027. Mm -hmm. It just makes me feel better about, yeah. about life. Um, all right. So, so yesterday was an interesting day on social media, on Reddit, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. It started with a helmet. And then by the end of the day, Antonio Brown and CT ESPN were breaking news about what the Texans leaked jerseys looked like, and people absolutely hate them. 
How do you feel? 713-780-3776. That's next on Glott and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. It's Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul Gallant and Joe George. ESPN 97.5 will be your home for NFL draft coverage in 2024. The only place in town to hear every single first-round selection on the radio is right here. ESPN radio coverage of the NFL draft starts next Thursday at 6 p.m. right after the Killer Bees. And then on Friday, when the Texans are finally on the clock, they'll have three picks that night. At the moment, we'll be doing our own draft show this year again. Paul, Dell, myself, and others will be on from 6 to 9 for our 2024 NFL draft show. So yesterday, the Texans' new helmet leaked. And then that was followed by very quickly, or not very quickly, but by the end of the night, all of a sudden, the Texans' uniforms have pretty much leaked. And they're very, very different than this uniform that's duh i guess but what they're doing they had such a traditional boring uniform for so long and they really have gone in a very different direction with their uniforms in 2024 you you said this like them you said that so politically i want to know what you think about them you 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 basically uh i said you said they were traditional and now they're very different is it better i don't know I don't know. I think they're better. Um, I know a lot of people disagree. I think you got to see the full array. Yeah. 
the ones that are specifically getting crushed the most are the one of three helmets, two new ones that they're debuting, where it has a light blue, giant old English H with a red outline on the side. A lot of people are saying it looks a lot like the Titans. Some people are saying it looks like an XFL or a UFL team. I like it. I, I think it's different. There aren't many teams in the league that have just one letter or letters on yeah. the side. I think it's the Chiefs. It's the Packers. I, I don't know if there's many more. Kind of the Ravens have a B on the yeah. Baltimore Raven logo. The Bears have the C. Uh-huh. But for the most part, most teams have some sort of logo. They got a letter. They're repping the H. Honestly, I hate the red the, the red helmet. That's my biggest issue. What this red gi- helmet? The giant um, horn. Oh, that's you mean, hate that one? Yeah, I don't like it. Why? That, I, I think that's the best one. I think it's so weird. I don't know. I like the H Town Blue jerseys. Uh, it looks like I saw. I, I, I'm disappointed because I thought there would be more H Town Blue. I thought so too, but it's I like, just an I like accent how it's double of the blue. Numbers. Uh, I like how it's double blue. It looks like the Houston skyline is on the side, on the shoulders, which I think that's a cool little um, addition to the jersey. I like that it's going to be. The H Town Blue outline around the logo, like I'm not surprised. People don't like change, even when they want change. And honestly, the social media reaction was always going to be bad. To be honest, it's it's impossible for people to be happy. Like that's that's part of it. it is no one's ever going to be happy. When does a uniform change happen in sports and everyone loves it? Like you even have idiots who still think the red brick Astros jerseys were better than what they have now. Like, and they're so wrong. And that's like 90% of people agree with it. But there's people who love the red brick and I'm sure for whatever the, reason. I'm sure there's some people who hated the Tequila Sunrise jerseys back Which is when crazy. they wore them. But I'm sure some people felt that way. I'm sure some people were like, oh, these are kind of gay. You know, I, I, I feel like there would have been some people like, that, oh, rainbows on our jerseys. <laughs> Come on, get out of here. Yeah. And like, and, and Fuente says, how are fans who just play around with Adobe able to come up with cool stuff, but the team paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to never able to do anything. I mean, the fans were basically just taking the other jerseys and just making them all red. And that's what one of these jerseys is. The only real change is the helmet. Like, it, it, they're not that different in a lot of ways. Like, they are the same. They're pretty they much are, the same. They're modernized. The traditional, the modern classic. Different numbers. The, the home road. Yeah, the numbers are different. It's it's one of those things where it's – my biggest is just – it was about time. Like, it was boring. They needed something new. They had nothing different for the first 22 years of their existence. Mm -hmm. They had the same helmet, the same exact jerseys. They did add a red one, but they went with the same thing for a long period of time. So it's about time. I like that there's some new stuff in here. And I know that some people are going to push back, but... I think that really when you see the team in action wearing them, I think you'll feel different. Yeah. Because here's the other thing that you should look at. Going forward, if they end up being good in these uniforms, you are going to remember these uniforms for maybe the best era in team history. I will make a comparison that is not a Houston-related one, but for those who like the Astros, these orange and blue uniforms that they have been wearing that are closer to the Colt 45 colors at the very beginning. I guess the Astros colors way back in the day. Those uniforms are going to be associated with the dynasty run. Uh, The Boston reference I was about to make, the Patriots had the coolest uniforms in the NFL. They had the Minuteman snapping a a football. They had the red jerseys. They had a white helmet. It looked sharp, but they stunk while they wore them. They got rid of them. They moved to this other look where it's like a flying Elvis on the side. I don't think it looks great. Mm -hmm. I don't, but... I associate that look with winning. Yeah. And and that's part of what the big picture was for the Texans is I think it was just it was time for a rebrand. And I don't think they anticipated the team having this much success in the first year of D'Amico Ryans and CJ Stroud. And that's part of the reason why the jersey was coming. The jersey was to try, in my opinion, to remove some of the stench of what was the past of even when you think back to Matt Schaub and only winning playoff games against backup quarterbacks and never being to an AFC title game and the Jackie Easterby era, like the uni- the new uniforms to me was like it is a it's a new era of Texans football 
And then CJ Stroud was supposed to be very good in them by the time they debuted. He happened to be very good in them before. Um, I But I do love this new well, they, Houston Texans attitude. They, they were working on this before they even had Stroud. Yeah. This is something that they had a, a meeting with us that began... I want to say it was like two, three weeks after Nick Casario's awkward press conference where the McNairs were sitting right in front of us and just letting Casario take all the shrapnel for the last couple of years. Everyone was asking him hostile questions. Why did you fire another black head coach? What the hell's going on here? And then they had that. So they've been thinking about this for a while. Um, the, the fun thing that they did wasn't quite as fun. It sounded like it would be cooler before the execution yes because they made a big deal about how they went around basically the nfl to try and get some version of that light blue as part of the unis yeah and the titans threw up a huge pissy fit about it yeah i'm not surprised because that's the only thing that the titans have of value as far as intellectual property goes like that's legitimately it the logo that they got rid of because everyone in nashville hated that they did not change their name when they moved here to something original and then they settled on the titans because they're unoriginal losers yeah. which it was alliteration was really like the reason that they became the tennessee titans that's so stupid the, the adams family very well known for good planning no. um but i, I love I'm guessing, like you, that the Texans just love themselves. This photo of Cal McNair oh, with yeah. his big-ass dog is great. The Texans think they're hot bleep right now. Yes. And, I mean, guess what? The Astros are so bad yeah. that it's it's like you showed up to school after one summer away, mm -hmm. and you're wearing the coolest clothes possible. Yeah, you went shopping for the first time. You're in better shape. Mm-hmm. You got a better hairdo, and the previous cool kid has a torn ACL, mm. is in a wheelchair, mm. a little acne. Now, long school year. So you have to see how it plays I out. I mean, theoretically, the, the the new cool kid could get stuffed in a locker, you know. And be called a fraud. After first, first period, uh -huh. you know, just gets a super atomic wedgie and hung up by a hook somewhere ever happened to you no thank god yeah that'd be, that'd be awful never happened to me either no people were scared of me but that's oh a yeah that's a that's a story for another day uh anyway were they scared of you or like your sister was older than you no so they I, they okay. were they were scared of me okay they were <laughs> it's because i was a little psychopath in sixth grade gotcha uh we've done a lot of work since then you know we've, we've done a lot of a lot of therapy things like that um but to bring it back uh, yeah, the Astros. I mean, theoretically, they're they're going to be back to being the Astros, or yeah. they might never be the Astros again. And theoretically, yeah, the Texans could be exposed as fraud, and O'Doyle's going to put a bunch of cow turds in the locker. O'Doyle rules. You know, it's going to roll all over their feet. I love the O'Doyles. They're such a great part of that movie. They yeah, really they are. are. They really Madison are. is my favorite Adam Sandler movie. Hmm. I, I do love Billy Madison. I, I do still, I really love Happy Gilmore. Happy Gilmore is good, and it's probably a better movie, but Billy Madison made me laugh in, in ways where, the, when I first watched that movie, I think I was yeah. nine years old. It's the hardest I've ever laughed at anything in my life. Uh, Big Daddy, pro or anti. Big that's Daddy's just, good. Big Daddy. Yeah. But Big Daddy's not as funny. No, it's not. It's but a it's, good movie, but it's not quite as funny. Yeah, I think it's the most uh, up and down Adam Sandler movie in terms of what if people like it or not. Uh, at least of that of that four that foursome including water boy billy madison is the one that's usually the bottom of most people's list it's at the bottom of mine of those four movies that we've named but it's still it's still pretty good i mean when he teaches him how to write his name it's one of the great scenes in tell in, in movie history i'm gonna teach my son to write his name like that hmm except we don't have snow in texas so what? i guess i'll we'll have to fly back to chicago for a weekend to do that one of the one of the great scenes in movie history not really but i just think it's funny i don't know no no stand on your take sir no i just think i just <laughs> the scene made me laugh like an immature child the first time I saw it. Look at you! You're, you're acting like you're you you're, you've gone full media just a couple of just a couple of months on the show. You're all of a sudden like, mm, yeah, I was very poor aisle, you know, very poor aisle of me to laugh at such hooliganery. No, I think it's great. Uh, are you excited for Happy Gilmore too? They're making a sequel. Is that they is are confirmed? They're, yeah, Adam Sandler has confirmed. I thought Sandler pushed back because he was getting annoyed that the guy who plays Shooter McGavin, who no, has he, not exactly been winning in the game of life of late, uh, no. was kind of pushing that movie as being out uh, about to come out. No, he told Dan Patrick like two weeks ago that they're making it. 
Oh, it is happening. Yeah, I hope they're on the senior tour. That's all I know. I think that would make it funnier. All right, there are two Astros issues we haven't really focused on in the last couple of days uh-huh. as they come back into action tonight. Plus the Nationals, we just found out. I just saw this on, on the social media world that they're going to troll the Astros this weekend because they can because it's five years since they beat the Astros in the World Series. So oh, boy. that's happening tonight. But some of the issues that are going on with the Astros we have not touched on. We'll get to that next year on Glotton George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's Gallant and George. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. So, yeah, the the, the Nationals are going to take this opportunity to uh, relish in the past and give away a bunch of stuff this weekend. They're going to give away rings on Saturday. Ugh, I just, it makes me sad. They're going to do... Um, well, Rings. why does it make you sad? They suck now. This is all they can do. I know. They're not good. They're not going to be good ever again. Like, you know? it's like Friday Night Fireworks 2019 World Champion music. What the hell is that? They had their golden generation where they get Steven Strasburg, they get Bryce Harper. Obviously, those guys didn't really get them over the finish line. They had 21-year-old Juan Soto. It's mm-hmm. over for them. It's very over. Let them have it. Yeah, that's true. But I think it's the one series that, like, the Twitch said... It- that's the worst part of this run. It's it's like when the Carthaginians invaded Rome and they got pretty far. Mm-hmm. Guess who doesn't exist anymore? Carthage. Guess who does? Rome. Italians won't let us forget about it. All right. I like the reference. I wasn't expecting that one, but you never know. It's 
what I'm going to get from you. Uh, there's two uh, two Good issues. Good hardcore with history the, podcast. Uh, there are, Tunic there, Wars, baby. There are there are two Astros issues that we have not really talked about. The first one you brought up on the rundown today, which is just the walks. Like that is. I was surprised to see this today. Yeah. So so they have a, a 10.9 walk rate. It's second only to the Marlins who. You put who really suck on here, but they are don't off- the Astros also really suck right now? <laughs> you definitely could make that case, Joe. <laughs> the Marlins are off to a historically last year's A's bad start. Though. Yeah, they are. They're really bad. It isn't surprising that these walk numbers are high given that you've had a couple of games where the starters have just been dreadful to open things up. Mm-hmm. But also some of these walks are coming in the bullpen, too. They are, and they're coming at unfortunate times. Well, like, like Josh Hader, you know, his two big outings that were issues – were started with walks and then things kind of fell apart for him and and Chandler put out an interesting piece on Josh Hader that we're going to get into in the two o'clock hour today just about his struggles and what they really mean but yeah the walks are definitely a problem we got the most negative text ever here from the 409 if JV gets bounced early tonight where's the panic meter going to be that will put us nine games under 500 well even if he gets bounced early KJ it doesn't mean that they will lose correct because they won the Blair Henley game that's true so you never know sometimes the offense carries the pitching for this team it would be nice if they did it you know a little bit more Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but guys tonight's the first game of the season you're looking at it all wrong they're Mm oh no right like they just played the pre-playoffs iron sharpens iron play a bunch of plus 500 teams this was their preseason, mm-hmm. okay? And they didn't take it as seriously as they probably needed to. But they know where they're going to be at the end of the year in the ALCS. So everybody who's looking at this and saying, oh, my God, the Astros are 6-14. and 14. you got to find a way in your mind to gaslight yourself into believing that it's all uphill from here. And that's how you do it. Today's the first game of the season. Today's the greatest day of your life. Today's the greatest game for the Houston Astros of the 2024 season. I'm Tony yeah. Robbins, bitch. If if uh, Justin if Justin Verlander gets bounced early today, the panic meter is going to be at an eight for a lot of people. You're going to put it. At, are you going to put it at an eight? A six. I'm going to put it at a point three because they'll be zero and one to start the season. How many times can we say this? I'm going to keep saying How it. How many times? As long be as day. I can. I'm going to say it until somebody gets a battering ram, blasts their way through the front door. Mm-hmm. Assuming they figure out which of our front doors is the front door, which is sometimes an issue here at uh, uh, our address. And, and they're going to have to get me out of the studio. There's a mm. lock in here. I, I'd be able to, to stay in here for a little bit. No food, Dude, no we water. Cook in here. Yeah, no toilets either. And yeah. turn the light. Maybe we turn the light off would be okay, but we couldn't stay in here very long. Right. Plus, they could come through the window. Yeah, they could get through that window, but we, we, we could have Austin in for Sean. He could lock the door. We'd be okay. Yeah, we'd be okay. So, uh, listen, I, I'll keep the propaganda going. How many times have I had to rally you people when you doubt this team? A lot of times. I, 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 I actually have done it a surprising yeah. amount of time. I, and, and this is not my team by blood. This is the bandwagon I joined. And here I always am telling you guys, relax. Yeah, but. From game six of the 2017 ALCS on. I like Junior Broncos take here. Astro sucking on purpose just to make the comeback even more epic. Exactly. They're bored. They're bored. They're like a cat. They're playing with their food, which is all of baseball. Mm. Uh, Chandler Rome also had this article today, um, which he highlights some numbers that are causing the Astros issue. And I and this one was interesting to me because as we talked about the lineup and the success that it has had with that has not had with runners in scoring position, there has still been, you know, Alvarez, Tucker, Altuve. These guys have still kind of been. They've been very good for the most part this year. So the Astros have a 506 OPS in late close situations. Oh my God. Uh, A late close situation. so bad. Yeah. Is defined as a plate appearance uh, in the seventh inning or later with the batter's team tied ahead by a run or having the tying run at least on deck. The Houston Astros have taken 104 of these this season at bats. (laughs) They're hitting 217. Well, it's better than Jose Abreu. Uh, the OPS is 506. The league average for this o- the OPS at this time is 679. Of the 21 hits the Astros have in these 104 plate appearances, they're all singles except for two, both coming from Jose Altuve. And Alvarez is one for 11 in these situations. Alex Bregman is two for 11. 
in these situations. Kyle Tucker is two for eight in these situations. Mm. And this is where it's not good. I go back to the Jeremy Booth argument a little bit where I do disagree with him about lineup construction is lineup construction doesn't fix that. That's just your best players having 30 play appearances right there. That math's correct, I think, uh, between Alvarez, Bregman, and Tucker and being very poor in important, important moments. Like that is, that was a, a shocking, jarring when I read those yeah. things. I was just like, oh, this is that's way worse than I thought it would be in late game situations. Well, hey, uh, spin zone, Joe. Spin it. That OPS is twice as much as Jose Bray's OPS. Mm-hmm. That 506, is that what you said? Mm-hmm. That is amazingly bad. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing it's so bad. You can't believe it. That's because it's, it's, it's it, flukish. It feels spin zone. It, it feels like. It's not real still. Like, that's where it's... It's not just a spin zone, Paul. It's not going to be like this forever. It's not. The Astros are going to be much better in the situation. They can't be worse. This season. Legitimately. Like, yeah. They At some point... Unless they're like, Jose Abreu. They're going to figure it out. They are going to be clutch again in these moments. The question is, is how big of a hole are they going to be in when they figure it out? Like, that's <laughs> really the question. Because they're going to... That stuff's not going to stick around. It starts tonight, man. This starts is, tonight. The eight-game winning streak begins tonight yeah. and ends in Mexico City. Can't wait. Much like Hernando Cortez once con- conquered Tecnotitlan and, and took Montezuma out. Dude, I got your first history lesson. I don't know anything about this one. You don't, you don't know about the uh, Mexico City is built on top of the former Aztec capital. Capital. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's like te- Tecnotitlan. Okay. And th- that's I'm going to take your word for th- this th- The second conquering of Mexico City is going to be by the Houston Astros. Because okay. the Americans never could. They tried yeah. to invade a couple of times, and it went very horribly. Gotcha. Okay. Do you like the history lessons you're getting I, today? I, I don't think you do. I don't think you like history. I like the first one just because I know about it. This one, I'm just like, I guess I got to trust you on it. But you're a history buff, so I would assume you would tell me the truth. I'm a little too obsessed with that. I, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History Podcasts. Many hours of my life, I've I've been on road trips. I listened to that one. Uh, have you watched World War II in color yet? Uh, multiple times, in fact. I've Is watched it? all. There's like three different documentaries that are literally the same thing. Uh-huh. It's World War II in color. You know. Do you have like a go to World War II doc? No, uh, not really. Like historical reference that like if there's a documentary that comes out, it, it's a must see. Oh, anything by Ken Burns. Okay, I will watch anything by Ken Burns. Um. I was mine like I'm thinking more like specific topic wise. I I'm fascinated by JFK, and like what happened. So anytime I bet you're fascinated by me, boy. Anytime there's a JFK documentary, you know what I was doing with my brother with Marilyn Monroe. I don't want to know. I don't want to know what he was doing, boy. There's a tower that a lot of people compared it to. Um. All right. Yesterday, uh, one of the uh, I think nothing to fear, but me in a room with an intern. I think it was uh, Vandalorian. I think it was on Twitter. Uh, was the first with this news that Jeff Bagwell, uh, you know, back of the baseball card captain over there, mm-hmm. was in Sugarland. And then coincidentally, well, our guy Mario, Joey, Loprofito. Right, that's say it by his confirmed Catholic name. Thank you. Uh, Mario Joseph Loprofito was not in the lineup. Now it's just a regular day off. But is there something to this? Are they? Meeting with Joey Loperfito, are they trying to figure out how ready he is to be first base? Are, is the end of the Jose Abreu era upon us? We can only hope. That's next year. on Glott and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Before we did that, I want to tell you about my friends at LaBerge, Lake Charles, Paul, Sean, myself will be there next Wednesday. Great place to go and bet if you want to bet on your Texas teams. If this Texans jersey's got you hyped up over nine and a half wins this season, LaBerge, Lake Charles, that's the place to make your bet. They have 19 betting kiosks, TVs all over the place, great food, blackjack, roulette inside the sports book. Obviously, while you're there, they have a massive casino, great restaurants inside La Burge as well. And when you're in Louisiana, because you can't do it yet here in Texas, you can download the ESPN Bet app all through Penn Entertainment, which owns La Burge. Uh, easy to bet, awesome app. I just downloaded it when I was there on my last day there because I didn't do it right away. Major mistake. Being able to bet on sports on your phone is a is a gift and a curse at the same time. But when you want to bet on your Texas teams, make sure you go to the Burge like Charles. And before you do, download the Pen Play app and you can win up to two thousand dollars in Pen Play cash.
You are back with Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul and Joe. All right, so yesterday, first where we got out of uh, in Sugarland was that Jeff Bagwell and other minor league scouts were there, of course. Uh, that's That second part's not surprising, but Baggy was there, which is interesting because now that what we know about this committee that the Houston Astros have, it does seem to be led by Jeff Bagwell. Uh, he seems to be number one of who has Jeff uh, Jim Crane's ear the most, I would say. Uh, but he's in Sugarland yesterday. Joey Loperfito was not in the lineup, so it wasn't exactly a full scout of, of Loperfito. But just where the Astros are at, what we talked about yesterday, where they've used 23 arms this season. Last year, they only used 24. We've seen multiple guys go up and down, uh, including Spencer Aragetti and Forrest Whitley. And really, they're the, uh, the two guys that I would be most intrigued by right now are Joey Loperfito and then um, Pedro Leon, who's had a very good start to his minor league season. I'm not sure if it's continued, but he at least at one point was doing very, very well. So I don't, I don't know. Are, are, you think they're down there? They're scouting these guys and trying to figure out who's coming up, or is this much to do about nothing? Well, no offense to the fine people of uh, Sugarland, but what reason would Jeff Bagwell have to go there? Besides to scout the team. Yeah. Yeah. And especially to specifically look at any possible solution so that they can clean up this Jose Abreu mess. Mm -hmm. I doubt that they'll DFA him. I know a lot of people want that. They have to find a way to, one, find a replacement, and two, quietly put him on injured list. Yeah. Something like that and, and say, listen, we're doing this for you. Like You're dealing with something wink wink mm -hmm. we don't want you to look bad here we care about you I, I wonder if that is something that's at least in the back of their mind if Abreu doesn't turn things around I'm not expecting Abreu to turn things around this time around I know that as the season progressed last year that there were some moments specifically the playoffs mm -hmm. and the end of the year where he actually was was good but oh, it just it just doesn't feel like that's gonna be the case this year and when you hear him talking about his confidence through a translator, and the translator saying that, I mean, if you've been watching that show, good show, the translator might from time to time clean things up a little bit. Yeah, we know that from from Shohei Otani. That's can't, that, tra can't that trust is, the translator. That, that nothing against the translator. Can't trust him now. But I'm assuming that if if he's talking about his confidence and and that's making it through translation, uh -huh. that it's it's not good. Yeah, I, I'll be honest though. I I don't know why, Paul. I got this sneaky wonder if they are if they're looking at Pedro Leon more than they are at Spence um, at uh, Joey Loperfito. He's hitting three twenty four this year. Yeah, he he just won the the Pacific Coast Player yeah. of the Week award. Like if you think back to when pay, when when he was signed, he just strikes out a lot. Yeah, like you think back to when he was signed by the Houston Astros, it was the biggest international deal the franchise had ever given out and there was this idea that he was going to skyrocket through the minor league system and make it up to the Houston Astros I think at one point it was believed that he was going to be maybe your Jeremy Pena because second baseman then they started putting him in the outfield a little bit kind of just going everywhere so I I just doubt that they're actually going to make a move on Jose Abreu, I don't know why. There's really no reason to replace Chaz or Jake Myers, but to me, it seems way more likely that they would be bringing in another outfielder to play on a consistent basis and have Jordan Alvarez exactly. DH more than Joey Loperfito be the first baseman. There's really only one position that you look at. It, there, there's enough depth in the outfield where it doesn't make sense for them to bring somebody up. Part of that has to do with Mauricio Dubon. There's an injury that, of course, would change. But, yeah, right now, there is legitimately only one hole on your roster. It's mm -hmm. the guy who has four hits and two errors, Jose Abreu. Yeah, and those errors are bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, even think back to the no-hitter, that play at the end of the game. He made that way more challenging than he needed to. It was not a uh, good-looking play, uh, I would say the least. So I just I don't think this means Loperfito's coming. I don't even know if it means Pedro Leon or yeah, or like you could be there evaluating pitchers. I guess like you, you never know. Anything's possible. Anything's possible. But it is of 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 note that like I just can't imagine that he's there for no reason. If you're putting things together, reading between the lines reading the tea leaves, et cetera, et cetera. There is literally no reason for him to be down there 
unless he is getting a look at Joey Loperfito and specifically maybe talking to him about his confidence playing first base. Yeah. Because that's the thing with Loperfito is he's played first base, but is he a first baseman? Yeah, exactly. Like it's a, it's he, a sample he, size. Right. It seems like right now he's he's positionless and he's played a couple of different things. So Jeff Bagwell, as a former first baseman, I'm sure, has probably some insight to share with him for all that we say about him maybe as a scout. I I, I would be, if yes. I were a minor league baseball player, someone who would want to hear what Jeff Bagwell has to say. Yeah, it, it is the one thing where if if it's he was just there to help teach Joey Loprofito how to be a better first baseman, so maybe he could yes. be that's, a Jose Abreu that's replacement. That's where I want his consultation. That sounds great. I'd rather Bagwell be a coach than an evaluator. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure as a coach, there are things that he can offer given that he's one of the best hitters in the history of the game. Yeah, it was that would be nice to see instead of, you know, calling the shots on Jose Abreu. Still why I don't think they'll ever replace him, because I don't think Jeff Bagwell and Jim Crane will admit they're wrong. At least until this offseason. This offseason is when they could probably move on, but I really don't think they're going to do it in season. Yeah, man, I don't even really know if you can. It's still eating $18 I know. Million. Uh From the 713, how late in the season was the infamous Tombstone article written by the Chronicle? I think it's right around the corner. I don't remember exactly. They've had a couple of those, huh? You had the, the Choke City. Yeah, I don't remember exactly when that article when that came out but uh it was early 2005 this was june 1st 2005 we still got a while there's there's an article about it from uh jake kaplan who was the previous astros writer for the athletic uh yeah June 1st, 2005, the Houston Chronicle pronounces the 19 and 32 Astro season to be dead. Thoughtfully provided a tombstone with a couple of uh, flowers on the top of it. And obviously things turned around uh, from that point on. Was who who put this in? I'm looking for who. Uh, oh, get this. Get this. It was the brainchild of the sports editor at the time. Fred Fowler. Oh, was it really? I, I, I'm. Is this? I'm, I'm assuming that this is interesting. This is not. This is. This is uh our Fred Fowler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be. Yeah, that that timeline matches up from what right Friday's twenty career. right two thousand two thousand five. I didn't know that. Friday, Friday, tombstones out on Friday. Is it time? Is it time for the tombstone? I know that's so fun. That's like the one thing you see. Like, can someone put out the tombstone article again for twenty twenty four? Uh, so I guess we have to wait till June 1st or until they're 13 games under 500, whichever comes first, to when we put out the tombstone. I think we should, we'll have to do our own. We'll make a YouTube video. Well, what, what would Fred do? Can we get, should we do some peyote ayahuasca? Maybe we can talk to Fred and the great beyond, bring a couple of beers. I think it sounds like a great idea. Some darts. We'll rip some darts with them. Play some poker. Fred, what should we do? I think that sounds like a great idea. Tell us, Fred. Um, yeah, I, it's so, I guess we're, we're on the horizon of that. If, if it needs to be, I wouldn't be surprised if the Chronicle have tried to run that back this year as a, a bit. Yeah. Of, bring it, bring it back. I mean, it worked once. Look, Houston sports worked. The Houston sports section of the Chronicle yeah. has done this multiple times. Yeah. Like you have choke city as well. You do. It, it clearly works. Yeah, but you, like, is it? It's They're like two a, for two. I, I don't think there's been any other ones out here. I, I think the only two times. Can it, does it have to come from the Chronicle? Uh, let me see. I I, I gotta confirm. Or like, could this be Houston like, Chronicle. could like, could the Athletic do this? Could we do this and get credit for it? Because I would say, like, I would like to get you know credit for the Astros turnaround if we could somehow pull that off. I I, I agree. Egotistically, I think that'd be a great brand for you and I. I I think it would be too. Yeah, chokes. And by the way, this all happened like the same month. That was May twelfth. So <laughs> basically, here's what needs to happen. Once uh once we get to I guess May first, anything in May we can use as voodoo magic to potentially turn things around. Um. All right. Uh. Other things going on in the world. Tomorrow's four twenty. You have thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> No, nah, man, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, I've I never really partaken in 420. <laughs> Loser. Uh, I mean, no. uh, wow, well, let that's, me, let that's me, your right. No, let me rephrase that. Um, I've never partaken. I, <laughs> I, I, I smoke occasionally. Narc, narc. Hey, there could be a narc listening, Joe. Yeah, clearly there is. I don't care. <laughs> um, I just never was like, oh, it's 420, got to do it. Like, God, it's just a day. 
Like, if you're going to do it, it doesn't have to be that day. Also, you know, that's like the day the cops were out in college. Like, they were, all, they were looking for it back in the day. You got to be smarter than that. You got to be more intelligent. It's like they just, they know it's coming. It's like the people who, like, are... They don't care about it anymore. Depends on where you are. Not in Houston. No, yeah, they don't anymore. Houston, they they used to, you know, slap you pretty hard for it. But now, they don't care. The, the cops barely respond to, you know, like a... Dominican uh, president's son getting shot up by like an AK-47 at a gas station. Do you think they're going to respond to someone puffing a J? I think it's way, way more likely to respond to that than the, what, the first thing you said. Little things versus important things. Yes, I, that's how often I, <laughs> I would like them works. to focus on that, but I don't even think they're focusing on that, for God's sake. So, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know, man. I don't think I think you're going to be in the clear. Uh, 420 is for little teenage potheads, and that's about Shut it. Shut up! Don't tell me who I am. Uh, I did see, like, if you care about wrestling, uh, there's this uh, wrestler, RVD. He's very infamous for for partaking, and he's getting a, some kind of special match for 420. So you, you got to celebrate sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yes, if, if you partake, you partake. Congratulations. If you, congratulations to you. You're a cool guy. And maybe one day, like, the legalization of gambling, they'll get their heads out of their asses and legalize that, too, and just move into the 21st century. That'd be nice. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Does CJ Stroud deserve to have massive input on the Texans draft process like the Ravens are giving Lamar Jackson. That's next year on Glant and George on ESPN 97.5 and So the Baltimore Ravens have given Lamar Jackson this year um, tape of the receiver prospects in this draft and letting them give his input on who they should potentially take. Now, I I would imagine this is a big need for them. OBJ is not back. Uh, Zay Flowers just had some legal troubles that got cleared up yesterday, I believe it was, and will not have any issues going forward so he, he'll be fine with the Baltimore Ravens next year it appears but they're letting Lamar Jackson really take a look at these wide receivers who they believe will be available late in the draft or if they wanted to make a trade or something like that I 
I'm not surprised by this story. Like, I, I would imagine this is much more common than we would think. You know, my guess is that it's more common that for a quarterback specifically that you would include them in these decisions versus like what we saw happen a couple of years ago with Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers when they drafted Jordan Love and didn't tell him at all. Like, it, it is your quarterback. It, it is your franchise. So when you're going to make a big decision, like who you're going to take a wide receiver, if you're going to take a backup or a future, typically it would be recommended that you leave that person, keep that person involved. If the Houston Texans, which I know neither of us want them to do, take a wide receiver in this year's draft, it seems overkill at this point. But if they wanted to take a wide receiver or a tight end in this draft, is that something that you really want C.J. Stroud having massive input on? I get nervous with this. I feel in 2024, we've gotten to a point when it comes to accommodating star players in all sports that sometimes we're, I think, being a little bit too giving. Mm -hmm. You're seeing it a lot with NBA stars, but you're starting to see it in football. And there are lots of fan bases who believe that their quarterbacks, if they're good enough, should have a lot of input in what the team does. Mm -hmm. I experienced this up in Seattle. When Russell Wilson was still good, there was a large faction of Seahawks fans who believed that Russell Wilson should have input in what the Seahawks do during the offseason. And this goes also back to how I was feeling last offseason where we heard that C.J. Stroud had spoken with Tank Dell. Yeah. And I... I rolled my eyes a little bit because they had just drafted C.J. Stroud the day before. What, they're mm -hmm. going to bring him into their room and ask him, Ooh, what do you think about Tank Dell the next day? But okay, he's been here for a year, and he was awesome. Does that mean he deserves to have input? And I'm always going to say no. Here's why I'm going to say no. It's not because I don't think C.J. Stroud knows who's good and who's bad. It's because there are people who are paid to do this. And I'm assuming that because they're paid to do this, that they're going to be better at evaluating talent mm -hmm. than C.J. Stroud might. Yeah, and like, and someone here on the Twitch uh, says C.J. was the reason they drafted Tank Dell to what you were saying as well. I don't believe that's that. not true. It's yeah. just not true. Imagine that they did that. I mean, if they did, then like, I they're I, not a professional operation if they actually yeah, did that. There's no way that Nick Casario was like the. We're just going to draft Tank Dell just because C.J. Stroud told us to. Especially Who's because Tank Dell played here at Houston. It, yes. it was almost like having something in your backyard that other teams probably weren't quite as focused on. Because mm -hmm. he's an undersized guy, but if you got to see him enough being here and in person a couple of times with whatever scouts you can send there, you're going to have a pretty good feel for who he is and who he isn't. Yeah. Stroud talking to him is not why the Texans drafted him. That is a myth and a half. And to where we're at today, Joe, seeing that the Ravens, I guess, are allowing Lamar Jackson to look at the film, th th that's good that they're allowing him to look at it. A and maybe he's going to say, hmm, I like what this guy does, etc." But outside of offering a few words, I, I don't really want my quarterback to be involved in roster construction because they're going to get greedy by default. And that was the problem with Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson, every offseason, would be asking for the Seahawks to sign literally every single offensive lineman under the sun uh -huh. and every single receiver under the sun or trade for them at the same time. And he was doing it with his annoying positivity message. And it got to the point where a friend of mine, but a guy who was his quarterback coach, who was also a radio host at that station, was doing the same thing and pushing for the Seahawks to just add everybody. There's a salary cap, one and two. I'm sorry. I don't trust Russell Wilson's evaluation of every single player in the league. And with C.J. Stroud, I'm going to hold him to that same standard. There are, there are zero players in the league that I would look at and say, this guy knows who's going to be good and who isn't coming out of college. People barely know that as it is. A guy yes. who doesn't actually do this professionally is going to have an extra clue. Probably not. And, and like, what what experiences he had he had with Tank Dell last year too was like what and they were just they were practicing together. Like they didn't even have all they had was, I guess CJ could have watched film, but it just it's not what happens. Now I'm okay with I'm okay with input. I'm not okay with decision making. So like just using the Tank Dell as a comparison, let's let's just say 
CJ Stroud really was working out with Tank Dell last year, and which we know he was. And then they were at, they asked him, "Do you want to draft Tank or do you want to draft? What do you know about Jalen Hyatt, the wide receiver from Tennessee, or Cedric Tillman, who is the, also the wide receiver from Tennessee, who they went picked seventy three and seventy four, Tank went number sixty nine. Ah, nice. If 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 CJ Stroud was like, well, I know Tank. This is what I like about him." And I have watched Tennessee play for whatever reason, even though they're in the SEC. And I have these concerns about Jalen Hyatt and Cedric Tillman. I'd be fine with you listening to your quarterback on that. But if Nick Casario feels differently, then it should be his decision to continue this <laughs> forward. It, it is his decision. Yeah. Right. And to continue this forward, we are walking into a year with the Houston Texans in which they have five wide receivers, I believe it is, who are going to hit free agency. At the end of the season, headlined, of course, by Stephon Diggs and both Nico Collins. CJ Stroud should have some say in which wide receiver he likes more. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because Nick Casario has to sign the one that he believes is best for this team and to the best contract of this team. Just like Dalton Schultz, we saw CJ Stroud just talk glowingly about the connection that CJ Stroud had with that him and Schultz had together this offseason. Well, it shouldn't be the only reason why Schultz is back. It can have it can have impact. But Nick Casario yes. is the one who will ultimately lose his job if things go wrong, not, not C.J. Stroud. Bad organizations let the players have the power in this situation. And to what you're saying, I agree. Where I would draw the line is if Stroud has thrown to this person before, either he's at Ohio State or they have worked together at some sort of off-season camp, whether it's all the way back in high school or leading up to the draft, I'll listen to him. But that's pretty much it. Yeah. And you just can't overpromise because that's what really ultimately, it wasn't just the massages that led, that was the beginning of the downfall of the relationship with Deshaun Watson. Like, you go back in time and think about it, it's Cal McNair made a mistake. Cal McNair promised, and Jack Easterby, they promised Deshaun Watson that he would be involved in the GM search. Which was dumb. And then while, I can't believe that yeah. they did that. That 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 I mean, you want to talk about how far they've come over the last exactly. couple of years. It's so huge that they got away from that. That was moronic. Yeah. And they and they had Deshaun Watson's approval on a candidate. It was Omar Khan, who is now the GM of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then while Deshaun Watson was in Cancun, Jack Easterby got in a plane and flew to Carolina and they hired Nick uh, Nick Casario. So, it, like, and then that's when, two days later, the first question from John McClain and Nick Casario was not about taking the job. It was a, hey, man, we're hearing Deshaun Watson doesn't want to be here anymore. So, like, that should be, hopefully, as the Texans organization has grown, like, and what Nick Casario has seen with the Patriots and the way he they did things there. Like, I, CJ can have input, but you can't promise him say. And if you do promise him say that, you got to let him have it. That's the other thing, too. <sighs> But don't. But yes, but please don't. <laughs> please don't. Because, yeah, that's what it opens itself up to. You're right. And he is a David Mulugeta client. So, mm -hmm. most powerful agent in the NFL. He absolutely he, is. He can figure a way out of Houston. That's for damn sure. All right, let's get back to some, some, some positivity. We've got more positivity with the Houston Astros. More good things are happening. More good things are on the way. More than their record tells you. That's next on Glott and George on ESPN 97.5 and 
Now back to Paul Gallant and Joe George, broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios. You know, just thinking about the C.J. Stroud stuff here as well, with like how much impact and, and say he should have. I I really hope that they, I really hope they learn from their lessons. Because I just think back, like, now I'm just really thinking about back to Deshaun Watson. Like, I just don't want to deal with that stuff ever again. And I hope it continues throughout all these organizations. Like, let's say they're right about Jalen Green. You brought up the NBA. Like, we've seen what's happened with, you know, LeBron James' teams. Yeah, they've been greatly successful. But what has happened when he's left? It's been disasters. And they've been like, over backwards gone. to accommodate him. And he, smartly, I might add, has always put pressure on ownership to make sure that they're always putting their chips in the middle of the table mm -hmm. by signing short-term contracts exclusively. It's his way of putting pressure on these teams. It is a smart strategy. Yeah. Different in the NFL with non-guaranteed contracts and such. But I think the one thing that is really surprising about the Texans the last couple of years is it feels like they have learned and we have seen them learning on the fly, which I don't think we would have made the same case for them in their first 20 years of existence. No, it's, they've, they've learned so much in the last couple of years. And, and, and they've it's not that they've just learned it too and eaten it. It's they've learned and they've made changes because Big of time. it. There are so many organizations across the league that have just stayed themselves for years. Dolphins, Jets, mm -hmm. bad ownership, festers. I'm wondering if Dave Tepper is going to learn. He's got a lot of money. That's for damn sure. He's been a successful businessman. He should learn by now. Daniel Snyder never learned. No, and that's what I think what we've seen. I think what Cal learned the most was just to trust the football people. Like, it sounds so simplistic, but letting Jack and Bill O'Brien even, like who's not a GM, have say in the way that they did, it was it was staggering. Now it's it's funny to think about like hiring of D'Amico. Like their first call was Andre Johnson, but this seems like a that's almost a little bit of a different situation because you're hiring one of your former players. Also, it was a a no brainer. Like, well, like what what about D'Amico Ryan's? Were they not going to love as a candidate to be the head coach of this team? But they've done a really good job just adjusting as an organization and changing in a, in a very positive positive way. Maybe the opposite of what the Astros are doing. Before we get positive, yeah, I feel like it feels like the Astros are, going are in the wrong direction. They're done with school. Yeah, school's out completely. Yeah, it seems like uh, Jim Crane thinks he got an education on on winning, and thinks that he's now the master of it. Uh, Jim Crane, Joe George, Jim Crane is winning. I put on sunglasses when I said that. Is he? Is he winning? He believes. He is winning embodied. Do you think that he thinks he's winning every time he signs a paycheck to Jose Abreu? No, but I think he feels generous in that moment. Yeah, Charitable. He's, he's helping people out. Listen, he's helping that man feed his family. That's true. He is. I'm sure they're eating great. Not feeding a lot of other people with his skills, but he's feeding his family. Well, they're, hang on. Jim Crane, maybe the most generous man in Houston. Oh, look, nah. at, look at what he's paying Lance McCullers. Look at what he's paying Rafael Montero. Josh Hader. Justin Verlander. Yeah. Paying a lot of money for not a lot of work. Verlander hasn't even pitched yet this year. He you will know start, what? He'll change that tonight. You know what, Paul? You're right. That's right. And that's why you are the minister of positivity. Oh, no. What are we going to do? Astros are off to a slow start. Maybe we're gonna fire Joe Espada. It looks like the season's over. Silence! I am the Astros Minister of Propaganda. I mean positivity. How dare you question the greatness? If you were listening to the show before, you heard what I said. The Houston Astros are 0-0, and the season begins today. All those games against plus 500 teams, iron sharpening iron. But today is the first day of the season. And today is the greatest day of their Astros lives. And of your lives vicariously. We're going to go to Washington. And we're going to take down the Nationals. Vengeance. When they 
put out that 2019 crap and talk about how Juan Soto used to be 21. Vengeance! Did you see what fearless leader Alex Bregman put on his Instagram? A picture of him smirking and flipping a baseball bat, saying, need a long season for a good season. That's a good point, Alex. Leadership! I can't, I can't read what I wrote here. Hashtag outwork yourself. That's also what we put. Also, hashtag nemesis. And the Washington Nationals, Joe George, were everyone's nemesis in 2019. Yep. Jose Altuve leads the majors with 31 hits. He's on pace for 251. He leads the majors in batting average and in OPS. Did you know that Justin Verlander is back tonight, Joe? I do know that. He needs one more strikeout to become 11th all-time in strikeouts. By the way, the three best pitchers in baseball are on the mound for the Astros this weekend. Justin Verlander's ERA, zero. Ronel Blanco's ERA, sub one. Christian Javier's ERA, I forget what it is, but it's pretty good. They're on the hill this weekend in D.C., storming the Capitol. The Nationals will self-immolate like that one guy did outside of the Trump deposition today. Want to hear something else? Yep. Josh Hader, things aren't going so well, not so fast, because he's got a 2.9 FIP, whatever that means, and a 444 Babbitt, which suggests that he's just run into some bad luck, JoJo. Just bad luck. The Just Ast- bad luck. The Astros are fine. The season starts tonight. 1-0. Let's go. <sighs> and there you go. The text line disagrees with uh, the Minister of Positivity. Well, that's because they're they wrong. Think, they think that uh, Panic Man should have been making an appearance instead. No. You know what? They didn't play a game last night. I hate Panic Man. We don't panic here. I, don't, I mean, I like Panic Man, but I hate Panic Man at the same right. time. Right. Panic Man is what happens. Panic Man is, is basically... Panic Man comes in when I'm, I'm being ironic mm-hmm. and making fun of the people who are getting mad. But now I can't really make fun of the people who are mad. Yeah, Panic Man's, Panic Man's a tough look right now. No, he can't He can't show up. Uh, of all the things from Minister of Positivity that I feel best about, the 0.0 ERA from Justin Verlander. <laughs> it's really good, dude. dude. Jose Altuve, he is getting disrespected. So true. I saw this... this article came out i think i don't remember if it was passing or someone from espn and they were talking about all these hot starts from like acuna and mike trout and all these guys mm-hmm. maybe jose altuve was written about in the article but they didn't use him as a headline well that was disrespectful how dare they he leads the league in batting average he's on pace for 251 hits jose altuve should be an mvp candidate right now he i think he they should give him the mvp trophy now already most valuable player Just give it to him right now Who, yep. who's gonna catch him He's on pace for 251 hits right now. Right now. He's going to be on pace for 270 hits by the end of the year. Mm. 27, 270. Coincidence? Mm, I think not. What would 270 be? Would he be hitting 400? Probably. Probably pretty close to it. Uh, yeah, he'd probably be pretty close to it. I would imagine. Man, I want to see someone hit 400 again. That'll never happen. Uh, what, what was the guy's name that Cody and Jeremy were bitching about on Twitter last year? Luis Arise. He, uh from sure. the marlins i i don't uh no offense really i don't pay that much attention. they were like arguing about if he was boring or not he hit like three he hit he hit three they're arguing if four they were arguing if he was boring or not yeah why because because i think cody said he was not electric i don't because he was chasing 400 who is this person he's uh he's a player for the marlins he he hit 354 last year oh wait is this is this uh I, I always get nervous when I say his name. Jazz Chisholm? No, 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 no. His okay. name is Luis Arise. I always get dyslexic with that, and I say yeah. it the wrong way. The vowels, like, they get flipped for me. Oh, I see. I'm an idiot. Of course, I see what you're saying. I've, I've done that accidentally several times. Well, I mean, it's kind not of on though. purpose. Sometimes <laughs> I do things on purpose. No, that's. That one's an accident. That is. <laughs> that one's not a real. <laughs> that one you don't mean to do. I, I truly do not mean but to. But it's funny. If you do it, though. <laughs> but it's, so, not, it's, just, it's not intentionally. No, it's not intentional. Uh, supposedly. Allegedly. 
I'm not sure I believe you, to be honest. <laughs> no, no, Normally, you're an honest person. And I, <laughs> no, no. And I believe you. Listen, this I'm, is one of those moments where I'm like, is he being honest? I'm mean, not so sure. Joe, I am a radio star, phenomenal talent, but like, mm-hmm. let's let's be honest. I'm For not, sure. I'm not the most intelligent man. And very often, sometimes the funniest things I do are unintentional. That's true. <laughs> very often. I mean, often. that's just kind of life. <laughs> I'm probably more funny unintentionally than I am when I'm intentional. Yep. All right. Well, Justin Verlander back on the mound with his 0.0 ERA. This weekend versus the Nationals, I just hope they sweep them. Yeah, I I just want, take two out of three. I'll I take. want to put them in a body bag. I I want it to be eight nothing all three games. Okay, that'd be nice. And if they win those games like that, how, well, where will all the panickers be when the Astros are three and zero on the season? It's true, they'll be three and zero, nine and fourteen on the season. That's what they'll be on the season. But we'll be feeling better on on Monday. We are time. definitely going to be feeling better Monday. If they lose the series. Then we'll just push back the start of the season to to Monday, <laughs> Tuesday, because they got Monday off. Off on Monday. Weird schedule next week for the Astros. Off on Monday, they play the Cubs Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then they're so, off on Friday. It's weird that they're playing on Thursday. I can't remember the last time. It, it felt like last year the Astros always had Thursday off. Yeah, they're playing on they're they're off on Friday because they're tra- I guess this is so funny because they're traveling to Mexico City. I think they have other obligations that the players have to do while they're there. So they're off on Friday, and then they'll play in Mexico City next Saturday and Sunday versus the Rockies. And then they play the Guardians, who quietly work hard, who have the one of the best records in baseball. So and doing it without Terry Francona. Yeah, thirteen and six on the season. So sneaky, sneaky team on the horizon. All right, it's that time. Our ten minute drill. What's going on in the NFL? That's next on Glott and George on ESPN. 97.5 and 92.5. First, let me tell you about my friends at Pendleton Whiskey. Yeah. You know what's a good way to enjoy the Houston baseball team going up the road to D.C. and storming that stadium? You get a glass of Pendleton Whiskey. You know what I do? Big old rock. Two fingers worth of that refreshing, smooth goodness. Guys, Pendleton Whiskey is made with the, one, finest northern grains. Two, it is barrel-aged in American oak, and it's cut with Mount Hood Glacier water. It is fantastic stuff that I've really come to enjoy over the last two years. And one of the things that I like to do with Pendleton whiskey is throw it into a cocktail of sorts. Usually I mix it with coffee. I, I really like iced coffee, but you put a little whiskey in it. It gives it a little extra kick. Really nice thing to drink on a Saturday afternoon. You're sitting down in your back patio, just waiting for Houston's baseball team to get their act together. It's Pendleton Whiskey. It's true Western tradition. Get it at your local liquor store or on drizzly.com. Pendleton Whiskey, it's true Western tradition.
Call on George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Uh, before we get into what happened with Jacksonville yesterday, uh, some interesting betting things Chemical happened. Warfare. Uh, yesterday. Uh, at one point, Drake May, or Jaden Daniels, was minus 350 to be drafted before Drake May. In the last 24 hours, they have now flipped to even money. They're both minus 110. So a very quick change in the betting market and the odds market of who will be the second quarterback taken next Thursday. Where's J.J. McCarthy right now? Off the top of your head, do you know? Uh, let's see. The Because uh, that's the one that I'm wondering about. It seems like the Dude, commanders they... showed some interest in J.J. McCarthy, and Listen it felt this. like he had been vaulting up draft boards at least over the last two weeks. Again, I, I think what we're hearing right now, you, you got to take everything with a grain of salt. Lots of smoke screens out there. Generally, the last couple of days before the draft, you're really going to get some interesting information. Uh, let's go DraftKings. DraftKings, Jaden Daniels, minus 115 to be the number two pick. Drake May, minus 115. J.J. McCarthy, plus 2,000. Oh, wow. Okay. So so he's far off the board. There and. Uh, Damn, see. I was hoping that the commanders would take him so the Patriots could pick either Jaden Daniels or Drake May. Well, it seems like you'll I'd get... I'd take either of yeah. those but and, you'd like to and have your say, choice. screw it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'd like them to have the choice at the number two guy after Caleb Williams. Now, my only thing I will say about this, uh, yeah. while it's interesting, mm -hmm. is April 24th, 2023, according to um, one of these websites, Will Levis was a minus 145 betting favorite to be the number two pick to the Houston Texans. CJ Stroud was plus 500. So the yeah, betting market, happen. the betting market was wrong. He was projected to be a top four pick according to all the betting odds. And he went in the second round. So this could be very wrong. Like it was last year, but it's just, it's interesting to see the betting has changed so dramatically in the last 24 hours, right after we got Adam Peters of Washington saying that they pretty much had made up their mind. Like, they made up their mind, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, here comes Drake May. I think it's going to be Drake May, for the record. Him and Sam Howell are best friends. I think there's a reason why they had to trade Sam Howell. Interesting. Like they both like like they were I didn't know they were best friends, but yeah. that makes sense. They were both North Carolina quarterbacks. Yeah, they were they were courtside at him at an NBA game like three weeks ago. But it almost feels like that's a reason to keep Sam Howell aboard. Can you really have you really want to do a quarterback competition between two it's best friends? It's not a quarterback competition. If he's the second overall pick, he's the guy. Yeah. Well Sam Howell will be the starting quarterback in Seattle by the end of the year. Also one of my takes for two thousand twenty four. I don't think so. You don't think he'll beat out Gino? I'm not a big Gino fan, but I I, I don't understand Sam Howell buzz. I like it. I don't know why. I, I guess I'm one of the side that I like him. I can't explain the it. Seahawks receivers love Gino. They do. Whether it's Lockett or it's DK Metcalf. Like, DK seemed to want Gino in as recently as, like, the last year of Russell Wilson. No. And he was mad when Russell Wilson came back from his injuries after his 24-hour rehab a day work on his hand. Is that because he knows that Gino's going to throw him the ball? No. Or because he's going to help him win games. No, I think he was annoyed by Russell Wilson eventually. Oh. I also would be annoyed. Especially when you Russell stop Wilson. winning. Yeah. And that act does not work. I remember I interviewed DK Metcalf once in Seattle, and there was this big offseason story about mm -hmm. how Russell Wilson had taught DK how to swim, which I'm sure is a story that DK did not want to get out. I don't remember that. And I'm sure that Russell Wilson really wanted it to get out. And I asked DK, hey, would you let Russell Wilson teach you how to do anything else? And he basically laughed and gave you a next question. <laughs> That's great. Uh, all right. The the funniest news coming out of yesterday. It's not, people are meeting with the media. Trent Baalke was meeting with the media yesterday. He's kind of a clown. Like he, I, he's a, he, I mean, he's the reason that the 49ers got rid of Jim Harbaugh. Yeah. And then, had a little downswing yeah, after that. They did with, the Texans thing. With they, Jim Tom Sula. Yep. After then, he had saved them from irrelevance. Who was after Tom Sula? Chip Kelly? Yep. Wasn't there somebody else, too, that was embarrassing? I think Oh, no, that was the Giants with Ben McAdoo. I always <laughs> yeah, confuse yeah, yeah. Ben McAdoo. And, and Jim Tom Sula? Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I guess you're going They're through. They're not anywhere close to the same, but, yeah, I always confuse them for some uh, reason. But here was uh, Trent Baalke of the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, meeting with the media yesterday. 
I still got a couple of days of going through. Coach and I haven't sat down and go, excuse me, gone through the final board yet. I like, play, I play I like one more, let's play it one more time. I still got a couple of days of going through. Coach and I haven't sat down and go, excuse me, gone through the final board yet. Look, I'm, I'm a child, I guess, but like. I, that's a professional right that's there. That's a professional right there. You know why? Joe, he kept talking. He said, excuse me. That's the most important thing. There's a rule. Yeah, but you could have pretended it was like a, one of the reporters. I mean, we know what NFL reporters typically look like. Large, overweight. Like, <laughs> they're just ripping, ripping ass in, in that press conference room. I don't know if the microphones would be able to pick it up. But the microphone was able to pick that up when his ass is firmly under the table is pretty hilarious. We had a rule, Joe, growing up. If you say, excuse me, after you farted... Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed to say that word, by the way, in the house. Farted? You had to say stinker. But uh, made a stinker. Yeah, you, you weren't allowed to say fart. I don't know why. But if you're, if you're ripped and you said excuse me afterwards, no matter how bad it smelled, no one could say anything. Oh, that's tough. But it was, it was a lesson to teach you that, hey, if you toot, you got to apologize. Yeah, that's good. If I mean you break wind... Let us know. What would you do, like, if you were in, like, high school, like, in class? Would you apologize publicly? Probably not, especially if there was a, a girl around. But yeah. over time, you realize, I mean, it is a natural function. You may as well just own up to it and laugh. I mean, it is gross. Yeah, but, every, but in high school, everyone, it's tough. You're right. It's hard to have that kind of, I guess, confidence. Yeah. That this too, yeah. this gas shall pass. This too shall pass. Um, uh, C uh, OJ got cremated. How are we going to know if he had CTE? Good question. Uh, I love uh, how that was a headline that actually came up. I know. We don't get to see if OJ had CTE. Do you need to know like, that a murderer yeah. had CTE? Yeah. Is that going to make you feel better? Yeah. OJ had CTE. That's why he did it. Oh, thank God. The, the, maybe, maybe now the Brown family and Goldman family will stop hassling him for all that. Uh, uh, those civil damages. Uh, so then the Kelsey brothers are always in the news for something weird. They got a podcast here about it. Um, and Did you know Travis is dating Taylor Swift? Uh, apparently the, the words touchdown were iterated in her 31 song album that she, she released. She got new night. songs out right. She took shots at people that were, yeah. that were Kim K taking shots at her. Yep. Shots fired. Mm hmm. 31 songs. That's, that's a lot of songs. And people were like... Quality over quantity, I yeah. always say. I was watching just like television last night, late last night. Okay. I was like, so always be like, I can't go to bed. I gotta listen to T-Swift's new music. Why? It's gonna be there for you tomorrow. Was that was that what your uh, your your wife was listening to music? No, it was a guy I used to work with. Oh, he, he was saying that he was gonna listen and to T-Swift all night? like, I'm staying up till I'm staying up till midnight to listen to every song. And then all of a sudden it was a double album. Now I gotta stay up even longer. Not I not ironically. Not ironically. The, I don't get music people. I like, like, oh, the album came out today. You're right. It, the music will still be there. Yeah. I'm gonna interpret the lyrics and try to figure things out. I listen, you know what I do with music? I just listen. And if I like the melody, I like it. I don't care about the words yeah. at all. Yeah, it's just it's that's but, why it's fun to sing grunge music at like karaoke and then realize, like, oh, this person's talking about killing himself. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, I brought the mood down, guys. I just I just like the way it sounded when Eddie Vedder goes, like, hey, oh, hey, hey, uh, but the Kelsey brothers were at the University of Cincinnati. Travis uh, Kelsey thought he was cool and chugged a beer after he got a diploma, which I'm sure he didn't actually earn. You got to fight for your right to party. Really original line by him. But apparently they did this like jocks versus nerds uh, thing while they were there and they were digging through Skyline Chili. <laughs> what? Which is gross. Uh, They're digging not through good. Chili? And the Kelsey brothers were not digging through it, but apparently somehow while they were doing this, Jason Kelsey's Super Bowl ring fell into the chili, and he lost his Super Bowl ring. They couldn't go through the chili. And, like, That's why I don't believe you it. You can get, like, one of those um, things that you, you skim the pool with. Or, like, he left it in the chili, and then they threw it out, or it fell in the chili and didn't realize. But, like, how do you... How do you not realize it? Those rings are yeah, huge. Like I, I, Have you ever I, put one of those on? Uh... A World Series ring. Okay. Uh, Ted Johnson, former New England Patriot. Love Ted. 
Ted won three Super Bowls with the Patriots, and when he was over at the Texas flagship with me, he let me wear them. They're so heavy. Mm-hmm. Like, even if you have big hands, they are ginormous. You would know if it fell off immediately. This is like, was he hammered and forgot that it fell off? Well, they're the Kelsey brothers. It, it is a little try hard, almost like you're running out of content to lose your Super Bowl ring in a bowl of Skyline Chili. So I'm a yeah. little skeptical about this. I, I think this might be a deep fake. Yeah, also, it, I'm sure it'll turn up at some point. Unless False flag operation. Yeah. Um, And then, oh, did you see what Sauce Gardner tweeted the other day? It just made me laugh, just like how little people know. Uh, um, yeah, I saw this. He, I, just, he was like, how do the te- how do the Bears have two top ten picks? Oh, I thought you were going to talk about something else. No, I was, I was going to that too. But like he was like, it's just it's funny how sometimes people know so little. NFL players are surprisingly unaware of the league that they play in, whether it's yeah. overtime rules, which many players in the Super Bowl weren't hundred percent on top of the newest change to the overtime rules, or yeah, just the goings on of other teams. In yeah. The league. Um, and then he tweeted out this photo. Uh, it was the other big three. And it was a photo of him, OBJ, and Drake. So are they cursed? I don't think that Drake would ever bring down his reputation by putting on a Jets uniform. Yeah, they're not good enough yet. Right, exactly. Like J- Drake's going to join your bandwagon when you're good. I-, I don't think Drake would ever put a Jets jersey on because they've never been good. Yeah. Outside I- of 99. Yeah, I don't I don't think Drake's going to be on that on the Jets bandwagon he hasn't given enough reason to the new uniforms they're Maybe. nice that's a reason yeah. oh, you gotta win games for drake I to be on your wagon I, uh, I mean that's why he caught, that's why the kooks didn't win this year because they gave him a jersey that's not the reason no it's not it's a jamal shed freakish accident but it's a, it's the they drake. were gonna get smoked by uconn anyway i'm just it gonna tell drake myself curse. that i hope the count i hope the mcnair family learns from the lessons of others and when they're in super bowl contention in the next two years they don't give a jersey to drake don't don't even risk it. No, everyone's welcome on the bandwagon. Nope, not him. You're not being inclusive. Not him. Don't want him. Oh, why don't you want to add Drake to the Texans bandwagon, Joe? How'd it work out for because Kentucky? How's Kentucky done since he joined the wagon? One uh, tournament win? Uh, I don't know. I, th- I think I think it's one. I think they won a championship. I think they have won a championship. I think he's been around for a while. I know he has been. I'm just trying. To I think the Warriors won another title after he wore a jersey. Yeah. Like some teams, he, I mean. Like the, the Toronto Raptors. I think they won a title, right? He's an actual Raptors fan. But see, fan. that's different. He's from Toronto. Maple Leafs haven't, but I don't think he cares. Yeah, I don't think he cares. But like the Toronto, he's a Raptors fan. Yeah. I still just think of Drake getting shot in the back, running down a hallway from Degrassi. Is that why he was in the wheelchair? In Degrassi. So yes. he was running at one point. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought I thought that he like started the no, show no, disabled. No. no, I was like, damn, that's interesting. Interesting that a person who was in a wheelchair on a TV show became the most successful. Yeah, rapper he was alive. not always in a wheelchair in that show. He's not in a wheelchair in real life either, right? Fact. I've never seen him standing. I've only seen him in Degrassi. That's not true. I'm kidding. Yes. <laughs> All right. Even I, that was the lie too far. <laughs> that was the one too far today. Wait, what? I thought Drake was a, was in a wheelchair. <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't say that word. <laughs> the word you were about to use just makes me laugh that you almost said it. I'm glad you stopped yourself. All right, how are the Buffalo Bills handling the Stephon Diggs breakup? We'll, we'll look into that next year on Glanton George on ESPN 97.5 and 
It's Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul Gallant and Joe George. So obviously we've spent a lot of time talking about the the Stefan Diggs side of the deal for the Houston Texans and, and what it means for the future of this team and 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 how it improves their situation. But for the Buffalo Bills, because they're still a team that is, well, on your schedule this year, one, and I think is still going to be in your way as you pursue going to your first AFC Championship game or Super Bowl in 2024. I'm really undecided about how I feel about the AFC East. That that division is, I think, the toughest to read in terms of who's going to still be at the top. Like, the North, we know there's just four good teams, and it's a crapshoot. But the AFC East, like, you've got the Jets, who have Aaron Rodgers. They improve their offensive line. They have Garrett Wilson, who seems like a superstar wide receiver ready to break out. So they should be better, but they're a disaster. They've had a good offseason. If Rodgers is healthy, they're the front runners, I yeah, think. I would agree. Because the Dolphins the Dolphins lost some pieces. On defense mostly, yeah. They and, lost Fangio. And you gotta wonder if this is gonna be like most two a years where his health is a problem. And at the end of the year, too, it feels like when things get cold, the, the Dolphins in those candy ass uniforms, they, they just, fall apart. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but they just don't play well late yeah. in the seasons. This is an annual thing. No one takes the Patriots seriously. No one should take the Patriots seriously. And then seriously. you have the Bills, who have who lost their two top wide receivers. Mm-hmm. Uh, the wide receiver they brought in was Curtis Samuel. My assumption is they will be taking a, a wide receiver in the first round. Lost Tredavious White, but he's not week. the same player. Lost Jordan Poyer, I think, yep. uh, who went to the Dolphins. Um, Von Miller is getting older. Yeah, the Bills look like one of those teams is going to take a a fairly significant step back, Mm -hmm. which is interesting given the way that the end of the year and that they once again were at the very least competitive with Kansas City in a playoff game. So I look at Buffalo, I see a team that's on the decline. I think most people do the same. How far the decline is is the big question. Are they going to be like a nine-win team, eight-win team, or are they going to be back at the real bottom? Now, how do you think they're handling the 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 breakup with Stephon Diggs? Well, we finally heard them weigh in on it. Yeah. And I I thought you got some very, very interesting words from Brandon Bean, who I think sounds like an idiot with what he said. Because Brandon Bean is the general manager, and general manager is always going to try to sell you on what he's done. And Bean's done a pretty good job with roster construction over the years. What you need are guys that in this offense are smart, versatile selfless Mm -hmm. interesting choice for a last adjective there and can make plays that their skill set allows them to make if it's a tall guy that josh is going to throw him a 50 50 ball oh like that ball down the right sideline that Mm -hmm. josh allen threw to stefan Diggs that Diggs didn't catch he's got to come down with it interesting i mean we got a couple of sentences here yeah two shots at stefan Diggs. if you're reading between the lines Uh uh-huh if it's a guy that we want to get the ball in his hands when we need some receiving yards after the catch, he's going to do that. That sounds like a Gabe Davis shot. Maybe. A little bit, but also maybe a little bit towards Diggs. I don't know what Diggs' yards after the catch numbers are. I think that's what we're looking for. If there's a one that pops out either in free agency, free agency is over, or the draft that makes sense for us, or a really good two, you know we'll do it. But I don't think not having a one doesn't mean we can't, have success on offense or as a team that's a quadruple negative i'll just read that one more time i don't think not having a one doesn't mean we can't have success mm-hmm. Could, i know you're not great at math joe but yeah quadruple negative does that mean does that mean he's saying we can have success on offense without okay. a one i think that's what he's trying to say here i think so which I okay. I don't I, necessarily disagree with that. I I would point to most of Tom Brady's career, but it's you're better off when you have one wide receiver who's better than everybody. Yeah, I do disagree with him. Um, with Josh Allen as your quarterback. Uh, now, they showed last year that it worked without a number one wide receiver, so they can be right if they're going to take the the philosophical approach they took last year, which was rely heavily on James Cook. 
as your running back and became a become a run, worked. a run first team, which I think they need to be to win a Super Bowl, to have success with Josh Allen, because the way that they were playing before, he's too he's he's too Brett Favre. He's got too much of the Brett Favre stuff where he's going to make too many mistakes. He's going to miss stuff. He can't do the easy stuff all the time. Where if you just let him focus on having a good run game and then occasionally being Superman, whether with his arms or his legs, which you know Josh Allen can do, they can have success. I don't think you need a true number one, but you need uh, a guy who's, it's clear when you look at your depth chart, is at the top of that at least. Like when you look at the Kansas City Chiefs depth chart, you have Rasheed Rice at the top of that, and you know he's at least the best wide receiver on your team, and assuming Travis he's not going to go to jail. Uh, and then you have Travis Kelsey. Historic tight ends. Where, I, I don't know, like, is Dalton Kincaid the wide, the tight end they drafted last year? He'd have to make a pretty big jump year one to year He's a He was a stud coming to the college. I like him a lot. I, he could be that Kelsey guy for he him. He was good, but he yeah. was not... All world. It's his second season. We'll see. Took Gronkowski a little bit of time to become the Gronk that we yeah. all came to know. Like, you don't think Lamar Jackson, like when you look at their depth chart, you're like, Zay Flowers became that guy. Mark Andrews when he's Mark healthy. Andrews, but when he's uh, who's, healthy. Who knows if Andrews is still the same player? Yeah, I, I kind of disagree. With, I totally disagree with him. On, yeah. on Like, I, I understand how you can talk, talk yourself into it, but I would say that if you were to ask Tom Brady, give him truth serum for the majority of his career, ask him how he felt in the seasons where they did not have a traditional number one wide receiver, yeah. he was probably pretty frustrated with it. I'd just point to uh, specifically the year before they got Randy Moss and Wes Welker, 06, where he was throwing to guys like Rache Caldwell. And I'd point to the last couple of years of his time in New England as well. Yeah, like that post-Edelman era. Brandon Bean is handling the breakup like a lot of people would, where he's saying that, yeah, I'm better off. Things are great. We're fine. But take a look at what Josh Allen, where he said, we'll always have a soft spot. I will always have a soft spot in my heart for him. Shared a text with him. I wish him nothing but the best. You look at stats, they don't lie. Numbers don't lie. My lasting memory of Steph was that he was the receiver that helped me become the quarterback I am today. And Sean McDermott, you never replace a player like Diggs. Like, there are some comments about moving forward, but the coach and the quarterback are like, it's going to be hard to replace him. Yeah. And the GM of the Bills is like, yeah, we don't need a number one. By the way, we like receivers who come down with the ball in coverage. And by the way, we like guys who are selfless. Mm -hmm. I very interesting choice of words. It was very interesting. Um, and, and maybe he'd had more of that. He was tired of the headaches more than Josh and Sean McDermott were, honestly, because it definitely feels like it's a semi toxic relationship, not full on T.O. examples like we've seen in the past where you're going to miss the headache because the reward's not going to be there. Yeah, you're look. I'd rather deal with the Stephon Diggs headache because it's not that bad. He's soft compared to what we've seen to some of these diva wide receivers in the past. It does it does get annoying, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to talk about relationships, everyone's dated somebody where it was fun even with the crazy. Yeah. If that other person is crazy. And we're always a little bit crazy to our significant other, much like they can be the other way around. You're, you're going to look at those times and you're going to realize that's just a part of who they are. I, I, I think the real question for Buffalo and for the Texans now going forward is, is Stephon Diggs the same player that he used to be? The headaches for Brandon Bean, it seemed like, were overshadowing the skills that he's most recently shown on the field. Mm -hmm. I think Stephon Diggs would say, well, they stopped throwing me the ball. They were running the football so much more down the stretch. I think Brandon Bean would say, yeah, and we were winning. Probably the winner of the argument right there. Yeah, I still think it's a reflection of Josh Allen versus Stephon Diggs. I think yes. to what you're saying, though, is right. I I, I think that, um, you know, the gunslinger gets shot eventually. Like, no yeah. matter how good of a gunslinger you are, Brett Favre, for all of his many touchdown passes, led the NFL in interceptions and only won one Super Bowl despite winning three MVPs in a row. I mean, Brett Favre's interception record my only, will never be touched. It's so bad. Definitely won't be, especially with the way that the league has changed where cornerbacks can't do anything anymore. But, yeah, I remember a, a six-interception Brett Favre playoff game against yeah. the Rams. And I remember that moment there. I was like, man, 
I would hate to have Brett Favre as my quarterback. He's thinking about retiring every offseason. He doesn't show up for the offseason at all. And then he seems to be just winging it when he's out there. Like, it's fun to watch to an extent, but all those interceptions drive you crazy. And I'm not saying Josh Allen is that careless with the football, but at times he is close. Very fun player to watch. Super talented athlete. Mm-hmm. But I, I think you're right in that moving to running the football minimize the amount of times that Josh Allen could turn things over. And for all the talent that Patrick Mahomes has, the thing I think he's best at is, one, not throwing interceptions. Mm -hmm. Two, avoiding sacks. It's not to say he never throws interceptions, but the less you screw up, the less of a chance you have to lose. Uh, That's what Tom Brady was best at. Brady was best at not screwing up. Yeah, and and look, and always like, I hope, this will be interesting if it works out for Buffalo. I'm way more convinced it's going to work out much better for the Houston Texans, at least for one year. I hope so. I hope you're right. Uh, I, I I do wonder about, for all that Bean's saying and sounding a little bit bitter there, Yeah. I, I do wonder about Diggs, week to week, his ability to handle not getting targets. 100%. And when you look at this deal five years from now, six years from now, there's a very good chance the Texans got smoked, just to be honest. There's a very good chance that the Minnesota Vikings are going to be one of the worst teams in the NFL next year. Let's say they are the worst team in the NFL next year. That means the Houston Texans traded the 33rd pick in the 2025 NFL draft for Stephon Diggs. That's a very good football player that you got for probably a one-year rental of Diggs. So there's risk and reward with this, and you just hope that the reward really shows up in a a big way this season. Uh, Speaking of how to build a team, Brad Holmes, the Detroit Lions, talked about you know, seeking sustained success, being all in. Which approach is better? Because the Texans took the all in approach. We'll see how it works this year. But which one is better for the long term of each franchise in the NFL and for the Texans specifically? That's next on Glanton George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Hour three of Glon George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. So as all these teams are meeting with the media, there's just interesting comments made by GMs, coaches, players, whatever, as you know the NFL draft approaches. 
Brad Holmes, the Detroit Lions, who was, he had, in 2023, he probably had the best offseason you could really have. Like, they were a good football team, the Lions. They were on the come up. They went into the offseason last year. They added David Montgomery, C.J. Gardner-Johnson, a couple other good moves, but nothing that was, like, earth-shattering. And then they went into the draft and they took a very different approach. Like they drafted a running back, a linebacker, a safety with their first three picks. Things you don't typically see teams do in today's modern football and value those positions. But he was meeting with the media and he was asked about going all in versus, um, you know, having or talking about like what they did this offseason. He said that they're trying to build a team that has sustained success versus going all in in this offseason. And it, it's kind of interesting because even though the Lions, Paul, went farther than the Texans in the playoffs last year, I mean, look, they were right there on the cusp of, of going to a Super Bowl, it felt like, last year with Jared Goff. Oh, he had a big lead in the, the NFC Championship game. The Texans took the more, I guess you could say, all-in approach. Do you, do you like what the Lions' approach is? with where they're at as a franchise or do you like the Texans franchise approach a little bit better? It's interesting with where the lines are because I think there are some limitations with where Jared Goff can take you, but Goff has actually been good in Detroit. I, I'm going to keep on saying this. I know everyone's excited about the Texans going all in, but to quote Admiral, excuse me, to quote Grandma Tarkin before the uh, Death Star blew up uh-huh. when uh, Darth Vader, you know, allowed Princess Leia and Han Solo and Luke Skywalker to go back to Yavin 4 you know, and tracking them because they wanted to find the rebel base. Uh, Grand Moff Tarkin says, this had better work. Just like that with the little British accent. If it doesn't work out where you push all your chips into the middle of the table, it's not like the Texans are in a spot where there's so many contracts on the books where they're going to find themselves having to cut a lot of guys. I'm just saying you're now at a point where draft capital wise, I think Warren Sharp put it out there going into a season where you're playing one of the toughest schedules in the league. You have, I think, the 25th most draft capital to work Mm -hmm. with. So you better have, for the most part, the pieces that you need for this season. And with the Stephon Diggs trade, you have taken away some future ammunition to reload. And I get it. Look, they got a full draft class next year. I don't think it's that big a deal that they traded it away. All I'm trying to say is they are going more all in this offseason than they ever have before. And if it doesn't work out and Diggs walks and then Collins walks... Where are you at? Did it ultimately result in failure? Where being smart year to year, which the Lions are trying to do. We'll see if they're actually able to Mm -hmm. do it. I guess in a way, copying the Patriots where you're going to make tough decisions and let people walk eventually, but the Lions haven't had to do that yet. That's how they're going to have to operate. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to go so far as to be like the Seattle Mariners who are saying, yeah, we're just trying to win 54% of our games. That was a load of crap. But I do think that trying to be sustainable is more smart than going all in. Like, if you're playing in a game of poker, sure, you might go all in a couple times. Maybe you're going to bluff. But generally, the more all in you go, like the more often you got a chance to be just completely out and having to reload cash-wise. Where if you play it safe and smart the whole way through, you got a better chance of eventually walking away with the biggest pile of chips. You know, my only, my, my main counterpoint to this is that I would say since 2000, really, like, 18, in the Super Bowl, you've seen two types of teams, and it's one is the home style, which is where they don't have to go all in all the time. But the difference with those teams is I would put those teams as the Kansas City Chiefs and every single time the Patriots are represented because that's not what the Chiefs and the Patriots would do. Now, they have that benefit of having Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady. Where pretty much all these other teams, whether it's the Eagles, the Rams multiple times, the 49ers, the Cincinnati Bengals, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, of course, they've kind of been more of the the all-in model where they've had cheaper quarterbacks and or sometimes lesser quarterbacks, and they've brought in tons of free agents and they've really gone that all-in approach. Now, the win-loss rate is is probably 50-50. The Cincinnati Bengals obviously lost, but the Rams were a team that went all-in that year. So I think you can have sustained success for both. Typically, I would recommend the all-in approach, though, if you don't have one of those top five quarterbacks in the NFL. Like, I don't think Detroit has done enough with Jared Goff as their quarterback to win a Super Bowl. 
maybe because they're in the NFC and it's so much worse that they'll have that opportunity. But I like that while C.J. Stroud's on a rookie contract that they did this because eventually they won't. Eventually they will not be able to have this philosophy. When C.J. Stroud's making $65 million a year in like two years, you're not going to be able to bring in Daniil Hunter and Stephon Diggs and Danico uh, Unless the salary cap keeps blowing up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they could get lucky. Like, if they... There is a point where, like, look, dude, Patrick Mahomes, he's underpaid. His contract is not good. They already ripped up part of yeah. it because of that. They're like, all right, well, hang on. We'll we'll, we'll work with you here. We, yeah. we respect what you do for us, sir. So I think you can have success in, in both ways. Um, but I, I like the Texans approach when you have a quarterback on a rookie contract because you can really only take this approach in the first four years. And because Nick Casario has a good draft record, I also believe that this team will be built to have sustained success as well. I, I'm, I'm with you there because of just him having been with New England. But this offseason does feel like one of those ones where mm -hmm. New England would not have done that unless they were like nervous Tom Brady did not want to play there anymore. Yeah. And even then, at the very end, they, they didn't really do that much to keep him happy. I, I, I think for the Texans, my question is if – what they've done this offseason is actually going to get them closer. Because you would think yes, but the AFC is loaded. The schedule is more difficult. They could be better as a football team and have a worse record. Easily. Easily. And they could be better as a football team. It's very clear they're better as a football team and losing the first round of the playoffs. There's no bums in the AFC South. They have a brutal uh, schedule of quarterbacks that they're going up against this coming year. It's going to be hard. The, and um, yeah, I, I I think that yeah they're they're better with the moves that they've made, but I I don't know that that means even eleven and six, let alone getting to the AFC Championship for the first time. Yeah, I mean like if we if we do the exercise at some point down the road of like who is who are the playoff the seven playoff teams in the AFC, that is challenging because even like like you have teams like that missed the playoffs last year who we think are on the come up or are going to be good. We mentioned the New York Jets. The Cincinnati Bengals are obviously going to be a very good football the team. The entire AFC North. Yeah. I mean, the Browns made the playoffs with Joe effing Flacco. Yeah. Like, you have the Colts, who we like. Yep. And, and the Chargers are still quarterbacked by Justin Herbert. I don't think they'll be a playoff team next year. But it's Harbaugh. Yeah. The Jaguars it's were, tough, man. at one point last year, 8-3 and three for yeah. all the faults that we believe they have. Yeah, the, the AFC East is the joke division. So that, Which is that, crazy because they still can have three really good football teams. I don't know if it's really good. I think they can have three good. I don't think any of those teams are going to be really good. I, I kind of lean that way, but... I think the AFC North has potentially three teams that could be great. And yeah, I'm putting the putting the Browns in there. If Watson ever is Watson again, I'm skeptical about 40 that. yards. He can throw 40 yards now. Throw 40 yards. With the That's shoulder that surgery, that he, an injury that he may have suffered in week three or week 10. They're not sure. Yeah. But they're I hoping just, it was week three now for some reason. Man, it is just... It, the AFC, is, it's it's wild next year. And that's where... Uh, if, if you were to, like, say, like, what is your like your lean on next season? Mm -hmm. I lean that mm -hmm. the Texans are, fans are going to be right. disappointed. Yeah. I, I, I'm with you there. And, I mean, my God, with the way that they're handling this jersey release, I mean, is there... Is there going to be riots? It feels like it. I mean, they're going to be good next year, but how good? Like, what's in front of them is, is so challenging. I just, I don't know. It is, 2024 is going to be a fascinating offseason. How challenging is it? On a scale of one to ten? No, I, I want you to just give me a, give me a random reference. Because you oh. supposedly watched Dune 2 last night. Didn't do it. You suck. I you to... said you were going to do it. I had people asking me on my live stream last night. Thank you, Michael Carroll, behind the glass. I had people on my live stream last night asking if you were going to watch Dune 2. People are concerned. N now I'm actually going to start to pressure you in. I've been very patient. Okay, I I tried to watch it illegally. You're a Harkinian bitch. And shame. Shame. My computer told me that where I tried to watch it illegally was not safe for my computer and it wouldn't play. Would you believe the government? When they, I, I tried when they to get lie a, to you. A, Paul, if there was an option to say, I don't care if this is going to virus attack my computer, I would have hit play anyways. Because, yeah, you do all the illegal streams and such. I allegedly. do. But it just, it wouldn't let me. It wouldn't, it wouldn't let Why me. Why don't you, I don't know, give back to the arts and go to a theater? I got a three-year-old at home. When am I supposed to do that? Going out to get groceries. <laughs> 
for three hours in the Home Depot. <laughs> oh yeah. Else Do I really look like off. a Home Depot guy here? Yes. Last time I went You're to a dad. Home, last time I went to a Home Depot, I had to get a new toilet seat. You know how like <laughs> <it's> a, <laughs> why? Uh, because the people who like we bought our house from. Oh, the people we bought the house from. Okay. Sure. They had the wrong one on there. Like they had the they had the elongated one, but it was the circle. And we had Joseph's birthday party, so I had to switch it. Oh, oh. gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So I had to go do that. I, I I will say when I bought my condo, the toilet seats there were these toilet seats that they kept falling. At, like you could put it all the way up, but occasionally it would fall back. And the amount of well, times I, the amount of times I peed all over myself because the <laughs> toilet seat fell down and it just like started ricocheting pee. That's tough. Yeah, I've, I've had some moments like that. You know, I, I pee on myself every now and then. Yeah. Um, I'm not being a Debbie Downer, Ron. I'm just saying, like, it's gonna be, um. I mean, the funny thing is, blowing I'm up the, the same it's gonna thing be, as Joe. It's going to be blowing up the Death Star challenging. Blowing up the Death Star wasn't that challenging. They blew it up three times. Yeah, they got it exactly right. Yeah, Michael Carroll. This they had to get three it. times. They had to they get a very. Yeah. They Death had to have Star. a very specific shot, and a lot of people died on the way. I would still yeah. call it challenging. Honestly, it seems like they did it with like eight people. Yeah, it really did. Because you know, yeah, low budget true. special effects. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, red one, red five, whatever, and, and then the, yeah. The yeah. guys who got shot down were old and fat, like Porkins and the, the fat guy. That's good and, point. Uh, the, I'm old leader. I sound like this for some reason. They came from behind. Oh, did they? Sounds like a draft profile. <laughs> Speaking of draft profiles, it's time. It's time to build the the Gallant and George big board. Hell That's yeah. next on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5.
You're listening to Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul Gallant and Joe George. You know, time, you know Paul, there is uh, times where you can always remember that it could be worse in your life. You could be a member of the Porter family right now. What's See that? What, uh, Michael Porter Jr. See what, it, what just came out? No, what happened? Apparently their youngest brother uh, just got sentenced to six years in prison. Oh, wow. So one brother gets banned for the NBA. Okay. And then now the youngest brother is in prison for the next six years. Hmm. Yeah. So it always could be worse than what the Astros are. They're having a bad week, the Porter family. Jeez. It's not good. It's not good. Not good at all. Have you watched any, Are you going to watch in the NBA playoffs tonight before we get to our big board here? I'll have it on, but I'm not going to pay much attention to it. It's the playing tournament. Like, it doesn't do anything for me. It's because it's not a seven game series, like, and there's all these injuries. Jimmy Butler, Zion not playing, like that just kind of sucks. It just that is a big it, bummer that there's hard. no Hemi and that there's no Zion. God, he was so good in that first game too. Like it, I was watching a little, like some of the highlights after. He's a monster. All right, it is time to continue to build the Gallant and George big board. You know Lance Zerline for his mock drafts. This is where the problems start in my hometown. <laughs> I pass on CJ Stroud. But have you ever read his scouting reports? Look at the body. Look at that bubble butt. <laughs> that power generator's right there. We're going to pick who the Texans should draft entirely based on these things he actually wrote. A little stiff in the hips. Ooh, they fall. They fall down hard <laughs> and long. And now, our unintentionally erotic big board. We have looked at cornerback already. Enos Rakestraw, Missouri cornerback. Terry on Arnold, Alabama cornerback. Nate Wiggins, Clemson cornerback. Cooper DeGene, Iowa cornerback are on our big board. Yep. And Chris Jenkins plus Tavondre Sweat mm-hmm. are the two defensive tackles that we looked at yesterday on our big board. Uh, now, uh, Michael Carroll is filling in for Austin momentarily because Austin's a, a awesome person and working an eight-hour shift today. Um, so, Michael, you'll have to help me with this. Okay. Um, after Paul describes the uh, attributes of these draft prospects, we have to decide if we're going to smash or pass. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sadly, I can't read with these sunglasses on. Shocking. Now, in case you haven't heard this segment before... I have gone through Lance Zerline draft profiles of specific players at position number three that we have agreed on that the Houston Texans need to look at. Mm-hmm. Safety. And you determine whether or not we put him on our big board entirely based off of the erotic writings of romance novelist and NFL draft profiler Lance Zerline. Yes. So we're going to start off with safety prospect number one. He has the size and the length. Okay. Will make his money as a ball thief. This is a little concerning. Plays with predatory mentality. I don't know if I like that. That's not good. I, I was with it, and then you, you said predatory. I think I'm like, I don't need another Watson. He's a high-end ball tracker. Okay. With ball skills. Average burst coming out of his man cover transitions. Needs to drop down and fit run gaps. What say you guys? I think you put us in a bind here. Uh, <laughs> by use, I think you could have skipped that one, and I might have been a, 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 a smash, but... I was smash. But I got I got a pass. I don't need anything predatory on my team. Okay. Yeah. No, pass for me, too. Also, nope. the, the average stuff at the end... Also not Texans not worthy. Not Texans worthy. Yeah, uh, what, what, his his average burst coming out of his man cover transitions? Yeah, that doesn't sound great. Yeah, it's average. I don't, yeah. nah. Okay. Not about pass. it. Uh, that is Tyler Newbin out of Minnesota, who per Lance Line is the top-rated safety on the board. Yikes. Okay, prospect number two. Plenty of instincts. Guess what else he's got? Ball skills. Okay. Those are important. A whisper of intentions sends him racing. Damn, that sounds hot. Good wrap and roll finisher, but okay. below average size. Dang. I know it's below average size, but I, I like the wrap and roll finisher here. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go smash. Okay. Below average pass. 
Uh-oh. Okay. We didn't have this issue yesterday. I like this. Uh, I have this issue. Well, we didn't have a tie yesterday. I- I'm going to break the tiebreaker okay. <laughs> here. And, I-, I mean, listen, a whisper of quarterback intention sends him racing. Mm. Bonk. That's pretty good. Yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna pass. That means that means that this guy, that means that guy, he, he cheats a little bit too much. That is uh, Dadrian Taylor Demerson. Damn. Texas Tech safety, who's the number two for, listed on the board. 0 for 2 on safeties? 0 for 2. That's not good. This oh. guy, number three, is a little tight. He attacks blockers with a stiff punch. He could struggle covering large patches. <laughs> uh, tightness in his hips. This is all bad. These safeties <laughs> suck. I'm going to pass this guy, too. How about you, Michael Carroll, behind the glass? I, I'm out on him. Yeah, I'm gonna pass. Javon Bullard, safety, Georgia. Jeez. Okay, I think I think this guy, I think this guy is one we're all gonna like. Okay, this is safety prospect number four, and yes, we are entirely reading words that were actually written by Lance Erline. I have not changed them up at all on his NFL draft profiles online. He's a run and hit striker. Okay, good start. Yeah. Plays in the box. Okay. Is a straight dot, dot, dot. Will have his issues when asked to flow with big bending. Angular and long with the size, but leggy and slow when gathering. Needs to do a better job of keying tight ends. Can lack pacing control. Did you say leggy? Leggy. And slow and gathering. I, don't know, I might actually have to have Lance define that one for me because I'm not He's totally probably sure. Probably got big legs. Yeah. Like, long um, legs. <laughs> like, I think we need a tight end on the board, and I don't know how many we're doing today. He's got box skills, which are important. Box skills, yeah. Yeah, box skills. Plays in the box. Yeah, he plays in the box. And he is a straight. And we want our safety to replace Jimmy Ward. I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm going to smash this one because I want a safety on the board, and I'm a, I'm desperate at the I, moment. I would have to agree. I would have to agree. I'm going to smash. I'm going to smash as well because his name is – because he went to Wazoo. This is Jaden Hicks. Uh, okay. Go Cougs. All right. Prospect number five. He can dart into gaps. A little slow playing off of big blockers. Has man coverage potential on tight ends. Okay. Good length, good size. Okay. Looks to blister receivers. I mean. And he knifes into crevices oh. as a box defender. Smash. Yeah, that's nice. This that's is easy. Good. Yeah. I like this guy. That is Georgia safety, Cole Bishop. Okay. All right, some more. Quick burst, smooth strides. Fluid swerving okay. and swiveling. Okay. Swerving Use, and swiveling. Uses his length and feel, but fails to wrap, mm. fails to finish. Runners and receivers can push through him. Oh, no. Uh, I mean, it was so it was going so good for this guy. But you got to wrap it and you got to finish it. Got to wrap so, it. Got to wrap. If you can't do those things, I'm out. That's Pass. Kalen Bullock, safety USC. Mm. That's good because if you play defense for USC, you usually suck at football. So at least recently. <laughs> so I'm glad that's that. We, you we make got lucky Caleb on that. Williams cry. One last one. Okay. He's got very good size. Toughness to tackle near the box. Has make it size okay. and attributes, and he cleans up leaky edges. <laughs> Or really childish. No, um, they're just reading draft profiles written by Lance Zerline to determine whether or not we want these guys. Because if we study the film, everyone's going to know we're full of it. This one's interesting. I'm going to... Because it's all it's mostly positive, but it's kind of boring. Yeah, a little. I feel like I'm not intrigued by this person. He's got size. He's very good size. Yeah. When you got very good size, it's like a lot of things... Now, what's the, what do you think the difference between being good in the box and near the box? Toughness to tackle near the box. Maybe mm. maybe 
Because I'm not like, a fan of tackling near the box. Because I feel like you want to be better. But he go, he does it anyway. You want to be better <laughs> in the box than near the box. So, <laughs> gotta be around this box. Well, you, I mean, some people, some people uh, are 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 talented near the box. Yeah, but what does that do for you? So I want to, I want to. Could do a lot. Some say. That's true. Well, a lot, a lot. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna pass. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna smash. Okay. I'm smashing too. Right. I'm smashing. That is a Keaton Oladipo, Oregon State. So, to wrap things up, Oladipo, uh, Keaton Oladipo from Oregon State, Cole Bishop from Georgia, Georgia, mm-hmm. and Jaden Hicks from Washington State are the three safeties that we are going to put on our big board along with one, uh, Enos Rakestraw, Terry and Arnold, Nate Wiggins, and Cooper DeGina, cornerback, and Tavondre Sweat, Chris Jenkins, a defensive tackle. Look at that! We got we got a pretty big board all yeah, of a sudden. Yeah, we're going to start moving it offense a little bit next I week. think so. I think we're, we're going to go interior. What do you, what's next for the Houston Texans? So we've agreed that cornerback, defensive tackle, safety – are three of their biggest needs in the NFL draft. What's fourth? I know you wanted to look at running back. I think running back might be next. So let's do running back next. All right. Well, so we'll do running backs on Monday as we continue to build out our big board. Uh, we will add throughout the week, and then next Thursday and Friday, we will finalize the order of our b- big board. And then when we're doing our draft show, myself, Paul, Dell, and others from six to nine uh, next Friday night, we'll be using. The Gallant and George big board to dis- to decide if the Texans are good at their jobs or not. All right, coming up next, Josh Hader. How do you use them? And some contradictions we've heard from Joe Espada and Josh Hader himself. That's next year on Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5.
You are back with Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul and Joe. So in just 10 appearances, Josh Hader has already given up the same amount of earned runs in 2024 as he did in 2023. Is that bad? Yep. Or is that bad luck? Uh, probably a little bit of both, but I would lean more bad. It's definitely bad. Some are arguing, though, Joe, that it is bad luck. I have no idea what uh, FIP is, Mm -hmm. but his FIP at 2.9 and his batting average on balls in play, I do know what BABIP is, Yep, are high enough to the point that he might just be Running into some bad luck on the mound. Yeah, and he probably is. And the walks don't help. Like, that's what's happened in the moments that's, that he struggled. But Joe Espada said the other day that he would not use him in the 10th inning. What I find interesting, and like and Chandler Rome put out this article uh, just in The Athletic today, but Joe Espada was kind of singing a different tune this offseason, and it was more of just, you know, we'll use him where... We needed to. Uh, Espada said that Hader has, quote, never expressed not wanting to pitch in certain situations. He is ready to come in and help us at any time, any innings, for however many outs we need. And then, after the game yesterday, or two days ago, Joe Espada said that's his job. Throw the ninth inning. Hader did his job. I agree. And they got to the tenth and they lost. But some people were wondering, I'm one of them, why in the two situations that Josh Hader is coming in the ninth inning, why he couldn't also go a little bit into the 10th. So Josh Hader has had given up the most earned runs or tied the, the amount of earned runs he gave up last year. He's pitching the same amount of games this year for the Astros. Interesting enough um, down uh, when they're down as he did last year for the Padres. So I think part of this Josh Hader, I don't know if it's a problem, Paul, part of the, 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 Josh Hader stuff that they're working through right now is that you've paid him this guy all this money and you're just not giving him opportunity to do his job. Like you're not giving him save opportunities, but his job is to pitch. You know, this is where I get frustrated with pitchers and their strange mentalities. They are a different breed from the everyday player in a baseball um, clubhouse. But Hey man, you're getting paid very well Mm -hmm. to do a thing. That thing is to throw a ball for a strike and hopefully get a lot of guys out while doing it. So when a guy says, well, you were supposed to be put in situations to save a game, he's that special. He's that fancy. He's only supposed to do one type of surgery. Once again, he's throwing an effing ball 90 feet. Right? Is that, Figure it out. is that the distance from the mound to home plate? Whatever. Right you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Here. It's it's just he just needs to get his outs. But you can't just use them in, in closing situations when you don't have those situations. Like that is part of the problem. Like if, if you're not good enough to be in a closed situation, you have to use Josh Hader in other moments and he has to get the outs for you. And I find the contradiction do you, do you view it as a contradiction, what, jo, what Joe Espada said earlier in the season, that just that, or it's just saying that Hater wouldn't do anything and then now saying he's the ninth inning guy? Because it does seem that that's the philosophy that they've now taken, that he will only be used in the ninth inning. Yeah, it is a contradiction. I mean, I suppose you're always allowed to contradict yourself. I, I, I'm not one of these people that says, you're a hypocrite. You must be held accountable yeah, yeah, when yeah. you change your mind. You're allowed to change your mind. 100%. But I wonder what would have had him change his mind from then to where he's at now. Because it's not like there's been a full season or anything like that. We're not even talking about a month of baseball. Yeah, and there's not... I can't imagine Josh Hader has changed his mind again recently. Cause, so I, I referenced this a couple of times, but I want to make sure people can... can we had never... I, I honestly, this is the first yeah. time. I found it today in uh, Chandler Rome's uh, athletic piece from yesterday mm-hmm. about... Uh, Josh Hader struggles. So here's here is Josh Hader on foul territory when he was asked about only being used in safe situations. Well, I'm not going to blow my arm out if you're not going to invest in me. So 
my investment back was I'll get you the inning, I'll get you the saves, and we'll do everything. But you got to put a team in a bullpen around to do that, right? And obviously, the team that we had going into that year, we had a back end bullpen that was unbelievable. So, you know, I think that's where things sometimes uh, show a little bit more of the business when, you know, things kind of fall out of place where, you know, maybe we get into a jam and we need some, we need some help and everybody's expecting that to be me. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it hurts obviously for the fan base and, you know, that's not something that, uh, I wanted to do to them, but at the same time, I have to take care of myself and make sure that I make, make it healthy out of that year. Uh, when you get paid, shouldn't that mindset change? Well, because at the beginning, that's what he says. Right. He says, if you take care of me, things will be different. And he's been taken care of. He's got a massive contract. It's a guaranteed $95 million contract. That's the funny part about this now. I, I totally get that line of thinking before getting paid, saying, well, hang on. Give me a little bit more, and I'll think about doing these things. But you've given him more, so why have they all of a sudden pigeonholed Josh Hader into only throwing the ninth inning and and no more. I, I hope that's not the same in the playoffs. That would be a huge mistake if they thought to themselves, no, we're only going to have Josh Hader throw three outs mm -hmm. and just in the ninth inning. You should look at Hader as somebody who can put out fires whenever. Mm-hmm. And that's where I get flustered with relievers who struggle when they're put into non-save situations. I suppose it is different when you are a closer and you have a lead. You're on the attack because those players that you're going up against, it's nature to mm -hmm. press when you're trailing at the end of the game. So maybe there is some something to why it's easier for a closer in a spot like that versus when it's a tie game. Yeah, I did find that interesting. Here, Josh Hader's quote in, in this piece when he was talking about how it's it's easier to get guys out when they're down because they're forcing things, which I I guess I, I just never viewed it that way. Like I've never thrown a pitch in my life. So like I wouldn't I wouldn't know that. But it it's it makes sense when you hear when you just when you read what he said about how it's just it's easier to accomplish that but it shouldn't be that much easier though ultimately yeah. you're still throwing the ball the same distance it's just the the batter has a slightly different mentality and is going to be more aggressive which i suppose helps you out especially if you got deceptive stuff mm -hmm. or, I, or fastballs that people can't turn around on which hater has the ability to do to your point about the the playoff stuff it, it'll change um it, it it will change dramatically in the playoffs i would imagine i i just i just don't I don't know how you could be a, a teammate and, and say go into a playoff situation and be like, yeah, I'm only going to do the ninth inning, man. Like, if, if that's really the conversation that's happening right now. What's really happening right now is hard to tell because there are, there are contradictions. What Josh Hader is saying is if you take care of me, I'll be used in other situations. Joe Espada is saying, you know, he'll be he's open to it. And then they're only teams when they're winning. So it's not like he's being given the opportunity to just be a traditional closer anyways. So I would imagine it's going to change. And I would imagine it's going to change soon because you can't wait for the playoffs. If you need outs, you need outs. Like the biggest way that this changes is that they don't have to use their bullpen in an unrealistic way going forward because it would be nice to, you know, have a important game and use Hater Presley and Abreu and then the next night be like, "All right, well we're just not going to use Hater tonight because we're not we don't need him." They just they haven't have they haven't been given those opportunities. Uh, it is official now. We just got the email from the Astros. They have officially sent Forrest Whitley down back to the minors. And Justin Verlander has officially been reinstated from the 15-day injury list. Huzzah! So First welcome back. Opening day, Justin Verlander on the mound. Just yep. started April 19th. The real opening day. Let's go, baby. It starts now. Oh, no. Oh, no. After the iron sharpened all that iron. And and look, it was like there was a lockout, Joe. The, the season's a little shorter. I like it. 142-game season? Hey. That's a lot more of my vibe, man. What's the perfect length for you? 30. No. Too short. That's perfect amount of time. 
Uh, just space the games out. One every three days. No. Yeah, that'd be great. No. Yeah, it would be awesome. What are we gonna talk about? I don't want it every single what? <laughs> we, we could talk about the build up to those games. They're gonna there's gonna be a lot more meaning attached to those games. They would be a lot more intense. Yeah. It would be I, I do And we wish... could talk about other things other than sports on yeah. the sports radio station That's true. the other days of the week. I do wish they would shorten it. I know they never will because of money. But it's the one sport where I'm like, Yeah, you need you need to cut down. I hate the NBA argument. Because they people try to argue to shorten the NBA season, acting like that's going to make the players play more when that's just not. The no, they'll just play. They less. will just play less again. They'll find a way to weasel their like way out. Like you cut that game, that season out of sixty-five games, Kawhi Leonard would still only play forty. Like it wouldn't change. Uh, but who's who's ultimately the smart person there? It's just Kawhi Leonard. Hey, but you know what, Kawhi Leonard? Wish I had that kind of power. Play for America. He's going to play for America this year. He is. He's going to be. He's going to be on Team USA. Is Kawhi Leonard American? I guess so. I'm being sarcastic. You made me second guess myself there for a second, where I was just like, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't. <laughs> I could tell. I was like, oh, now, I'm just, now I'm being. Mean. I was like, wait a minute. Well, you never know. Like Carl Anthony. It's true, Th- you never know who's an American. Carl Anthony Towns. Uh, we, we Canadian, American, oh. but he I can't. I, but the way you asked it, can't play for Team USA because he has Dominican Republic heritage and he chose to play for the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic has a team. I think John Calipari was his coach at one point in time. <laughs> I'm not even kidding you. Were the I, Dominican John I, Calipari's coaching I, the Dominican Republic? I think he was at one point. It's a traitor. Uh, well, you know there can only be one coach for Team USA. I mean, Greg Popovich has got a Coach K's dead. I Co- mean, not dead, but oh. retired. But Pop's the coach now. You know, same thing. Is it Pop? Pop's the coach. I believe Pop's the coach this year. Well, you don't think Pop should be leading America into Paris? To get a victory over the French and everyone else? I gotta say. That and the Canadians? It doesn't seem like Pop has the greatest appreciation for the United States. Oh, no. You don't really believe that. <laughs> Do you want me to keep going? What what NBA coach does appreciate the United States of America? Steve Kerr. <laughs> I like sports, and I don't care who knows. Uh, you know what? Ime Doka should be America's coach. From the Olympics to the pro. Toughen these soft boys up. All right. Uh, as we do every every day, we end the show with garbage time. Uh, that's next year on Glott and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. First, let me tell you about my friends at the Highway, Highway Cantina. We were there on Wednesday. Why didn't you join us? Do you hate me? Do you hate good drinks like their tall Texan margarita for 975? Do you hate good times close to a lot of awesome things to do in East Downtown Houston? Whether it's head to the ballpark, go to the basketball arena, or head to the soccer stadium. It's all within walking distance of the Highway Cantina. The food there, delicious. It's not just the margs that have me coming back. You've got wood-fired oysters. I love oysters. I love them. Some people would argue I was maybe eating some oysters before our unintentionally erotic draft board. No, I just I, I just like those oysters. How about some mesquite sausage? I think the best chicken fajitas in town, just traditional fajitas. Look, this is a fantastic spot. Whether you're working downtown and you want to go to a happy hour or you want to impress the boss, the Highway Cantina on St. Emanuel Street is your go-to place. Highway, Highway Cantina. Tell them Paul Gallant sent you by.
You are back with Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul and Joe. Uh, it's, it is not Greg Popovich, the coach of uh, Team USA. It is Steve Kerr. Okay. Uh, Steve Kerr, Mark Few, Gonzaga, uh-huh. Tyron Liu, Eric Spolstra. No Jim Beheim anymore? No. That's good. <laughs> I, I was tired of Jim Beheim at Syracuse. To have him coach the United States of America on top of that, eh, I'm sorry. I just, just didn't like it. Not, you don't want them to run the zone? I mean, if I'm playing pickup basketball, yes. Because pickup basketball and zone, everyone hates on it, but it mm-hmm. works. No one can shoot. Do you know who's on the uh, who's the the um, on the uh, three on three team? Who's that? Because there's, there's three on three basketball in the Olympics now. Who? Uh, some someone named Canyon Barry. Obviously, he's a, a Barry, like Rick Barry's kid, I believe. But Jimmer Finette's on that team. Jimmer. So we got some Jimmer time in the Olympics Is this year. Is he a year. starter? He well, so there's only three. So and there's four guys on the roster. So I would assume so. Okay. Yeah, but they, apparently they don't use NBA players for this. I don't know why. Why not? I don't know. Can you use ex-NBA players? Well, yeah, Jimmer's on the team. You know who I'd want if it was three on three? Jamal Crawford. Oh. Ho, ho. Crawford's so good one on one. Dude, I used to love watching like the Seattle Pro. Did you ever go to that while you were there? No, I wish I had. Oh, it it looks so cool. The pandemic oh, was yeah. the problem. I honestly, I wanted to go to that so badly. Everyone told me these great stories. Seattle weirdly has an incredible basketball. Yeah, that looks so cool. Locally. All right, uh, it is time for Garbage Time. Did you know what happened today? April 19th, 1993. Up in Waco? Nope. Well, Don't is, know. This is when the end of the siege of the Branch Davidian building happened with a fire breaking out. There's only oh, nine people yes. left at this moment in time. That also is one of those historical moments that I very much enjoy documentaries or the television show I thought was great. Mm-hmm. F, I find very intriguing. F David Koresh and F the ATF. Mm-hmm. That's really all I've got to say about that. But that was today. Yeah. A financial analyst claims a growing crisis of the young American male will cause house prices to fall as much as 30%. When? Why? Why? Because young men are increasingly living with their parents and are disinterested in starting families. Okay. And that's going to reduce housing demand. When do they think this uh, 30% is going to happen? I'm trying to figure out when to buy a house. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> like, I should have waited for this to like, happen. We're, ta- we're talking about buying a house this year. I'm trying to figure, like, I feel like I need to wait now. Well, you could wait. Um, the trend of men refusing to settle turn in turn means more women are remaining single into later life leaving them without the income or need for big family homes. The prevalence of video games is what started this all, Joe. And I know you oh, was that they're going to blame video games as a Call this? of Duty player. Yeah. Come on, man. 13% of men aged between 25 and 34 live at home. I know. That's actually well, surprising. I figured it would be less than that. Yeah, I thought so too. Maybe it's the job market. Definitely could be that. Or, or that everything's expensive. Yeah. Like way eggs. too expensive. The egg council has raised egg prices. Dude, our like, rent is it like that we pay for a house is a joke. Yeah, it's so much money. That sucks. So much money. The worst is when you're paying towards something that's over the top expensive and it's not going to anything as well. Yeah, because I mean I'm paying an outrageous amount for my condo, but at the very least, like, it's yours. It's it is mine. Although yeah. kind of sort of the banks, I think. So yeah, yeah, one of those things. Hey, you know what, board member Paul? <laughs> Theoretically, I'm not sure I want that. That kind of responsibility. Uh, a world record was broken this week, guys. Okay. An Idaho man balanced a running lawnmower on his chin for nine minutes and 17 seconds. Why? Well, this man, David Rush, is on a quest to hold the most concurrent Guinness World Records. Okay. He attempted this about four years ago, but was only able to go for three minutes and 52 seconds. 
The lawnmower didn't have a bag on it, so he was disqualified. Yikes. He was looking for uh, nine minutes and 17 seconds. Or excuse me, for 10 minutes, but he got he got close. Well, so how about that? I just, how do you find, like, these people who do weird stuff like this, how do you, how do you find that? Right, because you also have to find that you're good at it, yes. where it's not going to be broken really quickly. You're like, what can I balance on my chin? And then somehow you go from, like, uh, a cup? To a lawnmower? It's it's not like they pay you as well for having these Guinness World Records. Yeah, you just have them. You just end up in a book. That, like, who reads? <laughs> not me. I think I remember there being, like, in some classrooms growing up. Me like pictures. There's usually pictures. In the long, long time ago, me went class, mm. took mathematics and such. Cybertruck. Joe, you got a cyber truck? Nope. Would you oh ever get boy. a cyber truck? Nah. If it was affordable, would you maybe get a, a cyber truck? Maybe a normal Tesla, but not a cyber truck. They look awful. Okay. I, I think they look kind of cool, but guess what? Uh they're getting called back because Oh of, no. Uh, <laughs> because of an accelerator pedal problem. Those cars look cool, but uh, I really don't think it's, uh, they're not. You don't for like me. the look? No, it's not for me. You don't like the look? I, I like the normal Tesla and I would think about it getting it but they I, look too much like porsches for me and i like porsches but i think I, that's why i like it oh okay into a little porsche mm -hmm. in your life maybe one day maybe one day uh squatters have taken over gordon ramsey's home in london or excuse me bar in london yeah so obviously like, this is a big thing right now going on in houses squatting like, yeah like, listen, all across the country why don't you do that joe you instead of renting you can squat you probably have more rights yeah, i'm gonna hard pass on that in texas yeah, Texas is probably one of the states where it's not pretty confident I would get shot. It's not fun to squat. Florida and Texas yeah. seem like they take care of squatting for the most part. Yeah. But the Camden Art Cafe is now the new name of the place that is being uh, the Gordon Ramsay's restaurant that is being squatted in. It's a 13 million pound uh, venue. And they turned it into an art gallery. It's so interesting. And you're not how allowed. You can get away with this. You're not allowed in if you're a corporate shill. But if 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 you're if you're artsy fartsy, you're allowed in. You're welcome. Fascinating how people can just like show up, sit down, and it's theirs. Like, what a dumb world we live wild, in. Wild Wild West. Dumb dumb world. All right, that does it for us today. Indeed. We will be back on Monday. Our unintentionally erotic draft board. We will focus on the running back position on monday can't wait right you are astros taking on the nationals this weekend justin verlander back tonight uh the killer bees with brian and joel today are up next goodbye peace
Ooh, what up, H Town? Hey, how we doing? It's, it, oh, my bad. Go it's ahead. a oh. Friday edition of the Killer Bees <laughs> on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM. We are live from Sam Houston Race Park with a big night of racing and a huge weekend of racing ahead of us. We'll give you lots of details on that coming up. But Brian McDonald is in for Jeremy Brandon, who's taking the day off, traveling with Cougars baseball. Ironically, to Cincinnati, uh, VIP in it with uh, Joe Mixon. But uh, in all seriousness, he was on the same flight as Joe Mixon last night. Yeah, but he sent us a text in our group a group chat that Joe Mixon was on the flight, but he didn't even take a picture. Well, screw the picture. I said, get the exclusive one on one. You could screw, you know, piss off all the Texans, everybody that want, and six ten and, and the highway to hell, and just get us the one on one. He said, no, nah, he didn't want to do that. You know, I mean, Jeremy often claims he's not a journalist; he's more of an influencer. That's true. So I think I think his true colors shown yesterday. That's... Like he. He had the opportunity for, to do the journalistic thing to get the one-on-one interview with New Texans running back Joe Mixon, uh, but he doesn't have enough of that dog in him for the for the journalistic game. A little disappointed. I would expect that the, the Twitchers will be all over him when Should be. they get a chance. Uh, so, BMAC, today is the day. It's a JV day. We've been waiting for it for quite a long time, probably longer than anybody wanted to. Justin Verlander on the hill tonight in Washington to take on the pesky Nats. And lo and behold, we have breaking news. The lineup comes out, <laughs> and the bigger news than JV on the bump alone is, guess who's in center field for Justin Verlander? Uh, is it his personal center fielder, Mauricio hmm. Dubon? It is, because wow. as I think back to the many conversations that Mr. Branham and I have had about this subject, it was always, Jeremy was in complete denial. It was just a coincidence. There's no way it ever could have been that Justin Verlander's personal center fielder was actually Mauricio Dubon. And now, lo and behold, Mauricio Dubon is making an appearance in center field on the night when Justin Verlander makes his debut with your Houston Astros for the year. Yeah, when I first saw the, the tweet with the lineup, and I, I mentioned, like, oh, my God, Joel, like, the Mauricio Dubon's in center field tonight. I, you know, I wanted, like, my, my initial reaction was, like, okay, let's, I, I, I think I'm going to treat this as a coincidence, right? Like, I, I want to side on the idea that Verlander isn't making the call that Mauricio Dubon has to be a center fielder every time he takes the bump for the Houston Astros. But now, we're now not only spanning this across multiple years, we're also spanning this upon across multiple managers. Indeed. So, uh, I mean, Joe Spada, you know, did obviously uh, work underneath Dusty Baker, uh, so there maybe is some carryover there. But, I, yeah, I'm going to have to, I think, give some credence to this idea that Justin Verlander has – Inform the Astros that Mauricio Dubon will be his personal center fielder because this it's is, starting to feel like too much to be a coincidence at this it, point. It really is, and, and the fact is you can't put this now, like you mentioned, on just Dusty Baker or try to say that this was Dusty's thought and not JV's because now we've got a new regime, a new manager, and the same old center fielder, and the fact is is that maybe it was a two, two down to one because in the past, Justin Verlander was able to dictate his center fielder and his catcher now we're at least down to, and we don't know, but we're at least down to a center fielder. But if he decides that maybe he likes Caratini better than he likes Yiner, that'll be interesting to watch as well tonight because of the fact that J what JV wants, normally JV gets. And I think that also has, uh, it starts with the fact that he's buddies with Jim Crane and it goes right down the, 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 the main street of, hey, he's a legend, he's a Hall of Famer, we give him what he wants. Yeah, so if you haven't seen the lineup tonight, it is Altuve leading off, of course, playing second base. Uh, Jordan hitting second, but sorry, Joel, he's uh, he's DHing tonight. He's not in left ah. field. Uh, I, I don't know where are you at with your bet. Are you on? I'm oh, close. I think I'm close to ten. Are you on I pace? Think, yeah, I'm well on pace because okay. I believe he's close to ten games in left okay. field. I believe. So uh, Alvarez uh, again hitting second, DHing, then Bregman, then Tucker, uh, Yonder Diaz catching, hitting fifth. So uh, if if Caratini uh, was his preferred choice as catcher they're not showing any indication of that as of now jeremy pena moving up to sixth mm. a little bit higher than he, he'd been earlier in the season Ch Chaz mccormick who and we'll talk about this with todd Callis. he's coming up at four o'clock today yep. uh but Chaz mccormick has really been slumping he's hitting seventh and left field jose abreu is back at first hitting eighth and dubon the personal center fielder for verlander is at nine i mean overall i i look at that uh I look at that lineup, you know, your, your bench guys tonight are Singleton, Jake Myers, and Kessinger. I think I'd prefer Singleton at first base, but other than that, I don't really have a problem with this lineup. I don't either. I think you're right. I think aside from a flip-flop at first base to give you the potential to have some kind of oomph uh, at first base, 
I prefer Dubon's bat in center field. I believe he can do just – and Jeremy and I go back and forth on this. I know Jake has in, his, in the past been an above-average defensive center fielder. I think Dubon can do what Jake does, but he does so much more offensively that I'd rather have him in the lineup. Uh, and, and I like the fact that, you know, again – Joe Espada has proven to at least be flexible. If a guy's hitting well, he's going to move him up. If a guy's struggling a little bit, he can move him down. And it's not the dusty funk sway in the pawpaw's belly. It's just simply putting the best lineup and trying to get guys in the places where they will be most comfortable and most effective. And in this case, with Pena hitting hot, move him up. I love that. Yeah, I like that. And, look, I think we – I mean, it was game one. I think it might have been a bat one for Jake Myers when he hit a home run he against did. the Yankees, yeah. right? And since then, he's got, he's only had one home run since then. I mean, we, here we are, August nineteenth. Only one home run since, and his batting average is down to two thirty seven. So, I think we're starting to see kind of the kind of the career numbers of Jake Myers, you know, returning to their norm that they, that he's had over over his career. So, I don't mind. I, I I value Dubon's ability to be the super utility, but I wouldn't mind even if it's kind of funny that you know he's quote unquote a personal center fielder for Justin Verlander. I don't know. Uh, the the means that we're get, which we're getting there are a little bit funny, but the if the end result is Dubon playing more, I think he's the better hitter, so I'm fine with it. See, here's my thing. Uh, you know, I already had major concerns about Jake. I had yep. to kind of I had to kind of temper those di- that that displeasure when he did start the season after a hot spring uh, spring training. <laughs> First and bat, man, with a, with a dinger. <laughs> but I'm right back to saying I told you so because I just don't trust him, and I I don't think as highly of his defense as 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 some might look at the numbers and 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 think. Uh, but it, it, as you mentioned with Mauricio Dubon, the thing that's interesting to me is, yes, he's a super utility, but you have two glaring needs right now in this offensive lineup. It's first base and then figuring out center field. Sure. A- and so if, if center field can be solidified more by a guy that has proven to still be a stick in this lineup, when he's in the lineup offensively, he's effective. And if you're not losing a whole hell of a lot in center field, this is the guy that I want in center field. And then if you have to try and figure out different ways to kind of make do in the infield, so be it. But I like the fact that if he's in center field, one of those two positions offensively is more buttoned up. Yeah, and I, I think maybe sometimes we get uh, too caught up on where exactly he's playing. But the main thing that I think we need to get to is that Dubon's playing every day. Like, I, I would like to see him as the quote-unquote regular everyday center fielder. I, I, I'm with you on just not really believing in Jake Myers being a uh, good enough offensive player to stay on the field. And then, you know, even though Dubon's in center, if you do have an injury to, you know, an infield position or a guy needs a day off, there's no reason on that day that Jake Myers could step in sure. at center field and then Dubon moves around. But if you still get to the main part of it, which is Dubon playing every day, then I'll live with the rest of how else they get there. Well, ideally, the other thing, too, BMAC, is if Chaz McCormick was hitting the ball a little better, that yeah. was the, ideally the guy that I wanted to be in center field anyway. But you're right. If if Chaz could be the guy that fills in one day in center field or Jake's the guy you're going to give a start to in center field, it's just that one day when someone on the infield needs a break and Dubon goes there. But if he isn't truly indeed, and he is, and there's no reason to believe he's not, your super utility, use him as Joe Espada feels necessary. And right now, because of the deficiencies we've seen, center field, first base, use him in center field, and then if he needs to come into the infield and spell Altuve for a day or, or Pena or, or Bregman, then you can put one of the other guys in center field, he goes to the infield, you're absolutely fine because I don't trust the other bats off the bench, and right now this team needs to give its pitching staff all the runs it can, and that's why I think you got to fill those holes and just – put Dubon in the lineup for the foreseeable future until things kind of sort themselves out. Yeah, there's really not a single bat on. And that was kind of one of the problems that we've had uh, when talking about what the Astros did this offseason. There's not a single bat really on the bench that you can turn to that you feel confident in. So Dubon really does need to be an everyday player. And you're right, you mentioned Chad's uh, uh, scuffling. I mean, I think that is, I think, part of what made the other players struggling so glaring. Like, if, if Chaz was hitting at the level that we saw last year, then I think you're probably excusing a lot of what you see from, you know, the, the eight and nine guys. But the, 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 the one through nine becomes a little less deep when Chaz is, see, I, I, he's hitting right now 133 with a sub-500 OPS since April 5th. Yeah, this he's, is – He's been a bad offensive player since April 5th. When, when the three of us were having these conversations going into the season, the, the one concern that I had was that he had a career year last year. 
that it was it, certainly it, seems so. It was a notch above what we had known him to be ever since he's been a major leaguer. And, and sure, there there was one school of thought to say, hey, this is the the springboarding of his career. Now it's this is where this is the new bar that's been set. This is where he's going to go. But the alternative to that is what we're looking at right now, and you're hoping that it's not he doesn't sustain this level of effort offensively for the rest of the season because now he's about as 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 useful as Jake Myers in the Ooh. fact that. As much as you rely on, don't him. put Jake Myers on him. Well, but I'm saying, I mean, I need a whole lot more production. And even to me, it's not even one of those situations where meet me in the middle, kind of come back to the means and fall back. He could fall back a little bit from last season, but if he's going to start in the outfield, especially a corner outfield position in the major leagues, he's got to be a lot better. Yeah, I mean, last year I, I agree with you. It's probably we're probably going to look back uh, when we get you know five years from now. If we, if, pardon the phrase, Joel. When we look at the back of Chaz's baseball mm. card, we're probably going to see 2023 as his career year. I mean, he had like, a, I think he was, what, third on the team in OPS, maybe second on the team in OPS. Uh, he, he he had a, an amazing season, I th- and he added on like 19 steals to that. So there, we very well could see 2023 being the career year for Chaz McCormick. But, I mean, let, let's get back to, to Verlander. I mean, on the mound for the first time tonight and on the major league level uh, the, for the Houston Astros, Going, I believe he's going up against Mackenzie Gore, is he not? Yes, he is. So yep. Mackenzie, yep. Mackenzie Gore has been really good this season. Former uh, top ten prospect for the Padres, came over, went over to the Nationals in the Juan Soto uh, deal, and right now he's two and zero with a two eighty one ERA. So the young guy certainly seems to be figuring it out. What are your uh, what are your expectations tonight for Justin Verlander in his first major league start of the season? Uh, I think that's that's where it gets down to expectations versus hopes. You know, my hope is that he gives you six innings and gives up. It's a quality start. He gives up two runs, two two runs to a Nationals team that shouldn't be overpowering to him. But if he can keep it to, to six innings, three runs, or six innings, two runs, I'll take that out of him. I just don't know what to expect from him because he, he was so rocky in his two minor league starts, and I know you're oh, working yeah. on things, and, and, and he's the first one to tell you, as long as he felt great, don't look at the results. But the fact is, is that, at the end of the season last year, we saw that fall off or the feeling like you're never going to get the old Justin Verlander that, that he used to be when he even in an Astros uniform, not the Tigers version. We know that's gone. But I think that even then his fastball had taken another notch down. He looked like he was, you know, not quite himself. And so my expectation would be that realistically – Six and three is probably more fair. Five and three might be more, you know, along the norm. But I'll take what I can get at this point because I expect him to be better than a lot of the starters that have let this team down early in the season. Yeah, I think I would settle with, uh, and you pretty much nailed it right on the head with the, basically the line that Hunter Brown gave you in the Tuesday start against the Braves, which was six innings, two and runs. Um, he gave up five hits, struck out three. Because uh, Verlander, like you mentioned, he's not quite the, or at least from the strikeout and velocity right. uh, angles, he's not the D- Detroit Tigers uh, version of Justin Verlander. not the old Astros. Well, Jamie. I mean, la- last last year, when once he got to the Astros, his uh, his ERA, or maybe, no, I'm sorry, th- I, I'm, I'm a little bit forgetting the timeline here. It was the second half of the season. So second this half is, of the season. So this is a little bit more, or a little bit less than just his time with the Astros, uh, or regardless. But his ERA second half of the season was below three. So I think he could still get done the ERA, the run prevention yeah. ang- part of it. But it's not going to look the same. He's not going to hit the same velocity, and he's not going to have the you know 11-plus K per nine that he would have in the Tigers days. That's where I'm at. Like, the, the fastball is, has gone down a few notches on the miles per hour, but more so the strikeouts are way down from what they've been for the majority three of his career. Three years in a row they've been down. So, yeah, yeah you're not going to all of a sudden find the fountain of youth, and that kind of stuff is going to come back, especially – dealing with a spring, getting into spring training when he got a setback due to his shoulder. So it's going to be interesting to see. What do you guys think? Where are you at? What are you looking for? What are your expectations versus what are your hopes for Justin Verlander, Verlander tonight? Realistically or not, 713-780-3776. Call or text the show. You can reach us via Twitter, at Sacked by BMAC, at Pac-Man Joel with a K, as we will be here till 6 p.m. Sam Houston Race Park, right off the Beltway 8. Uh, between the airport and 59, you know how to get to them. You know how to get to us. We'll be here until 6 o'clock. Back with more of the Killer Bees right after this. ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM.
Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at Sam Houston Race Park. Here's the Killer Bees, Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. Live from Sam Houston Race Park, it's a Friday edition of the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM. The Hive is alive, therefore BMAC is with us because Jeremy is not. Jeremy taking a day off, traveling with the Cougs baseball team on the way to Cincinnati as they went last night. Uh, BMAC and I'll take you all the way till 6 o'clock right here as racing will be underway all weekend at Sam here Houston Race Park. And uh, we're going to be out here till 6, but you guys should stop by all weekend. Lots of great stuff going on. They got a diamond dig tomorrow night where they have, I believe, $23,000 worth of diamonds that are going to be hidden in the infield. God, I hope everybody finds yeah, them. Yeah, apparently 10 guests will win a piece of jewelry from Shannon Jewelry's. Uh, Shannon Jewelers Diamond Dig is uh, is the sponsor. It'll be after the fourth and sixth race. Uh, they're also going to have cupcakes, glasses, and hat giveaways. Okay, cupcake. Uh, <laughs> yeah, is that sponsored is that, by Jeremy yeah, Booth? Is that, is that better is than that pumpkin? Yeah. yeah, maybe Jeremy Booth can get uh, in on that instead of Hey Pumpkin. Speaking of hats, I don't know if you looked ahead to May 3rd, Kentucky Derby weekend, but they're going to have a hat contest. Oh. So that, that'd be – I mean, even if uh, – you know, even if the, if the, if watching horse racing isn't your biggest thing, I think people watching with seeing all the crazy hats yeah. would be quite a bit of fun. Because you know, Derby Week in at the actual Derby, that is literally some all world people watching. Oh yeah, elite level people watching, no doubt. Uh, so some of the other people were chiming in on the text line. Someone said, "Who cares as long as Verlander gets a win, uh, seventy five sixty? My only concern is he can go the distance or be the next Presley." Please text back what you mean by <laughs> be the next Presley, unless yeah. you mean Elvis. I don't know what you're talking yeah. about, but in terms of going the distance, don't count on it. I would think no. that he's probably on a pitch count of 80-ish or less. Yeah, I don't remember what his final pitch count was for his last start with the hooks uh, last week, but I know his longest uh, minor league start in this rehab was four innings. I think it was four innings around 70 pitches. Okay. So I can't imagine, what, what would you put the number at, like 85 pitches I think probably? He's, I think it's hovering right around 80. I don't think they want to push him too far. You know that you are dealing with, but I don't think it matters in this situation, like trying to save arms in the pen. I think this is one of those deals where he's such a vital cog to this team long-term this season that you can't take any chances. No. And, I, and that's why I think that no matter where they are, and you know he's going to be a bulldog and want to stay out there, I think it's going to be right around 80, probably max around 85. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good number. And it does help that the Astros had the day off yesterday, so hopefully that should mean all arms available for today's game and then you figure it out for the rest of the series over the weekend. Hope that uh, Javier, which, I mean, that's never a guarantee, but hopefully uh, Javier and Blanco can uh, – look. If, if Verlander goes short, hopefully they can pick up some of the slack and save the arms on Saturday and Sunday. As good as some of the young players are on the Nats, overall you should be looking at a series that you can win. And the other thing is is that you have your three best pitchers right now going because you have JV, Blanco, and Javier, but not in that order, JV, Javier, and Blanco. You have those three guys going. That's better than you've had in terms of three straight starters that you could go to that you can rely on. So you have to capitalize on everything right now because you played a lot of really good teams early in the season. You lost a lot of close games. You were outscored 31-4 to from the seventh inning on and lost a lot of games you probably could have or should have won. Now you need to kind of reverse fortunes, pull the 180, get some more wins in the win column, and go from there. 4-3-2-1 says, uh, JV gives up one or two bombs, two or three runs, four to five hits, five innings. Okay, three runs in five innings. I, not I, a quality start. Not a quality start, but it might be enough to win this game. You're mentioning the fact that he's they're, they're, they're facing a, a, a fairly good pitcher, but at the same time, this is a really good hitting lineup, and this is probably the best offensive lineup they could put out there, Sands, Singleton, for Abreu. So I would take that from Justin Verlander in his first start back because he's traditionally not a guy that's going to put the foot down on the gas pedal and, and really try and shut a team completely down. He is – kind of susceptible to giving up some bombs so if he gives up three runs in five innings I think I still think that's a game you should win yeah oh, I, I guess the question would be then like if if I offered to you five innings three runs that's that's a number you would sign up for versus the unknown I I think I would because this is his first it would start. be better than his minor league starts because those those minor league starts he had two he had one for uh, Sugarland and one for the the hooks down in Corpus uh, 11 earned runs in seven innings. Well, that's where I was going. I, I think that based on it's his first start in the bigs this season and couple it with the fact that the two starts in the minors didn't knock anybody's socks off or say the old JV's coming back and when he's back, he's going to roll. 
I'll take that as the opening first baby step to getting him back to at least, you know, the kind of Verlander that we can stomach at the start of the rotation. So I, I guess at this point, yes, I would take five five innings, three runs, and and l- learn to to live to fight another start. Would there be any sort of performance? And I, I mean, there's obviously got to be a line here, but is there any sort of performance where you're go so far beyond well oh it's just his first start to where you actually would get worried like because I think a lot of us and me included sounds like you as well uh, are, are willing to be completely dismissive of the two bad starts in his minor league rehab starts he's a 41 year old you know Cy Young MVP level pitcher he, he's working on stuff I'm not really worried about minor league rehab uh, stat line but if he goes out and gives up I don't know six runs five runs where are we at like what what would it take for you to watch a start uh, his start tonight and go uh oh, we may have a problem here. It's actually kind of easy, B Mac. I mean, because of the fact that unfortunately we've seen enough of it to start the season. If he gives you a Hunter Brown esque start in Kansas City, if he gives you uh, some like of the, breaking, <laughs> y- yeah. I mean, if you start talking about uh, some of the young guys that have had a chance to start for the Astros this year and go, that's not what you want to see. You want to see if, if, if there's a start that worries me that he struggles with his command a little bit, the fact that he gives up multiple runs early in the game and, and then maybe gives up runs in multiple innings, then I'm going to start you know, being a little bit more concerned because of the fact that the situation matters, right? The Where this team sits right now is different than they've sat in years past and in the recent history of the golden era to where you, you're relying on him more than maybe you ever have, even when he was the horse at the start of the, the rotation. So you need a guy that doesn't give you reason for pause you need a guy that gives you reason for optimism that this was the first one he's going to continue to get better he looks like he's still got his a game so that that's where i would be it sounds like what i'm hearing you say is the astros need a stopper oh i don't think there's any doubt i mean look they got two guys in the rotation you can count on there's five spots in that rotation and they'd like to go to six if any of those other things are going to be true and they're going to be a competitive baseball team you have to have four of the five guys you can rely on while you figure out who your fifth starter is going to be. And right now, yeah, Hunter Brown looked better in his last start. Yes, J.P. France looked better in his last start. I can see those guys being another one of those guys. But at the front of the rotation, I need a veteran that can pitch, not throw, that knows how to, you know, bulldog his way out of situations. And you need a Verlander that is kind of a stopper. Yeah, it's – Look, you're facing a Nationals team, and it's easy to, you know, the crap on the Nationals. They haven't been a good team really since they won the World Series. But, I mean, sadly enough, they're sitting at eight wins. The Astros are at six. So as much as we want to crap on the Nationals, the Astros are looking up at them in the standings. So, uh, and that kind of leads me to uh, where the the question I have going into the series. When you look ahead uh, and what's coming up for the Astros, this, this including this series, their next four, uh, you have uh, before you get to a Mariners series, which will be really important next month. You have the Nationals this weekend. You go you you go to face the Cubs, who are a winning team at 11-7. You got two games at the Rockies, and then the Guardians come to town, uh, who are 13 and six, leading they're, they're the playing uh, good baseball. American League Central. Yeah, and at, right after that, if if that wasn't like cause there's two winning teams there, so that's not exactly uh, complete. You know, completely filled with cupcakes. Once you get done with that stretch. I mentioned the Mariners. The Mariners coming to town. Then you're at the Yankees and at the Tigers, who are both above 500. I, seeing this schedule coming up with the Cubs, the Guardians, the Mariners, the Yankees, the Tigers, I'm kind of looking at this uh, national series. Tell me if you think this is crazy, but almost as a must sweep for the Astros. I'm not going to say must sweep, but when I was thinking about it, looking at it this morning, it's more like your, your mentality now has to go back to a mentality that I talked about in years past when you were kind of in the driver's seat. But it, it works both ways. Just win the series. I don't think it's a must sweep, but it's a must win for the series. You have to take two out of three. You have to you have to show that you can right the ship because sooner rather than later, if you start winning series, whether you sweep them or not, you're going to get your record back above 500. you You're going to get back to respectability and beyond, and you're going to be competitive in the American League again. So I don't think it's to the level of desperation like down the stretch late in the season when you're chasing a team by four or five games when every win is hyper important. I think series wins are what's really important right now, that you go out and take two out of three, three out of four, depending on how long each series is, and in this case you take two out of three from a Nationals team that you still are better than on paper, should be better than at the end of the year, and need to be better than to get back into respectability in the American League. Yeah, no, I, I think you're certainly uh, taking the more logical approach than probably I am here. I mean, that is so you, – well, you're if right. You, if you think they need to be – are you more desperate? 
Yeah, no, I do feel desperate. And, that, and, and maybe I'm – look, maybe I'm being spoiled Astros fan – uh, you know, even though I grew up some during some of the lean years of the '90s, before, uh, before they when they were getting either missing the playoffs or they're, or they're tipping their hat to the Braves pitcher every pitchers every year in the postseason, so maybe I'm being spoiled here. But look, I mean, the the math is going to add. I mean, I think you're right. The math of you know you win two out you, two out of three, uh, and you do that over a long period of time, it's going to work itself out. But when you look at six and fourteen, it's just like man. They got to go on a run here at some point, and when you go into a series against a team like the Nationals, who even though they have more wins than you, they are a sub 500 team, and you're throwing out Verlander, Javier Blanco, your best three pitchers, and it, it feels like I would walk away with just a 2-1 series win. Uh, not speaking for you, not speaking no. for the listeners, but speaking for myself, I would walk away feeling disappointed. As long as they win the series, I'm not going to feel disappointed. But the follow up to that to you would be of the three guys pitching this weekend. Is it safe to say Verlander's the guy you trust the least? For this weekend, yes. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. This, I, for think, I think that's realistic. Specifically for this weekend, yes. Like I, I mean, over the course of the season, Verlander, I, I, I have full confidence will round into form and start to look like the Verlander of the second half that we saw last year, which, again, people forget it. They see his season-long ERA and like, yeah, okay, maybe he's slipping a little bit. But his second half ERA last year was under three. So hey, we started to see – uh, the old Justin Verlander, he is old, but the, the you know the Justin Verlander numbers that we we, we started to, to, to or we, we've come to expect over the course of his career, but for specifically this weekend, this start, given you know the the, the quality of his performance in the minor leagues, given that he's going to be on a pitch count, given that he hasn't pitched in a major league game in I don't know how many months it is now. I'm not going to try to do Joe math on the air. But, yeah, I think I would have more confidence in Javier, who's been pretty much great in every single start. Same thing with Blanco. It's interesting because I think some of the orange Kool-Aid drinking Astros fans of uh -huh. Twitter have made an appearance on the twi uh, uh -oh. the, on the text we line. Got? Because we've got a couple like this one from 6015. I got a bad feeling about this. I think JV gets shelled. Oof. Okay, Don't really care for that one a whole lot. No. Followed up by another uh, like uh, Sunshine and Roses. Bet the entire ranch on the Washington Nationals. Wow. Tonight? Yeah. Or just, oh, man. I, I, I guess more people than not are, are looking at the starts in the minors and thinking there's something to this. Now, 3311 says, how do the Space Cowboys feel about JV trying things out at their record's expense? <laughs> They don't care. They, I mean, I'm sure they care to some degree. but, but that's, No, because they'll, they'll fake JV for the gate. But, but the flip side of that for me is – JV stat chasing, and I don't I don't want to call him like a stat chaser for his career, but we know that the wins and the strikeouts are very important to him right now. Sure. And, and then he also has a vested option to where he's got to pitch a certain amount of innings. 140, yeah. So, therefore, there is credence to the fact that when he goes to the minors, he does not care about the situation the team is in. He is trying to figure things out, maybe work on a pitch that he's been working on, work on like controlling and placing a few pitches differently than maybe in the past so that he can fine-tune it so that when he gets back to the bigs, he can chase the stats, do what he needs to do, and get where he and the team need to get to. I'm not worried about what he does in the minors, but when you give up, I mean, a, a guy that's been that good of a major league pitcher for that many years against minor league lineups, I just feel like there's something that to be leery of to some degree when he gets beaten up a little bit. And I, I think that is, is certainly uh, or at least possibly a byproduct of uh, the overall feelings the Astros this season have given us. Like, I mean, you look at Verlander's numbers, 11 earned runs through seven innings and over his two minor league rehab starts, and obviously that's not good. But I think if the Astros, you know, if, if you were to flip their record, instead of being 6-14, and 14, they were 14-6. and six. You know, everyone's having good vibes. Everyone's feeling confident. They're, the Astros are looking like the team we expected them to be. Then I think people would be a lot more willing to dismiss, like, oh, he's, it's a former Cy Young Award winner. It's a former MVP. He's, Justin Verlander's 41. He's done this a thousand times. He's working on stuff. But because we're looking through the lens of, holy crap, the Astros are bad. They have the second worst record in the American League behind only the White Sox. Then viewing Verlander's minor league rehab starts are, are tunneled through that vision of holy crap, everything you know, the sky is falling, and I think that gets misinterpreted just because we're all in a in a, in a our heads are all spinning because of this bad start. So let, let's let's again spin through some of these because again now we're looking and searching 
for positivities as well as the negatives. But we we followed it up as uh, 5895 says, I'll be fine as long as he's in the top four of our current pitchers in the rotation after tonight. If he looks like he should be number six or number seven, then I'll start to panic. I, I think that one start in might be too quick to, like, push the panic button. It's also a low bar. But I feel I feel where they're coming from simply because of the fact that they've dug a hole for themselves. So, like you said, you're, you're, he's a he's a stop get. He, you're relying on this guy tonight. Now, here are the two that always make make me laugh because one of them is just a guy that likes to bang. He listens every day, <laughs> and all he wants to do is bang on us, no matter how wrong he is. Okay. And I'm assuming it's a him. Uh, could be my mistake. Uh, but a, 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 he fought, first of all, I'm going to give you the negative first because. This is 6030 who loves to come at us. And I, I, I lost it here for a second. Hold on. Uh-oh. He he always bangs on. He said, team is two going to lose two out of three. This team is trash. So you can stop trying to butter up people like you did all of last season, trying to convince everyone this was the best lineup ever. First of all, I don't think we ever said the best lineup ever. But, oh, by the way, because I did want to follow it up with reality, which is this team had is one of, it was the best offensive, was it OPS, and the, one of the best offensive teams in the American League, if not the best offensive team in the American League. They're second least in strikeouts, fourth highest in all of baseball in OPS. So if that is indeed the case, you are wrong, sir. We are right, and don't put words in our mouth. But continue <laughs> to listen on a daily basis because I don't know why you continue to do this just to stir the pot. Yeah, look, I, I think some people are going to be It's honest. not the offense. No. Well. Except for Abreu. I, I, it is. I, I'm, I'm mostly with you. I do. If you, if you were if we were going to blame the, the offense, and maybe this is something we could carry over. But I think you could blame maybe the consistency. Sure. Because they have nights where they score 10. But you're they not score the best. Eight, you, they score nine. And then one run the next day. Right, but that's every that's baseball. Like sure. that's every team in baseball. Now the good thing is is they're not going and completely disappearing after double digit games as much as they did a year a year ago. But at the same time, if you are the number one team in the American League and in the top four in baseball in OPS you're doing something offensively. You are sure. not disappearing on offense. So it's outlandish to go and keep texting the show that we were wrong, thinking that and putting words in our mouth about how great they were. This is a damn good offensive lineup. Yeah, I think the frustration comes from – I'm just looking at a stretch between the Rangers, the Royals, and then back to the Rangers series into the Braves series. So the last game uh, against the Rangers when you, they were at Arlington, they scored 10 runs. They go to Kansas City, score 3-2-3. Three, three. You then face the Rangers again. You score 8-9-8 eight, and eight, in which you take two out of three. Which is you, good. Which is amazing. And then you score 1-2-4. <laughs> so I, I think that's maybe – and it, it, maybe it's unfair. Maybe, as you said, that's just baseball. That's just the natural ups and downs of a long season. But I think maybe that's where some fans, if they are putting some blame on the offense, are coming from. Not so much that the offense has been bad, but you just have these wild swings where you go one game scoring ten runs to the next day scoring one. And even though the, that, even though the ten runs is going to make the overall numbers look pretty good, the, those just complete stinker games – especially when you're facing teams like you, that you feel like you should beat, which I think a lot of Astros fans felt about going into the Kansas City series. We obviously know now that they're a better team than we expected. Uh, but they I think that might be that worse. Of, yeah, that, that might be a, a source of some of the frustration. It might be. But, you know, I think, again, a lot of the, the panic, the quick to bring negative to the table – is centered around the slow start. And, and when, oh, yeah. when you dig yeah. deeper on the slow start, I've been adamant about the fact that you didn't get your doors blown off, you know, throughout the, throughout the course of the first 20, uh, 15 games of the season. You were in every game in the Yankee series. I think, quite honestly, you should have won at least two, if not three of the four, from the Yankees, and you were in position to do so. So that that already was a positive for me that this team isn't that bad. The, the one series that just drives me nuts is the Kansas City series because yeah. it really is inexplicable based on the fact you thought they were starting to play better, the offense hadn't let you down, and then it starts with horrible starting pitching, but you're just going, my goodness, that was the one that kicked you right between you know the, the, the left and the right and going, uh, it's just uh, it, that that one is why I think everybody is kind of a little bit more off than maybe they should be. Yeah, I think, look, I mean, if, if we're trying to rewrite history, I think if the Astros go into Kansas City and win two out of three, even though they would still have a losing record at that point, they would be, uh, what would they be? They would be eight and 12 instead of six and 14. Uh, I still think we, I mean, we would still obviously be disappointed. It'd still be a losing record. It'd still be four games under 500. But I think you'd be more willing to, I guess, uh, see or, or play the 
the song of, okay, this is a team that's going to figure it out. This is a team that may be slumping early because the schedule's really tough and it's going to lighten up a little bit going forward. But you get swept in the way you do against the, Can- the Kansas City Royals, especially with that Hunter Brown performance when they lose 11-2 in game two. Or maybe that – actually, that was that game three when they lost 13-3. to I, I lose count. They had, they had a couple blowouts in that series. But if, if you take two out of three from Kansas City, then I think p- people are I think looking, I think people people are are looking at this yeah. a, lot, a lot differently, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, are, are we late? Did we, did we yeah, get, we, yeah, we need to get to break. we got to get to a break. We're going to come back with more of this. You guys want to get in on the conversation. Lots more to get to because, again, a lot of finger pointing going on. Maybe it started me to really kind of – you know, double down with the the Royals series. But, you know, who do you blame the most? A lot of people pointing the finger at Abreu. A lot of people pointing the finger at Espada. Who are you going to blame? The starting pitching uh, it can be ro- rolled into that as well. Injuries could be blamed. We want to hear from you. 713-780-3776. Call or text. Hit us up on t- uh, Twitter. Uh, it is BMAC and Joel on a Friday on the Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM. You're back with the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios located at Sam Houston Race Park. Hey, back, as the announcer has so eloquently put it, we are back at Sam Houston Race Park getting ready for a full weekend of racing out here throughout the weekend. Your chance to get involved, bet on the ponies, have some fun, lots of things going on. They've got uh, their 30th anniversary party uh, coming up, center club level, cupcakes, glasses, and hat giveaways. Uh, Shannon Jewelers Diamond Dig after the fourth and sixth races tomorrow night. $23,000 in jewelry is going to be given away. Ten guests will win a piece of jewelry 
at tomorrow night's festivities, April 27th. They have tequila and taco tasting. Now we're, now we're talking. Ooh, now we're talking. Okay, 630 to 930 on the club level. Tasting card for 20 bucks, good for five tequila tastings. Tasting card, $10, good for three tacos. Uh, Wait, lot- so for 30 bucks, I could get five tastings of tequila and three tacos? Pretty much. That's a, that's a damn good party. Uh, and then on the 27th, they have a comedy show featuring Jesse Payton and Dusty Sims in the pavilion. For all this information and more, you can visit SHRP.com. And again, like I said, we will be here till 6 p.m. This evening, this evening, as you can tell, it's getting rowdy as people are watching photo someone, finishes and races down to the wire. I can't tell if they, they, they lost dramatically or won dramatically, but either way, the emotions are flying here. No question about it. Uh, text line is alive today. It's unbelievable. And some, some of the uh, swings and misses that we're getting along the way with some of the people that are bringing value to the show. Uh, so there's there's plenty more to get to there. Uh, Ocho's wanting your opinion on NFL draft stuff. We can get to that later in the show. Oh, yeah, we got stuff on that coming up. 3062 says the offense is raking, but we were able to look, overlook uh, that in the past uh, that the staff was freaking nails. Now that the staff has to be overcome because of lackluster pitching, more attention has to be paid. There. I mean, that's a fair point. Look, the, no matter how good the offense is, the real problem is is the fact that the the pitching it has been an issue. You expected the middle of the bullpen to be uh, problematic, mm-hmm. but you but the two things that you didn't expect were one, you'd have more injuries in the starting rotation, therefore it would be more depleted and less effective, and you'd see some of these young guys. And then the back of the bullpen was supposed to be absolutely shut down after the sixth inning, and Abreu has struggled. I mean, right down the line, all three guys have struggled, and, and that's given you more angst and more reason to have a couple of more antacids. <laughs> yeah, I, not that I need a whole lot of reasons. My diet is not good. Uh, but, yeah, look, I mean, you mentioned the back end of the bullpen struggles. I mean, I mean, saying they've struggled is almost underselling it. I think this came up on the show the other day, but the lowest ERA right now amongst your back end, your Brian Abreu, Ryan Presley, and Josh Hader, is Brian Abreu with a six ERA. That's the best one. That's awful. Uh, Ryan Presley's above nine. Josh Hader's above eight. Certainly, obviously, you expect him to come back, you know, more towards their mean, and maybe that is a reason for optimism that the natural progression to the mean will bring their numbers down, which also means they'll pitch better, and hopefully that will lead to more uh, wins from the team. But I, I think, we, as you mentioned there uh, from what the texture said, I think they're spot on. You can't really dismiss, even when talking about the offensive uh, maybe inconsistencies, you can't really dismiss the starting pitching part of that out of the equation outside of Javier and outside of uh, Blanco. It's just been absolutely awful for, for the overall. I mean, you, the first game of the Rangers series here, they score eight runs and lose by four. I mean, the offense scored eight runs. If, Try. You, if you score eight runs in a game, you should win Look at the Rangers yesterday. They start lighter for the first time. He gives up seven, but they win the game nine to seven right. because your offense is that good. If your offense is as good as the, the, the Astros are, more times than not, you're supposed to win those games. You're not expecting a pitching staff that should be better than the Rangers on paper and on the field can't get the job done, especially with the amount of money and the, the, the resumes and the back of the baseball cards oh boy. of a lot of the pitchers on this staff. Yeah, look, it, you, it all it's all been turned upside down when that trip through the rotation happened where you had you know Hunter Brown only get two outs. You had uh, Blake Heaney only get, I believe, one out. Uh, and then you had, I believe, Spencer Arigetti, uh only went three innings, and the J.P. France had like a three-inning start uh, mix in there. And that, you, so that's, that turned into the Astros. We saw just have an absolute uh, parade, basically, from Sugar Land up to Minute Maid Ballpark, bringing in all these new fresh arms, these relief, relief uh, bullpen guys, because their bullpen was just getting hammered because they're having to pitch six, seven innings every night, if, if not even you know more in some cases. So it's hard to – Look at anything else when that is happening because that is so disruptive to the bullpen, then to the starters the next day because then the next day starters are expected to do more because the bullpen's tired. The offense is expected to score more because they're into the, the Astros are into their bullpen in the second inning. I mean, it just throws everything off to, to a level that it's hard to point at anything else as, the, uh, as a reason for blame other than the starting pitching in those cases. You know, and, and, and some of the other text messages, uh, 4321, we can't forget that for some reason, coincidentally, we never give Verlander a lot of offensive support. If he only gives up three runs and the bullpen's playing like they do, the team actually might be in trouble if we're not hitting the ball and supporting him. Look, yeah. the same way that Dubon has been a mainstay in center field, 
they're not wrong. For some reason, no. you can't. It's like what's with the batter's eye? What's with the home record? The, the, you can't put your finger on it. But they don't traditionally give JV a whole lot of run support. Yeah, that's such a weird thing because you you see that occasionally with random guys throughout you know team's history. Like if I mean I wasn't uh, I wasn't old enough to be watching a lot of these games at the time. But you look at some years for Nolan Ryan when he was here with the Astros. He's got like a sub two ERA and a record of like eight and fourteen. Because he just was getting no run support. I remember there was a pitcher for the Astros in the '90s named Tim Redding, who oh, I remember. was was actually pretty good, you know, a couple of years. But he just would never get that many wins because the ga- in the games where he would start, the team would put up absolutely nothing. So that is a concern today. Like I'm with you. Like I would probably take five innings, three earned, just as a reasonable expectation for Verlander's first start in I don't know eight months, whatever it's been. But you're going against a pretty damn good pitcher in McKenzie Gore, so it's not unreasonable to expect the uh, the Astros' offense to struggle. And if they do against a good pitcher, three runs or three runs allowed for Verlander with the bullpen struggles might not be good enough. Now, where are you on this? Thirty-three eleven says, point the finger everywhere. It's not the pitching, the bats, or the defense. If it's it, one, it's the state state of the game. The others have been too mediocre to compensate for the good games. I don't think that's the case, but I don't know where you are on that. Uh. Re- I, I yeah I I don't know there there is a little bit of everything but again I go back to it's hard to blame anything other than the starting pitching when you're having that run through the the order that they had with Arigetti throwing three innings and JP France having a three inning start and uh, Blake Heaney having a one a one out start and Hunter Pence having a two out start literally setting a major league record for most hits allowed in the first inning not to even uh, ignore the fact that they also gave up nine earned runs in that first inning so. There, there is a lot of blame to be passed around. But well, I think and, and really on that note, 7560 talks about something that we started talking about yesterday again. you got to blame the owner for going after aged players. Investor over experience on playing decisions always loses. We need help at general manager, not necessarily a new GM, just better help. Well, that goes to the tweets I was going at yesterday. The Crane Gang ain't getting it done. And the Crane Gang now was supposed to hand over the reins to Dana once Dana got the gig. And instead, now because of Reggie Jackson and the podcast, we find out even more insight to what we didn't want to know, which is you can't really blame Dana Brown at this point because it seems like it's decision by committee and the committee can overrule Dana Brown at any time. Yeah, I I had this uh, conversation with a buddy at lunch today, uh, and it's something that I've kind of been mapping out as a possible topic for us in the future but like I don't know if what we could even find out if Dana Brown is a competent manager this year because it, 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 from the outside looking in and we obviously aren't privy to the exact workings of the front office of the Houston Astros but it certainly feels like at time at times that Jim Crane and his buddies with Reggie Jackson and Jeff Bagwell are coming to the decision of what they want to do and then telling Dana Brown go get it done it doesn't feel like Dana Brown has been given the power, the authority, and the autonomy. Uh, uh, oh man, I'm going to butcher that word. Autonomy. I yeah, I shouldn't have attempted that. That was bad, uh, bad self-awareness. I'm here to help. Jeremy bad thinks it's a negative. I'm here to help. <laughs> bad self-awareness by me. But he doesn't have all that like a normal, uh, uh, powerful general manager, I think, would have. And maybe that's a product of, of Jim Crane feeling some mistrust from what how it ended uh, with Jeff Luno, uh, seemingly not getting along with James Click, and – after not trusting a general manager, after not liking the next one, maybe he's just now in a spot where he's feeling like he has to take that power away from the general manager. Because it certainly seems like Bagwell, Reggie Jackson, and Jim Crane are making the decisions, and then Dana Brown is just the man to actually go and, and uh, execute B-Mac, their vision. I, I don't think that Dana Brown, in my in my opinion, and we I don't know if we'll ever know fully, but it's because of, again, what Reggie said, uh, on top of how uneasy I felt since Dana Brown got the job. I don't know if this is the job Dana Brown signed up for, but I certainly believe in my heart of hearts he's never been able to do the job the way he wanted to do it. I think this is even more reason why you should feel sorry for James Click and realize that he got railroaded out, out of town because the owner was demanding and wanting to play fantasy baseball while he was trying to actually run a major league baseball team like an experienced general manager. And I don't know that any general manager in the league is going to want this gig as long as that's the setup. That is an interesting point to this. And it kind of goes back to a conversation we've had. Um, I know we had it on Wednesday. I don't remember if, if it was after you had to leave or if it was before. But, I mean, I'm, I think it's more than just me. I, I, th- I know Jeremy's brought it up. But I'm really starting to get some Jerry Jones vibes from Jim Crane. Someone and, and, texted that, I believe, too, and I, I was driving home. I think you're right. Yeah, and that I, asked, I, I agree. It's, it's hard to ignore that. It goes back to what you're saying about how 
the, and what, what I was saying before with uh, what, what, what it feels like is Jim Crane basically taking the decisions from himself, Bagwell, and Reggie Jackson and just passing along mar marching orders then to Dana Brown. And, and, and the, maybe how future general managers will view this job, like if they're looking from the outside, you run off a good general manager in James Click. It, seemingly like, it seems like you've taken a power away from a very worthy candidate uh, in Dana Brown, who was a very hot candidate at the time the Astros hired him. If you're looking on the outside, you know, outside like, man, do I want to come to the Astros and be their next general manager? I'd have a lot of questions for Jim Crane before I'd be willing to say that. You job. might very well at some point, Brian, down the road, say five, ten years, you might be looking at two guys that turn out to be above average general managers in Major League Baseball that you had under contract and let get away or simply forced away because of the way owning this team you chose to run everything by a committee. Yeah, I know. I, I there's no doubt about, it, especially with James Cook. I mean, I, obviously the the book is still out on uh, Dana Brown, and I honestly don't think we're really even going to get an answer to you know how good of a general manager Dana Brown is. But I think right if now. Dana Brown has another interview somewhere in baseball down the road, if this doesn't work out, all it's going to take is the word of mouth to travel that hey, he his hands were tied. He never got sure. a chance to be his own guy, and that's going to be enough for another team, especially a young team where he has shown to be the the propensity to be able to. Anal uh, analyze uh, uh, talent and be able to find and then lock up good quality Major League Baseball players to where some team's going to go, hey, their loss, our gain. They screwed it up by not letting him do his job. We'll we'll give you what the control you need. We'll let you roll and believe that he can do the job. Yeah, I think so. I think I think people from the outside are realizing what's happening. We saw in that article from Ken Rosenthal, I, get, I don't remember if it was earlier this week or the week before, uh, pointing out some of the uh, – Maybe the odd workings of the, of the the Astros front office, but I think people would look at Dana Brown, realize that his hands have been tied by J uh, Jim Crane and this Astros panel of uh, Hall of Famers with Bagwell and Reggie Jackson making the decisions, and then just look back at his track record when he was the second in command in Atlanta with all the great signing or other great moves he made with Spencer Strider, Michael as, Harris, Michael Harris, uh, not only drafting them but then getting them uh, getting them locked up to team-friendly deals uh, uh, paying off, you know, uh, their first couple years of arbitration and then into uh, what would have been their free agency. I think people will look at that, and especially since those were the reasons why he was a hot candidate for uh, to become the Astros general manager, and they would still see him as a valuable candidate going forward. That's what I'm saying. I, I, you would hate the fact that the, the golden era of Astros baseball was basically thwarted at the end by an overzealous, over-controlling owner that let two quality general managers get out the door because of personality conflicts and, and his ability to want to control everything. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, it, it's it's going to be a, something that I think is going to end up on a 30 for 30 it's in quite about possible. 10 years. All right, that's the first hour of the show. we still got two to go. One in the books, two to go. Second hour of the show coming up next. Plenty more to get to as we continue Todd to roll Callis on. Todd Callis up next. Todd Callis will join us, the voice of the Astros, joining us from Washington as we get ready for this big series and the start of Justin Verlander's night, uh, 2024 season. All that and more coming up next. Todd Callis right around the corner. Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5, FM.
you are back with the Killer Bees. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at Sam Houston Race Park. So our out. Hey, we're back from Sam Houston Race Park. You heard what the brilliant pipes of our voiceover guy has told you. We are at Sam Houston Race Park. Jimmy Branham on the road with Cougar Baseball from Cincinnati this weekend. So my man BMAC has skipped over from behind the window to right next to me as we continue to roll on. And uh, one of our good friends that we love talking to and catching up each and every week is the voice of your Houston Astros on television, TK Todd Callis, brought to you by Texas uh, Star Grill Shops and Gulf Coast Chevy Buick GMC in Angleton. TK... Obviously, everybody's first line of concern tonight is Justin Verlander. Uh, I'm interested because of all your experience throughout baseball and then knowing JV and all your time with him. He said the two starts in the minors don't matter. He said what matters is he feels good. What are your expectations for JV coming into tonight's ballgame? Yeah, um, he got hit around. There's no there's no way around that. Uh, by double-A hitters and triple-A hitters in the two starts, so you hope that uh, he was just trying to fill up the zone and not worrying about results. Uh, we'll see what happens tonight. The Washington Nationals coming off winning two out of three against the Dodgers, so they feel pretty good about themselves. Uh, they had the off day yesterday, too, so they're fully rested. It's been a little bit of rain here pregame, but I think we're going to be fine by game time. Just a little light rain going on right now, so the field's covered. But uh, I expect JV to go 80 to 85 pitches. He'll probably go about five innings deep. If he's really pitch efficient, he might go six innings. Uh, they've got to control the running game. The, the Nationals love to steal bases. Uh, and I, I would anticipate a good start out of Justin. But, yes, the fact that he gave up a bunch of runs in the minor leagues, you never know what that means. It, it, you don't want him. You would rather him come in after a one- or two-run game allowed, but uh, that's not the case. So we'll find out tonight. Usually when the bell rings, those guys know how to figure it out. And hopefully that's the case for J.D. tonight. Hey, Todd, this is Brian McDonald. Nice to talk to you from this side of the table instead of uh, calling you up on the phone. So uh, Nat- Astros going up against a really good young pitcher tonight. McKenzie Gore has a sub-3 ERA. But thankfully, on, on, on our side of things, you have Jose Altuve, and I can't believe I'm saying this uh, at his age. It started off as a hot take I had on our show a few weeks ago. But maybe having the best season of his career, I mean, he's leading the league uh, in hits. He's on pace. I know it's early in the season, but he's on pace for 40 home runs. It feels like we run out of ways to, to talk glowingly about Jose Altuve. But what do you think has led to this just absolutely incredible, not even resurgence because he never fully dropped off, but this explosion in his offensive production uh, this season? I think part of it is he felt healthy all spring, and obviously that was not the case last year. So he got off to a little bit of a late start last year. Uh, I think the fact that Jordan hitting behind him has given him more fastballs uh, that he's been able to see and more pitches in the, zo- in the zone overall. That's definitely helped. And, you know, he's, he hasn't had a chance in the last few years to pick up a 200-hit season just because part of it is he hasn't been healthy. But uh, he's off to a phenomenal start. He's leading all of baseball tied with Mookie Betts uh, in OPS. He's leading all of baseball in, in total bases and hits. And he, he's been amazing. So, yeah. It's been exciting to watch Altuve at the top, and uh, hopefully he can keep it going against Mackenzie Gore because you mentioned this guy's pretty good. He's a lefty that throws close to 97 on average with his fastball. His velo's up on his fastball about two miles an hour from last year. Uh, he's added a changeup this year to go along with the curve and a slider. He'll be really tough on the Astros. He has been tough on uh, the teams he has pitched against this year, but ho- hopefully the Astros can come out here and win some games and uh, get this thing turned around on the road because it was not as a pretty series against Atlanta for sure. Todd Callis coming to you thanks to Texas Star Grill Shops and Gulf Coast Chevy in Angleton. And and TK, coincidence or not, I look at the lineup tonight and there is a personal center fielder in Mauricio Dubon. (laughs) We we joked about the fact that could it be, is it, is it not in the past? But now two different managers – consistency with one certain pitcher when Justin Verlander pitches it sure does seem like his personal center fielder is Mauricio Dubon it seems that way I was actually looking at the lefty matchup today and the fact that Dubon has played now in the last five starts by left-hander so there, there might be a trend there too but yeah it seems like whenever Justin Verlander's on the mound Mauricio's out in center field that seems to be his per- personal preference I mean you, you really can't go wrong between Jake or Chaz or Mauricio, they all have relatively the same defensive metrics. Jake's might be just slightly better than those other two, uh, but Mauricio probably has the best arm of the three. 
So, yeah, uh, Justin likes it when Mauricio's roaming out there in center field, and, and Dubon's been as good as anybody in terms of hitting with runners in scoring position in baseball. So, yeah, uh, giving him the start tonight, I, I don't think that's coincidental. Todd Callis joining us here on the Killer Beast. Todd, uh, obviously a lot of attention has been paid to the back end of the bullpen and some of the struggles had by Ryan Presley and Hayter and, and Brian Abreu. But one guy that I think a lot of fans were maybe uh, not so happy with last season that certainly pitched well this season, Rafael Montero, uh, 10, I believe 10 appearances already so far to start the season, which I believe leads the league for relievers. And his ERA under two at 180. What have you seen from Montero that's re- uh, had this return to form from the Montero that we saw in 2022? Yeah, I think I was looking at some of the underlying numbers on the off and nothing really jumped out at me. I think he didn't pitch well last year. There's no way around that in 2023, but some of those numbers that he had last year were inflated based on what they should have been based on metrics. Uh, this year he's maybe getting away with a couple more things than he got away with last year, but I think his stuff has been good. His confidence is up, and I think that's a big part of it. Um I just think he's a, a, a guy who last year ran into some bad luck. It, I was looking under the hood, if you will, trying to find out why he has been better, and nothing really stood out to me. So hopefully he'll be able to keep it going. Hopefully last year was just a one-year aberration. And I think once he gets the ball on the ground, which he's been doing a little bit better this year than he did last year instead of in the air, then that usually bodes well for Montero's success. TK, I, I don't know if it's in sickness and in health, but Alex Bregman had a bit of a bug and took a couple of games off, and he comes back, and it seems like maybe he tweaked his swing a little bit. Maybe he's not trying to swing upward as much as the the whole kind of hitting approach he had at the start of the year. But he looks like he's really fo- coming into form right when they need him the most. H- have you seen a difference or a- any kind of a change from the start of the season to where Alex Bregman is right now? I thought I started to see a change when we were in Kansas City. It just seemed like he was putting barrel on the ball a little more consistently, and that swing was staying through the zone longer than it was maybe right before that. Um, I just think with Alex, though, there's, that's the one guy that you can go series to series, and it can be completely different. His swing tweaks are unbelievable. He's always adjusting. He's always tinkering. Uh, he looked good in that Kansas City series. He looked good coming off the illness. Uh, he didn't play against Texas and, and was fine against Atlanta. So hopefully that'll carry forward in D.C. I really think he was better before the illness, and, and fortunately getting sick over that weekend didn't take anything away from him. Todd Callis joining us here on the Killer Bees. Obviously, Todd, the series against Atlanta did not go how Astros fans were hoping, but one silver lining from the series was a big bounce back from Hunter Brown. Maybe a, a few too few too many walks in that outing against the Braves on Tuesday, but overall six innings pitched, only two on runs against one of the best offenses in baseball. What did you see from Hunter Brown? Obviously, bad start a few weeks ago uh, against Kansas City, but start maybe to round into form with a better start against Atlanta on Tuesday. To me, it seemed like the start in Kansas City, he was just living on the outer part of the plate, and guys were just teeing off on it, and he didn't really work both sides of the plate. Hunter's got good stuff, but you got to be able to keep hitters honest. And he got in on righties. He got in on Austin Riley a couple times. He was using both sides of the plate. Uh, he was using his curveball well. I thought he, he really pitched well. I thought his sequencing was good. Uh, that game in Kansas City, just, it just kept spiraling on him. It was a snowball rolling downhill, gathering momentum, and, and he couldn't stop it. And it just got out of control, two-thirds of an inning, and 11 hits and nine runs. We'll probably never see that again, maybe in the next 20 years. So, uh, I thought it was a good bounce back for Hunter. I really thought it was a good bounce back for all three of those guys in the Atlanta series. Unfortunately, the Astros didn't win any of those games, but I thought Spencer Arrogetti made nice strides, and that's going to help him in the future uh, when he'll get another start somewhere down the road for the Astros. And J.P. France bounced back after his real tough outing the time before. So all three guys in that Atlanta series really kind of stepped in uh, into a spot where we thought it could be problematic, and they all pitched well. But I think Hunter in particular, like you said, I think using both sides of the plate really helps him. TK, I'm curious, just looking at what you mentioned about a Washington team that likes to run and and JV throwing to a younger guy like Yiner, and we know that he loved Maldi a year ago. Uh, he's got. We talked earlier in the in the interview about the, the the personal center fielder possibilities with Dubon. Is there a situation now where, because of Caratini and the fact that he's a veteran and he's hitting the ball well, that you know it's going to be a start by start thing with JV that maybe 
he, he's going to prefer the veteran behind the dish, or is it going to be more now that Joe Spot is managing that Yiner's going to be the main guy no matter what? I think Yiner's going to be the main guy, which means probably getting two-thirds of the starts. And whether he continues to be JV's catcher or whether they mix it up with Caratini, I think a lot will depend on how these first few starts go. I mean, Ver- Verlander, like you said, he's a guy that always pitched to Martin Maldonado. He never pitched to Yiner Diaz, even in spring training, because he was shut down. They never really connected other than a few bullpens. So this will be the first time truly in a game for Yiner to catch JV. And that will be interesting to watch. Same with Bromber when he had to learn uh, to catch Bromber after Maldi was his personal catcher. So to answer your question, I think for the most part you're going to see Yiner get the starts two-thirds of the games this year, but I, I don't know how that's going to play out with Justin Verlander, whether – uh, he wants to stay with Yiner based on how it goes earlier. If he would want to uh, see what the, uh, the more experienced Caratini has. Todd, we appreciate you always joining us. Have a great weekend. Get us some wins, and let's get this team uh, riding the ship right now on this part of the schedule. It would be nice. It would be nice to get this thing going in the right direction, and the road has usually been good to them in the past, so hopefully they continue. There you go. He's Todd Callis, voice of your Houston Astros, brought to you by Texas Star Grill Shops and Gulf Coast Chevy Buick GMC in Angleton. Start shopping for your new vehicle at LanceZCars.com. So you've heard a little bit from Todd Callis. We talked a lot in the first hour about what to expect, what your expectations are, and what I mean, desperate Brian over here thinks they have to have a sweep. Whereas I've been more real. for Joel. I've just been more realistic about the fact if they win the series and win two out of three, especially because they are facing a good young left-handed pitcher. Yeah, he's tonight. Good. He's real so good. So, what are your thoughts? Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. What do you need to see? Do you have to have a sweep against the Nats, or is two out of three good enough? Obviously, we don't want to see one out of two or losing all three as they did in Kansas City. M- uh, much more coming on the Killer Bees. Stay right where you are, ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM.
You're listening to The Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at Sam Houston Race Park. Hey, you heard the man live from Sam Houston Race Park where they got a big weekend of racing that's getting underway starting tonight. Going through the weekend, uh, it's SHRP.com for all your information on all the races and all the times and all the good times that can be had out here. Much more there. And we also want to remind you that our annual golf tournament is coming up, or semi-annual since we seem to do two a year. You can take the day off of work and play a fun round of golf with your favorite sports station. That's us, he's been 97.5 and 92.5. As we call it, the Occasional Invitational it benefits kids' meals, so all the money goes to a great cause. This year's tournament's going to take place Tuesday, May the 7th, 10.30 a.m., Highland Pines Golf Club. It's out a little bit on the north side. It is phenomenal. It's beautiful, and it is brand new. Each golfer receives beverages from Carbach Brewing, lunch and dinner from Valencia's tex Metz Garage, 18 holes of golf, and a quick award ceremony immediately after the tournament. Register now, ESPN975.com. Under the promotion tab, use the code EARLYBIRD. For a $97.50 registration for a limited time. So you actually save some money by registering early. Play some golf with us. Have some fun on your favorite sports radio station, ESPN 97.5. And I am looking forward to that. Not only because it's actually on my side of the town, my side of town, so I don't have to uh, drive quite as far. But as you mentioned, we've been out there before to Highland Pines. I think, I guess it's about a year ago Grand we were Open, out there. Yeah, yeah and it, it's a fantastic facility. It's beautiful. And not to mention that you mentioned in the read there, uh, food catered by Valencia's Tex-Mex Garage. I could, I will, I will, um, I will uh, absolutely destroy some brisket queso that day. Valencia's so I am, food is phenomenal. I am, I'll, I am definitely ready for that. And Granado, he, he, I heard him this morning. He's absolutely right. It is so well done in the design of the course. You actually feel like you're in Georgia or somewhere down more like south, where there's the the, the tons of trees. Yeah, it's kind of sunken down. All really beautiful. Their clubhouse is now open. Baron does a great job marketing that place. Dennis and his crew that own it. It's phenomenal. So come on out and join us. Have some fun. Check out the great scenes uh, and hang out with us for a day if you can. Uh, BMAC, we were talking about a lot of Astros. Just got done with TK. Interesting some of the things that he had to say. Um, I'm curious because we talked early in the show about people that wanted to blame. We got a text now that just said the magic and the mojo was gone the minute that Dusty and Maldi walked out of the door. <laughs> like, that's the kind of stuff that just drives <sighs> me insane. And, and I meant to get to Todd and we ran short on time, but I, I think getting back to what you and I said, you take out that Royal series, and I really believe because of the level of competition and how competitive the majority of the games were, I felt like a lot of people would be a lot less panicked. But you have people, and we get them every day, that are texting us and calling us and tweeting us and telling us Espada's got to go. And if it's not just Espada, well, then we know Abreu's got to go. And then, you know, it's the whole conversation of do you continue to have to pay him because of his contract so you keep him, or when do you feel it's time to cut him free? From a listener's perspective, but I'm going to start with you first. Sure. Where do you place the blame? Is it on a who, a what, or a both? Uh Mostly on a who, and it's not on Joe Espada, and I don't even really think about, I don't even really uh, put a lot of the blame on any individual player. Obviously, there are some players not playing well. We mentioned the back end of the bullpen. We were talking to Todd Callis. None of, none of them have pitched uh, particularly well. But to me, the, the person you put the blame on, the who in this case, is, is definitely uh, the Astros owner, Jim Crane. Like, I mean, none of this, what, none of the, what we've seen result in a 6-14 and 14 record happens without the direction of Jim Crane. And look, Jim Crane will forever deserve a ton of credit for being at the helm of two World Series uh, championship teams. But what's happened since that second World Series title has really uh, drawn a lot of ire, and I think justifiably so. Running James Cook out of town, I know we kind of joke about he was actually fired. Like, I don't care if technically that's not true. He was fired. They offered him a, a deal he knew he, they knew he wouldn't take, and they ran him out of town because they had disagreements on guys like Star, uh, Sterling Marte and, and probably a few more. I know there was a, a trade that involved uh, Jose Arquiti Arquiti and, that did, um, right that didn't get done. Uh, Contreras, Contreras, Wilson right? Contreras. Yeah, from the from the Cubs at the time. Uh, so I, I put it on Jim Crane. Like he his he was pretty much forced, I would assume, to, to get rid of Jeff Luno. That's understandable. I don't, I don't fault him for there. You, you had to move on from what happened uh, during the sign-stealing scandal. But moving on from James Click and then bringing in what we feel is a capable GM, but then taking the words seemingly of Jeff Bagwell and Reggie Jackson more, 
guys who don't know what the majority of uh, analytics stats are, or even if they do know about them, seem seemingly ignoring them, uh, ignoring them in favor of the back of the baseball card. Uh, that's his choice. I mean, he has made the choice to fire a good GM, to basically ignore and neuter another one, and take the uh, take uh, the advice of people who don't follow the same analytics approach that brought you two World Series titles. So that's all the direction of Jim Crane, and as for much as he's done for the city and for this team, for this specific year, the failures of the 2024 season so far, I think they all have to go in Jim Crane. So I, my answer will be, and again, let us know who you think. Who are you blaming? Is it a who? Is it a what? Is it a combination? 713-780-3776. Text us. Call us. Hit us up on Twitch. Hit us up on the YouTube chat. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out just kind of the, the, the gist of where you guys are coming from. And from my standpoint, it's a who and a what. Because I agree with what you said about Jim Crane, so I'm not going to double down on that. You said, uh, said it perfectly. I think to me it's, it's, it's a twofold situation. To me it's a what, first and foremost, it's injuries. Because you knew coming into the season what you knew, which was you're not going to have Garcia till at least midseason. You're probably going to have McCullers after that. So you knew you were down two starting pitching, two starting pitchers. But you weren't expecting Verlander before you even get to camp to have a setback to where you weren't going to have him until st- tonight. So you miss the first couple weeks of the season. And then on top of that, you weren't expecting to have Fromberg go down when he was such a vital piece to the front uh, front part of your rotation and because you're already down in numbers to where when you start talking about a rotation on the IL that's better than most rotations in baseball, yeah. that's a major, major problem, no matter what you do offensively, defensively, in the bullpen or otherwise. So I would start with the fact that the injuries have been literally overwhelming because of what you knew and then what you didn't know and how they all piled up against you. But then if you're going to start doing the who's, to me, it's it's one hitter and a whole bunch of pitching, right? To me, it's the fact that Abreu is again Abreu, which you expected to see a different guy because of the fact that when he finally went to the IL with the back injury, when he came back late in the season, and I know you you were big on I, the numbers, oh yeah, on which got guy. extremely inflated in the way they looked <laughs> based on his 162 games schedule average if you got it to that level. But at the same time, we saw the Jose Abreu that that's who they wanted to go out and sign. That's the guy that they brought in here was the guy that we saw late in August, September, and into the playoffs. That's the guy you expected to get at least the majority of for this season. Instead, you get a guy hitting below the Mendoza line. You know, basically, I think Joe some, or someone said the other day he can't even hit his jersey number for the most part, <laughs> which is, you know, 79, a higher number, and he can't even hit .79. You look at Abreu, and then you look at just the, the three guys in the back of the bullpen, and you say – you know, if you guys are doing your job, I believe that this team is much better off and has a much better record. So I, I agree with you. I think it starts with two things. If I was just to say, aside from what you and I said, I would say it's Crane's decisions and it's it's injuries. But if you want to get into specific players, you can't help but start with the worst offensive player in your lineup that you're paying $19 million a year to, and then one of Crane's decisions and three guys that are supposed to be dominant that have been anything but that. Yeah, and I think I mean you're absolutely right. There's uh, there's an uh, there's something that you can't escape with the injuries that the Astros have seen with the starting pitchers, and that's certainly a large uh, or playing a large factor in why they struggled and got off to the six and fourteen start. But even within that, even with the the bad luck and the unpredictable nature of the injuries they've had to the starting pitching, there's still in uh, therein lies some blame to to pass along to Jim Crane. Even within that, and it's gonna seemingly seem like I'm really going after Jim Crane, but I think it's maybe just it's a by- fair, it's a byproduct of a 6-14 and 14 star. Look, we're going to have tough conversations and have harsh words when things don't go well. And, look, you're right. Like, we didn't know uh, Verlander uh, when, the, when, when spring training started and the, and the pitchers and catchers reported. We didn't know Verlander was hurt, and that certainly threw a monkey wrench into the plans. But we knew, you know, Lance McCullers wasn't going to be back for a while. We knew uh, Louis Garcia wasn't going to be back for a little while. And then we found out with enough time available to still then go make a move, especially for a couple big names like Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery, we knew Verlander wasn't going to be available for a while. And we heard the quote from Reggie Jackson last week or the week before about uh, that, you know, just wasn't fiscally responsible to go out and sign Blake Snell. Oh, what was a two-year deal, Joe? Well, that's, and if you were worried about get, giving yeah. up any kind of compensation, Montgomery was short of a two-year deal. As he was looking for a two-year or less deal, too, and, and you didn't have to give up any compensation to get him yeah. either. Either one of those guys could have done exactly what you needed him to do. And even on the more cheap, uh, the guy that was with the Tigers that uh, that uh, the Rangers oh. signed, 
Oh, um, I, I, okay. I was thinking. I thought you were going to say Eduardo Rodriguez, who went to the the, the Diamondbacks. No, you're talking about someone else. Uh, yeah, he had worked out, and I think the Astros were one of the teams to go look at him. Right after that, he signed with the Rangers, and his first start, he got a win. He, there were guys out there. If you were, you knew you had to do something, even if it was just a band aid and a stopgap, but you didn't do it. Like Total Arlington says on, on on the Twitch line, he said it's been the pitching period. It, it's been kind of a trade off between the starters and the relievers. Who's good when the other's bad, and vice versa. And that's not really wrong, but a lot of the starters, y y y I guess it's one thing to say, look, Hunter Brown and J.P. France had awful starts. Mm -hmm. But then when you factor in the injuries, that's the only reason why you're seeing some of these guys that were brought up that weren't ready to be starting major league pitchers, especially with teams needing really good starts with their arms depleted and, and the situation with the losses the Astros were in to where I'm not going to blame the young kids that were brought up. It's more so the fact that, you had guys that were really good for you in the case of J.P. France a year ago or were supposed are supposed to be really good for you for the foreseeable future in Hunter Brown that completely crapped the bed. Yeah, and from uh, 8632 on the text line, uh, he writes, this is Keith, I blame the schedule very tough to start the year. I mean, there's certainly an element to that. It feels a little convenient to blame the schedule, though, because – I mean, the Royals, while they've turned out to be a pretty good team, they weren't a playoff team last year. Right. Uh, the Blue Jays are a good team, but they're not a world beater. Uh, and you were in games against the, the Braves, who are arguably the best team that you play this year. You're in games where you're down or you're up 4-2 going to the eighth on Wednesday. You're only down, I believe, 2-1 when Hayter uh, allowed four runs in either game one or game two of that series. I mean, certainly the schedule has been tough, but if you're thinking of, of the Astros as a World Series caliber team, other than the Braves, they haven't faced a team that on paper has a ton more talent than them, especially with the question marks for the Rangers uh, uh, starting rotation. And that's the one team you're four and three against them, the defending World Series champs. Yeah, I think that's the, the silver lining to me is the fact that if you do want to look at the schedule, you can say the Yankees are a playoff team. I think the Blue Jays are a playoff team. I don't know. We're last year. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they're a World Series caliber team or not. That can be debated, but I think they're a playoff team. I think that there's a chance the Royals could be a playoff team this year. I think the, the Guardians and the and the Royals are going to be at the top of that division. I think it's going to be uh, – Certainly ain't going to be the White Sox. No, those are two good good baseball teams. But then you know the Rangers are the reigning World Series champs. They're the, they're the, the main competition in the division as well. And, and I think that you played well against all those teams – to where you can say, hey, look, there is something to be said. There's an element, but I can't blame the schedule as much as you can see where the guys have completely threw up all over themselves, That especially with the money they're making and the back of their baseball card. <laughs> you're supposed to be there expecting a whole hell of a lot more. Yeah, and, and, and maybe if they played competitive baseball, because you're right, for, for, for almost the entirety of the schedule, even in the games that they lose, they were, they've been at least competitive. But the problem with that and why it, it's tougher for me to make the schedule excuse it's because they weren't competitive against the Royals. I mean, they did lose the first game in extra innings when Wander Soro, and I believe his only inning this year yeah, for awful. the big league club, uh, gave up the game on a Salvador Perez walk-off hit. But then in the next two games, you lose 11-2 and 13-3. Uh, yep. it's, it's hard to make the schedule uh, argument when you lose the, the, second, the second and third games of those series by a combined uh, score of 24-5. to See, five. Mac, I think on the flip side, that's why I keep pointing to that series. If you take out the lack of production that you're talking about offensively in the Royal series, it's hard to blame the offense. Because if you take out that the, the, that series, the fine. offense against good yeah. teams has been better than average, been good enough, and, and one of the top in the American League to where you say, it, that's why for the texter that can't stop texting us about how wrong we were about the offense, the offense has been, has not been the issue. It has been the other things that we've talked about that are e that, that just are rearing their head on a nightly basis, like TD said about the pitching, about the fact that the back of the bullpen sucks. The starting pitching hasn't been great. That's where, and the middle of the middle relief, which we knew was going to be a problem, hasn't been, aside from Montero, anything to speak of, and a little of Seth Martinez. So I, I think that there's enough fingers in, to, to, to point at and enough people to blame. But I also think there's, a, there's still reason for a silver lining to believe they can still turn this thing around. That's why I've been so optimistic. If, Joel, I'm going to go back to it again. If they sweep the Nationals this weekend. Two out of three, and they're fine. <laughs> All right, you, want we, to get, you want to get to who said are it? Are we playing who said it? All right. Yeah, All right we're we're going to play who said, who said it. it next. All right. That's coming up next. Don't go away. We're midway through the show. That means 90 minutes in the books, 90 still to go. Second half of the show comes up next on the Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM. Before we go to the break, a word from a good friend, Doc Linville. Doc Linville, best in the business. Uh, I was running some errands this morning and had, didn't have a hat on and, and saw my friends at the Starbucks, and they're like, whoa, Joel, we always see you with a hat on when we didn't. 
where'd all that hair come from? And I said, my good friend, Doc Linville. I mean, I, I knew that I needed hair because of the fact that my hairline had gone from a forehead to an eight head. I didn't think there was anything I could do about it. And then lo, lo and behold, Doc Linville said he wanted to have a conversation with me, explain the neograft procedure. Once he did, it was a no-brainer for me that I was going to get that procedure done because it's simply put getting your own hair back where you need it most, and it ain't going anywhere for the rest of your life. Check him out right now at 975hair.com because you can get a free consultation like I had with Doc and his staff that normally costs 150 bucks just by listening to us and going to 975hair.com. Get all the information. Ask the questions. Get the answers. Let them explain it all to you like they did to me. And I'm telling you, you're going to be as convinced that I, as I am that the Neograft works and it can be a game changer. It's not all the gimmicky stuff that just masks the problem like the sprays and the foams and the creams. This is a real life changer because it's your own hair. Doc told me himself, 95 to 99% of the follicles that he's going to move are going to stay and grow and be with you for the rest of your life because they come from a place that they never are going away. He also explained to me, genetically, you're never going to lose the hair on the sides and the back of your head, no matter how bald you go in other areas. I did not know that. When I found that out and then found out that he takes the hair from there to get it where you need it, it all started making sense. I did the procedure. It was painless. I loved the results right off the jump because I could see the follicles in place. Six to nine months later, when they got stronger and longer, the results just knocked me off my feet. Phenomenal. You get yourself confidence back because you love the way your hair looks again. Check them out today. Tell them I sent you by. Check out 975hair.com. All right, you heard the man. It's time for what used to be one of my favorite games. <laughs> you won last week. What are you talking I've been, about? I've been good. I won without Jeremy. I won with Jeremy. Jeremy has been an anchor around your neck, and I actually have some good news for you, Joel. Uh, uh, you, you don't know this, but I have a surprise for you. I don't know if you saw the tweet from the station account. You did not. Uh, I have a surprise partner for you today. Look, I didn't want you have it going solo. Jeremy actually has been an anchor around your neck, so maybe we do this more often. But joining us right now on the HRMP listener line, someone you might know, someone who uh, left the show to move out to Chicago. I don't need help. Brendan Riley joining oh, the show. Oh, no. Killer Bees. Brendan, how you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm doing good, man. Thanks for inviting me for this. I, I don't know if I'm good news. I, I live a thousand <laughs> miles away. I, I haven't worked at the station in a year. I'm going to be a terrible teammate, but I'm excited to do my best. Yeah, I, I think, Joel, you obviously have the final call on this because, as Brendan mentioned, he oh, hasn't, I been, don't. 
<laughs> look, I mean, but look, you've got as, some help today. As Brendan knows, I've been I've, I've always been the super team player that goes with whatever flow that you guys want want to want to throw my way and hinder my performances. I'm ready to do this again. I don't know if you caught this. I haven't caught up to Brendan since and congratulated him with his beloved Lions for all the success that they had. We also got to congratulate him on Oakley getting a tournament win. That was a That's pretty right. that, that with was a, big time too. with a Milwaukee kid right in the middle of it. I loved it. Yeah, it's it's been a good year for me in sports, no question. Well. Well, good to have you back on the show, Brendan. So you will uh, be assisting Blankers here to help him defeat me and who said it. Are you ready for quote number one? Yes. I, All right. I, I'm as ready as I can be. I, I'm a little worried because as soon as we went to you on the line, I heard a police siren in the background. So I'm not sure what Brendan's got going Probably on Probably riding right now. a loop. <laughs> yeah, but, but we'll, 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 hopefully he'll be able to help you out here, Blankers. All right, quote number one. Boban's been in movies. He's in multiple commercials. What does Jalen Green have? Fingernail polish. What does Alpern have? Nothing. Um, I'll go first, Brendan, and then see what you think of this. But I You'll think defer that, to me. I would love to hear your thought process here, Joel. Yeah, I'm going to give you my first initials and then see if, like I'm saying, see if you're on board with it. I I know that the morning show and John and Lance have been crushing Jalen for a, a long time, for the most part. I know that I heard something like this. I think one morning, but I could see. This being a conversation between John and Lance where, you know, John, old school, very straight laced, is very anti nail polish. That's to me, too. Yeah. I, Paulie's fine with it. I don't think Joe's probably going to have a problem with it. I, I think it's some definitely, a, and I don't think Dell's going to have a problem with it. I think if it's anything, it's going to be on the bench. And I think that it's it, it to pinpoint which one is is going to be the, where we have to the challenge because I think it's definitely the bench. So can we get are, it one more time? Are you dead set on the morning show? Because my instant reaction was the morning show as well, yes. and then a small part of me goes, Paul will play devil's advocate to himself sometimes. So I did wonder just a little bit. Yeah, I think. But, but this I is, was I, I was going morning show initially too. So if you feel good there, I'm fine going there. One more time, B Mac. Sure. Boban's been in movies. He's in multiple multiple commercials. What does Jalen Green have? Figure now polish. What does Alperin have? Nothing. And this is just one guy saying all one of guy. that. Yeah, one okay, guy. Okay, because I thought it was a back and forth. No, no, no. Well, this is one. You, you make a good point, Brendan. I, I mean, I could see, I could see Paul saying it too, trying to hear it that way. But I'm gonna say, my personal gut feeling is John Granado. That that was my gut feeling too. So I say we stick with that. Let's go. Final answer, John Granado. Boban's been in movies. He's in multiple commercials. What is Jalen Green? Oh, Brady you were right there. Right show, wrong guy. In, uh, what is Al- Yeah, you were right there. You were right on. The, you, you, the, the process was good. You, limit, yeah. you eliminated guys who wouldn't I'm care about. I'm good at the 50-50, the, the just not pegging polish. it all the time. Yeah, you were uh, phrasing. Uh, number two, Joey was your first. Oh, sorry. Let me start that one over. Joey was your first sign he's Italian. The O at the end of his name. But that could that could be a Latin American. But then lo perfido, and then you look at him and you see where he's from Pennsylvania. He's bona fide Italian. Oh look, he's got gravy on his shirt here. It looks like or oh well, maybe that's actually, actually just clay. Okay. Mm, Boy, these are a lot longer than when I used to do them. <laughs> yeah. Well, B-Mac really I'm takes this seriously. B Mac uh, takes too much info for me on this one. Where are you leaning? Well, I don't think that Granado's ever going to question an Italian. I, I mean, at first I thought Granado, but then, I mean, he's going to know by the name alone that he doesn't have to question his Italian heritage. I could see Pauly doing the Joey Lo Perfido and, and getting the voice <laughs> and doing all that he does. I don't think Joe would say this. I don't really. I don't know if Dell would say this. Do you need it one more time? So I'm, I'm going to struggle the most with Dell because he wasn't on when I was there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't I, – I'm not going to be able to help there. Uh, my initial lean was morning show, and it was John, but what you said makes sense. He's going to know, right? Um, I did wonder, Joe, a little bit. It feels like something Joe would say. Um, you know, look, if BMAC doesn't have any Paul Gallant on this, me and BMAC are going to have a problem. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. I, I'm taking the posters made their way to Illinois with you? Of course. Um, the Paul I, I would be between Paul Joe posters. and Paul here after listening to your thought process. All right, one more time. You need one more time? Yep. All right. Joey 
was your first sign he's Italian. The O at the end of his name. But that could be Latin American. But then Lo Perfido. And then you look yeah, at him and you see dope. where he's from Pennsylvania and he's bona fide Italian. Look, he's got gravy on his shirt here, it looks like. Or maybe that's just clay. So first and foremost, anybody that says Joey is the first sign he's Italian, I don't know how in the <laughs> hell you get that logic. <laughs> but that sounds like the, the illogical Joe George to me. But does that change your opinion hearing it again? Which one do you think it is? Uh, yeah, no. I, I, if we're gonna if we're gonna stick with that show, uh, let's 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 rely on on Paul here. Okay, I'll, you co-signing? Uh, I'm gonna. I'm Your gonna, final call. God, I almost I thought it was Joe, but um, Paulie says some says some really ridiculous things. I'm gonna. I, we'll we'll go, Paul. Joey. Was your first sign? He's Italian. Oh the O God. at the end you of his Lance name. Back that, to back. <laughs> you are so filthy. That is so dirty. Oh, that goes back to. All right, we got to make a comeback here. Brendan had a long time ago about wanting to uh, to go with all all one people, but yeah. I promise you, it's not all Lance. I will give you that clue. All right, uh, clip number three or quote number three. Okay, <laughs> like I I'm not ashamed of this. I I like tofu. I actually do. I think it's good. Um, but the amount. But the amount of work you have to put into making tofu taste good is probably not worth it. Wow, that's to me that sounds like it could be Dell or Joe. Well, I I think the important thing here, at least for me, is it's somebody who cares about making tofu taste good. I, I, how many people? Uh, how many people on the lineup are eating tofu? Well. I mean, not and how many people on the lineup are it. making it, by the way? Not just eating it, making but, it. But I think you can make it taste good, but you can still get it from a restaurant. Because I think Dell eats a lot of – he orders yeah, no, out but, a lot of the, Chinese food. But the complaint is how much work it is, right? It's not a lot of work to get it from a restaurant. Yeah, but I heard that as you can order from a restaurant, but then you got to put a bunch of sauce and you, stuff you on it. it again? Yeah, give me one more time. All right. Okay. Well, Where are you leaning? I, Oh, what, what we're going to give the quote one more time here, Brendan. Okay, like, I'm not ashamed of this. I, I like tofu. I actually do. I think it's good. Um, but, the amount, but the amount of work you have to put in to make tofu taste good is probably not worth it. I hear Dell. I, I hear Dell because the cadence early with the like in it, kind of, it's either Dell or Joe to me. I was and going it, Dell or Paul. I told you Dell's where I'm going to struggle. If you're feeling Dell, let's go with yeah. it. You said Dell or Joe. Yeah. What, what do you got? The like is where the cadence of with the like is is where I heard Dell or Joe. Um, but I said we go Dell. I don't know, Brendan. I I think that Joe uses like a lot. Do you think I, I, I'm going to be surprised? We we are we have a different line of thinking on how we're getting to this one. Joe's trying to work out, by the way. He's got a he's got a gym sponsor. That now, is so true. He, he's Joe trying to become a, a, a leaner, yeah. meaner version of Joe. You can work out all you want. You can eat healthy all you want. I just, I'm skeptical that Joe is making tofu. And I think whoever said this is making tofu. Uh, all right. I'm going to go Dell. Okay. Like, I, I'm not ashamed of this. Oh, my I, God. I, I am gonna, I'm going to bang <laughs> my <laughs> head on the soy boy. I had it. Um, God. But- the like is what I uh, – mm. <laughs> You were so dead all with the like. That is yes. exactly how Joe talks, the like. That is a dead giveaway. Ugh. Oh, I feel for you. I feel for you, Blankers. That's that's a rough one. You were right there again, 50-50. All right. I told you I was going to be a bad teammate. <laughs> well, it's great to hear your voice. That's the positive in all this. Okay, BMAC, let's finish All right, this. we got two more, two more to go. Quote number four. New Orleans isn't a healthy lifestyle. There's nothing about the city that's that's healthy lifestyle. The people, like, nothing about New Orleans is healthy lifestyle. It's drink and food and fun, and that's what it is. And there's the sirens again. Yeah. Not Are you on the, the L? Am I on the L? I'm walking around downtown. Okay. Um, you got any take on this one? This one, so far, of what we've gotten feels like the least contact. Like, I don't even know where to begin with this one. I agree. I don't think that there's cadence. I don't think that there's any kind of, ca- you know, any in the lingo that n- says, oh, that sounds like there's no, like, crazy or, or poly. Be it again? Yeah. And uh, even, there's not even, like, an opinion here to work with, really. Nobody thinks New Orleans is a lifestyle. This is how dirty, is how dirty <laughs> BMAC is. All right, quote one more time. 
New Orleans isn't a healthy lifestyle. There's nothing about the city that's that's healthy lifestyle. The people, like nothing about New Orleans is healthy lifestyle. It's drink and food and fun, and that's what it is. I think it's John or John's got Louisiana. I could see roots. that. It's a conversation I could see them having. Yeah, As somebody who's jo- cut cut these uh, clips before, yeah. it is a conversation I could absolutely see them having. Well, John, um, when, John's wife's from Louisiana. John spent some time in Louisiana. Um, when he was John Grant. I think it's John or Dell. We've lost, oh, man. so it doesn't matter. I don't, have, I don't have a strong opinion here. If I had to go between those two, I'm probably going John. But like I said, yeah. I, I don't think we got a lot of context in this one. It just feels yeah, like gonna, a conversation uh, the morning show It's a have. coin flip. Uh, uh, since we lost and I don't care, we'll go John. <laughs> New Orleans isn't a healthy lifestyle. There's oh nothing about the I'm city gonna, that's, no, that's, no, that's healthy lifestyle. Really not. The people, like, so we had the conversation in the show again. This is fantastic for me. My weekend sucks, and we've been close on three of them. Oh, you've been very close on three of them. Yeah, the only one it, where it, you uh, you weren't really on was the Lo Profito one. Yeah. If this okay, one is just falls a lot, BMAC, I'm going to be very offended that you invited that's me That's true. I, well, hopefully this isn't the last time we can have Brendan Riley on. We'll, we'll find out if uh, he's going to. Uh, boycott us if this is not Paul Galan. All right, last quote. These grifters, these absolute grifters, how is there a market for these people? They're so dull. And in context, they're talking about the uh, Harry and uh, Meghan Markle. That Well, I, I think it's Paul. Well, and there's two reasons I think it's Paul. One, I'm going to go with the conversation type again. Very Paul. Two, yep. I'm actually, I, I think BMAC accidentally gave us a clue. Because he got worked up while giving us this quote. And we both know if someone's going to get worked up talking about this, it's Paul. Yes. And then the third thing that would be one where I just throw it out for discussion is who uses the term grifter? I think Paul would use the term. I don't yeah, think I think John it's probably Lance the most likely. I didn't pick up on that one, but I think it's a good one. I'm going to say Paul. I'm with it, too. Yeah. Final episode. <laughs> Grifters. These absolute Thank God I didn't get scared. How I, I is dis- there a market for these people? Well, one, I, one, I'm happy that uh, I didn't disappoint. Plus, Brendan, you can't do Brendan. that to Brendan Riley without know, putting a Paul I know. quote I, in there. I, I'm happy that I didn't disappoint him so so thoroughly by not having Paul included in his, in his return to the show. But he was absolutely, totally correct in one thing he picked up on, in which how I got excited <laughs> doing the Paul Galat. Because you can't do Paul Galat takes without raising your voice and getting excited. Yeah, you can't do any take without him <laughs> going like octaves. Real quickly, the- I have to ask, was that intentionally last because it was me? Uh, no, no, I didn't even actually really even think about that aspect of it. Uh, but it, it, did, it was funny uh, timing uh, for the coincidence and how it worked out. Fair enough. Well, hey, hey, buddy, have a great weekend. Great to catch up with you. And I miss our morning uh, teleconferences. I miss you guys, too. Thank you so much for having me on for this. It was a good time. All right, don't get arrested. We've heard too many police sirens in the background. Thanks for joining us, Brendan. <laughs> there you go, right, Brendan you. Riley, former former member of the Killer Bees, now killing it in Chicago, Illinois, on the home of the White Sox, who See, aren't killing it playing baseball. Even though you lost, I mean, that made it worth it, right? You got fun. to reconnect yeah, with Brendan. That was fun. Yeah, definitely. The things I do for you, Joel. Uh, don't let me start comparing producers <laughs> after that. After what you did to me there. All right, we're going to continue to Keep roll on. Cut me, Joe, and Brendan. Uh, we got to go to the break. <laughs> uh, I'm not answering that for the grounds of incrimination. Uh, we've got plenty more to get to. We we'll get a little Texans talk in here. We just saw some Vegas odds that might raise some eyebrows on the favorite for MVP in the NFL. It was Patrick Mahomes. You may be pleasantly surprised at who it is now. Much more coming up on the Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM.
You're listening to the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at Sam Houston Race Park. Hey, you heard the man from Sam Houston Race Park. It's Brian McDonald and Joel Blank. As Jeremy Branham has the day off, but the Killer Bees are alive and well and stinking. Uh, can I read still a text from, for you? Can I read yeah, a text for you, Blank? Yeah. All right, so from 5798, LMAO, you brought Brendan back to let Joel down one last time. It's not, tr- not, <laughs> not wrong. Not wrong. The one thing that BMAC does have in common with Brendan Riley and Joe George is, is that they're big fans of siding with Jeremy on everything. He's not even here. No, not today. I mean, it's the only chance I got. Um, Want to remind everybody, Sam Houston Race Park, SHRP.com. Lots of stuff going on. Big weekend this weekend. Uh, lots of stuff going on with racing tonight and drink specials. Uh, Friday night drink specials, 6 to 9 p.m., $4, 24-ounce big beer Friday, $2, uh, 187 milliliter wines. Uh, and then, of course, tomorrow night is the 30th anniversary party. Center club level, cupcakes, glasses, and hat giveaways. Shannon Jewelers with the big one, the Diamond Dig, after the fourth and sixth races. They're going to give away $23,000 in jewelry. Ten guests are going to win a piece of jewelry. It's going to be hidden, I believe, she said, somewhere out it's on the in track. in the dirt. Yeah, they're going to have to dig for it. going to be a lot of fun, but you can't miss that because you can't miss all the action. You can get out and bet on the ponies. Uh, and it, it, we'd be remiss. I was just talking to one of the bartenders here. Shout out because of the RA. RIP to our good friend Fred Fowler, who was a legend here out at the racetrack. But SHRP.com, check out the weekend and then all the festivities all through the spring and summer months. Yeah, especially, I mean, I'd like to mention one more event because it has my name all over. April 27th, the tequila and taco tasting. I mean, you had me right there. Uh, But $20 is good for five tequila tastings. Another $10 is good for three tacos. Uh, Order a handcrafted margarita tequila sunrise. Shout out to the Astros. Or ranch water made with her tequila of choice and have it uh, straight or on the rocks. That'll be uh, from 6.30 to 9.30 on the club level on April 27th. So another great thing to check out here at Sam Houston Race Park. Uh, You mentioned the Texans uh, uh, as we went to break there, but we were a little bit over in our fun with uh, Brendan Riley if we want to catch up on a break. You want to hit the Texans on the other side? Yeah, we're going to talk Texans on the uh, the other side. Very interesting information. I got an email from Vegas this afternoon. Patrick Mahomes, eight and a half months ago was the hands-on favorite to win another most valuable player award he's now second and someone that you know and love may be the guy that has unseated him as the favorite for most valuable player in the nfl we'll talk about that and a whole lot more as we get into some texans talk right here on espn 97.5 and 92.5 fm
You're listening to The Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at Sam Houston Race Park. You heard the man come out to the track, SHRP.com, but better yet, right off the Beltway, on your way to the airport, most likely, if you're coming from the Sugarland area or the downtown area. Bottom line is get out here to SHRP and have some fun, bet on the ponies, all kinds of activities starting tonight with lots of great drink specials and through the weekend where you could uncover some jewelry and possibly walk out of here with more just than some winnings from betting on the horses uh, as they're having a promotion as well where they're going to hide some jewelry in the dirt and, uh, out there on the track and you have a chance to uncover that and walk away with some beautiful prizes. Brian McDonald in for Jeremy uh, Branham as we continue to roll through and get you ready for your weekend. And BMAC, a lot of Astros talk on the show so far, but got to get to this. Uh, as we roll into some Texans talk, um, eight and a half months ago, Patrick Mahomes was the the favorite to win another most valuable player. Um, and going into last season, C.J. Stroud was a 150 to one potential NFL MVP. Oh, have times changed since the Texans were extremely aggressive and active in the offseason with the trade and then all the different ways that they have brought in and signed free agents. Now, as I look at it today with the new odds that have just come out at sportsbetting.ag, C.J. Stroud is your new favorite to win the most valuable player in the 2025 NFL season. Wow. He, he's at 6-1. to one. Mahomes is at 7-1, to one, so okay. it's close. And then behind those two, it's Burrow, Jordan Love, and Josh Allen at 12-1. to one. <laughs> I kind of want to start with Jordan Love just to Good get your reaction. Lord. So he's in the top five with – did I hear that right? Is he number four in this list? He's tied for third with Burrow and Allen. Wow. Okay. I just, I mean, it is such now his smoke touchdown and mirrors. Nu- his touchdown number was great last year. I know you have pushback on how he got to that touchdown number, which is it's fair. I had, obviously didn't watch as many game, Packers games as you did. Uh, but he's got elite wide receiver talent, and he's got uh, – Elite? My, okay. Potentially elite. Potential, because yeah. they're young, they're, they're all and, very and in young. the case of one in particular, but several, they can't stay healthy. Yeah, Christian Watson has trouble staying healthy. Uh, but I like all those guys they have, uh, especially uh, Jaden Reed. I'm, I'm really excited about him. He's good. Uh, and he's got a great offensive coach. Look, so I, they're loaded with talent. They have the youngest team in the league. They have one of the, they have a, a really, really loaded up roster, and they got five draft picks in the top 100 coming up in the draft. But good. the bottom line is when you look at what Jordan Love has and hasn't done, he throws – Fly balls to center field that, that, that their receivers can have 30 yards of space to run underneath and go get. He's got to show me more that he's able to put the ball in the tight windows, make the big throws. They're going to have a tougher schedule this year. I think that there's a ton of smoke and mirrors as opposed to the kind of ability. Because back home, I can tell you right now, unequivocally Packer fans think that, that Jordan Love is better than C.J. Stroud. And here, from my opinion, it's not even close. I will say, though, just strictly from an MVP odds sort of thing, I think Jordan Love, if he were to repeat or even better last year's numbers, and then, hey, look, he's got a lead offensive coach. Those young wide receivers are going to have another year under him. They, I, I don't think it's impossible well, they he does a, so. Their running back change bothers me, too. Right, but I think Love more so than a guy. Like, w- when you look at Jordan Love, and because his receivers are young, if, they, if the Packers have a lot of success and Jordan Love puts up big numbers, I think Jordan Love is getting – 90% of the credit for that. Whereas when you look at other quarterbacks who have a loaded wide receiver room or maybe uh, yeah, or, or have done it you know, a ton of times like Lamar Jackson, uh, who's already won two MVPs, I think the voters would be more willing to give Jordan Love an MVP vote than Lamar Jackson. One, because they don't want to give Lamar Jackson a third MVP. And two, because they're going to look at the Packers and say, okay, those wide receivers are young, and he's elevating them, and therefore they're going to give him more credit in an MVP conversation. See, but where I would push back with you is CJ did that a year ago because he made Nico Collins into what he was always supposed to be. He took a rookie in Tank Dell and made him one of the better receivers in the league. Now, if you add a digs to the mix and say, now you're giving him the kind of weapons that kind of Mahomes had early in his career when he had the Cheetah along with Kelsey and other guys, I don't think it would hurt CJ because I think the schedule seems to be tougher for the Texans than most just about anybody, and even especially starting with if you're looking at, at Love and Green Bay. And I think that there's already a belief that this is the guy that elevates everybody on the offense, and no matter who they, the names are on the back of the jersey, he's the reason why they're getting touchdowns and yards and they're scoring. So I think that 
one of the guys that could get more credit for doing it, no matter who he's working with, than Love would be C.J. Stroud. I, I do think there's some uh, there's some uh, um, truth to that because specifically with adding Diggs, like, like there's no doubt C.J. Stroud elevated Nico Collins. Nico Collins was a guy who had in top 600 yards in his first two seasons, and then he goes off and has a 1,200-yard season with the Texans in year three. Uh, Tank Dell was a, obviously a, a very productive wide receiver at U of H Go Cougs, but he comes in as a rookie third-round pick, and no doubt C.J. Stroud elevated him. It's hard to necessarily – it's hard to make the argument that C.J. Stroud could elevate Diggs, but I will on this aspect of it. Stephon Diggs, whether he was in Minnesota with, you know, the guys there, I, I think uh, with Kirk Cousins or whoever he crossed he over had, with. Uh, he had Case, too. Yeah, and Case, too. Go Cougs. Or he was with Josh. You've <laughs> been around. See, this is my point. You're always on his side. I'm playing into a bit. It's all right. Uh, but, look, I think when you're, when you're making the argument uh, as far as would he get credit for elevating talent, I think he would with Diggs because – Diggs in Buffalo with a quarterback like Josh Allen wasn't able to break through and get to a Super Bowl. Uh, so I think if they see Diggs step up, especially coming off of a couple years where he was unhappy, I think he would necessarily – I think he take would Take the second part of that. that. That's where I'm going with this. If you could take a guy that no matter how good the Bills were, seem- seemingly was always finding a way to be unhappy – and in a lot of ways was demonstratively showing it on the field and on the bench and towards his quarterback, if you can find harmony with Diggs on and off the field and he has a a, a, a big year and, and there's no issues that people are noticing with cameras on the sidelines or conversations and quotes in the locker room, CJ would get all the credit in the world for that too because Josh Allen is an MVP candidate. Josh Allen's one of the better quarterbacks in this league no matter what you think of his turnovers. And Josh Allen was a guy that was the target of the ire of, of, of Stephon Diggs. If Stephon Diggs comes here and in his first year has a big year, CJ's going to get all the credit in the world for that. And then if he's able to spread the football around so that everybody gets theirs, I think he gets more credit than he got a year ago when he gave Noah Brown his two best games of the year when you needed him. Maybe two best games of his career. Yeah, and made other guys look better that maybe – you didn't know if they could because they weren't supposed to be on playing on the field as much as they were late in the year. I think CJ is the one one, one guy that's probably going to get credit no matter how good his wide receiver room is, as opposed to guys that are just supposed to take you know big time rooms and and, and basically are elevated by big time players on the outside. Yeah, and what we saw from Diggs at the Pro Bowl was uh, an obvious. Uh, willingness and want to play with C.J. Stroud. And I think that factors into what we're talking about here. And, yeah, I do think C.J. Stroud, if he's able to get a guy who's basically been a problem child everywhere else to buy in and be a good teammate and still put up numbers, you know, equal to or better than what he's done over the last couple of years, I think C.J. Stroud would get a, tr- a tremendous amount of credit for that. Though, go, getting back to the odds, I still feel like number one, though, Bit of an overreaction. Yeah. Like, I can't put, like, specifically AFC. I know this is an NFL award. But specifically AFC, I would be hard-pressed to put CJ in the MVP odds ahead of Mahomes or ahead of Burrow. I think I'd be comfortable with him at three because, again, I don't think the voters are – I think are, Josh Allen falls off because he doesn't have the he's talent. Not gonna, I, right. He's not going to have the talent. And I don't think the voters are going to want to give Lamar Jackson a third award when he keeps coming up short in the playoffs. Now, to your point – Two guys that have loaded weapons to go to are 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 lower on this list. Jalen Hurts and Brock Purdy have a whole lot of weapons to throw to, and, yeah. and they are uh, sixth and seventh on this list at fourteen to one and sixteen to one. To me, those are two guys that maybe, unless they get criticized for having too much talent to work with, should get all the credit in the world because Hurts can run the football. He's, pre- he's starting to show everybody, including myself, that he's a better passer than I thought he was. Purdy's went from Mr. Irrelevant to a guy that has stepped right into the Niners' offense when they swung and missed on a high draft pick and, and, and taken that team to a Super Bowl. I just believe those two guys have the potential to do as much or more as CJ simply because they've got a little, they, they've got a little bit more cachet in terms of how far they've gone uh, in, in, the, in the playoffs as well. Yeah, it would be interesting because I think at certain times during last year's season, like weeks, I don't know, one through ten, I think Jalen Hurts was at some point in that time oh, yeah. the unanimous run, yep. runaway MVP winner. Like everyone had just given him the award. And then at a certain point after that, that became Brock Purdy. There was a three-, four-week stretch where everyone was going to give Brock Purdy the MVP. But what we saw, like uh, the, the, the Eagles got – and I think there's two things playing against them. 
uh, each one, each one of them. I mean, Jalen Hurts and the Eagles got off to a 10-1 start, and they lost something like six in a row and flamed out. So I think Jalen Hurts is now going to have to overcome that criticism, that blemish that we saw last season to move himself back up towards the top of the MVP uh, candidacy because under his watch, under his on, uh, on his play, the Eagles fell off a cliff. And I think Brock Purdy, whether it be fair or not, is always going to get labeled as a guy who's being carried by his talent. Because, I mean, who has better skill position players than the Niners? A Kittle and Ayuk and Debo yeah. and George Kittle. Uh, and Christian McCaffrey, I think I might have named Kittle twice, but I think Purdy is always going to get that knock. Like, okay, yeah, his numbers are great. They're you know the team's fourteen it, and three, but like we're giving the credit to the skill players. So, is it the true testament if you can do it without them, like sure. CJ did last year, yeah, 100%. And, or like Mahomes did last year, right? Because in yeah, a lot yeah, of ways, Kelsey, but other than that, he yeah, didn't have a lot. and Kelsey came on like later in the year, midseason and beyond. He got, he got off to a slow start. He was hurt. I think they're managing his reps just because of his age. Maybe load managing in a different yeah. way, yeah. But overall, you've seen Mahomes do it with a full complement of unbelievable receivers. Now you saw him do it without. Like, I think the fact that you've proven you can do it both ways. Because to your point on Purdy, if you put Purdy in, in the Texans' offense a year ago, I don't think he, 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 he sniffs what C.J. did. And I think that you find out who he truly is as a quarterback and maybe some of the limitations – and that's to the credit of CJ to say, with or without a talented receiver room, he makes everybody around him better, which which is what an MVP is supposed to be. Yeah, and look, I mean, I know the playoff stats aren't factored into MVP conversation, but look at that pr- that playoff win over the Browns uh, this last year from CJ Stroud. At that point, with Tank Dell out for the season, he basically had one explosive option in the passing game. That being, of course, Nico, Nico, Holland, yeah. Nico Collins. I mean, Dalton Schultz is a good player, but he's not a he's but not he a game breaker. the backup tight end. I, I know exactly, and that's my point. I mean, I know it's not it's not eligible. That part of the of the stats isn't something going toward for, towards the MVP, but it does, I think, make his case as to why he'd be in the conversation this year because we saw in the playoffs against what a top three pass defense. C.J. Stroud absolutely shred a top three pass defense with one game-breaking wide receiver. They were the, number, the Browns were the and, number and, one. And one. Browns were the number one defense right. for the regular season. And he and he against that number one defense with the one game-breaking wide receiver and one game-breaking wide receiver that he made arguably tore that defense apart. See, here's what I would say though. I would say that with all this, and it's fun and nice to see him, you know, be at the top of the list right now. That's why they play the games. So I would say that he's deserving of being in the top three. Not one. But not one. Yeah, I would have him. I think I'd, I'd have to think about the NFC candidates, although I, I don't think Purdy or Hurts or Dak would be but above him. Patrick them. Mahomes is Patrick Mahomes for a reason. I would, I would have him behind Mahomes and Burrow. I think I'd have him third. But See, Burrow coming off injury, I'm not as quick to put him above no, him, but, sure. maybe because, but maybe because so you'd of – you have Stroud too? He's – He's right. He's one, two. Like I said, he's top three. If you want to put Burrow at two, I'll hear it. If you want to put Josh Allen, who because of his legs, or like I said, Hurts or Purdy in the conversation because of who they got and because they're going to have unbelievable numbers and stats because of that, I'll hear it. But I think he's worthy of being top three. But I'm not going to anoint him the favorite right now just because of what they did in the offseason because I, I am one of those that still firmly believe that schedule matters and that schedule is going to be tough. I wanted to go to that because I think obviously a part of the conversation when you're when you're talking about can C.J. Stroud win an MVP, does he deserve to be at the top of the leaderboard for the odds, is the record because, yeah, I mean, C.J. Stroud briefly was actually in the MVP conversation last year. People were starting to make that conversation midway through the year. Right. I think right maybe it was right after the Tampa Bay game where he threw like Five touchdowns. And they passes. wanted at the buzzer. I wanted at the buzzer, right? I, it might have been after that game. Maybe it's a little further the season, but regardless of that, um, I, I, it'd be interesting because I think C.J. Stroud is going to, especially with the addition of Diggs, is going to have the numbers to be the MVP candidate. He he arguably already did last year, even missing two games. But can he get? Can the Texans get to a win total that would win him the MVP? Because you can't win the MVP, in my opinion, with ten wins. I don't even know if you can win it unless your numbers are otherworldly. I used to disagree with that, but I think that's fair. Uh, unless you're setting records, I don't even know if you get there with 11 wins. To me, if CJ's going to win it, the Texans are going to have to get to 12. I know you have concerns about the schedule, so I guess the question is, do you see a scenario where the Texans could get to 12 wins? Because I think that's what it would take for him to win MVP. 
12 wins or more. This schedule, 12 is going to be hard for me. I, 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 I'll entertain 11. 12 might be a stretch, but I guess it all remains to be seen. All right, we've got to get to a break. We're going to continue to roll on. Uh, if you want to join the conversation, 713-780-3776. Call, text, hit us up on Twitch, Twitter, uh, YouTube. Uh, as I said, CJ Stroud, now the Vegas favorite over Patrick Mahomes at 6-1 to one to win the NFL MVP. Good to hear if you're a Texans fan. How realistic is it? You can let us know. Lots more to get to on the final couple segments of the show. What do you want to do next, BMAC? Do you want to predict the new playoff team in the AFC and the NFC? Yeah, let's stick with the NFL and, and have some fun with that. Let's do that next. Coming up on the Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM. You're listening to The Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at Sam Houston Race Park. Hey, it's Brian McDonald and Joel Blank bringing you all the way to the top of the hour at 6 p.m. as we wrap up another fun week of The Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM. Coming to you live from Sam Houston Race Park out here off the Beltway. And if you guys want a fun weekend of wagering, you can get out here starting tonight where they've got lots of drink specials and a ton of races to bet on. And, of course, the weekend is going to be a whole lot of fun. 30th anniversary party tomorrow night, center club level. They're going to have cupcakes, glasses, and hats. Shannon's Jewelers are going to have a diamond dig after the fourth and the sixth races of the evening. $23,000 in jewelry, and 10 guests will win a piece of that. 
by the end of the evening. So lots of fun and games as they start another full schedule out here at Sam Houston Race Park. We love being a part of the racetrack. Always out here with you guys during the course of the summer months. We look forward to doing it again this season. And be back before the break, we were talking about the Texans, and rightfully so, I think, because of how aggressive the Texans have been both with trades and with the free agency market. There are a lot of teams giving a lot of hype to your Houston Texans. The fact is, is that they were a playoff team a year ago. I think the expectations are, no matter how the schedule, how hard the schedule is, that they should be a playoff team yet again next year. We talked about it before the break to tease the segment, but seemingly every year there's a team from the year past that does not make the playoffs and goes either from last to first, but somehow finds last to playoffs uh, and gets in in their conference into the playoffs the following season. You, you, we're gonna we're gonna kick it around a little bit here. Who who are you looking at, and what are we talking about in terms of one team from each conference? Didn't make it a year ago, but you think you're gonna make it this year? Yeah, I was just curious to get your opinion on teams who you know weren't good enough to make the playoffs last year that you feel confident can go from out of the playoffs to into the NFL playoffs this season. So your candidates just to uh, refamiliarize ourselves with the teams who missed the playoffs last year. I'll go through these quickly. In the AFC, missing the playoffs last year, these are your candidates to choose from. You have the Jets, the Patriots, the Bengals, the Jaguars, Colts, Titans, Raiders, Broncos, and Chargers. That's in the uh, AFC. And then over on the NFC side, and some of these are going to be no-brainers and not even included in the conversation, but you have Giants and Commanders, probably part of that group, uh, Vikings, Bears, Saints, Falcons, Panthers, Seahawks, and Cardinals. So one team from the AFC that you feel confident in, one team from the NFC that you feel confident or most confident can go from outside the playoffs to inside the playoffs this season. So for me, starting in the AFC, it, it, I have I have three that w- were on my mind, but two that are no-brainers. I think it's going to come down to the Jets and the Bengals. You nailed you nailed my top two, 100%. Yeah. I think if I'm going to say a sleeper, the Harbaugh effect and, 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 and a, 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 a competent – coach with offensive mind that's going to give Justin Herbert a chance to really shine is is something I'm encouraged by. I don't like the weapons that they have and what they got rid of when they yeah, got rid of Allen and Williams. The weapons they had are, are and gone. Eckler, yeah. They're all in different cities. Keith yeah. Allen's gone and Mike Williams is gone. Austin so Eckler's gone. It comes down to me the health of the two quarterbacks because if Aaron Rodgers is healthy, the Jets we already talked about, they had a really good defense a year ago, and they've got a ton of weapons on offense. And I think they're going to get more. I think they might even look at Brock Bowers in the draft. If you look at – Ooh, that would be nice. Yeah, if yeah. you look at the Bengals, for one season at least, one more season of having those two quality receivers with a healthy Joe Burrow is enough to say that that should alone translate to a, a playoff team because they have a good defense. So I'm going to say the Jets because I believe that Rodgers has so much more to prove – and because this might be his last hurrah, that I think that they are so far all in that they don't have the problems the Bengals have with being a little frugal if they need a player here and there and have to spend a little extra money. I'll say the Jets, but I think that both teams in my mind are going to be playoff teams this year. Yeah, so those are my top two as well. And and I think for both the Jets and the Bengals, we're really only talking about is their quarterback healthy. I think if Joe Burrow and Aaron Rodgers are healthy, especially for Aaron Rodgers. Hell, he got hurt, what, four plays into four the plays, fir- yeah. first game of the season. If those quarterbacks are healthy for, let's say, 15 of their 17 games, that's the only factor that would hold them back potentially from missing the playoffs. If Aaron Rodgers and, and Joe Burrow are healthy, and not just playing, but like actually healthy enough to play at their best for 15 of, the se- of their 17 games, both teams are making the playoffs. Yeah, that's if, okay. if, I, if I had to pick one, though, as my most confident, I'll, I'll go different than you. I will say the Bengals. I just – I feel like, not you specifically, but I feel like a lot of people, because of how down the year was for Cincinnati, have just seemed to forget how elite Joe Burrow had become. Going to Kansas City in in the AFC Championship game and and beating the Chiefs. Going to the next year to a snowy uh, Buffalo and beating Mm -hmm. the Bills in the playoffs before giving the Chiefs a a, I mean, Burrowhead Stadium. I mean, if there was uh, was kryptonite for the Chiefs, it was Joe Burrow. Yeah, I just absolutely believe, and and obviously their their coach has uh, has done a really good job as well coming from that. But, Brian, there's also – Sean McVay. It's not one injury, it was two. Because, remember, he started the year with the calf. And Jamar Chase was also hurt. And at at a time when he was down a weapon, his calf was awful. Right. And then right after the calf and later in the season, then it was the wrist and the the surgery and everything that he had done. So – I think that it's just one of those comedy of errors where the the injuries stacked up on him. 
I believe he's going to be back. I think it's it's a tougher conversation in the NFC because I don't like you said. I think a lot of the bottom feeders are just eliminated right off the top, and no matter what you think of yeah, Caleb, like, I wouldn't vote for the Commanders or the Giants or the like, Panthers or the Panthers. I, I, I have a hard time thinking the Bears in, in, in year one are going to be a playoff team. that's teams. actually one of the two teams I'm most confident in. And, and but may, do you think Caleb can do close to what C.J. did? Because I think that's what it would take, and I, I don't do. think he can. I do. Well, I don't think he'll do what C.J. did, but I think he'll do what's, what's now seemingly very uh, uh, over, not overpowered. but in, uh, He's got close. all the weapons in the world, I mean, or at least D- they've, yeah, they've – Yeah, D.J. Moore and Keenan Allen. Cole Komet Komet, was a pretty, yeah. pretty good tight end. They added uh, DeAndre Swift, who was a pretty good runner last year for the Eagles. I think Caleb Williams could come in, and, and I mean, we've seen this with, you know, uh, several quarterbacks, more than just Stroud, of these rookie quarterbacks coming in and playing pretty well and getting their teams into good spots really quickly. Uh, I think they can do enough in an NFC that is not as strong as the AFC. Like, the list of the contenders is not as deep in the NFC as it is the AFC, especially with, with the talent at the quarterback position in the AFC. I think the Bears can get to 9-10 wins and make the playoffs. I don't. I, don't. I think the division is tough with the Lions and the Packers and the Vikings the, the are not well, a slouch. Yeah, the, well, I mean, the Vikings don't have a quarterback, though. Not yet. but I, I, I mean, think Even if they draft J.J. McCarthy. They still have I, Justin I would, Jefferson. they got a decent they defense. They, they've they got some guys. I just don't believe in their and quarterback Addison. situation. Uh, but overall in the NFC, I think it, it, it's a what tougher. About the, what about the Falcons? Getting Kirk Cousins, obviously a lot of offensive skill talent there with Bijan and Drake London and Kyle Pitts. Yeah, there's there's two teams that really kind of struck me as teams that I would consider, um, and one of them is definitely Atlanta because I think Atlanta's defense was already pretty decent, and we saw Desmond and Ritter a defense ahead, defensive minded yeah. head coach, and we saw a def- uh, an offense with Ritter that beat the Texans somehow, <laughs> and he had three yeah. and he had three hundred yards. Yeah. But you talk about a, a team with weapons that was in desperate need of just a guy that could do something with him. Cousins, no matter what you say about his playoffs, his James Harden-like playoffs, he's a really good regular season quarterback. And I yeah. think Atlanta is primed uh, to make a jump, that they can make a run, that they can be there at the end of the day. And I think that's the first team that jumped out in my mind. So you, you mentioned you had two teams. I know you weren't in on the Bears. You disagreed with me there. What was your other NFC team that came to mind? I'm trying to think of – Give me, give me the teams. That yeah, so the teams that missed the playoffs, uh, the 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 uh, Cardinals, the Seahawks. oh the Cardinals. Cardinals. I, I think, I think if is you that go, contingent of them drafting Marvin Marvin Harrison or Jr.? a receiver? Okay, I think you give him another weapon. The fact that when we looked at the Texans schedule a year ago, we thought that it was an easy win when you played the Cardinals, and in in, in, in Kyler Murray's first game back, essentially. He, he, he had them in the ball game with the Texans down to the final plays of the game. Like, he's that good, and I never thought he would be that good. But I think that he matured a lot last year. I think he showed that he can game manage when he has to, but he's still capable with, with an arm and with his legs of making big plays. I think if they just put a piece or two around him to, for him to work with, I think they got a chance, and, and so I would say the Cardinals are my second choice, but I think Atlanta is the team that I would go with. Yeah, I like Arizona uh, quite a bit too, especially in that division. Uh, I don't think the Seahawks are going to be all that great, and the Rams, I think, take a step down now that Aaron Donald's retired. And while everyone's going to be focused upon who the Cardinals draft, uh, whether it be Marvin Harrison Jr. or maybe it's Malik Neighbors, I think it's going to be one of those two that they drafted mm-hmm. for. They've also got some other pretty good, pretty good other pieces. James James Connor Connor had a good year. Is very underrated. Like he he does get hurt a lot. He will miss probably three games this year. That's just what he does. But when he's healthy, ever since he got to Arizona, he had some good play in in Pittsburgh as well. But ever since he got to Arizona, he's been a very uh, explosive runner, especially in a, a dynamic threat in the passing game and two. And they've got a young tight end in Trey McBride who really broke out. He was a first round, I think he was a first round pick, or maybe he's just the first tight end drafted two years ago in 2022. Didn't do much his rookie season, was hurt a little bit, but last year, especially over the second half, really broke out. So you had uh, you know Marvin Harrison Jr. to Trey McBride and James Conner, and I think I think Kyler's got enough to get some things done. Now. Of, with that being said, I think the Rams, because Stafford's still an above-average quarterback. Well, they made the playoffs last year. Right. I, I think that that division itself, when you think about it, I think the Rams are going to be a playoff team again. So if Even Rams, without Donald? Yeah, I do. I think – yeah, that's one guy, though. I, I think that oh. you got an offensive-minded head coach and you still have those weapons at wide receiver to go with a very, very – Good. I mean, look, I didn't think I didn't give him a chance in hell of making the playoffs a year ago. So I think in that division, Arizona's got to climb because of the fact that they have to they have to get over the Rams, um, they have to get over the Niners, 
and that might be the biggest challenge that they're going to face. Seahawks are supposed to be desperate, but I don't think as long as Geno Smith's their quarterback that they can do anything. Yeah, I, I mean, I love their skill position talent. I think arguably uh, of all these teams that missed the playoffs, they might have the most explosive uh, offensive skill talent. I mean, D.K. Metcalf is a beast. Tyler Lockett's not. Smith I mean, and Jigba, he, he's right? dropped out. Yeah, he, uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba showed some flashes last year. Tyler Lockett's dropped off, but he's not done yet. And you got really two dynamic runners. I mean, I know uh, Zach Charbonnet didn't show a lot a whole last year because he didn't play much, but Ken Walker is an explosive, explosive Kenneth athlete. Walker from Michigan State. Yeah, uh, Michigan State. So, that, I mean, Seattle, if Geno Smith just gets his hat out of his butt and plays you know, anywhere near the level he did in 2022, I think Seattle could be a team that we talk about uh, making the jump as well. Let us know what you think, 713-780-3776. Call, text, hit us up on uh, the Internet and let us know who do you think is going to be a team that missed the playoffs a year ago that will make the playoffs next season. We've got plenty more to get to in the final half hour of the show. We've got a food debate on Wheel of Bits that BMAC has concocted. I'm interesting, interested to hear about that uh, and lots more to get to. So stick right where you are. It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM. Before we go to the break, I will tell you about my good friends at Allstate Siding and Windows. Look, I love these people. I love Mary and her whole family. They've been in business for almost 50 years. They've been involved with us and with Houston sports for almost as long. They love the people of Houston. They love taking, taking care of you, and they do so with products that protect, protect your biggest investment. We all know your house is one of the biggest if not the biggest investment you're going to have in your lifetime. And the main thing is living down here in Houston, between the heat of the summer and the occasional really, really cold days in the winter, and then all the different uh, elements you face during hurricane season, you need to protect your biggest investment in your house, and that's with siding and windows. I just had my windows done by Allstate Siding and Windows. Could not be happier. First thing you notice when you pull up to my house is it upgrades the overall look, appeal, and appearance of your house to a more modern and unbelievably rich feel. The, the windows are fantastic. They look beautiful, and they're eye catchers. But the more important thing to me was, I'm going to save up to 40% on my energy bills because they do exactly what you need them to do. They keep the heat in in the wintertime. They keep the heat out in the summertime. And they are super strong when it comes to hurricane season. And the siding does the same thing. And because you go to Allstate Siding and Windows, they're going to do a lot of things. They're going to come to you and tell you what they can do and how they can help. And it's going to cost you nothing. Free estimates. And then they're going to give you deals along the way. 30% off all windows right now, $2,500 off a complete siding job. You can get your free estimate now just by calling and picking up the phone. 832-204-1936, 832-204-1936, or head to the website, allstatewindowsandsiding.com. Discounts available for first responders, military, and senior citizens.
Always good on a Friday, headed to the weekend, a food debate, Brian McDonald. What uh, What's on your palate today, sir? Uh, lots on my palate, and I think it, I think the timing on this is critical. We can't do this bit like at 3.15, because no. then we got to sit here for another, like yeah. two hours of 45 minutes starving while we're thinking about all this delicious food. They already got the popcorn cooking here. I it know, smells phenomenal. I know, man. I, 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 am, a, I am a sucker for popcorn. popcorn I, I, oh, my God. I love popcorn. Uh, it's one of the best parts about going to the movies. So I, I wanted to play into your travels as someone who uh, obviously has traveled around the country w- while uh, working for multiple NBA teams. And I found this article talking about, like, the the super regional delicacies, uh, uh, food and drink that sure. certain parts of the country are most known for. So, one, I'm going to tell you an area of, the co- area of the country and see if you have an idea of where they're going to be. I'm going to stick to NBA areas. I'm not okay. going to go – with like Kansas or something like that. Uh, but then also, you know, once we talk about these dishes, see if you'd actually try it or if it sounds good to you. So let's start off. We'll, let's start off here actually in Texas. Um, what would you guess would be if you're, if you're making the claim of what is Texas, spe- the Texas specialty dish, what's Texas most known for as a regional dish that maybe isn't eaten a lot of other places in the country, what would you guess would be it? Uh, now this is voted upon. I, uh, maybe this part. Now of the here's my is, logic behind saying this because I don't want to get is from attacked. From Food Network, this. by yeah, the way. Okay. So, but, so we have that so out there. So just so that there's the understanding, I think that there are two to three cities that try and claim barbecue. So I'm going to say it's between barbecue and Tex-Mex, but I'm going to say that it's going to be Mexican food because of the fact that Tex-Mex is all Texas and and Mexican food's all Texas. Yeah, I would I would have guessed Tex Mex could could have been any either, but it's actually chicken fried steak. Really? Chicken fried steak, according to Food Network, is the most regional I, I, I specialty dish of the state of Texas. Now, you being from Wisconsin through uh, Portland, now here in Houston, are yeah. you, how are you on chicken fried steak? You a big fan? Is that something you uh, go to quite often? It's not my go to. I've had it. Mo- I mean, I've had it throughout my life. It, it's not my my favorite or my go to. I understand. It, it, there's a lot going on if you do the gravy and the fried on the outside and all the other stuff. I would rather just have a steak steak or have other things. So it's not it's not one of my favorites. Yeah, I, I man, I could crush some chicken fried steak. I try not to because I'd be 500 pounds, but uh, I try not to. Uh, all right, let me, uh, let's get you to guess a couple of these. See if okay. you can figure out what the regional cuisine or drink, some of these are drinks, uh, are for these parts. And I'm going to stick with the states that have NBA in here. So uh, let's start off. We'll go al- alphabetically. Arizona. What would you guess is the regional cuisine or drink of Arizona? Uh, margarita. You, ding, ding, ding. Yes, a prickly pear margarita. Now, I, I know, I know you don't drink uh, now, right? It's, it's occasionally. Occasionally. Not, like, yeah. I, are you a big margarita fan, or what is your drink My of wife choice? is. My wife loves margaritas, so that's normally one of the, one of the drinks that w- we will have is because, you know, if we're, if we're doing Tex-Mex, She's like, I'm in the mood for a margarita, too. And I'm always like, hey, for you, go get one. That would be fantastic. <laughs> so th- this one, I'm going to throw in one extra one because it's it's so uh, uh, outlandish to me. They don't have an NBA team. But do you have a guess what would be the regional, regional dish or, or drink of Arkansas? Arkansas. Mm, boy. Um... I, I can help you out here. I don't think you're going to get this one. I was surprised when I saw this. I'll, I'll just go ahead Squirrel. and Squirrel. <laughs> now that maybe that's Tennessee. Uh, no, it's chocolate gravy. <laughs> what? You no. Know, I saw this. I was like, chocolate gravy. So reading from the Food Network uh, article, uh, apparently it's popular in the Appalachians, especially Arkansas. This sauce is made with a flour cocoa powder roux and ladled over fluffy biscuits. Would you eat? A chocolate gravy covered biscuit, Joel. Well, I mean, people put chocolate in chili too, and the chili tastes just fine. Yeah, I- I'm sure that this doesn't taste like chocolate. So I would, I, w- I would be, because I mean, look, biscuits and gravy is phenomenal. Oh, so maybe I- the best dish in the world. So I'm not gonna say that, but I, I would say uh, John Daly probably has had plenty of this, and Coach Cal has this <laughs> to look forward to. But I'd try it. All right. So your your wife is from California. Is yes, that, that's sir. correct. So I'm, I'm gonna let's go there uh, next. California. What would you guess is the regional delicacy uh, of California, as as said by Food Network? Man, what they're most known for. And now I will say I don't know uh, what part of the state your wife's from. They mentioned San Francisco specifically oh, no, no, no. in this in no, this she's article. She's Southern California. She's, okay. She's Palm Desert and, uh, and about two hours from L.A. Um, man. 
for I hadn't heard of this, so I'm curious if you had. Like, uh, see, Cal- calamari. Yeah, see, I would think something light, something fresh, maybe like a fish taco. Yeah. That was kind of where my head was at. Apparently, California, according to Food Network, their most known uh, regional delicacy is something called Dutch Crunch Bread. Have you heard of this? No. Yeah, apparently it's a. Uh, apparently, people in San Francisco are obsessed with this. Uh, but it's a bread which has tender white crumb and cra- uh, crackly crisp, uh, or in a crackly crisp top, thanks to a rice flour coating on the top of the bread. The picture, I'll show you the picture Sounds here. Good. It looks really oh good. My. Yeah, it looks really good. That looks good. really delicious. It looks really good. So I, I definitely want to try it. I, when I first set, thought of California, it's like, okay, it's going to, like I said, I think it's going to be like a fish taco or yeah. something like that. But, uh, yeah, no. Not. A round loaf with a kind of crispy texturized top that almost looks like melted cheese, but it's not. But it looks delicious. All right, let's skip ahead a little bit. Uh, something closer to where you grew up. Indiana, what would you guess would be the regional dish of Indiana? Man, the Hoosier State for food? Yeah, I know. It's not a state I think of for food, for sure. I think of Ron Swanson first. Indianapolis, isn't it known for the mac and cheese, I want to say? It's not mac and cheese, I'll tell you that much. And Indianapolis also has the steakhouse, the St. Elmo's? St. Elmo's, yeah. Uh, but, But I don't, I guess I'll say steak because it's nebraska slash indianapolis but i don't know that i really believe it apparently according to this it's a pork tenderloin sandwich and what they show is like a german schnitzel sandwich on a bun it looks kind of fried yeah it looks pretty good apparently there's a a large uh german immigrant population there in indiana but it looks pretty good but yeah like there's germans all over milwaukee what are we doing (laughs) well we will get to wisconsin bust the beer we will definitely get to wisconsin before this is over but yeah i was a little surprised when i saw the pork tenderloin Uh, it looks it looks absolutely delicious but i just would have guessed like you like i think of indiana one i don't really think of food destination but i would have thought steakhouse but all right let's move over to um I, I, well, I guess technically uh, there's not an NBA team in the state. I don't know where the arena is, but it's close by. Let's go to Maryland. What would be your guess there for Maryland? I mean, it feels oh, like crabs. That, exactly. It's right? got to be crabs. Right. It, it's right. It should be. It's it not. It should be crabs. No, Joe, it's something called a lemon peppermint stick. Look at this. They literally cut a lemon in half, put a peppermint stick through the middle, and are drinking out the lemon juice through a peppermint stick straw. You know what that looks like? A stupid gimmick at a state fair. That Joel, you're exactly right. So this is apparently found in the in, at Baltimore carnivals and ice cream oh, there shops, you go. where peppermint sticks suck straight through half lemons, and they suck the juice of the lemon through the peppermint stick for a, as they call it, a sweet, sour, mouth-tingly experience. Other than Texas, with all the different <laughs> ways they deep fry things and have those delicate dessert, delicacy desserts, how the hell are you getting a delicacy out of a state fair? Yeah, that's I, a peppermint stick jammed in a lemon. I don't know. I mean, it actually does sound. The re- drink of the year, I believe, in Maryland is going to be a peppermint stick lemonade, where you just stick the stick right in the lemonade and you <laughs> no, call I, it a day. No, I actually would do that. I mean, uh, all, I don't. I, all, I like all, peppermint, but not. I'm not a big mint guy like that. All kidding aside, it's ridiculous. It should be crabs, but I would actually try it. Uh, all right, so let's go uh, a couple more here. Massachusetts, what would you be? By the way, there's guess? a guy walking the concourse with a Dodgers Urias jersey on. I'm not sure I'd be wearing that. Mm, no, um, don't think I would either. What? 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 Say uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yeah. Chowder should be the answer. Should be. It's something called. Uh, and I, I think I've heard of this. Boston brown bread. Have you heard of this? No. Apparently, but I, it's. I'm so, hoping it's clean. Well, it it looks like this. It doesn't look very appetizing. No, it doesn't. And I, I'm going to make this worse for you. Not only is the picture not very appetizing, apparently in the Boston area, it's sold in cans. It's canned, Joel. Yeah. No. I would never eat bread out of a can. Just hearing Boston brown bed and thinking bad thoughts <laughs> and then looking at the picture, those bad thoughts came to fruition. Boston brown bread does nope. sound like a euphemism for something else. You're First on. time I ever <laughs> went to Boston from the cab driver on, you got to try the chowder. Chowder, yeah. It's all about the chowder. That's, that's I mean, certainly what I would have uh, have guessed, uh, but no, they didn't go with that. Uh, I'm going to scroll ahead here uh, for a, for just probably one more. Let's scroll ahead to, uh, I'm buying time here. Actually, let's go with Oklahoma first, and then we'll make our way to your home state of Wisconsin. What Oklahoma. Do you, what, do you, what would you guess for Oklahoma? Man, Oklahoma, again, kind of in the middle of where I would think cattle. So I'm going to try one more time at what I'm going to fail and miss at, but I'll say steak. You're sort of on the right track because it involves beef, 
But uh, apparently Oklahoma and I, is famous for this, and I have seen this on Food Network before and a, a few other shows. But they have something called an Oklahoma onion burger. Have you heard of this? No. It looks pretty tasty. If, oh, if that you looks the really good. Again, go to the Food Network website if you, you know want I to love see onions. Pictures. That, yeah. that looks good. So it's a thinly charred burger with shaved onions pressed into the patty, two slices of American cheese and sauce dripping down your hands. Uh, Oklahoma delicious. onion burger. Yeah, I would definitely try, though. I, you know, my I, mom I, and dad owned and operated their own restaurant for oh, 16 years. What, what was and, the type? What type of food? It was a drive-in, but my dad cooked. So my dad, if it wasn't even on the menu, but you wanted it, he'd find a way to get it and make it for you. But Davy Burgers, my dad's specialty, were the burgers that he did. That he would, uh, he would take the ground beef and roll it with the the, the onions before he grilled it, and then added the grilled onions on top of it Ooh. with yeah, the cheese and good. all that. It was phenomenal. I right, actually two more because there's another there's another state here you spend a lot of time in Oregon. What would okay. you guess would be the specialty Salmon. of Oregon? Uh, no, it's actually uh, – apparently they get credit for uh, actually inventing this, but tachos, nachos put on tater tots. Have you seen these? It looks pretty damn good. I, I've Some had these at uh, a place called Rodeo Goat that's uh, – Pizza here. Hut or somebody starting to do this? Uh, Domino's does Domino's, that. Yeah, Domino's I saw does the fast that. food place doing it. I, I, Portland has always it been is, known for salmon. Por- yeah, po- well, Portland is given credit to this, and apparently the Tillamook uh, – Tillamook. Yeah, Tillamook. yeah, that's there, and so they're, they're given a lot of credit for – being the innovators of this all dish. Cheese, yep. So, I mean, what, is that something you try? The, uh, yeah, the, try it. Okay, yeah, yeah. It, it looks absolutely dis- uh, delicious. All right, let's get to your home state from Wisconsin. A lot of, lot of, lot of pressure here. you got to get this one right. What is Wisconsin's most known or most known regional dish? It's got to be sausage. It's got to be something to do with sausage, bratwurst or some kind of sausage. Uh, well, there is a meat in this. It's that not it, sausage? It, it doesn't specifically say sausage. It's something called booyah. Do you know what this is? No. So apparently this is a stew made for meat, tomatoes, and veggies that's commonly made in big batches and served at fundraisers and uh, church functions. It's thought to be tied to European settlers, and the name could be a derivative of the word bouillon. It's called booyah. It's basically like a super stew. I've never heard of this something before. You, something you used to make watching Sports Center when Stuart Scott I, yelled yeah, at Yeah, that, that's the like, first thing I thought of that was is? Stuart Scott. That's every day that ends in a Y when you grow up in Wisconsin without money. Because yeah. my parents, that's all they did. It's goulash stew. Right. Hot dish. Wherever right. you live in Wisconsin, that's what that's called. Is it, should this just be any state that's called? Yeah. It, this feels like this could be the regional dish. That's any, meat and potatoes 101. Uh, right. Of any state that's cold. I, I felt like they did Wisconsin as service. This feels just like any state that's cold in January, this is something you would eat because no, it's, 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 it. it's hearty. It's got meat. It's got potatoes. It's got your vegetables. And more importantly, again, Comfort hot. food. Yeah. yeah hot. No doubt about it. All right. We got one segment to go before we wrap up the show. You know what it means because Jeremy's not here. I don't have to listen to all those ridiculous <laughs> freaking mean texts. We're going to go wrap it up with our car wreck of the day and get you into your weekend next. Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5. 92.5 FM.
All right, back for a final segment of the week on the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM. We always appreciate you being a part of the Hive, keeping the Hive alive. And Brian McDonald keeping the Hive alive today with Jeremy taking a day off. Alex already looking for someone else to kill now that Joe George can't be a sacrificial lamb every day. <laughs> has said that Jeremy should be the car wreck of the day because he didn't call in today, and it's not like he's vacationing on a vacation day. He just went to Cincinnati. I've seen a lot of burials and car wreck nominations for that Food Network list we just talked yeah, about. The, uh, from 9229, I've already canceled the Food Network for this piss poor list. I don't disagree. I, like, if you're going to go, like, don't try and, like, shake the tree and, 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 and rewrite history, right? We know what certain states and, and certain areas – are known for everyone's known for the hot dish wisconsin's known for what beer cheese and sausage yeah. it's that simple yeah. someone else said wisconsin should have been cheese curds that i would that settle for that but cheese fine. curds in wisconsin yes they serve the deep deep fried like all the bars do but true real good cheese curds are served cold and they squeak when you bite into them if they're fresh yeah i think i would go fried they're very good uh, uh, uh from five zero one zero this list is worse than jose abreu's batting average it's pretty true <laughs> like i didn't have a problem with the texas nomination of chicken fried steak certainly there would be an argument for tex-mex or barbecue but i didn't have a problem with that one but yeah the wisconsin one was really bad uh this one from one five nine one not banging the list but says chocolate gravy does actually taste like chocolate and it's pretty good would rather have uh, sausage gravy, but still not bad. So I think we got to try the chocolate gravy yeah, here. Yeah, because like, if you're going to go barbecue, the only reason why I didn't say it is because of the fact that you could go Memphis, you could go Kansas City, or you could go anywhere in Texas. So therefore, if you're going to give it, give it to one, Texas has variations. And the one thing that they're known for because it's in their name and nowhere else is Tex-Mex. Yeah, that's that's a good point. It's actually in the name. Yeah. All right, so non, uh, non-food network list that we need to bury today in the car wrecks of the day. I don't know if you saw this. Ryan Garcia, Devin Haney uh, fighting tomorrow in a uh, welterweight uh, fight. Uh, supposed to be at 140 pounds. And but Ryan Garcia, he's had some issues uh, with missing weight and a few other things. Uh, well known out there if you follow boxing. Uh, so they had a bet. Devin Haney had a bet with Ryan Garcia. For every pound he was overweight of the 140-pound limit, uh, Garcia would owe Devin Haney $500,000. Well, Ryan Garcia now owes Devin Haney $1.5 million because he weighed in for a 140-pound fight at 143.2. Yikes. Absolutely brutal. Now, will he pay or will he be king of Twitch? Uh, <laughs> I don't think he's going to have a choice. The The commissions will take it out of his purse before he gets well, they, it. What, why? The commissions are able to say it was legit bet? Yeah, if they have it in writing. If they have it as I part of the contract. Do you think they put it in writing? It's I've seen it in boxing before. Okay. I think it's certainly possible. What other nominations do you think we have? Brendan Riley that? for leading me astray uh, and freaking who said it. I didn't ask for him. You gave him to me. <laughs> and then he led me away from at least three I, of the answers to, I would have had. I wanted to lead you into the weekend, Joel Blank, with a nice this surprise. This is another way that you become our, Bush League. Of our old you pal, made, You force-fed me a partner I did not want or now, need, and I lost. But I did say you had final say. Like, you have final say on all these choices for who said it. You had him on the line already <laughs> when I'm going to say, hey, Brendan, sorry to break it to you, but I don't need you goodbye. No, you didn't have to say goodbye. You could take his input and then go your own way. You take it and shove it. I didn't need it. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we're pretty close to out of time. What do you think uh, should be our official car wreck of the day? Mm, Justin Verlander's personal snow. Um, I don't know, man. Make I think a, I got to go Ryan Garcia. I was going to say, make you, it a bet and losing $1.5 million. You lose, right, you lose $1.5 yeah, million because you, you can't make weight after like a six- or eight-week training camp. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Be professional, bro. Hey, you were professional today. Thank all my you. thanks go to Brian McDonald for all, not only filling in for Jeremy today, but trudging all the way out here to Sam Houston Race Park with me, where you should be this weekend for all the fun and festivities. You can get yourself a part of $23,000 in jewelry that they're going to hide somewhere out on the track tomorrow as part of their 30th anniversary celebration. SHRP.com. For Brian McDonald and A-Rod back at the station doing all the hard work. I'm Joel Blank. Have yourself a great weekend. The Hive will be alive on Monday. Join us for the Killer Bees right here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 FM.